are my recollections of a very unusual young man with whom I was thrown into contact at long intervals. He's not famous. It even may be that when his life is over, he will leave no more trace of his sojourn on this earth than a stone thrown in a river leaves on the surface of the water. And yet, I met him first in the summer of 1919 in Chicago. A friend of mine, Elliot Templeton, whom I'd known in Paris, invited me to a sort of family dinner party at a country club. Oh, there you are, Mo. Welcome to this benighted city. Let me present my sister, Louisa, Mr. Somerset Moore, my you? sister, Mrs. Brandt. How do you do? He's really quite famous abroad, Louisa, so pretend you know all his books. Oh. <laughs> but how much longer must we wait for dinner? Well, if you'll excuse me, I'll try to find out about it now. Of course. Uh, I should never have left Paris. Well, why did you? To visit Louisa and Isabel. Oh, Isabel is my niece, Louisa's daughter. She's round here somewhere. I'd like to meet her. You'll also meet her young man. His name is Larry Darrell, and I don't approve of him. Oh, I have nothing against him, but he hasn't any money. We can't all be millionaires. The fellow hasn't even got a job. He doesn't want one. That must be a great shock to a man like you, Elliot, who's never earned a penny in his life. <laughs> it may have escaped your notice, my dear fellow, but I am not an ordinary man. For the run of mankind, industry is essential. Oh, there's Isabel now. She's very lovely. And that other girl? Her name is Sophie Nelson, a sort of country cousin. Well, come, I rather think I require a cocktail. A few minutes later, seeing that Sophie was alone, I walked over and introduced myself. Quite a party, isn't it, Mr. Mom? Oh, I wish I had a drink. Well, let me bring you one. Oh, don't tempt me. I promised Bob I wouldn't. Bob? My fiancé. He doesn't like me to drink. Now, which one here is Bob? Oh, he hasn't arrived yet. You see, he's putting himself through law school and he doesn't finish till late. Mr. Mom, you're a great friend of Mr. Templeton's, aren't you? Elliot has no friends, my dear, only acquaintances. Oh, he's an awful snob, isn't he? Awful. But he's kind and generous. In Paris, people laugh at him behind his back, but they never hesitate to drink his wine and eat his food. Oh, uh, is that Mr. Darrell there with Isabel? Oh, no, that's Gray. Gray Maturin. His father's a millionaire stockbroker. He gives us class. I see. Gray's really wonderful. And he's so much in love with Isabel, he can't see straight. And she's in love with Larry Darrell. Mm -hmm. I suppose that could complicate matters. Oh, speaking of Larry, there he is now. Come, Mr. Mom, I'll introduce you. Well, now that everybody knows everybody, excuse me. What's the trouble, brown eyes? You're nervous. Oh, of course I am, Larry. I'm waiting for Bob. Is tall, dark, and legal standing you up? Oh, I'd like to catch him trying it, Isabel. Now, be nice to Mr. Mom. Your old friends, Mr. Darrell, you and Sophie? They grew up together, Mr. Morm. Sophie was probably the best shortstop our neighborhood ever had. Mr. Morm, since you're a novelist, I'd better warn you that Larry's very stupid. He knows nothing about anything but flying. But when he came back from the war, he looked so lovely in his uniform. I just camped on his doorstep until he consented to marry me. The competition was awful. Isabel's not a bad girl, Mr. Mom. She's just a terrible liar. Larry, I think we've time for a dance before dinner. Will you excuse us, Mr. Mom? Of course, run along. Oh, hello, Uncle Elliot. Isabel? Oh, I thought you were still cavorting at that horrible country club. What's the matter? And where's Larry? Hmm? He dropped me off and fled. Hello, Mr. Morm. Your uncle insisted on bringing me home for a brandy. He thinks... Uh, just I'm... a moment. Uh, Isabel, about Larry, did you have a talk with him? Yes. Well, may I venture to inquire the result? Larry's decided to go to Paris for a while. Why? To loaf. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Well, that's what he told me. Really, if you had any spirit, you'd have broken the engagement. Hmm. What can I do? I love him. Mr. Morm, I'm sorry to have inflicted this on you, but you know Uncle Elliot. Well, uh... I'll say good night. Good night, Isabel. You think I'm upset, don't you, Mom? You've made it fairly obvious. Well, I'm not upset at all. In Europe, Darrell will be out of the way. And I don't see why Isabel shouldn't marry Grey Maturin before the year is out. You've lived in France too long, Elliot. You've forgotten that in this country, a girl doesn't marry a man because her mother or even her rich and worldly uncle wants her to. <laughs> you know, I don't mind admitting I have a sneaking sympathy for this Darrell fellow. I'll keep my eye on him in Paris. I look for an apartment at a really smart quarter. Oh, I'll do him proud. I'll lend him the rose and my chauffeur now and then. Yes, Mom, I may even make Daryl my protege.
poor Elliot, all the wonderful things he was going to do for Larry in Paris. Unfortunately, Larry would have none of it. And Elliot flicked him off like a speck of lint in his impeccable lapel. Larry spent his year in France. Then, quite suddenly, Isabel and her mother arrived. Now, don't look so unpleasant, Uncle Elliot. Of course I'll see Larry. Darling, don't be hurt. But I didn't come to Paris just to see you. He met you at the boat, I suppose. Oh, and it was wonderful to see him again. Mother, doesn't Larry look marvelous? I must admit, Isabel, he's thrived beautifully in your absence. Indeed. Well, I haven't a very good account of that young man. Oh? When he first arrived in Paris, I invited him to a luncheon. I planned to introduce him to the Princess Novamale. He told me that he doesn't eat lunch. Perhaps he doesn't. And then when I asked him to dinner, he said he had no evening clothes. Maybe he just didn't want to come. That's the most incredible reason for refusing my invitation I've ever heard. Well, Louisa, how long are you and Isabel remaining? Oh, I don't know. We'll stay about a month, Uncle Elliot. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if Larry's with us on the boat back home. You tired of walking, Isabel? There's a taxi. Oh, no, like no, Larry. It's delightful. All these wonderful little shops and everything. <laughs> Larry, do you know I've been here nearly a month? Impossible, darling. I've seen you every day, and I still don't know a thing about what you've done all year. Well, there's nothing to tell. Not really. I've traveled around the countryside, read a lot, gone to lectures. And, well, that's about it. Have you found that peace of mind you were looking for? No. How much longer do you think all this is going to take you? I don't know, Isabel. And after that? What are you going to do with all the wisdom you will have acquired? Well, if I ever acquire wisdom, I suppose I'll be wise enough to know what to do with it. You know what Uncle Elliot says? <laughs> Nothing to my credit, I'm sure. He says you have a cozy little hideout somewhere. Well, come and see for yourself. The cozy little hideout's only a step from here. In this neighborhood? But darling... Oh, Isabel, it only looks dirty. Come on. I'd like you to see it. Four flights up. In a tenement. Oh, Larry, how can you bear to stay in this backwash when America is living through the most glorious adventure the world has ever known? You just can't go on loafing forever. Oh, can you? Well, it's possible. But what's all this going to lead to? Oh, I, I don't know, Isabel. Maybe nothing at all. But it may be that when I'm through, I'll found something to give that people will be glad to take. I mean, a way of life. Oh, I'm talking like a fool, and I know it. I'll probably fail. But if I do, I won't be any worse off than the fellow who's gone into business and hasn't made a go of it. I see. And there's nothing more to be said. Isabel, what are you doing? Giving you my engagement ring, Larry. Dressed up, Isabel. Where are you going? Oh, where in particular, Uncle Elliot? Larry and I are going out on the town. Larry? But you gave him up. Yes, dear, I know. But we thought we'd like to spend my last night in Paris together. If he had any sense of decency, he'd never ask you. I'm profoundly shocked. But he didn't ask me. I asked him. No doubt there were moments that night when Isabel and Larry forgot their engagement was ended. But most of their evening was sad and strained and filled with a yearning that neither music nor champagne could quite overcome. When Larry brought her back to Elliot's home... Five hours, you'll be on the boat train. How does one say goodbye, Isabel? Must we say goodbye now, Larry? Oh, stay for a moment. We could have one last drink together. I'd like to... Isabel, I... I've never seen you so beautiful. Oh, darling... Darling. Oh, what would I do without you? I love you so much I can't even... You better go. Larry, no, please, no. Don't kiss me again. Please, Larry, for heaven's sake, go. Goodbye, Isabel. Larry. That was a brilliant performance, my dear. Oh. Hello, Uncle Elliot. I've been waiting in the next room. I left the door open just a little. <clears throat> Do you still want that drink? I expect you need it. 
Oh, you think you're very clever, don't you? Oh, come, come, child. I guessed you were up to something. Even your poor mother noticed the pains you went to to make yourself particularly alluring tonight. You're hateful. Oh, but no fool, Mon Ange. Isabel, you're a beautiful woman. You had him trapped just now. You know you did. Yes, I know. But when I looked at him, when I saw he hadn't the slightest idea, I, I just couldn't play such a dirty trick. I couldn't help myself. Huh. I suppose it was my better nature. Nonsense. It was your sound Midwestern horse sense. Isabel, in less than a year, you'll be Mrs. Gray Maturin with $20 million in the bank. I'll forget Larry. Within a year. I said less than a year. Trust your Uncle Elliot, my girl. He's a very wise old party. I wonder. I wonder. married and in less than a year, Isabel and Gray Maturin. I doubt if anyone was more pleased with this turn of events than Elliot Templeton. I must say they make a most attractive couple, Mom. Uh, all's well that ends well. I hope they'll be happy. By the way, was that Sophie Nelson I saw a few minutes ago? Oh, Isabel's country cousin, yes. She's uh, married now to that lawyer fellow. Isabel insisted on inviting them to the wedding. Why, I don't know. Did she invite Larry Darrell? Are you trying to bait me? You know very well Daryl's in Europe. Yes, I saw him last spring, Elliot. He mentioned something about going to Strasbourg and working in a coal mine. Working in a... Most undesirable young man. Now, about your plans, dear fellow, did I hear you say something about India? As a matter of fact, you did. I'll be in India by the first of the year. Well, look me up when you're back, old man. <laughs> Naturally, I shall be in Paris. It was in Strasbourg, as I subsequently learned, that Larry Darrow came to a great decision. He had made a friend, a fellow coal miner named Costi. You're late for our glass of beer, Monsieur Darrow. Sorry, Costi. I've been over at the university. I've been rolled for a night course. You're a fool. Why should a man who wants to develop his brain work in a coal mine? I just wanted to, I suppose. Hiding out, Larry? Police after you? No. A woman, maybe? No, I just thought, well, a coal mine might do me good. And when you've had enough of it, you go back to America, huh? I suppose so. And do what? Mm, sell stocks and bonds. But what about the answers to all your profound questions? Peace of mind, happiness, how to live? <laughs> Don't you know people have been asking those same questions for thousands of years? They can't help asking them. You know what you sound like, Larry? Like a very religious man who does not believe in God. I'm not sure I believe in anything. Look, have you ever thought of going to the East, India, for instance? India? I went there once. I met a very strange man, a saint. People from all over India go to him for guidance, for teaching. Did he help you? No. But that was not his fault. It was mine. A few weeks later, Larry Darrell arrived at a sort of monastery at the foot of the Himalaya Mountains in northern India. Why have you come here, my son? I've come to learn. Ever since the war, I've been searching for something. Something that I'm not able to put into words. In France, I met a Polish coal miner. He told me that, that you might help me. God is the only help. I've traveled, I've studied, I've read everything I could get my hands on, but nothing seems to satisfy me. And should you find what you are searching for? It will be something good, something to be shared with others, but how to find it, where? The whole world is like you, my son, restless, confused. It will always be so as long as men set their hopes on false ideals. The road to true salvation is difficult to pass over, difficult as the sharp edge of a razor. But this much we know. There is in every one of us a spark of the infinite goodness which created us. And when we leave this earth, we are reunited with it, as a raindrop falling from heaven is at last reunited with the sea. 
which gave it birth. May I stay here? Will you help me? Of course you may stay. Our life is very simple here. There are books. We will talk together. You can work in the fields if you wish. Thank you. Come, my son. I don't know if Larry Darrell ever thought of Isabel in the years that passed. For there in India, he was as one lost to the rest of the world. One day, he returned to the monastery from a solitary pilgrimage in the mountains. Eagerly, he sought out his venerable teacher. Well, my son? Do you remember what it was you told me the day I left here? I told you that sometimes, alone in that mountain, strange things may happen. Well, something very strange did happen to me. One morning, I suddenly awoke and walked out of the little hut. I just stood there on the mountaintop. And gradually, the light began to filter through the darkness, like some mysterious figure stealing through the trees. And then the first rays of the sun came up, the mountains, the mist caught in the treetops. I never felt or saw anything like it. I know. I felt that I'd been released from my body, and all the things that had been confused before suddenly became clear to me. I had a sense of knowledge more than human. I felt that I'd broken away and was free. I felt that if it lasted another moment, I'd... I'd die. And yet I was willing to die if I could just hold on to it. Because for that short time, I had the feeling... The feeling that... That you and God were one. Yes. I'm going back there. I'm going back. No, my son. Your place now is with your own people. It's being given you to see the infinite beauty of the world, which is only the reflection of the beauty of God. That vision of beauty will remain with you, fresh and vivid, to the end of your days. Go now, my son. Go back to your world. Much had happened by the time Larry Darrell was once again in Paris. Our meeting in a little Italian cafe was entirely accidental, but I had considerable to tell him. And what about Elliot Templeton, Mr. Mom? Have you seen him lately? Oh, yes. He's given up his Paris home. He's taken a villa on the Riviera. All the better people are on the Riviera now. I, uh, I don't suppose you've had any news from home. That is, my home, Chicago? Some, Larry. For one thing, there's been a great stock market crash. Gray Maturin lost everything. But wise old Uncle Elliot sold short. He made a fortune. And what about Isabel? And Sophie and her beau? They were married, of course. Yes, they were married. They had a little girl. The husband and child were killed last year in an automobile accident. And Sophie? Elliot didn't know too much about it. Other than that, Sophie just about lost her mind. I understand she disappeared. No one knows where she is. Sophie. And now what about Isabel? It may surprise you to know that Isabel and Gray and their two children are living not five miles from here. Here? In Paris? Isabel? Well, after the crash, Gray had a nervous breakdown. He hasn't been well enough to work. Elliot's been very generous. He insisted they take over his home here. Oh, poor Gray. I should look them up. Now suppose you let me ask some questions. What did you do in India, Larry? Well, I learned something about myself. I was very happy there. About Gray and Isabel, if you could give me their address, I might... Better yet, I'll meet you there this afternoon. Here's the address. Mr. Mom, how nice of you to drop in. Hello, Isabel. How's Gray? Oh, another one of his horrible headaches. He's lying down. Oh, what a pity. I was hoping you and Gray would dine with us tonight. I'd love to, but I don't see how we can. Did you say us? Yes. Larry Darrell is back in Paris. Larry? Larry Darrell? He lunched with me today. He'll be dropping in any minute. Larry. Where has he been? India. India? Do you realize I... I haven't seen him for years. Oh, yes, Marie. Excuse me, madame. Monsieur Darrell is calling... Isabel. Larry. Oh, Larry, I, 
I can't believe it. Hello, Isabel. And Larry, let me look at you. You haven't changed. You haven't changed at all. Well, it is Gray home? And where are the children? Oh, I'd so like to show them off. Their nurse has taken them to the park. Gray's here in the library. Gray. Gray, dear, look. It's Larry Darrell. Larry? Hello, Gray. Oh, I'm glad to see you, Larry. Uh, sorry you caught me like this. Blinding headache. Gray, Mr. Moore wants to take us all out this evening. Do you feel up to it, Gray? Oh, I wish I could say yes, but go anyway, please. Wait a minute. Gray, would you let me see if I can help you? How? Your headache. I, I might be able to help you. I'd like to talk to you. Well, sure. I think Dr. Darrell would like to be alone with his patient. Do you mind, Isabel? It won't take long. Oh, I, I can't understand it, Isabel. It's practically gone. My headache's gone. Larry, what on earth did you do? Well, he, he just talked to me, and then he told me to go to sleep, and, and I did. Whatever it was, Larry, you learnt the trick in India, didn't you? Well, there's nothing so unusual about it. Sort of a hypnosis, I suppose. I merely put an idea into Gray's head that he would feel better. He did the rest himself. Larry, do you think you could cure him permanently? Well, I, I, I can't work miracles. But there's no reason why he couldn't cure himself in time. But that was a miracle. I know how miserable he felt. Can we reconsider dinner then? Oh, sure we can. I'd like to go out. Excellent. How do you know, Isabel? I'll phone for reservations. Where'd Larry go, Isabel? I asked him to get my rat. What did you do with my husband? Well, Gray's getting the car. I... I was watching you and Larry dance. Isabel. I know what you're thinking. Go on, say it. You're not going to be so silly as to fall in love with him again, are you? I've never stopped loving him. Never loved anyone else in my life. Gray's such a good fellow. It would be a pity to hurt him. I'll never do anything to hurt him. I'm too fond of him for that. Well, it's your business, not mine. Well, where shall we go now? Oh, how about the Rue de Lac? Rue de Lac, what a neighborhood. But I've never been there. At least it'll be different, please. Well, if you really want to go, of course. But I think you'll be sorry. It's dirty and it can be dangerous. Mm, that's ridiculous. Here they come. Gray, guess where we're going? The Rue de Lac. Sophie. But it is. Look at her. Here in a dive in the Rue de Lac. She's seen us. Oh, it's not possible. Well, well, look who's here. Oh, Sophie. Well, who'd you think it was? Oh, don't get up. Don't get up. Well, fancy meeting you all like this. Hi, Larry. Hi, brown eyes. How are you? I'm thirsty. Let's all have a drink. Patron. Certainly, I know them. They're my childhood friends. Donnez-nous une bouteille de champagne. Très bien. Well, I can't say you seem so terribly pleased to see me. I heard rumors you were in Paris, Sophie. Well, you might have called me. I'm in the telephone book. Well, Gray, you went bust, didn't you? Yeah. Tough. I guess it must be pretty grim in Chicago. Lucky for me, I got out when I did. Well, drink up, it's champagne. For you, Sophie. Thanks, Larry. When they were killed, Bob and my baby, I went to pieces. And then I put the pieces together again with alcohol. My loving in-laws kicked me out. I think that gentleman's trying to get your attention, Sophie. Oh, that's my boyfriend. That's Coco. Oh, la paix! Tu ne vois donc pas que je suis avec mes amis? Coco Zan. You living in Paris now, Larry? Yes. Yes, I am, Sophie. You remember the summer before the war? Sure. Well, we saw a lot of each other then. Oh? When? When you and your mother were being social. We used to read poetry together. Remember, Larry? I remember. Well, well, maybe I'd better get back to my boyfriend. He'll raise the roof. Sophie, we, we'd really like... Oh, to... so long, folks. Come and see me again when you've got nothing better to do. I'm here every night. 
o'clock. Uh, I guess we better get out of here. Let's all go home. You never saw two people so crazy about each other, Larry. Sophie and Bob. After the accident, we did all we could to help her. It was just no good. A normal person recovers in time. She just never did. She was always unbalanced. Even her love for Bob and the baby was exaggerated. Don't you think I'm right, Larry? Sylvie was as normal as any person I've ever known. Was she in love with you, Larry? Oh, good heavens, no. Just a skinny little girl with a ribbon in her hair. I remember her crying once when I was reading a note of Keats because it was so beautiful. All girls of that age are emotional. Yes. Yes, I suppose so. Well, I'd better be getting along. Uh, don't run now, Larry. It's late, Isabel. And gray here had better get some sleep. Oh, but I feel fine, really. Larry, we will see you. Of course, Isabel. Good night. Good night, Mr. Mom. Well, I should be going, too. I'll give you a lift, Larry. When I inquired of Larry where he was living, he asked me if I'd mind taking him instead to the Rue de Lat. I left him at the cafe with Sophie. I saw nothing more of Isabel, Sophie, or Larry. Then one day, in answer to a telephone call, I rushed to Isabel's home. The idiot. The stupid, blind idiot. If you'd calm down, Isabel, I might figure out what you're trying to tell me. He's going to marry her. Larry is going to marry Sophie. How do you know? He called me on the phone. I'm frantic. Well, it's his own affair, isn't it? He says she stopped drinking. The fool thinks he's cured. Oh, that's possible. Have you forgotten what he did for Gray? Gray wanted to be helped. She doesn't. How do you know? Because I know women. She's no good. Do you think for one minute she'll stick to Larry? What's the matter with you? Do you think I've sacrificed myself only to let Larry fall into the hands of a woman like that? How did you sacrifice yourself, Isabel? By giving Larry up. And for one reason, because I didn't want to stand in his way. Come off it, Isabel. You gave him up for a square-cut diamond and a sable coat. Get out of here. Get out. I hate the sight of you. I'm sorry for that, Isabel. Because the sight of you always gives me great pleasure. You're beautiful. You're fascinating. And smart enough, I've always thought, to make the best of a bad job. No. Larry is in the grip of the most powerful emotion that can beset the breast of man. Self-sacrifice. He's got to save the soul of the wretched woman whom he knew as an innocent child. And there's nothing you or I can do to prevent it. But... He's going to be so miserable. Do you love him very much, Isabel? It's a nuisance, isn't it? I can't help it. Then why lose him altogether? Make friends with Sophie. Be nice to her. Yes, I, I could ask her to lunch tomorrow. Oh, but I can't. Not after the awful things I said about her to Larry on the phone. If I ask her to lunch, will you behave? Oh, like an angel of light. One o'clock tomorrow at the Creon. Isabel, you're not... Hatching up anything, are you? Don't be hateful. Just terribly curious to see what she looks like. Now that Larry's reformed her. Luncheon with a reformed alcoholic and a jealous girl can be something of a strain. Larry was the only calm one among us. There were cocktails on the table... They seemed to fascinate Sophie, but she spoke readily and openly of having stopped drinking entirely. Isabel actually behaved beautifully. She insisted on giving Sophie a Molyneux gown for her wedding dress. Sophie was to call at the house the next day, and Isabel would drive her to the shop for a fitting. But I'm so glad you're early, Sophie. As long as the fitter can't see us until four, we can have a nice long talk. That's what I want, Isabel. Because there's something on my mind. You... Hate me for marrying Larry, don't you? Oh, I don't hate you at all. But I'd hate anyone or anything that came in the way of his happiness. I'll be a good wife, Isabel. I was before. Yes, I know you were. Would you like some tea, Sophie? No, thanks. What's in that bottle? That? Oh, it's called Pesovka. It's a sort of Polish brandy. Uncle Elliot sent us a case of it yesterday. It's really wonderful. Oh, and to think I shall die without ever having tasted it. Don't you love the color? 
It's like the green you sometimes see in the heart of a white rose. Oh, poor Sophie. I have a great desire to drink, Isabel. But give me about two more weeks, though. I haven't had a drop since that night in the Rue de Lap. It must be awful. I mean, breaking off completely, all at once. Sometimes when I've been alone, I've wanted to shriek the house down. But this is my only chance. Larry's giving me my only chance. I know that. Excuse me, madame. The car is here. Oh, thank you, Marie. Sophie, my little girl's at the dentist. As long as I have time to pick her up, perhaps I'd better. Of course. Is that her picture, Isabel? Your little girl? Oh, this is my other one. This is Priscilla. She's seven. Linda. My baby, Linda, would have been nine in November. This November that's coming. Well, I, I won't be long, Sophie. Linda. My baby. My baby. <gasps> one drink. Just one drink. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. Isabel did not return till quite late. By then, Sophie was gone, and the bottle of Pirzovka was empty. Four days later, Larry finally found her. She was back in the Rue de Lap, and worse than ever. There was a fight when Larry tried to take her out of the place. He was badly beaten. When he recovered consciousness, Sophie had disappeared. That was the last I saw or heard of her until almost a year later when I received an urgent telegram from the police department of the city of Toulon. How good of you to come here, Monsieur Mont. Well, I will not beat around the bush. Here is a book, a novel. You recognize it? I ought to, Inspector. I wrote it. Did you also write the inscription here on the flyleaf? I... Yes, I did. I gave this book to Sophie Nelson several years ago in Chicago. Have you found her? We have found her. She has been murdered. What? We fished her body out of the harbor. The throat was cut from ear to ear. Monsieur, how does it happen that a person of your age and respectability should be acquainted with such a character? I knew her very slightly. Your book was found in her room. Monsieur, we wish merely to establish a few facts about her and uh, arrange for a burial. Of course. I don't, Inspector. Monsieur Darrell has returned. Come in, Monsieur. Hello, Mr. Mom. So they sent for you, too. Have they told you? Yes, it's dreadful. I've been at the morgue. I had to identify her. Well, messieurs, we think we know who perpetrated this crime. Finding him may be another matter. Meanwhile, if you uh, care to arrange a funeral, I can give you the necessary authorization. We, we'd like to very much. So happens, I have a personal friend who is an undertaker. Very reasonable, messieurs. Here, his card. Thank you. May I see where she lived? Follow me. I shall be happy to take you there. <laughs> Deceased apparently had occupied this room for about five months. Mr. Mom, look. Yes. Ah, oh, yes, that photograph. A man and a child. You know who they are? Her husband and her baby. Oh, where are they now? Dead. A long time ago. Could the picture be buried with her? If you wish, monsieur. Poetry. She still had this book of poetry. An ode of Keats. I read this to her when she was just a little girl. Fades the sight of beauty from my eyes. Fades the shape of beauty from my arms. Fades the voice, warmth, whiteness, paradise. Vanished unseasonably at shut of eve. After the funeral, Larry came with me to Nice to call on Elliot Templeton. I had heard from Isabel that Elliot was very ill. Uncle Elliot, you have visitors. Look. Elliot. Oh, my dear fellow. How very nice to see you. And Larry. Well, this, this is a surprise. Mr. Mom said you were sick. Did he? Well, I am sick. But you don't look it. You look extremely well. Well, really, now, that's the most sensible thing I've ever heard you say. I've got the Grand Duke lunching with me on Sunday, and I've told my doctor he must put me to rights by then at all costs. Oh, too bad this should have happened just now. 
It's a particularly brilliant season. Are you going to Princess Novomali's party? Of course not. Has she asked you? <laughs> She's asked everybody in Europe, Larry. She's giving a great do. Fancy dress. Fancy dress. She hasn't asked me. It's a deliberate insult. Come now, Elliot. Why should she want to insult you? It's just an oversight. I'm not a man that people overlook. Well, perhaps she doesn't know you're in the south of France. Don't be ridiculous. Everybody knows I'm in the south of France. It's going to be the best party of the season. If I were on my deathbed, I'd go to it. Never mind, old boy. It may rain the night of the party. That'll ruin it. You know, I never thought of that. I shall pray for rain as I have never prayed before. <laughs> the old witch. She'd never have got anywhere if it hadn't been for me. Now she doesn't invite me to the greatest party of her career. Fireworks, my dear fellow, they're going to be fireworks. So unkind, I hate them. I hate them all. They've eaten my food and they've drunk my wine. I've run their errands for them and I've made their parties for them. What have I got out of it? I've got nothing. Now that I'm old and sick, they have no use for me. They don't care whether I live or die. Not one of them. It's so cruel. I wish I'd never left America. Elliot. Go out. Go out, please. I, I was carried away. You must not see me like this. Come back later, please. Oh, of course. Mr. Mom, I know Princess Novomali's secretary. I think I can do something about that invitation. It would make him feel so much better. You're not leaving, Larry. I'll be back later, is it? Where, where did he go, Mom? Larry. Oh, I don't know, Elliot. I imagine he'll be back. I didn't tell you before. The bishop is here today. The bishop himself. Great honor. Now I shall enter the kingdom with a letter of introduction from the prince of the church. I'm, I'm afraid you'll find the company very mixed. Don't you believe it. I shall pick and choose my company there, as I always have. Where is Isabel and Gray? We're here, dear. Oh, now, now, if you're going to make a scene, Isabel, leave my room. Oh, Uncle Elliot. Gray, I understand you have a job in prospect. Yes, if I can raise enough money to start up my father's old firm again. Well, you have the money now, my boy. I'm a rich man. I've left you and Isabel everything I have. Mrs. Maturin, I beg your pardon, but this note just arrived for Mr. Templeton. Oh. Mom, read it to me, please. Why, it's an invitation. Princess Novomali's party. There, didn't I tell you? Have you got a piece of paper? Yes, Elliot. I want to reply. Not now, Uncle Elliot, please. I've always been a man of the world. There's no reason why I should forget my manners as I'm leaving it. Mr. Elliot Templeton regrets he cannot accept the Princess Novomali's kind invitation owing to a previous engagement with his blessed Lord. You witch. That night, Larry Darrell told Isabel he was leaving at once for Cherbourg. There was a boat sailing for New York. What are you going to do when you get there, Larry? Oh, I thought I might take a job in a factory or a garage. I don't know. Might even buy a taxi. A taxi? Well, why not? It's a good life. You're always on the go. Meet a lot of different people. Oh, Larry, for heaven's sake. Just look what you've done with your life and with mine. What are you trying to prove? I'd, I'd hoped you'd come back to the States with us. Gray's going into business again. He'll need all the help he can get. Gray's all right, Isabel. He doesn't need me. But, Larry, suppose he does. Suppose something goes wrong again. He has another breakdown. You can't imagine what he went through the last time. I honestly believe if it hadn't been for the children, he'd have killed himself. Well, that's the wonderful thing about life, Isabel. Most of us always get a second chance. I got a second chance right at the moment when I thought there was nothing in the world worth living for. Do you know what it means to see another man give up his life for you? To walk the streets at night knowing that someone deliberately died so that you might go on living? You asked me that question some years ago. I didn't understand then. I don't know. And I told you I didn't think I'd ever find myself. Well, I haven't yet, completely. Oh, I found some of the things I was looking for. And someday I may find them all. 
But I know what lies ahead, Isabel. I know where I'm going. And Gray, in his own way, can do the same thing. Because this is his second chance. What about me? Doesn't it mean anything to you that I love you? That I've never loved anyone else but you? That my children might have been your children? Look at me, Larry. You know you love me. You know that. You've always wanted me. Say it's true. Say you know it's true. Oh, Larry, I love you. I love you. Please promise you'll come back with us. Promise you will. Tell me about Sophie, Isabel. Sophie? That afternoon, she came to your house. Did she have anything to drink? Yes. She helped herself. I had to leave to pick up my daughter at the dentist. But when you found Sophie gone and the bottle empty, weren't you surprised? I just thought she got tired of waiting. When I noticed the bottle, I thought the butler had drunk it. I very nearly spoke to him about it. You never were a very good liar, Isabel. You don't believe me? Not for a moment. All right. If you want the truth, you can have it. I did it, and I'd do it again. I was determined to stop at nothing to prevent her marrying you. Nobody else would do a thing. They didn't care. Oh, Larry, you men are such fools. I knew that sooner or later she'd break down. It stuck out a mile. You saw how jittery she was. I knew she'd give her soul for a drink. I made up my mind that if I found Sophie had not touched the bottle, I'd make the best of things, try to be friends with her. Now, that's true. I swear it. Then when I came back and saw the bottle was empty, I knew I'd been right all along. That's pretty much what I thought. Sophie's dead, Isabel. Dead? In Toulon. She'd been murdered. Oh, how horrible. Do they know who did it? No. But I do. There's no need to be shocked about Sophie any longer, Isabel. I've had a feeling all day that Sophie is where she'd want to be most. With Bob and Linda. Oh, I know it's a very simple way to look at it. But it's comforting. Goodbye, Isabel. And take good care of Gray. He needs you now. More than ever. Mr. Mom. He's gone. Larry's gone. I know. I've lost him. Lost him for good. And I love him. I love him so tenderly. And now I've lost him. Do you suppose we'll ever see him again? It isn't likely. His America will be as remote from yours as the Gobi Desert. Oh, it's all so crazy. So useless. What is he trying to do with his life? What does he hope to find? My dear, Larry has found what we all want, and very few of us ever get. I don't think anyone can fail to be better and nobler, kinder for knowing him. You see, my dear, goodness is, after all, the greatest force in the world, and he's got it. Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Ella Raines, Edmund O'Brien, and Vincent Price in The Web. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Of all forms of entertainment designed to hold an audience in rapt attention, none has ever surpassed the murder mystery in excitement, drama, and suspense. And tonight, we bring you one of the more thrilling mysteries to reach the screen this season, Universal International's current hit, The Web, with three of its original fine stars, Ella Raines, Edmund O'Brien, and Vincent Price. And with enchanting Ella Raines in the cast, you'll gather that tonight's play, in addition to its other spine-tingling ingredients, has more than a suspicion of romance. And speaking of romance, 
During the filming of the web, Ella Raines herself became a bride and settled down to happy married life. Uh, uh, between pictures, that is. She assures me that when it comes to household management, a good supply of Lux Flakes is a wonderful help in washing fine fabrics and keeping tableware and silver sparkling clean. Well, I'm sure that many other young brides in our audience have discovered the same thing and thank their lucky stars for Lux Flakes on the pantry shelf. Here's Act One of The Web, starring Ella Raines as Noel, Edmund O'Brien as Bob Regan, and Vincent Price as Andrew Colby. New York City. Two men, complete strangers to each other, are determined to see a certain Mr. Andrew Colby. One of them, elderly, haggard, has just stepped off a train in Grand Central Station. Father. Oh, Father. Are you are you sure you're all right? I'm all right, Martha. You should have let me come up to meet you. To see me get out of prison? It's not a sight I'd want you to remember. You're free now, Father. That's all that matters. Where is Mr. Colby? He didn't come here. Did you expect him? Yes, yes, of course I did. Father, please, don't, don't upset yourself. Let's go home now. He should have been here. I must see him, Martha. I must see him. The other man, so intent on seeing Mr. Colby, is now in the offices of Colby Enterprises. Is there something I can do for you? Any number of things. But unfortunately, I'm here on business. I'd like to see Mr. Colby. What about? Well, he's been carrying on with my grandmother. I'd like to find out what his intentions are. I'm Mr. Colby's secretary. If you have any business with him, you have Don't to... bother. I can announce myself. Mr. Colby's busy. You can't go in there. Don't blame your secretary, Mr. Colby. She did her best. I trust this is something urgent. My name's Robert Regan. I'm an attorney representing Emilio Canepa. As a result of your negligent driving, his pushcart and load of bananas were damaged to the extent of $68.72. Oh, yes, yes, I, I seem to recall You've ignored I... my letters, Mr. Colby, so try ignoring this. This piece of paper is a summons. Well, I assure you, Mr. Regan, it wasn't my intention to defraud your client. I turned your letters over to my attorneys, Porter and Griswold. Porter and Griswold? <laughs> they wouldn't take a bath unless it involved at least $100,000. I think you may have a point there. Anyway, I'll see that Mr. Kniepa gets a check. And a letter congratulating him on his choice of attorney. Ah, thank you. Do you always uh, attend to these matters personally, Mr. Regan? I thought my client was getting pushed around, Mr. Colby. I didn't like that. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Regan. Well, I guess you saw Mr. Colby all right. Sorry if I got you into a jam. Oh, anything for the cause of justice. My name's Regan. Robert Regan. I'll uh, try to remember. Oh, you will excuse me, won't you? Mr. Colby's buzzing. Well, I'm in the phone book in case your push card ever gets pushed. It very rarely does. Goodbye, Mr. Regan. I'm sorry about the interruption, Andrew. Regan? Oh, he was a welcome relief. <laughs> what an intense young man. <laughs> you seem in a very happy mood. Well, I ought to be. Noel Holcomb just phoned me. They've decided to back me 100%. Andrew, that's wonderful. You can wire our Paris office. We'll be ready to leave here in two weeks. May I come in? Oh, Charles, please do. We've been waiting for you. Croner was on the train, all right. His daughter met him. Croner. Hmm. How does he look, Charles? Well, about the same. Thinner, a little bitter. Five years. It doesn't seem possible, does it? No, that Regan fellow, what did you think of him? Oh, I don't know. Rash, hot-headed. Fairly bright, I imagine. Have him come to see me tonight. Come to see you? Yes, at home. Say nine o'clock. Um, will you want me there? Naturally, no. Naturally. Come in, please, Mr. Regan. Quite a display of hardware on your front door. Do you always... Good evening. Well, hello. Ah, you know, when I'm worth $40 million, I'm going to have a secretary who looks exactly like you. Oh, my tastes are fairly simple. $20 million would be quite enough. How's Emilio Canepa? Expecting a check. Uh, what's the idea of this interview? 
Ask Mr. Colby. Oh, I thought you were his personal secretary. He keeps a few secrets from me. I couldn't. Say, uh, what kind of a guy is he, anyway? Handsome, generous, warm-hearted, brilliant. Come in, Mr. Regan. Ah, it's a very attractive secretary you have there, Mr. Colby. Yes, I'm still young enough to notice that myself. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're wondering why I wanted to see you? Yes, yes, I am. Well, I was very much impressed with you this morning, Mr. Regan. I liked your loyalty to your client. Loyalty is a very rare quality to find these days. Well, you can buy it at any dog store in town. Unfortunately, that's about the only place. How would you like to work for me? Ooh, sounds fine. At considerably more money than I believe you're earning now. Sounds even better. What have I got to do that Porter and Griswold can't do? Well, briefly, it's this. Up until five years ago, I had a business associate, a man named Leopold Kroner. He became financially entangled and stole nearly a million dollars worth of bonds belonging to our firm. He had counterfeit duplicates made of them, and then, using his position as an executive of the firm, he sold those counterfeit bonds. Clever boy. Not so clever. He was sent to prison for five years. He's just been released, but I'm afraid the long confinement, well, it seems to have unbalanced him seriously. How do you mean? He seems to hold me responsible. He phoned me today, and he threatened my life. You better call the cops. If necessary, I will. But I'm negotiating rather a large loan, and if certain prospective backers were to hear that my life had been threatened... Uh Ah, I see. On the other hand, if I were to engage a bright young man to be constantly at my side... Nobody would think a thing about it. Exactly. That is, nobody except me, and I'd think about it a lot, and I wouldn't like it. Why not? Because I'm a lawyer, not a bodyguard. It wouldn't be for long, Mr. Regan. I'll be leaving for Europe in two weeks. In two weeks, you'll make $5,000. I've heard of that kind of money. Well, then what do you say? If you think I'm going to turn it down, you're crazy. But then you act a little crazy anyway. (laughs) Uh, uh, I'd feel better if you took this. Be careful, it's loaded. Well, it's as serious as all that. Yes, I'm afraid it is. Can you get a permit to carry a gun? I can try. I have a friend in the police department, Lieutenant D'Amico, homicide. (sighs) Well, when do I start? After you've seen your friend. I could see him tomorrow. What about tomorrow night? Very well, tomorrow night. You'll come directly here and Charles will have a room ready for you. Charles? Charles Murdoch, the gentleman who met you at the door. Oh, oh, sure. Tomorrow night then, Mr. Colby, you've you've got yourself a bodyguard at 5,000 per body. What's bothering you tonight, Mr. Regan? Besides you, well, nothing really. I'd like to see the boss, though. I'm afraid he's still upstairs in his study. You keep long hours for a secretary. I'm, uh, well paid. Oh. Where have you been? Oh, just looking the place over and getting the pants scared off me. That guy Murdoch. <laughs> Does he always walk around in the dark? Oh, Charles. He was probably just checking up on you. You better tell him I've got a permit now for that gun. He ought to wear a taillight. What does he do apart from turning up unexpectedly? Oh, lots of things. He's been with Mr. Colby for years. Mm, Nice, compact little group. Murdoch, you, and Colby. There are a lot of double meanings in that remark. Oh, no, no. I just like to keep things straight. Who belongs to who? Why should you care? Well, we're we're all hired help together now. Maybe I have visions of asking you for a date sometime. With uh, what in mind? Mm, Dancing, drink or two. Catch as catch can. (laughs) Thanks for warning me. I'll bring along my police whistle. Oh, that won't be necessary. My early years in reform school left a lasting impression. Problem, child? Average. I'd set fire to my kid brother once in a while, but (laughs) who doesn't? Well, that's very encouraging. Ask me nicely for a date sometime. Regan! Regan, help! Regan! Colby! Connor, no, don't be a fool! Regan! Look out, Regan, he's got a gun! You better take his gun, Mr. Gold. Yes. Get a yes. doctor, will you? No. No, wait. I didn't know my aim was so good. But he, he may just be pretending. I'd better... No. He's dead, Mr. Colby. I I killed him. Who is he? Leopold Croner. Cro- How did he get in here? I don't know. I'll call the police. <laughs> I am late, Amico. I've been in with the district attorney. Yeah, I know. So he turns you both loose, huh? You and Colby. Why, does that surprise you? Oh, no, no, no. You killed a man in self-defense. Hey, did he give you your back, back your gun? Yeah, as a matter of fact, yes. 
Ah. I fixed it for you yesterday to get a permit for that gun, didn't I? I want to have my head examined. Huh. That would look great in there without a permit. I don't like what happened last night. Well, neither do I. Colby's in his study on the second floor of his house. He's going over some business papers. He looks up and sees Leopold Kroner. How did Kroner get in there? I don't know. I told you that. So did Colby. Kroner has a gun in his hand. He says he's going to kill Colby and then kill himself. He says Colby has ruined his life. Well? Nothing. I just like to hear myself talk. Colby throws the papers in Kroner's face and makes a grab for the gun. Kroner fires one shot that goes into the floor. Colby starts yelling for you. He's still struggling with Kroner when you walk in. Yes, I signed a statement to that effect, didn't I? Sure, sure you did. You said Kroner turned on you with a gun, but he was off balance, you guessed. And you were able to shoot first. Any news yet from Kroner's daughter? Well, you'd know that before I would. Maybe. Maybe I would. Colby said he wants to make some sort of provision for him. What's bothering you, D'Amico? You are. A guy takes a shot at your boss while you're downstairs romancing a dame. You're a great bodyguard, you are. Why didn't he come to us if he'd been threatened? He didn't want the publicity, huh? All right, Regan. What was the payoff? Look. Look, are you going to hold me? No. But I've been looking over the chrono record for five, five years ago. Guy counterfeits some bonds, sells them for a million dollars, and then pleads guilty. But nobody ever finds the million dollars. He stashed it away some. Great, then what's he so sore about? Man with a million dollars isn't sore at anybody. What's that got to do with me? Everything's got to do with you. You killed him. In self-defense, he had a gun in his hand. He'd already fired once. Anybody can shove a gun into a dead man's hand. Kroner's fingerprints weren't the only ones on that gun. Colby picked it up after Kroner was dead. We told you that. Kroner gets out of prison one day and gets bumped off the next. And all the time, there's a million dollars in cash lying around loose someplace. It couldn't be that you got a line on that money, could it? Now, lay off, Tomiko. You know me better than that. I only know one thing. This case is a long ways from settled as far as I'm concerned. Remember that, Regan. Tomiko, you really think there's something phony? You heard me. I've made out the check for Regan, Andrew, here. Oh, thank you. No, well, I'm terribly sorry you had to be mixed up in all this. Maybe you'd like to go on to Paris ahead of me. No, I'll, I'll wait. But I hope it'll be soon. I'm beginning to... We're in here, Mr. Regan. Oh, come in, Bob. I haven't had a, much of a chance to really thank you for last night. Oh, well, forget it. I'd like to show my appreciation. Well, would a check for $20 million be asking too much? <laughs> yes. But here's the amount we agreed upon. Well... Another day, another $5,000. I'd take it if I were you. I intend to. Thanks. Bob, if you'd like to stay on with me, I... No, no, I'm afraid I just couldn't stand the strain. I can't get used to the idea of killing people. What's the matter, Bob? Did that police lieutenant say something? Nothing important. What's the matter with her? There's nothing the matter with me. Oh, I think Noel's a little depressed. That Kroner didn't get me first? Is that nice? You know, you and I were talking about a date. Let's make it for dinner tonight, huh? No, thanks. Ah, oh, come on. We're both in the dumps. We really shouldn't inflict our company on anyone but each other. Why don't you, know? Call me later on. I'll let you know then. Okay, I will. Oh, uh, Mr. Colby, here. My gun. I'm checking it in, Coach. It was a great fight, and I'm glad I won. Bob, I... I Meanwhile, really... you still owe my client, Emilio Canipa, $68.72. Noel, I'm... Uh, I'm glad he suggested dinner tonight. Are you? Why? I just think you might enjoy it. Maybe I will, if I go. Well, you could cheer him up. Seriously, Noel, he denied it, of course, but that lieutenant must have said something to disturb him so deeply. And uh, you'd like to know what it was? I didn't say that. A few minutes ago, you were sorry because I was mixed up in all this. Noel, what's come over you? It isn't like you to suggest that I go out with someone else. Regan has done us a great service. It seems to me the least we could do for him. Of course. I'll dig up some light, bright table talk in my most alluring dress. Anything else? No. Nothing else, no. More coffee, no? Who would you rather dance? <laughs> Not much of a choice. Coffee. Well, I couldn't have been more surprised when Colby let you out tonight. What do you mean by that? 
I mean, if I were in charge of you, I'd be a little more careful about how I passed you around. If there's uh, any passing around to be done, I, I do it myself. I saw the look you threw him this morning before he gave you the nod. I merely wanted to know if he had anything for me to do tonight. Uh-huh. That's what I mean. You see, I don't kid myself that the president of Colby Enterprises isn't a little competition. This is America. You, too, can be competition. How do you stand with Colby? Why? What does that matter? Well, maybe I've already made a few plans. <laughs> well, if you have, they certainly don't include him. So why worry? Mm, I'm just naturally a worrier. How long have you worked for him? A little over six years. You must know him pretty well. I recognize him when I see him. Well, no more questions? Uh, what's the use? Tonight I sit making awkward passes at a beautiful girl. Last night I killed a man. Tomorrow... Uh... You're not to blame for what happened. I'm to blame for getting in a spot like that. Who am I to be carrying a gun, playing around with people's lives? There was nothing else you could have done. Oh, I could have shot Croner in the shoulder, couldn't I, or in the leg. I could have kept my head and not have killed him. Is that what Lieutenant D'Amico said? Huh? What does that mean? Nothing. Only you seem so disturbed when you got back to the house. And after I tell you what D'Amico said, do you have to leave right away or can you stick around a while and report to Mr. Colby later? Let's go home. Quit kidding. Colby asked you to find out what happened down there. Did he? Well, as a matter of fact, I intend stopping by his house. Your friends, Porter and Griswold, are there. I may be typing all sorts of reports till morning. It's happened before. Go on. Look. I went out with you tonight because I wanted to. You're rude, but you're upset, so I'll forgive that. But if you want us really to know each other, why don't you stop acting like a schoolboy asking grown-up questions? I'm sorry. So am I. Now take me home. I'd ask you to come in, Bob, but Mr. Colby's probably still busy with the lawyers. Good night. Oh, wait a minute, Noah. I don't like to leave things like this. About tonight, I'm a warm-hearted, impulsive boy. Sometimes I say things I don't mean. You're forgiven. I, I'm not only warm-hearted, I'm, I'm shy. I need a lot of encouragement. To do what? Can I demonstrate? Kiss him good night, Noah, or I'll have him here for breakfast. You must wear rubber soles, Mr. Colby. Well, Porter and Griswold left a half hour ago. It was such a nice night, I decided to take a walk. Did you tiptoe the whole way? Is there anything you want me for, Mr. Colby? No, no. Run on home if you'd like. But why don't you both come in for a while? It's still early. I'd be glad to. Well, what did you do tonight? Oh, not much. We sat around, threw a few rocks at each other. Well, aren't you coming in, Noel? <laughs> it suddenly dawns on me that my dangerous beauty depends upon eight hours of sleep. My car's right here. Good night. Good night, Good night no. no. You have a drink, Bob? Hmm? No. Uh, no. Well, would you care to play some billiards? No, I don't think my aim's so good tonight. Well, how about a few hands of poker, then, at uh, showdown at a dollar a hand? You must be interested in my $5,000. I'm interested in everybody's $5,000. <laughs> Sit down, I'll get the car. Lieutenant D'Amico doesn't settle so cheaply. He's interested in a million dollars. Oh? Kroner's million. He thinks I know where it's buried. Do you? Until last night, I had to save up to weigh myself. What else does... Uh, what else does the lieutenant think? I don't know. I can guess. <laughs> he thinks a wealthy industrialist has somebody he's anxious to get rid of. He hires a not-too-bright, eager young man as a bodyguard. And he frames a situation where the bodyguard has to kill the guy in self-defense. And then... The industrialist is rid of the guy, he's in the clear, and the not-too-bright young man never tumbles. It's an interesting point, because even if our dumb boy should tumble, there's nothing in the world he can do about it. Why should he want to? Why shouldn't he? Well, the man is already dead. There isn't anything your young friend can do about that. The district attorney has exonerated him, so there's no danger there. But on the other hand, he may have made himself a powerful friend. But you forget, he's not very bright. He may feel some twinges of conscience. Why? There was no intent of murder on his part. Morally, he's as pure as the driven snow. That's true enough. Then deal the cards, Bob. Sure. Well, it's Lieutenant D'Amico's plot. Let him worry about it. Regan, I wish you'd change your mind and come to Paris with me. You'd like it. Maybe I would. Maybe I'd end up with as much dough as you have, huh? <laughs> hey, how good's a pair of kings? No good at all. I seem to have eights over fives. 
There must be some way of beating you. There are lots of ways, Regan. But not while I'm holding all the cards. In just a moment, our stars return in Act Two of The Web. Libby, what are you grinning about? (laughs) Remembering one of the funniest pictures I've seen recently. And what is that? Universal International's forthcoming Western. I was fortunate enough to be on the set when they were filming it. A Western that's funny? (laughs) Well, that's something new, isn't it, Libby? Yes, definitely new and hilarious. It's called The Wistful Widow of Wagon Gap. (laughs) And in it, Abbott and Costello do a comedy version of the old six-shooter Westerns. Marjorie Main is the wistful widow with uh, seven children, (laughs) and she makes a strong play for Costello. But uh, she has a beautiful daughter, played by Audrey Young, who foils all her attempts at romance. Didn't Audrey Young start her career as a Broadway dancer? Mm Mm-hmm. But she also shows a definite gift for comedy in the wistful widow of Wagon Gap. Uh, She dropped in on the set while I was watching Marjorie Main do a very muddy barnyard scene, and then... Well, Audrey proved that she's a mighty smart girl. I can believe that. Especially when I tell you she's a luck girl from way back. You see, we were both walking through the barnyard to chat with Marjorie Main between takes when our nylons got spattered all over with muddy water. Oh. Oh, they looked terrible. But Audrey said, Oh, goodness, Libby, I don't mind that. A dip in locks will fix them in no time. Well, of course, I cheered those sentiments. And she told me how she used to save her dancing stockings with locks. She really raved, John, about the way Lux cut down the runs even in strenuous dancing routines. And she's so right, as you know, Libby. Our famous strain tests showed that stockings washed with Lux flakes last twice as long. Not only nylons, but every type of stockings. Silk, rayon, cotton. Yes. I wonder why any girl would risk strong soap or rub her stockings with a cake of soap. Oh, uh, there's another thing about Lux Flakes, too. Oh, I've forgotten something, Libby. Well, it's especially important these days. It's the way Lux saves the color of your stockings. And now, with the exciting new deep tones that you see in the stores, that's vital. Thanks, Libby. So, to keep stockings lovely, to make them last longer, it's smart to Lux them after each wearing. Here's William Keeley at the microphone. Act Two of The Web, starring Ella Raines as Noel, Edmund O'Brien as Bob Regan, and Vincent Price as Andrew Colby. It's 20 minutes later. Deeply engrossed in the events of the past two days, Regan has gone home to his apartment. He's just opened the door when someone steps up behind him. Shut the door, Mr. Regan. Your Krona's daughter. Yes. And I have a gun in my hand. How much hate does it take to kill a man, Mr. Regan? I I didn't hate your father. I I didn't even know him. And yet you murdered him. I had to shoot. You've got to believe that. Why? Why should I believe a hired gunman? You murdered my father because you were paid to do it. To you, he was just, just a new car you could buy when he stopped breathing. Your father wasn't himself. He, he tried to kill Colby. I never dreamed I could hate enough to want to kill. But I've reason enough to kill you now ten times, and I'll do it. Oh. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to hurt you, Miss Croner, but I, I had to get that gun from you. All right. You've got it. Why don't you kill me, too? You've got to listen to me. I, I, I was hired to protect Mr. Colby. Protect him from what? My father wouldn't have hurt anyone. Miss Crona, when a man is out of his mind... He wasn't out of his mind. And he didn't threaten Colby. And he never owned a gun. How do you know? I knew my father. He was the kindest man who ever lived. But he did break into Colby's house. He didn't break in. He was invited. Huh? Invited? He was asked to be there at 10 o'clock. I was there when he phoned As if you didn't know. You're sure of this? Do you have any proof? (laughs) If I had any proof, do you think I'd be here now? Or that you would? No, Mr. Regan. If I could prove what I know, you and Colby would be where you belong. In prison. (laughs) 
mind if I sit down, D'Amico? Or do you want to eat alone? Yeah, what do you want, Regan? I just called police headquarters. They said I'd probably find you here. You know, you were absolutely right about people carrying guns. Here. Where'd you get this one? From a girl named Crona. When last seen, she was in my apartment trying to kill me. You asking for protection? Uh Uh-uh. I'm asking for information. Amico, how near are you to pinning Crona's death on me? I'll let you know when the time arrives. Suppose I told you that I agree with you, that I think it was murder. I've got a pen if you want to sign a confession. Not, D'Amico, look. Everything I told you was the truth. Then what are you worried about? Well, it's finally occurred to me that I, I might have been a patsy in all this, framed. What's got you so scared? Does Crona Dame know something? I just want to work with you on this case. I, I'm on the inside, and I might be able to dig something up. Sure, and cover it right up again. You seem to forget you're the one I'm after. You killed Crona. If it's murder, you did it. What was my motive? That $5,000 you deposited in the bank today. In other words, I'd better get out of town. You wouldn't get three feet out of town. If I were you, I'd go to church every day and pray that a certain dumb cop named D'Amico was running himself right up a blind alley. Well, that's great, except I like to sleep at night. And I just talked to the daughter of the man I killed. Oh, you're in a tough spot. D'Amico, isn't there some way we can get together on this? Certainly. You confess and I'll arrest you. Okay, D'Amico. Regan, for a lawyer, you're not very smart. If you can prove that it's murder, you prove that you're a murderer. If it's a frame, there's only one guy can clear you. Colby. And I don't think he'd be too anxious to run to the rescue, do you? Thanks for nothing, D'Amico. Anytime, Regan. Anytime at all. Hello? Oh, good morning, Bob. I don't know how I could. I'll be busy all day. You what? Oh, uh uh-huh. Well, this afternoon, then? Three o'clock. No, you better not. I'll, um, meet you downstairs in front of the building. I'll be there at three o'clock. Now, isn't this better than working? A happy little drive through Central Park. You said it was important. When I feel like seeing you, it's very important. Why are you, uh, stopping here? Oh, this is the best little parking spot in town. I used to operate from here all the time when I was in high school, except I'd hit it a lot later in the evening. Uh Uh-huh. That must have been a progressive school you went to. Oh, it was. What did you want to see me about? Well, made up my mind about a lot of things last night, Noel. For one thing, I'm not going to Paris with Colby. And I don't want you to go either. Really? What do you want me to do? See America first. You might get to meet someone you'd like. I might. But, Colby, what have you got? Money, influence, travel, yachts? Why don't you let me take you out of all that? That's an offer if I've ever heard one. No. I'm really very serious. I know you are. Bob, what's the matter? I spent the whole morning in a newspaper office going over the accounts of the Krona trial five years ago. Why? You just naturally get curious about someone you've killed. Anyway, I ran across the name of Victor Bruno. Who was Bruno? Didn't you find out? Well, I went to see a friend of mine, court clerk. Cost me a bottle of scotch, but I found out something. Now I'm very curious. He didn't remember much about Bruno, only that the cops figured him for the engraving job on those counterfeit bonds. But Bruno never testified at Krona's trial. No, no, I know. They never found him. But, Noah, what do you know about him? No more than you do. (laughs) Funny. Krona didn't look like the type to get away with a million dollars. Neither did Bruno. Oh, you've seen him? Yeah, once. Before he disappeared. Croner was out on bail at the time, and Andrew was doing everything he could to help him. He spoke to Bruno, hoping to clear Croner. What did this Bruno look like? Oh, I don't know. Strange little man, always trying to hide. He looked like a, oh, $20 a week bookkeeper. Glasses two inches thick and not a hair in his head. Is he a foreigner? Well, he spoke with an accent. Um, is, is Colby going to be home tonight? As far as I know, why? Oh, maybe I could get him to throw some legal business my way. (laughs) I'll keep him at home for you. Now you better take me back to the office. Well, well, little did I think when I first met Emilio Canepa that you'd be the mother of my children. Why? Is there some connection between the two? No Emilio, no summons. No summons, no children. 
We'll name our first one Emilio, then. Uh Uh-uh, over my beautiful, muscular, dead body. Oh, well, back to your office. Hello, Murdoch. Good evening, Mr. Regan. Much killing going on around the place tonight? Mr. Colby is expecting you in the library. Ask a dull question, you get a dull answer. Oh, hello, Bob. Don't be so glad to see me until you find out what I want. I've already told him, Bob. Well, I'm sorry you won't come to Paris. Didn't you tell Mr. Colby about the services our new firm is prepared to offer? I thought I'd better say that for you. Well, we're offering everything in the legal line. Ambulance chasing and grave subpoenas. It sounds like an up-and-coming outfit. We'll sympathize with our clients' troubles and charge only $500 a day for the sympathy. Well, that's cheaper than the sympathy I'm getting from Porter and Griswold. Your proposition sounds very attractive. Oh, uh, say, I almost forgot. You know, I think your house is being watched. Watched? Yeah, some little bald-headed guy, not a hair on his head. He, he just stopped me in front of the lamppost. I don't understand. He spoke with an accent, kept blinking at me through glasses two inches thick. Seemed like he was a $20 a week bookkeeper trying to act important. Oh, no. Perhaps, Charles. Perhaps. Why did he stop you? Well, he asked me for a light, wanted to know if I was coming in here. Look out the window, Charles. He said something about being a friend of Croner's and that you'd hear from him. He must have gone there. There's no one out there now. There isn't any danger, is there? Oh, I don't think so, Bob. Well, if you'd like me to talk to him... If we want Bruno, we can always reach him. Mr. Colby, if there's any threat I could see him tonight... Maybe we'll call on you later. I'm much obliged for the information. All right. But uh, seriously, though, about my legal services... I'm sure there will be something for you, Bob. I'll have Porter and Griswold contact you. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Mr. Colby. Good night. Good night, Noel. Good night. Bruno. I wonder what's brought him back. Croner's death, of course, was in all the newspapers. Bruno never impressed me as being the sort of fellow who'd make threats. He was such a meek little man. Did you ever meet him, Noel? Probably. Oh, yes, of course you did. Sometimes I forget how long you've been with me, Noel, how long we've been together. Andrew, if you don't... What was it you once said about Bruno? That he reminded you of a $20 a week bookkeeper, wasn't it? Do... Do you have anything else for me to do this evening? I don't think so. Well, then then I'll say good night. Good night, Noel. Well, hello. Hey, this could give me a pretty bad name with my landlady. But come in, come on. I'd like to know what you meant by that little performance tonight. Was I convincing? You're not a very nice person, are you? Your high school parking spot came through beautifully. Now, now, wait a minute, Noel. No, you wait. Just what are you up to? What's your guess? Blackmail. (laughs) That's a nice business, too, if you have the right connections. I think I deserve a better answer than that. Sure you do. Noel, there are several people in this town who believe that Croner was deliberately murdered. That's ridiculous. Is it? It would have been comparatively easy for Colby to frame... He invites Croner to the house. In the middle of the conversation, Colby pulls out a gun. He fires one shot into the floor, shoves the gun into Croner's hand, starts wrestling with him and yelling for help. I rush in, Croner turns startled, bang, bang, and it's all over. You must be out of your mind. Why should Andrew want to kill Croner? Suppose, suppose he dreamed up this whole counterfeit deal himself. Now, he promises Croner a share of the profits if he takes the rap, while Colby takes the million and builds up the business. Croner gets out expecting a share of the gravy instead... The lights go out. If I use that kind of reasoning, I could think of at least 50 motives why you killed Croner. The police have 100. Just what were you trying to do tonight? I want to see Bruno. I dreamed up that little man by the street lamp, hoping I could startle Colby into giving me Bruno's address, but fortunately he doesn't startle so easily. How can you be stupid enough to believe all this? Andrew's one of the finest men I've ever known. He's certainly been decent enough to you. Uh, He may have carried his friendship a little too far for my own good. So... You take out the little corn-fed secretary, prime her up with some fake sincerity, and she spills over with everything you want to know. Oh, I know it's not going to be easy to convince you that the things I said today were sincere. It's just about the most hopeless proposition you ever faced. No, look, I'm going to have to make another try for Bruno's address tomorrow. If you give me away, I'll be sunk. In more ways than one. Do what you want. Just don't ask me for any promises. Good night. Well, Charles, 
Where did she go? Straight to Regan's apartment. Yes, I was afraid she had. Why don't you forget about the girl and start thinking about Bruno? She's not easy to forget, Charles. I think a great deal of Noel. It isn't like her to do anything behind my back. Well, what are you going to do about Bruno? Nothing now. I rather suspect he'll telephone us tomorrow. That'll be plenty of time to decide, Charles. Plenty of time. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Return to Act Three of the Web in just a moment. One of Paramount's loveliest finds of the year is charming red-haired Lynette Parks, who came from St. Paul to Hollywood by way of the Pasadena Playhouse. Do you find your new life exciting, Lynette? Oh, tremendously, Mr. Keeley. You know, my very first visit to a set was during the filming of Cecil B. DeMille's new picture, Unconquered. An exciting spectacle indeed. The siege of Fort Pitt by the Indians with flaming arrows and authentic fireballs is really sensational. Modern Pittsburgh, on the site of old Fort Pitt, will have a chance to relive its history when the picture has its world premiere there October 3rd. I learned so much from watching the actors, too. No doubt, with Gary Cooper and Paulette Goddard heading such a fine cast of more than 5,000 players. I was especially thrilled when... Paulette invited me to her dressing room one day while she was having a costume fitted. And you know the costumes for Unconquered were absolutely authentic for the period. Well, what thrilled me most was the gorgeous negligee Paulette wore between fittings. You know, I used to be afraid washing would fade such pretty things. Before I learned from the studio wardrobe people that Lux Care keeps lingerie lovely so much longer. But John Kennedy knows that. The studios see the practical results of Lux Care in the net. I've seen scientific proof. In actual washing tests, slips and nighties washed the Lux way stayed lovely three times as long. Those washed the wrong way soon looked faded and drab. That means girls who give their underthings Lux care can have three times as many without spending any more. How do you figure that, Mr. Kennedy? Well, instead of constantly replacing faded, drab underthings, you can buy pretty new ones because those you Lux stay lovely three times as long. So, without spending any more than you would for replacements, you have three times as many pretty things. Thank you for coming tonight, Nanette Parks. We return you to William Keeley. Act Three of The Web, starring Ella Raines as Noel, Edmund O'Brien as Bob Regan, and Vincent Price as Colby. <laughs> It's been several days since Robert Reagan has seen Emilio Canipa, he of the demolished pushcart, but now, shortly after breakfast, the much-involved young lawyer has good reason to call on his client. There's nothing to it, Canipa. Just phone Colby and tell him exactly what I've told you to say. But you, you sure this ain't illegal? Look, now look, haven't I always been your friend? Sure. Emilio, didn't I graduate from law school? Yeah, sure. Didn't I get you $68.72 for your pushcart? Not yet. Well, don't be so greedy. If it hadn't been for your push card, we wouldn't be doing this in the first place. Well, okay, I call up. Atta boy, that's better. Hello? Hello? Oh, yes, this is Mr. Colby. This is Victor Bruno, Colby. Oh, yes, Bruno. I heard you were in town. I want you to police to hear I'm in town. All right, Bruno. How much this time? For $10,000, the police don't find out. $10,000, that's a lot of money. I got a lot I could say. Stop by my home tonight. No, 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 no. I don't make the same mistake Crono made. You send the money to me. Where? You know the place. You uh, remember the address? Yes. You sure you remember? Yes, of course. Now listen, Bruno, I'll give you the money on one condition. Get out of the country, you and your wife. With the money, there'll be two tickets to Mexico City. See that you use them. Just be sure to have the cash there tonight. Nine o'clock. This is the last time, Bruno. Remember that. Well, Charles, what's the matter? You look worried. Uh, if we're going to start paying Bruno, he'll never let us stop. Don't be absurd, Charles. That wasn't Bruno on the phone. Well, then who was it? 
Not Regan? No, not Regan. Probably a friend of his. How do you know? Instinct, Charles. That's what makes me such an enormous success. But if Bruno was here last night... Victor Bruno has been dead for five years. Dead? Then how did Regan know what he looked like? No. She's the only one who could have given him that description. You never told me Bruno was dead. How did he die? Protesting his innocence. Well, what was Reagan after just now? Bruno's whereabouts. Andrew, did you have Bruno killed? <laughs> don't be so inquisitive, Charles. I just don't want you to get the idea that what happened to Bruno could happen to me. I'm no coroner and I'm no Bruno. I hope we'll have you here for some time, Charles. Uh, what about Reagan? Go to the bank and get $10,000. And then? And then we'll have to do something I'm not going to like doing at all. What about the girl? She's involved in this as much as Regan? Yes, it looks that way. You don't like the idea of getting rid of her, do you? I don't like it at all. But if I have to, I'll do it. I'll arrange for Noel to be here at 8 o'clock. I'm sorry I'm late, Andrew. I had dinner downtown. I found your message when I got home. No, there's something I wish you'd do for me this evening. In the safe there is a large manila envelope with $10,000. Will you get it for me, please? Of course. And then I'd like you to go to the Pennsylvania station and get two tickets for Mexico City. When you've bought the tickets, phone me. I'll tell you then where to deliver the money. Oh, never mind. You can leave the safe open, though. Is this the envelope? Yes. It's for Victor Bruno. You know, it's strange, Noel... Right now, I'm on the verge of getting everything I ever wanted to have. And yet I find there's only one person I can really trust. Andrew, please. I wonder if you know how much I appreciate it. Andrew, that that telephone call from Bruno... It's... What about it, no? Oh, nothing. It's, it's not important. I'll see you later. What do you want, Noah? He's paying Bruno off. $10,000 and two tickets to Mexico. Well, you were right, weren't you? Well, I'll know for sure after I've seen Bruno. You'll see him. Right after I bought the tickets. Come on. Well, she's on her way, Charles. She's probably met Regan by now. Why do you suppose she did it, Charles? Did she fall in love with what him? What difference does it make? For a moment, I thought she was going to tell me. If she had, I would have forgiven her. Well, I, I'd better call the police. Andrew, wait. I'm not so sure this is such a good idea. But why? Well, granted, we can have them picked up for stealing the $10,000 if they find her fingerprints on the safe. That doesn't really get them out of the way. But then, what if they're arrested not merely for theft? What if they're arrested for murder? What? What are you talking about? Whose murder? Your murder, Charles. Hello? Yes, this is Lieutenant D'Amico. Mr. Colby. What's that? Where? You sure? Penn Station, huh? Okay, just sit tight, Mr. Colby. The Manhattan Limited, leaving on track eight for Philadelphia, Harrisburg. I'd like to make connections for Mexico City, too, please. Leaving tonight, if possible. Mexico City? Oh, yes. Yes, uh, just a moment, please. Excuse me, miss. You know old Faraday? Why, yes, but... What... Come with me, please. You're under arrest. Arrest? And don't worry about your boyfriend. He's right where you left him. Except there's a cop hanging on a weak arm. Where are you taking me? To Lieutenant D'Amico, miss. He's waiting for us at Mr. Colby's house. Uh... We got him all right, Lieutenant. Regan and the girl. Keep him in the hall. Okay, Doc. Take the body in the library. <sighs> On the stretcher. Murder. Just stay put, Regan. But, but what happened? Why are they holding us? Mm, because I'm the biggest lunkhead of the year. It never occurred to me Colby would take it out on you. Andrew? 
Murdoch's dead. He's gotten rid of the last guy that knew anything about the phony bond deal, and he stuck us with a rap. But he couldn't possibly hope to get away with this. Why would we want to kill Charles? Don't worry. With Colby tailoring the evidence, it'll fit like a bathing suit. Well, a lot of good it does to say it, but I'm sorry, Noel. Bring him in, Johnson. Let's go. Well, laughing boy. I thought I told you not to leave town. Get out, Domingo. What are the details? Murder and grand theft, and you haven't got a prayer. How does she figure in it? Oh, come on now, Regan. You got the money, Johnson? Here. And she was buying two tickets to Mexico City. Okay. Do you mind stepping in here, Mr. Colby? I hope you'll get this over with as quickly as possible. Andrew. Uh, you don't have to talk to her, Mr. Colby. Just identify this envelope. Yes, that's it. I assume the $10,000 is the same. Lieutenant, you understand this is very difficult for me. Miss Faraday has been my confidential secretary for years. Now, just tell me what happened. Well, I was up in my study doing some work. I heard a shot. I came downstairs and I found Charles dead on the floor with Regan's gun beside him and the safe was open. My gun? That was his gun. I gave it back to him after... You did? Funny it should have only your fingerprints on it. All right, all right. Maybe mine are on it. When I gave it back to him... I set it on the table. Now, if he had this in mind, he wouldn't have touched it. Not without a glove. Regan, if you were me, would you believe that? If you knew Colby, you would. Who saw you give him back his gun? Miss Faraday, she would... Oh. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Colby. Well, I realized Miss Faraday was the only person besides Charles and myself who knew the combination to the safe. Andrew, you had me open the safe yourself. A couple of nights ago, I happened to overhear a conversation between Mr. Regan and Miss Faraday in which Mexico City was mentioned. And she was buying two tickets to Mexico City when we grabbed her. You already told me that. What are you looking for, a promotion? Lieutenant, he knows why I had the money and he sent me for the ticket. Uh, you'll get your chance to talk, miss. This is very awkward for me to Well, tell. we're almost finished, Mr. Colby. Why do you believe him, D'Amico? Only yesterday... That I... was yesterday. I'm not interested in the Krona case anymore. I got one right here that suits me fine. But this is a frame. You get framed more than any guy I ever met. You're supposed to be a lawyer. Look at the evidence. Lieutenant. Uh, yeah, yeah, Doc. He's still alive. Murdoch's still alive. Charles. Stay right where you are, Mr. Colby. What are you talking about, Doc? That injection of adrenaline. We won't have him forever, but he may last through the night. Any chance of him coming too? Could be. Let me know the minute he does. Is it all right if we leave him in there, Mr. Colby? Uh, uh, couldn't we move him upstairs? No, no, don't, don't let him near Murdoch. Are He'll... you still running this case? I'm telling you, don't let Colby near Murdoch. You're under arrest, Regan. Now, will you stop telling me my business? Lieutenant Charles has been my closest friend for years. Naturally, I want to go to him. Well, later on, maybe. Right now, I'm waiting here in case he can talk. Maybe we all better wait here. Uh, Mr. Colby, uh, suppose you wait upstairs. Huh? Uh, Gus? Yeah, Lieutenant? Uh, pull up a chair in front of that room where Murdoch is. No visitors. Uh, Johnson, you wait in the front room. And, uh, you, Regan, you and her can have this nice big library all to yourselves. And you better start reading up on alibi. Bob, why don't we tell him about Bruno? Mm, how do you think that would sound from the witness stand? I was trying to find a man named Victor Bruno because I was convinced that the other killing I'd done was murder. No... <laughs> Colby figured on that one. If only somebody could find Bruno. Bruno's probably dead, too. Otherwise, how could Colby have been so sure it wasn't Bruno on the phone? <laughs> I suppose so. <sighs> how could I have been such a dope? You? I've been second-guessing the whole way. You couldn't have put your life in worse hands. Listen. Huh? Andrew. His study's just above us. He's worried. He's walking back and forth. He's worried. Lieutenant. Well, he's still alive. Still alive. He's still alive. I thought I... You left the cop in front of the door. Where'd he go? That doc needs some more adrenaline. Sent Johnson to the drugstore. Oh. Murdoch's not alone in there. The doctor's with him, isn't he? First you shoot him, and then you worry about his health. The doctor's in the kitchen boiling up a hypodermic. Come on, Regan. That's where we're going. You stay where you are, miss. He's alone. Charles is down there alone. Alone. Uh, they'll 
never know now, Charles, will they? They'll never yeah, know that... Don't bother killing them again, Colby. D'Amico! Murdoch's been dead for two hours, ever since you shot him. Now, how... Watch it, Regan! Turn on the light, Counselor. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, don't just stand there. You knock Colby down, I'll pick him up. Get him out in the hall. Uh, you can come out, Miss Faraday. This you'll want to hear. Bob, what happened? I'm not so sure I know myself. Well, Mr. Colby, tough break, huh? I really solved this one from left field. I've had Regan tail for the last two days. I knew he wasn't here tonight. It's quite a comfort to us taxpayers to find our police department in such competent hands. Thanks. Thanks so much. Oh, uh, just to keep the record straight, whatever happened to Kroner's million dollars? That's strange. That's what Kroner wanted to know. Yeah, very funny. Come on, Johnson. We're taking Colby downtown. Oh, that D'Amico. He's really the answer to a maiden's prayer. Yeah, he's a smart cookie, but he doesn't catch everything. What's that? Something D'Amico forgot to take. Two tickets to Mexico City. Think we can use them? Hmm? <laughs> I've, um... Always wanted to try out my Spanish. Hey, don't forget, you two. You'll have to check with my department if you're figuring on living the country. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, D'Amico. That Colby still owes my client $68.72. Well, you're a lawyer. Sue him. <laughs> Our stars will return for their curtain calls in a moment. Libby, do you realize what a big job American housewives do just getting together meals for their families? That's true, Mr. Kennedy. The average housewife plans, buys, carries home, cooks and serves well over 1,000 meals a year. And in most cases, she washes the dishes for all those meals, too. An average of six tons a year. And yet her husband and children expect her to keep her hands lovely. Well, smart housewives have found out how to do that, in spite of dishwashing, Libby. Of course, with Lux Flakes. For dishes, for any soap and water job around the house. Right. That's why a Lux lady doesn't have red, rough dishpan hands. Well, naturally. Some women try other types of soaps at one time or another, but they soon get wise. What strong suds can do to hands is a caution. And red, rough hands are no prize at a bridge game. Discouraging to friend husband, too. So, John, it's no wonder thousands of housewives stick to Lux for dishes. They're so right, because hundreds of scientific tests have actually proved how much kinder Lux is to hands. When strong soaps made women's hands rough and red, changing to Lux improved them in two to seven days. Soon the skin was just as soft and smooth as ever. And Lux is so thrifty, too. Lux flakes make such rich suds, they actually go further, much further. They don't die away like some suds. So, ladies, why not try Lux for your dishes? Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. For an exciting performance of a thrilling drama, our thanks to Ella Raines, Edmund O'Brien, and Vincent Price, who take the spotlight for a curtain call. Ella, now that you and Edmund have solved the mystery of the moment, I wonder if, uh, in an altogether different vein, you'd help our audience solve the burning question of the season. I'll do my best. What is it, Bill? As one of Hollywood's most photographed and best-dressed stars, where do you stand in the current fashion battle between long and short skirts? Well, I, I see that Ella takes a stand in short skirts for tonight's appearance. Well, that's because I happen to be wearing a suit. Now, does that follow? Look at my suit. <laughs> Still just below the ankle. <laughs> but for women's suits, I feel the shorter length is smarter. For dresses, I prefer the current longer length. How do you feel about the question, Ed? Oh, I feel that women shouldn't be a slave to fashion, but ought to follow what looks attractive. You agree, Vince? Sure, I follow anything that looks attractive. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, when it comes to shorter skirts, I believe the eyes have it. <laughs> you mean the masculine eyes, of course. <laughs> How about you, Vince? Are you a member of that um, 
little below the knee club? Well, it depends how little is below the knee. Uh-huh. <laughs> De gustibus non disputandum. Did I say something I shouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> no, Vince. Ella means there's no disputing taste. But there's no question of divided taste in what we're offering on this stage next Monday night. I understand it's something very special, Bill. Yes, one of the screen's most brilliant feminine stars, whose rare appearances in radio are always an event. Plus, one of Hollywood's outstanding male stars in his first screen role since he left the Navy Air Corps. Catherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor. I guess you need say no more, Bill. <laughs> no, indeed. Catherine and Bob appear in Metro Golden Mayor's thrilling drama, Undercurrent, repeating their original screen roles of a man and woman whose love is overshadowed by a haunting figure from the past. Well, it ought to be standing room only Monday night. Congratulations and good night. Good, good night. night to all of you and thanks. <laughs> Viva Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes. Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Catherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor in Undercurrent. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Again, a word of appreciation to the Housewives of America for the swell job you're doing, saving and turning in used fats and oils. The world shortage of fats is still very much with us, and industry needs every drop of used fat just as much as ever. So now that the weather is cooler and you're doing more cooking, keep a tin handy for used fat. Remember, your dealer will pay you well for every pound you turn in. Ella Raines will next be seen in Nunnally Johnson's The Senator Was Indiscreet. Edmund O'Brien will soon be seen in the Canaan production... A Double Life. Vincent Price's next Universal International picture will be Up in Central Park. Heard in our cast tonight were Maria Palmer as Martha, Bill Johnstone as D'Amico, Robert Griffin as Murdoch, and Norman Field, Jay Novello, Edwin Cooper, Cliff Clark, and Eddie Marr. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is rebroadcast to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Undercurrent with Catherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor. It's spry for pastry so tender, flaky, nut sweet, any pie filling tastes more delicious. You'll say pastry is extra delicate, better tasting with spry. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Undercurrent with Catherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Peter Tobin introducing Lux Radio Theater. Tonight and every Monday night at this time, Lux Radio Theater presents for your entertainment the finest in radio drama. This week we bring you The Sacred Flame, a gripping drama by W. Somerset Moore. When crippled Morris Tablet dies suddenly, no one questions the doctor's statement that he died of heart failure. No one, that is, except Nurse Wayland, who insists that he has been murdered. But who would want to kill Morris? 
his devoted wife, Stella, his mother, who adored him, his brother, Colin. Listen in a few moments to the devastating consequences of Nurse Whalen's bitter accusation in The Sacred Flame, produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Anne Freed and directed by Henry Diffenthal. And now, Act One of tonight's Lux Radio Theatre presentation, The Sacred Flame. is the essence of the game of chess, old fellow. <laughs> Don't let your son bully me, Mrs. Tabdard. I think you're quite capable of taking care of yourself, Doctor. If you moved your bishop, you'd make things a bit awkward for me. Hmm. Morris, when I want your advice, I'll ask for it. Mother, is that the way respectable general practitioners talk to their patients in the days of your far distant youth? How on earth do you expect poor Nurse Whalen to read when you never for an instant hold your tongue? <laughs> I can't even hear myself knitting. I don't mind, Mrs. Tabret. Don't worry about me. After listening to my lively conversation and wheeling me around for nearly five years, Nurse Whalen pays no more attention to me than if I were a deaf mute. Well, who can blame her? I know, it's exasperating. It's worse than that, Nurse. It's inconsiderate. If you please, ma'am, Major Lee Condor wants to know if it's too late for him to come in to have a drink. Of course not. Ask him to come in, Alice. A very good man. You know him, don't you, Doctor? No, I've never met him. He's the fellow who's just taken that furnished house on the golf links, isn't he? Mm. Yes, we knew him years ago in India. That's why he came here. Is he a soldier? No, he was a policeman. He's retired now. Oh. He was one of Mother's numerous admirers. Oh, <laughs> nice chap. And I believe he's a rather good golfer. Colin has played with him once or twice. I asked him to dine tonight so that Morris could get a game of bridge, but he couldn't come. Major Leconda. Oh, good evening, John. Hello. How nice of you to come in. I was on my way home and I saw your lights on, so I thought I'd just ask if anyone would like to give me a Doc and Doris. Oh, help yourself. The whiskey's on the table. Thanks, Millie. How are you, nurse? Fine, thanks. And the patient? Bearing up pretty well, considering all he has to put up with. You're in your usual high spirits, I see. I don't think you know, Dr. Harvester. How do you do, Major? Don't let me disturb your game. It's finished. Have you beaten him? Hollow! I haven't come to stay, only to say I was sorry I couldn't come to dinner. I'll just swallow my drink and take myself off. There's no hurry. I'm not going to bed for hours. We're really waiting up for Stella and Colin. They've gone to the opera. Morris, why don't you let Nurse Whalen get you ready? Then you'll only have to slip into bed and Colin can help mm, you. All right. What do you say, Nurse? It's just as you like. I'm quite prepared to stay up until Mrs. Morris comes in and put you to bed after you've said goodnight to her. No, come on. You look tired. Put your shoulder to the wheel, Nurse, and gently trundle the wounded hero to his bedchamber. I'll be back in ten minutes. She seems a very nice woman, that nurse. Yes. She's extremely competent, and her patience is really wonderful. She's a jolly good nurse, and you're very lucky to have her. Oh, I'm sure we were. It's a pity she's so tactless. It never seems to occur to her that Morris wants to be alone with his wife. He likes to say goodnight to Stella last thing, and he likes to say it without anyone looking on. That's why he's staying up now. Poor boy. I suppose he's absolutely dependent on a nurse? Absolutely. All sorts of rather unpleasant things have to be done for him, poor dear. And he can't bear that anyone should know about them, especially Stella. Is there really no chance of his getting better, Dr. Harvester? No, I'm, I'm afraid not. He was terribly smashed up, you know. The lower part of his spine was broken and he was badly burned when the plane caught fire. What a shocking thing to happen. Yes, indeed. Now, when you think that he was flying all through the war and never had a mishap, it's so silly that this should happen just when he was trying out a new machine. It was so unexpected. His courage amazes me. He never seems low or depressed. Never. His spirits are wonderful. It's heartbreaking to watch him in dreadful pain and still forcing a joke from his lips. You know, I'm sorry Colin is going away so soon, Mrs. Tabret. I think his being here has done Morris a lot of good. Yes. As boys, they were great friends, which isn't always the case with brothers. Colin's been away so long. He went to Central America just before Morris crashed, you know. 
Well, does he have to go back? Well, he put his share of his father's money in a coffee plantation. Oh, it's doing very well. He loves the life out there. And it seems cruel to ask him to give it all up to help look after his crippled brother. I think it would be most unfair. One has no right to ask anyone to give up his own chance of making the best he can of life. Here yeah, we are again. Ah, mm. I'm fixed up and ready for any excitement. Aren't I, nurse? What's that? What? I, I thought I heard a car. Yes, I did. It's Stella. She's in her new evening dress tonight, Doctor. Just wait till you see her. Which opera was on tonight? Tristan. That's why I insisted on Stella going. It was after seeing Tristan that we got engaged. Do you remember, Mother? Oh, of course I do. It was a wonderful oh, evening. Is. Oh, here yeah. she is. Stella! Hello, my darling. Uh. Mm. Have you missed me? Mm. Why are you back so early, you bad girl? <laughs> you promised me to go and have supper. Why didn't you take her, Colin? Well... <laughs> Good evening, Doctor. Well, darling, evening. I was no, so no, thrilled no, and excited no. by the opera, I felt I simply couldn't eat a thing. Hang it. Oh, oh, hello, Doctor. Hello, Major. You might have gone to Lucian's mm. and had some supper. <sighs> What's the good of my spending the earth buying you a magnificent new dress when you won't let anyone see it? But, darling, I wanted to show it off in the intervals, but it seemed so grand that I hadn't the nerve. <laughs> I kept my cloak on. Well, take it off now and show the gentleman. Oh. Come on. Oh, you are a bully, Morris. <laughs> Oh, there you are, then. Oh, you've made me feel shy now. <laughs> Stand up so we can all see. Ah, it's lovely. Mm. Oh, uh, uh, Stella, what, what's the matter? Catch her, Colin. She's going to fall. There you are. Come on. Sit down. Yeah, I'm all right. Nothing, just... Just a little faintness. Stella. It's all right, Morris. Don't fuss. Put your head between your knees, Stella. Mm. Let me help you. No, no, I... I'll be all right in a minute. Silly of me. My belief is that she's just faint from lack of food. Nurse, would you mind going into the kitchen and seeing if you can find anything for these silly young people to eat? Of course not. I'll make them some sandwiches. Colin can get a bottle of champagne from the cellar. All right, Mother. Is there any ice in the house? I've got a thirst I wouldn't sell for 20 pounds. Well, I'll say goodbye. I'm sorry you're feeling poorly, Stella. Oh, Mother's right. All I need is a large sandwich, preferably ham. You're looking better now. Mm. For a few moments, you're as white as a sheet. Good night, everyone. Oh, good, good night, night, Goodbye. Good night, Goodbye. John. Goodbye. It was nice of you to look in. Don't worry, I'll see myself out. If you're not in a hurry, Doctor, wait and have a sandwich with us. And in the meantime, let's take a turn in the garden, shall we? It's so lovely and warm. Good idea. And uh, the ham sandwiches, I hope Nurse Whalen has the sense to use plenty of mustard. Stella, are you sure you're all right? Oh, my darling. I'm sorry I made such a fool of myself. Oh, you scared the life out of me. Why didn't you go on and have supper before coming home? Oh, I didn't want to. I wanted to get back. But, Stella, you go out so seldom. Oh, this is no life for you. Tied up to a cripple. You're young. Oh, darling, darling, don't. Please, I'm not missing anything, I promise you. The fact is, you've lost the habit of going out and having fun. Well, nothing is fun if you can't share it. Now, don't be idiotic, my poor darling. I wish Colin weren't going away so soon. At least you've been able to get out and around with him. He only came home for six months and he stayed nearly a year. You promised you'd try to persuade him to stay on a bit. No, but he must, he must get back to his work. Mm, I suppose so. I was thinking of you. Oh, now, Morris, darling, you must stop fussing because you think I'm having a thin time. I'm not. You never try to prevent me from doing anything I want to. I don't know what it is to be bored. <laughs> Why, I haven't time for half the things I want to do. Yes, you're wonderful, Stella. You always have been. You've made the best of a bad job, all right. I've had to, but why should you? Oh, my darling. Don't talk like that. I married you because I loved you. It would be unspeakable if I stopped loving you now that you need my love more than ever. Oh, my dear. We can't love because we ought to. Love comes and goes. And we can none of us help ourselves. <sighs> Morris, what do you mean? 
Have I done anything to make you think I, I wasn't the same as I'd always been? Oh, of course not, darling. You've been an angel, always. What's the matter? You, you suddenly went quite pale. You're not feeling faint again. No. No, I, I'm all right. Perhaps I seem to take for granted all that you do for me, but don't think I'm not conscious all the time how much I owe you. But I've done nothing for you. I've never let you nurse me. Well, I couldn't bear that you should have anything to do with the sordid side of my illness. You know that I'm never going to get well, Stella, don't you? I don't indeed. It's a long business, we know that, but I'm absolutely convinced you get much better. No. They pretend they can do something in order to give me hope. But I pretend to believe them because it's the easiest thing to do. But I know I'm on this invalid bed for life, Stella. Oh. Oh. Then let's take what comfort we can in the great joy we've had in one another. In the days when you were well and strong. I shall always be grateful for the happiness you gave me. And for your love. Do you think that's changed? I love you as deeply, as devotedly as I ever did. You're everything in the world to me, Stella. I, I ought to be frightened because I'm so dependent on you, but I'm not. Because I know... Not just with my mind or my heart, but with with every nerve in me, with every little feeling and every pain. How good you are to me. Oh, but darling, why, why are you saying all this to me tonight? Because I owe you so much. You know, Stella, when you're an invalid, you find out all sorts of interesting things. People are sympathetic, but you mustn't abuse their sympathy. You soon discover it bores them if you talk about yourself. You must make jokes, make them laugh, so they feel they needn't be sorry for you. Then they go away feeling relieved and kindly disposed towards you. Oh, my darling, you break my heart. It's so cruel that you should have had to learn such bitter truths. My dear, they're not as bitter as all of that. I shouldn't have mentioned it, only I wanted to tell you that, it, that it's you who've given me the courage to carry on. I can stand anything as long as I know I shall see you tomorrow and the next day and the day after and always. Oh, Morris, I'm unworthy of such love. I'm so ashamed. I'm selfish. Thoughtless. Never. And you're so beautiful. You've never looked more beautiful than you do tonight. What is it that, that gives you this sudden new radiance? I don't know why I should look any different from usual. I watch your face. I know every change in it from day to day. A year ago, you, you had a strained look, but now, lately, you've had an air that, that is strangely peaceful. You gained a sort of lovely serenity. Oh, Stella, if only we'd had a child. Someone I could see as part of you and me. And you would have had something to console you. You wouldn't have felt you'd entirely wasted your life. But Morris, darling, I, I, I don't feel I've wasted my life. Oh, look, you, you're not yourself tonight. You're, you're ill and tired. I love you, Stella. I want to take you in my arms, as I used to. I want to press my lips to yours and see your eyes close and your head fall back and feel your dear, soft body. Still, still, I, I can't bear it. Oh, hush now, my darling, please. <laughs> darling, don't. 
think it would have been better for both of us if I'd been killed when I crashed. Darling. I'm no use to you. I'm no use to anybody. No, darling. Don't. Don't. Please, please, darling. Forgive me, Stella. Oh, what a complete fool I am. Oh, my dear. You frightened me. It's what they call a nerve storm. Good thing Nurse Whalen didn't see me like that. Give me my handkerchief. Oh, yes, here you are. Whiskey and soda is what you want. I'll get you one. No, no, no. I'll... Uh, no, I'll have one later. Oh. In bed. Oh, yes. Sorry I've been so long. There wasn't any ham, so I made toasted bacon sandwiches. Oh, mmm, they... they look delicious. I'll call the others. Oh, Dr. Harvester! Come and have a sandwich before it gets cold. Stella. Yes, darling. D darling. Hmm? If you don't mind, I think I'll turn in. Oh. I suddenly feel very tired. Oh, I I I'm sorry, Morris. Did I hear you calling me? Y yes, you did. Morris doesn't want anything to eat. He's going to bed. Oh, I'm so glad. It's very late. Good night, my boy. Sleep well. Good night, Mother. Bless you. Here, let me give you a hand, Dust. I can manage perfectly. I'm so used to wheeling the invalid bed, and he weighs nothing. Never mind. Let me push him. Look in on your way to bed, Stella. Yes, of course, darling. Oh, don't be long, Doctor. The sandwiches will be stone cold. Right <laughs> Morris is rather nervy tonight. Sorry, I went to the opera. Oh, my dear, you go out so seldom. I haven't the inclination, really. You're tired. Why don't you eat something? No. No, I'll, I'll wait for the others. Whatever happens, darling, I want you to know that I'm deeply grateful for all that you've done for Morris. Why do you say that? You don't think he's getting worse? No, I think he's just the same. I just wanted you to know that I realize what a great sacrifice you've made for him. After all, you didn't marry Morris to be the wife of a helpless cripple. Well, one must take the rough with the smooth. You're a young and beautiful woman. You have the right to live your life just as anyone else has. For five years now, you've given up everything to be the sole comfort of a man who is your husband, only because a legal ceremony had joined you together. Oh, no, no, no. No, because love had joined us together. My poor child. I'm so desperately sorry for you. Whatever the future may have in store, I shall never forget your courage, your self-sacrifice, and your patience. But I... I don't understand what you mean. Don't you? Well, let us suppose that it is the anniversary of my wedding day and my thoughts have been much occupied with the ups and downs of marriage. Ah, oh, here you are at last, Colin. You'd better pour us some wine. Right. Where's Dr. Harvester? Here I am. I've been with Morris. I'll just have a sandwich and swallow my wine and then be off. Is Morris all right? Oh, fairly. He's a bit down tonight for some reason. I, I don't know why. He was in great spirits earlier in the oh, evening. I expect he's tired. He insisted on staying up. Well, I've left a sleeping draught that he can take later if he wants it. And I'll go up and see him before I go to bed. If he can get a good rest, I'm sure he'll be his usual self in the morning. Well, I must get home. Good night, Mrs. Staverett. And thanks for a very pleasant evening. I'll see you to the door, and I'll go straight to bed. Good night, children. Good night, Good night, mother. Good night, mother. Good night doctor. Good night, doctor. Stella. Stella, darling. Oh, Colin. Poor darling. Oh, Colin, what have we done? Morris was so strange tonight. I couldn't make him out. It, it was almost as though he suspected. No, impossible. He must never know. Never. I'd do anything in the world to prevent it. Why did you ever love me? Oh, why did I ever love you? Stella, come here. My darling. No. No. Oh, I'm so ashamed. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Excuse me, my dear. Could you pass me a packet of Radeon? Why, of course. Here. Never use anything else to get my wash really white, do you? You know, uh, whoops, mind the trolley. Radeon is a wash out a white in. What? Radeon, an absolute white in, a clean up, a fresh in. And Radeon's so good in washing machines. My wash is whiter to the last sock. Pow! Radeon with sunflakes. Pure white power. Remember that. Now, I'll be on with my shopping. Uh, mind the trolley. Well, I never. A white in. Radeon it is, then. Pure white power. Pow! Shield brings you the dry look. Shield brings you the dry look with Stay Dry, a formulation unique to the newest Shield aerosol deodorant. It keeps you cool, confident, and feeling poised even in the sheerest of fashions. And Shield's extra dry spray never stings or burns your skin, even if you use Shield right after a bath. Stay dry with Shield, the only deodorant with Stay Dry. Dear Colin, I've only just heard. I can't tell you how sorry I am. It was nice of you to come. I was at the golf club and old Blake came to me and said, I say, have you heard that poor Maurice Tabrit died last night? I couldn't believe it. I'm afraid it's true all the same. And Maurice seemed comparatively well last night and in such good spirits. Was he taken worse in the night? No. He just died in his sleep. I suppose so. He can't have felt ill or would have rung for Nurse Wayland. When did you find out, then? Well, you see, sometimes if he had had a bad night, he slept late in the morning. Stella insisted that no one should go in to him until he rang. It was the only matter in which there had been any friction between her and Nurse Wayland. Oh, she was quite right. At least the poor chap was happy when he was asleep. We were just finishing breakfast when Nurse Wayland came in. I noticed she was very white. She said she had just been in to Morris. Stella was furious. I've never seen her so angry. Nurse Wayland was trembling. She looked all funny, scared, you know. I had the feeling something was wrong. Is anything the matter, nurse, I asked. She gave a sort of cry and clenched her hands and said, he's dead. How terrible. Stella gave a sort of gasp and went into a dead faint. And your mother? Oh, mother was wonderful. I sprang forward to help Stella and I saw mother just sitting at the table. She was awfully white. And then she began to tremble. She never made a sound. Just shrank back into her chair and suddenly became an old, old woman. She just said you... Better go for Dr. Harvester. I shall never get the sound of her voice out of my ears. Oh, hold on, old man. Don't tell me any more if it upsets you. No, I'm all right. There's nothing more to tell. Mother and Nurse Welland attended Stella and I went for the doctor. He said Morris had been dead for a good two hours. And probably heart failure. How about Stella? She's all right now. And your mother? Harvester's with her. Oh, here he is. Uh, how is Mrs. Tabret? Very upset. Trying not to show it. She has wonderful self-control. Do you think she'd like to see me? I'm sure she would. Oh, Nurse Welland, is my mother asleep? No, only resting, Mr. Collin. Then I'll go and ask her, Major. I won't be a moment. I told you to go and lie down, Nurse. I couldn't. I'm too restless. Oh, it's been a shock no less for you than the family. Yes, a great shock. He was always so brave and cheerful. Yeah, it was always on the cards that he'd go out suddenly. Like a candle that you blow out when you don't want it anymore. Where does the flame go then? 
My dear, I, I'm afraid you're taking poor Morris's death a good deal more to heart than his wife. Did you think he was only a case to me? Even a nurse is human. Strange as it may seem, she has a heart like other people. Of course she has a heart. But it doesn't do her or her patients any good if she allows her emotions to get the better of her common sense. What, in your opinion, Doctor, did Morris Tabret actually die of? Heart failure. Are you going to put that on the death certificate? Certainly. You've told me half a dozen times that Morris might have lived for years. He might have. And I can tell you now that it's a blessing for everyone concerned that he didn't. Dr. Harvester, Morris Tabret was murdered. What are you talking about? Do you want me to repeat it? Morris Tabret was murdered. Do you mean that you intended that statement to be taken quite literally? Quite. But my dear, why should anyone want to murder poor Morris? That at present is no business of mine. Now look here, nurse. You know perfectly well that everyone connected with him was devoted to Morris. No one was ever more surrounded by love and affection than he was. I, it's incredible that anyone should even have wished him harm. Whatever I may think or may not think, I'm at liberty to keep to myself. Oh, come now. You know as well as I do that Morris died of natural causes. What on earth is the use of making a fuss and getting everyone upset? If he died of natural causes, a post-mortem will prove it. And then I shall have nothing more to say. I am not going to have a post-mortem. It's quite unnecessary. I must warn you. If you sign the death certificate, I shall go straight to the coroner and protest. I should have thought the tablets have enough to put up with without your forcing such an ordeal on them. Major Laconda, you were in the police, weren't you? Tell me, what is the duty of a nurse who has reason to believe her patient has died by foul play? I suppose her duty is quite clear. But I think she should be sure that her reasons are valid before she exposed to distress and publicity a family that has treated her with unvarying kindness. Yes. Yes, you're right. Everyone in this house has treated me with the greatest consideration. I do at least owe it to them to make no charges behind their back. Does that mean you want them uh, sent for? Yes. In point of fact, I think I hear Mrs. Tabrick coming now. I'll go and fetch Stella. My dear Major, how kind of you to come. Oh, I felt I must come and see you for a moment. I'm sure you know how deeply I sympathize with you. If there's any way I can be of service. Thank you. I'm trying to put my own feelings out of sight and mind and think only that my son's martyrdom has ended. I won't weep because he is dead. I will rejoice because he is free. Good morning, Major Leconda. Dr. Harvester told me you were here. I came to say how much I feel for you and your great loss. Thank you. You know, Morris and I often talked of death. He, he was never afraid of it. He didn't even attach much importance to it. He asked me not to wear mourning for him, but to go about and do things exactly as if he were alive. He loved you so much, Stella. He put your happiness above everything. <sighs> Nurse Wayland, you'll be leaving us now, I suppose. I want to thank you for everything you did for Morris and to tell you how deeply grateful I am to but you. I don't need gratitude. I only did my duty. <sighs> What's the matter? Stella, I've got something unpleasant to tell you. I would sooner not have to add to your present trouble, but I'm afraid it can't be avoided. But what is it? Nurse Wayland is not satisfied that Morris's death was due to his illness. She thinks there was some other cause. But I, I don't understand. What other cause could there be? She says he was murdered. Oh, murdered? You must be mad, nurse. It's preposterous. However, I presume she has some grounds for her statement. What are they? Well, nurse? You all know that Mr. Morris suffered from sleeplessness. Dr. Harvester had prescribed a sedative, chlorolin. Will you repeat the instructions you gave me last night, doctor? Morris was excited and overwrought. I asked Nurse Whalen to give him a tablet and told him that if he woke in the night, he could take it. I dissolved the tablet in half a glass of water and put it by his side. There were five tablets left. This morning, the bottle was empty. That's very strange. Very. Would five tablets have been a fatal dose, Doctor? Six, including the one I left for him. Yes, there's no doubt the effect would have been fatal. It's incredible. 
Well, it's much more likely that someone took them for his own use. If so, they must have been taken after I went to bed. But no one went into Morris's room last night after that but me. I went in to say good night to him. You're not under the impression that I took the tablets, I suppose, Nurse Wayland? If you had, you could presumably produce at least four of them. Believe me, if you'd taken those five tablets at midnight, you wouldn't be sitting here now. The fact remains that five tablets disappeared last night. Where are they? Doctor, is it possible that Morris can have died from chloral poisoning? I have told you that I was satisfied that death was due to natural causes. I wasn't asking that. Yes, of course, it's possible. But I don't for an instant believe it. But I'm so confused. It's come as such a terrible shock. Nurse Wayland, do you really think that Morris died of an overdose of his sleeping tablets? I do. No, it's absurd. Who on earth would have thought of murdering Morris? It's out of the question. Oh, no, no. Nurse Wayland can't seriously think that anyone would deliberately give Morris an overdose. But I'm beginning to be desperately afraid that perhaps he took it himself. Suicide? Well, he wasn't... he wasn't himself last night. He was... he was very strange. I'd never seen him so upset. Oh, did he speak of suicide? No. What did he say? Well, really, Nurse Wayland, there are some things I can't tell you. What passed between my husband and myself concerned only ourselves. I beg your pardon. I only thought it would be better for your own sake to be frank. What do you mean? Are you accusing me of holding anything back? I'm not accusing anybody. My dear, I won't ask you anything that is painful to answer, but there's this. If there is anything in what Nurse Whalen says, I suppose there'll have to be an inquest. The coroner will certainly ask you if your husband said anything at all that might indicate that suicide was in his mind. Well, he, he said it would have been better if the accident had killed him outright. But he wasn't thinking of himself, he was thinking of me. That's very important. Nurse Wayland, if poor Morris did take an overdose of something, can't you square your conscience to say nothing about it? He had so little to live for. Can't you let him go in peace and spare us the distress of a post-mortem and inquest? But you see... I don't believe your husband committed suicide. Why not? He was sometimes very depressed. And for that reason, I didn't think it wise to leave within his reach the means of putting an end to himself. I always kept the tablets well out of his reach. I never saw him depressed. I know you didn't. You never saw anything. Now, Swayland, what have I done to you? Why do you speak to me like that? Your face is, is twisted with hate. I, I don't understand. Don't you? Oh, I'm beginning to be frightened of you. What sort of woman have we had in our house for five years? There's nothing to be frightened of, darling. Don't give way to your nerves. Because he joked and laughed when you were there. Did it never occur to you that there were moments when he was overwhelmed by black despair? But why did he insist on hiding it from me? His one aim was to make his suffering easy for you to bear. Whatever pain he had, he hid from you so that you should never have the distress of being sorry for him. How can you say such dreadful things? Everything he had had to be hidden from you. When you were coming, the medicine bottles and the dressings had to be put away so that there should be nothing to remind you that there was anything the matter with him. I would willingly have done anything for him that you did. It was his most earnest wish that I should not concern myself with that side of his illness. That's true, nurse. I'm sorry you don't think Stella did all she could for Morris. As his mother, I'm perhaps no less competent than you to judge. I have only admiration for her unselfishness. Oh, Mother. I always think we do the best by people when we help them in the way they want to be helped. There's a lot in that. I'm sure Stella did Morris most good by answering him back in the same strain when he chaffed her. Uh, when he laughed, laughing with him. I was nothing. Only his paid nurse. He didn't try to hide from me the despair that filled his heart. He didn't have to pretend with me. He didn't have to be good-tempered or amusing with me. He could be morose and know I wouldn't mind. He could quarrel with me and know he couldn't hurt me. What are you telling us, Nurse Wayland? 
I'm telling you the truth at last. What a strange truth it is. But, Nurse, what you've been saying suggests that in one of his moments of despair, he must have thought of suicide. It was just one of those moments that I was on guard against. The sleeping tablets were kept in the bathroom on an upper shelf. I had to stand on a chair myself to reach them. Was it impossible, Dr. Harvester, for Morris to have crossed the room into the bathroom and stood up on a chair? Quite impossible. He had no power in the lower part of his body. His back was broken in the accident and his spinal cord was injured. Well, the matter can't be left like this. I'm afraid, Harvester, there'll have to be an inquest. But confound it, man. No one commits murder without a motive. No one had the smallest reason to wish Morris dead. How do you know? Everyone was devoted to him. Did you know his wife was going to have a baby? <gasps> you fiend! Stella! I suspected it last night when she nearly fainted. This morning I knew for certain. Are you accusing me of murdering my husband? Is it true what she says, Stella? Shall I keep luncheon back, madam? Is it one o'clock? No. You can serve it. We can't have lunch now, Mother. Why not? Lay the two extra, Alice. Major Laconda and Dr. Harvester will be lunching. Very good, madam. Mother, it's impossible. How can we all sit down as though nothing had happened? I think it's just as well. We have a great deal more to say to one another. It will do none of us harm to talk of other things for half an hour. I... I, I couldn't. P please let, let me stay here. I insist on your coming, my dear. I must go home, Mrs. Tablet. I'll have a bite there and come back immediately. Very well. Will you come, Nurse Wayland? No. I'll have something sent up to your room. I don't want anything. You may when it comes. Lunch is served, madam. Come, Stella. You know the pepsodent you've been using? Pretty good toothpaste, wasn't it? But now there's all new Pepsodent. It's a toothpaste revolution. Get your teeth dazzle white without scratching tooth enamel. All new Pepsodent made with Erlium actually polishes teeth dazzle white. It doesn't scratch. All new Pepsodent, the greatest toothpaste discovery in your lifetime. But you don't have to believe that just because we say so. Extensive laboratory tests prove that it's true. If you'd like to see the results of those tests for yourself, write to Pepsodent, Box 909, Durban, and we'll send you documentary proof that all new Pepsodent gets teeth dazzle white without scratching tooth enamel. All new Pepsodent gives you the smile that dazzleizes. From the fertile fields of the eastern Transvaal come new flavor Royco's farm fresh vegetables. Plump chickens come from lush Natal. Our beefsteaks are the beefiest, our herbs and spices subtle and delicate. So come home to Royco, made from the freshest and youngest. That's why Royco soups taste the best and cook the quickest in only seven minutes. New flavor Royco, warm, friendly, satisfying, made with the good things you would choose. Have you finished lunch already? More or less. Are you all right? Mm, yes. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't stay in the dining room. It was awful sitting there as though nothing had happened. I don't know what induced Mother to make us go through that fast. Oh, I dare say it was sensible. With the servants there, it was obvious that we had to hold our tongues. It gave us all a chance to collect ourselves. Stella, is it true? About the baby? Yes, it's true. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't want to. You were going to let me go away without knowing. I didn't want to spoil your last weeks here. Because I was worried didn't seem to be any reason why you should be worried, too. But what were you going to do? I didn't know. I was desperately trying to find a way out. I thought it would be easier when you were gone. Whatever happened, I wanted to keep you out of it. But, darling, this is something I must share with you. Surely you realize that. 
when a woman tells a man she's going to have his baby, it's important to her. She wants to be made a fuss of. I couldn't expect you to feel joy or pride, only consternation. Stella, you do realize, don't you, how much I love you? <gasps> don't call her. Don't say anything that, that's going to upset me. I don't want to get emotional. If we've got to talk about it, let's do so as calmly as we can. What's that dreadful woman going to do now? Oh, I don't know. I don't care. Oh, no, that's not true. I'm frightened to death. Oh, God, what's going to happen to us? You do love me, Stella, don't you? Oh, yes. I wish I didn't, but I do. Oh, lunch oh, already? Yes. Forgive me for coming through the French doors, but I walked through the garden. Mother and Major Leconte will be here in a moment. They're still having coffee. And Nurse Good. Welland had lunch in her room. Perhaps you'd better fetch her, Colin. Right, oh. Won't be a moment. I, uh, I hope, my dear, this is going to come out all right. Doesn't look much like it, does it? Mm. Dr. Harvester, will you tell me something? Yes. Do you think it possible that Morris could have guessed... Uh, about the child? I, I shouldn't think so. Oh, I hope not. I couldn't have borne the thought that he died rather than expose me to shame and disgrace. He was capable of that, you know. My dear, I'm afraid that if Morris died of an overdose, he can't have taken it himself. But who could have given it to him? That is the question, isn't it? Oh. Yes, Nurse Whalen. Oh, oh, yes. I can hear Mother and the Major. Oh, you're back quickly, Doctor. Have we kept you waiting? I hope you had everything you wanted in your room, nurse. Everything, thank you, Mrs. Tablet. Well, uh, well, sit down, everyone. Now, we are in your hands, Nurse Wayland. Have you decided what to do? Major Leconda asked your daughter-in-law a question before luncheon. She didn't answer it. I'm afraid you must have thought me very impertinent, Stella. Nurse Wayland said you were going to have a baby. And I asked you if it was true. It's quite true. And then another question inevitably rises in one's mind. It... It's difficult for me to ask it. I'll answer without your asking. Of course, it's quite impossible that Morris should have been the father of the child I'm expecting. Since his accident, he's been my husband in name only. I am the father, Major Laconda. You! Do you mean to say that it escaped your sharp eyes, nurse, that Colin and Stella were in love with each other? Oh, did you know? Nowadays, I find the young are apt to think their elders even more stupid than advancing years generally make them. Oh, Mother, what must you think of me? Do you much care? I suppose I ought to be terribly ashamed of myself. But I must be honest. I could no more stop falling in love with Colin than I, than I could help the rain falling. You're shameless. But you have every right to think that I treated Morris shamefully, Mother. He's beyond the reach of pain, but I bitterly regret the pain I've caused you. I have no excuses to make for myself. My dear, don't you remember what I said to you last night? I thanked you for all you'd done for Morris. Did you think I was talking at random? I knew then that you were going to have a baby and that Colin was the father. I blame myself. Not for loving Stella, but for not going away as soon as I find out. What, whatever you think of me, I ask you to believe that I didn't give myself to Colin to, to, to gratify any passing whim. I love him with all my heart. I know, dear. I, I struggled against it. I, I told myself that the only return I could make Morris for, for all the devotion he gave me was by remaining faithful to him. I tried to drive Colin away. I did everything except ask him to go. I couldn't do that. And Morris was so pleased to have him here. Yes, I understand. I don't understand you, Mrs. Tablet. You seem to be going out of your way to find excuses for your daughter-in-law. If you knew what was going on, why didn't you stop it? I'm afraid I shall shock you, Nurse Wayland. Stella is young, healthy, and normal. When Morris's accident made it impossible for him and Stella to ever live again as man and wife, 
I asked myself how long she'd be able to support such a false relationship. No one could say that you had much trust in human nature. I have a great deal. I knew that Stella's pity was infinite. I knew that she meant everything in the world to Morris. Everything. But I feared the time would come when she could no longer be content with the miserable life that was all that Morris had to offer her. If she wanted to go, I felt we had no right to prevent her. And I knew that if she went, Morris would die. I would never have left him, never. I was willing to shut my eyes to anything, as long as she stayed with Morris. I found myself wishing she'd take a lover. Mrs. Tabret! When Colin came back, and after a while, I realized that he and Stella are in love. I was glad. I felt that this would make things right for Morris. She wouldn't go now. She was bound to this house by a stronger tie than pity or kindness. But didn't it strike you what great dangers you were exposing them to? I didn't care. I thought only of Morris. When they were children, I think I loved both my sons equally. But since his accident, I haven't had room in my heart for anyone but Morris. He was everything to me. For him, I was prepared to sacrifice Colin and Stella. I hope they'll forgive me. As if there were anything to forgive. You'll only laugh at me if I say I'm shocked. But I can't help it. I'm shocked to the very depths of my soul. I was afraid you would be. Well, with a baby on the way, you must admit that Morris's death has come in the very nick of time to get her out of a very awkward predicament. What a cruel and heartless thing to say. Are you sure your motive for causing all this trouble is anything more than your bitter hatred of me? Why should I hate you? Believe me, I only despise you. You hate me because you were in love with Morris. How dare you say that? You gave it away constantly. I could see that you were fonder of Morris than a nurse generally is of her patient. But it didn't strike me as serious until this morning. I know now that you were madly in love with him. And if I was, what of it? Nothing. Except that it's my turn to be shocked. In the circumstances, I think it was rather horrible and disgusting. Yes, I loved him. My love grew as yours faded. I loved him because he was so... so helpless. So dependent on me. I never showed my love. It, it would have meant nothing to him. He had no room in his heart for anyone but you. You think you were kind and considerate. If you'd loved him as I did, you'd have seen how less than nothing was all you did for him. I could think of a hundred ways to give him happiness, but they would have meant nothing to him. And you, whom he loved, could think of none of them. Nurse Wayland. I'm sorry for what I said just now. It was stupid of me and unkind. I suppose there is something beautiful in love, of whatever kind it is. Will you let me thank you for the love you gave my husband? No! It's an impertinence to offer me your thanks. I'm sorry you should think that. All you had for him was pity. But I loved him with all my heart. I never asked anything but to be allowed to help and serve him. What was he to you? What was he to his mother? To me, he was my life. And you killed him! That's a lie! Come, Nurse Wayland, you have no right to say that. How dare you stand there and insult Stella? The situation is perplexed. It's true, and you know it! I know nothing of the kind. I only know that you've worked yourself into a state in which you're saying all sorts of things for which you have no justification. My dear, I could no more have killed Morris than, than I could walk a tightrope. Doesn't it occur to you that there was nothing to prevent my leaving him? Who could have blamed me? I could have gone away with Colin. Yes, and heaven knows I wanted you. You'd have been afraid of the scandal. And you knew that your treachery would have broken your husband's heart. You couldn't face that. You preferred to kill him. After knowing me for five years, Nurse Wayland, how can you think me capable of such wickedness? Your husband loved and trusted you. He was bedridden. He was defenseless. If you were capable of being unfaithful to him, you were capable of killing him. Are you not falling into a rather vulgar error, my dear? Chastity is a very excellent thing, 
but it isn't the whole of virtue. There's kindness and courage and consideration. Are you defending her for having been untrue to your son? I'm excusing her. I know she gave Boris all she could, and the rest was not within her power. Oh, my dear. You're so kind and wise. No, darling. I'm only so old. Stella, I'm sorry, but Nurse Wayland has made a definite accusation. It must be met. If Morris died of an overdose of sleeping tablets, it was administered by somebody. It was not given to him by me. You appear to have been the last person who saw him last night. You said he was upset earlier in the evening. Why? Oh, must I tell you? It was very private. No, I, I have no right to ask you anything, but if there's an inquest, you'll be asked. Oh. He, he broke down because he couldn't love me as, as he wanted to love me. He said, he said he would have so liked us to have a child. But when you went in to say good night to him, he made no further reference to that. No, none. He seemed quite recovered. Did he ask you for anything before you went? The sleeping draft, for instance? No, Major Laconda. Morris did not ask me for the sleeping draft, and I did not give it to him. May I ask a question now? Certainly. Why were you so upset when I came in this morning and told you I'd been into your husband's room? I was angry with you for going in before he called. Are you sure you weren't afraid I'd gone in too soon? Oh. Supposing he'd been still alive and it had been possible to save him. You've made up your mind that I murdered Morris, haven't you? I know you did. You have done what you thought was your duty, Nurse Wayland. Well and good. It's obvious the matter cannot rest here and the responsibility is now mine. There is no need for us to take up any more of your time. I'll go. I'm just as anxious to leave you as you all are to get rid of me. But I can't go, Mrs. Tablet, without saying how... how sorry I am to have repaid your kindness by bringing this unhappiness upon you. I know you must hate me. It seems frightful, but I... I do ask you to believe that I... I can't help myself. Before we part, my dear, I should like, if I could, to release your spirit from the bitterness that's making you so unhappy. Bless you for the kindness you showed by poor Morris and for the unselfish love you bore him. Oh, I'm so desperately unhappy. Please leave your address, Nurse Wayland. Dr. Harvester will communicate with the proper authorities and they will want to get in touch with you. I shall go and see the coroner and put the facts before him. If you don't mind, Mrs. Tabret, I'll ring up his place from here and find out if he's in. Before you do that... May I say something? Of course. I'll try to be brief. Stella is mistaken in thinking that she was the last person who saw Morris alive. I saw him and spoke to him later. You! I couldn't sleep last night. There was no light in Morris's room, but I had a strange feeling that he was lying awake too. I opened his door quietly. But he heard me and called me in. What time was this? I don't know. Perhaps an hour after you left. He told me he'd taken his sleeping draught, but it hadn't had any effect. Then he said, Mother, be a sport and give me another. It can't hurt for once, and I do want to have a decent sleep. Yes, he was, uh, he was very nervy last night. I suppose his usual dose wasn't enough. Very early after his accident, I promised Morris that if life became intolerable to him, I would give him the means of putting an end to it. Oh, Mother, no. I said that if his suffering was so great that he couldn't bear them any longer, and he solemnly asked me to help him, I wouldn't shirk the responsibility. And sometimes he'd say, does that promise still hold? And I'd answer, yes, dear, it does. Did, did he ask you last night? No. What happened then? I knew Stella's love meant everything to Morris. And I knew that she no longer had any to give him because she'd given all her love to Colin. Poor Morris could not stand losing her. 
But Stella had done as much for him as even I, his mother, could ask of her. I was not so selfish as to demand from her the sacrifice of all that makes a woman's life worthwhile. Oh, why didn't you give me the chance? It was a lovely, lovely dream he dreamed. And I loved him too much to let him ever wake from it. For I loved Morris. He was everything to me. I gave him life, and I took life away from him. Mrs. Tappert, it's impossible. Oh, how dreadful. I went into the bathroom and climbed on the chair and got the bottle of chlorolin. I took the five tablets and dissolved them in a glass of water. I took it in to Morris, and he drank it at a gulp. Then I sat by the side of his bed, holding his hand until he fell asleep. When I withdrew my hand, I knew it was sleep from which he would never awake. He dreamed his dream to the end. Oh, Mother. Oh, what would be the end of this? I'm so frightened. Oh, my dear, don't worry about me. What I did, I did deliberately. Oh. And I'm quite ready to face the consequences. Well, it's my fault. How can I ever forgive myself? No, you mustn't be silly. You mustn't think about me or distress yourselves at what happens to me. You and Colin must go away, marry, and have your child. And you must forget the past. You're young, and you have a right to life and happiness. Oh, Mother, darling. Oh, Mother, you make me feel so ashamed. My son, I love you, too. I have your happiness very much at heart. Oh, my dear, dear Millie, what can I say? Dr. Harvester, are you still willing to sign the death certificate? Yes. Then sign it. If there are ever any questions, I'm prepared to swear that I left the tablets on Morris's table by his bed. Oh, Nurse Wayland. We're very grateful to you, Nurse Wayland. So infinitely grateful. Oh, Mrs. Tablet, I've been so petty and revengeful. I, I never realized how mean I was. Come, come, my dear. No, don't let us get emotional. We're both of us lonely women now. Let us help one another. So long as you and I can keep our love for Morris alive in our hearts, he's not really dead. Up the rice in the church where a wedding has been. Lives in a dream, waits at the This is Peter Tobin introducing Lux Radio Theatre. Tonight and every Monday night at this time, Lux Radio Theatre presents for your entertainment the finest in radio drama. In today's Lux Radio Theatre, we feature the story The Cruel Sea by Nicholas Montserrat. Adapted for broadcast by Stephen Grenfell and starring Jack Hawkins. My name is George Eastwood Erickson and I spent my war at sea. This is part of that story. It's a long and true story of one ocean, one ship and about 90 men. It's a true story because that is the only kind worth telling. First, the ocean, the steep Atlantic stream. The map will tell you what it looks like. What the map 
will not tell you is the strength and fury of that ocean. Its moods, its violence, its treachery. Next, the ship. The doomed ship. In November 1939, she's brand new. She's a corvette, a new type of escort ship. Her name is Compass Rose. Lastly, the men. The 90 men. They're very nearly all amateurs. Bakers, bank clerks, farmers' boys, lorry drivers, shop assistants. One day, the war and the navy will have welded them into a company of sailors. They come onto the stage in twos and threes. Some are early, some are late. Some, like this pretty ship, are doomed. They have women, at least 90 women, loving them or tied to them, or glad to see the last of them as they go to war. The men are the stars of this story. The only heroines are the ships. The only villain, the cruel sea itself. Job number 2891, move to the stores. Oh, heavens, I'm out of practice. Come in and shut the door very firmly. Reporting for Compass Row, sir, to Lieutenant Commander Erickson. Uh, I'm Erickson. You're Lockhart? Yes, sir. And you're Ferriby? Yes, sir. First trip? Yes, sir. We've just come up from King Alfred. And how long were you training there? Five weeks, sir. Oh, and now you know it all? No, sir. Well, that's something anyway. What was your job in peacetime? Journalist, sir. And what about you, Ferriby? I worked in a bank, sir. Ever been to sea? Uh, only across to France, sir. Oh, well, we might find that useful. You two subs know what you're in for? Uh, no, sir. Well, gentlemen, the particular war you've elected to join isn't a very pretty one, and the place has been hot. Yes, sir. And it'll get a damn sight hotter before we're all very much older. The Germans hang about off the coasts of Scotland and Ireland and in the Bay of Biscay on the lookout for stray ships that they can pick off at their leisure. Rather like jackals, sir. Yes, sir, rather like jackals. We weren't looking for a cushy war, sir. Good. All right. I'll take a look at the ship and report to the first lieutenant. His name's Bennett. He's somewhere aboard. Aye, aye, sir. Yes, sir. This is going to be damned crowded. You and I share a cabin, I suppose. I wonder what the first lieutenant's like. Hello! We shall soon know. Hello! Is that us? Come up here and double up! Names? Lockhart. Uh, Ferriby. Sir. Sir. Which of you is senior? We passed out together. I know that, but one of you is ahead of the other on the Navy list. We're not in the Navy list yet. You're not out of the egg yet, by the sound of it. Well, we'd better find out what you can do. You have been around the ship? Yes. How many fire hose points are there? Fourteen. Very clever. You, Ferriby? Yes? What sort of guns have we got? Four inch. Four inch what? Breach loading quick, firing mark four, mark six, fixed ammunition? Four inch... I don't know. Find out. I want to know next time I see you. i got work to do. You two subs get back to the hut and start checking CVs. Oh, my, an engaging character. Come in here. He's uh, not really what I expected. <laughs> Gold dust baffles brains, my lad. And CVs happen to be confidential books. See what I mean? How on earth did you know there were 14 fire hose points? <laughs> I didn't. And I was damn sure our Antipodean mastermind didn't either. I liked the captain. He loved you. Yes, he's all right. The good r and are really good. By the way, Lockhart, which one of us is senior? I think I'd better be. <laughs> Lockhart? What is it? I wonder if I could get my wife up here. I don't ask about it. Who? Bennett, I suppose, or the captain. Bennett would say no. Probably. You know, I was just getting used to being married. Must be very satisfactory. Oh, it's more than that. It's meant everything to me the last few weeks. I don't know how I could have got through otherwise. 
Mavis is... She's someone you can tell everything to without feeling ashamed. She's someone who's the other half of yourself. That's why it's so rotten being separated. Why don't you see if you can get her up? After all, the captain's wife is staying with him. So I was told at some ghastly hotel on Kelvin side. She'll not be a happy ship. Or my name isn't Chief Engine Room Artificer Watts. Oh, she'd be lovely enough. And she's not got the makings of a happy ship. I'm not saying the skipper's not okay, and you as cocks not make a great difference, Bob. Mm. But that Jimmy, the one's a proper Aussie bar steward. He was round my engine room tonight, blathering about a watch-keeping bill. And me with a ruddy main shaft still opened up. Makes you wonder what sort of country Australia is, doesn't it? Ah, the sooner I get my ticket and settle down on pension, the better. Well, there'll be no tickets in this war, mate. If you warm, you're in for the duration. Ah, that's what I'm afraid of. Yeah, you could hoist the old outfit aboard me old ship repulse and not feel the difference. I hope your repulse will be handy if we run into trouble. Well, what have we got in the way of armament? One perishing little four-inch pop gun and a couple of rows of depth charges. Ah. Oh, they make rings round us. What gets me is the accommodation. There's stokers messing alongside seamen, and you know they don't like that. Mm. There's no canteen, no refrigeration, no forced draft. And the galley's right aft so that everything will be stone cold by the time we eat it. Ah. Whoever designed that ship must have been blind drunk. Wish the basket had to sail in it. We won't be able to do that. I have a feeling we're going to move soon. Well, gentlemen, we go down river tomorrow. Which happens to be Christmas Day. A nice present, sir. I hope so, Locker. Well, here's the rough program, anyway. We'll be towed to the oiling berth about five miles down river. We'll oil there and then steam the rest of the way down to Greenock. How long do we stay there, sir? About a fortnight, taking on stores and ammunition and adjusting compasses. Then we go north to Arden Crish for our working up exercises. How long will they take, sir? Well, three weeks. But if we don't put up a good show, they can keep us there as long as they like. So it's up to us. Do you hear that, subs? We don't want any mistakes from either of you. We don't want any mistakes from anyone, whether it's me or a second-class stoker. They're a commodity I'm not going to have aboard. I'll be in my cabin if I'm wanted. That means that in less than a month we can be at sea. In the Atlantic, perhaps. Which is plenty cold at this time of year, Subs. You know what I was thinking? I was thinking that perhaps one might stand a better chance of survival in very cold weather, swimming in the water supported by a life jacket, than sitting wet through in an open boat exposed to the wind. Rot. Wait till the first time you're fished. You'll soon change your mind. How do you know? You can hardly have been torpedoed yet. You talk to me like that again, and I'll crown you. That would get you into a great deal of trouble. Just watch it, that's all. Hands! Steady, guns! We're leaving harbour! Number one? Yes, sir. Are we ready to move? Yes, sir, any time you like. Well, you should come and tell me. I can't guess at it, you know. Oh. Sorry, sir. Are all the hands on board? Um... I reckon so, sir. Well, are they or aren't they? Didn't you have it reported to you? There was only the postman, sir. I know he's aboard. Well, what about the mess caterers? What about the leading steward? What about the birthing party? I'll check up, sir. Well, find out and come and tell me here on the bridge. And next time, remember that you report to me that the ship is ready to sail with all the crew on board at the proper time. That's part of your job. I'd better detail fair You won't detail anybody unless you want to change jobs with them. Leading signalman Wells, I want to send a signal about our leaving. Yes, sir. To flag officer in charge, Glasgow. From Compass Rose, sail in accordance with your 0945 stroke 23 stroke 12. It was not particularly impressive, that first tow down river to the oiler, save for one odd accompaniment, which I, like many others on board, found moving. As Compass Rose edged outwards from the quay, with a tug at either end, a small cheer broke out from the knot of dockyard workers lining the quayside. It was ragged. It was... Un- but that made it preliminary gunnery and depth charge tests. Then Compass Rose weighed anchor and sailed for the open sea.
shortened into two shackles, sir. Wait. Aye, aye, sir. Wheelhouse, stand by engines. Clear anchor, sir. Wheelhouse, half ahead. I must say, it has rather been a state of continuous tension. The old buzzard. When his signal came this morning, half the crew were ashore on some mad scheme of his. And I found myself hauling on a rope like any ordinary metalo. I'll be cleaning up the lavatories next. Signal from the Admiral, sir. Oh, hell, what is it this time? Here, sir. Compass rose from flag officer in charge. You are being bombed by... Holy cow! Captain, sir. What is it, number one? Signal from the Admiral, sir. You're being bombed by long range heavy bombers. And German parachutists have been landed on the beach two miles north of Ardner Kreis. All right, I'll be up in a tick. Uh, sound off action stations and detail Lockhart and the folks will party to stand by as an armed landing force. Aye, aye, sir. Lockhart. Sir. Get your folks will party to stand by Port Whaler. Aye, aye, sir. Fellow sound off action stations. Aye, aye, sir. <laughs> Stand by to lower Port Whaler. Holy cow, he expects a lot, doesn't he? Action stations 30 minutes before we go on a gunnery exercise. There's the tug, sir. Red 8 Calling us up, sir. Take it down, Harris. Compass Rose from Basher. My course and speed... Two, seven, oh. Seven knots. Length of toe, seven, five, oh, yards. Ready for you. Right. Wells, make. On our first run, we will close in from 4,000 yards and fire three rounds. Please signal hits. Aye, aye, sir. Basher. Singular name for a target towing tug, sir. No, well, it gives you fair warning. <laughs> Reply from Basher, sir. If any. No, oh, the humorous. Uh, bridge wheelhouse, starboard 20, steer north. Lockout, sir. Sound off action stations. We'll start this from the beginning. Aye, aye, sir. <laughs> Gun crew closed up, sir. Medical Phillips. Lou. Target bearing. Red, four, five. Range, three thousand. On target, sir. Shoot! Well short of target. Up four hundred. Shoot! Down two hundred. Shoot! What's the matter? Shell half in and half out of breach, sir. Clear it. Hi, sir. Next one would have sunk it. Hey, what's the matter with you, Greg? Moving over your old woman again. Look here, my lad, if you do that in action and they land a couple of 14-inch bricks while you're fiddling about clearing the gun, I'll, oh, I'll never forgive you. Cease fire, sir. Check, check, check. Not bad, Lockhart. Get ready for the next run. Aye, aye, sir. Captain, sir. What is it, Wells? Secret signal, sir. Signal boat just brought in a board, sir. All right, thank you. Being in all respects ready for sea, HMS Compass Rose will sail to join convoy AK-14, leaving Liverpool at 1200 the 6th February 1940. What do you think of your first convoy, sir? I never realized it would be so big, sir. 
46 ships. Yes, and our job is to shepherd them through the most treacherous waters in the world with a 15-year-old destroyer, Viperus, two corvettes, a trawler, and a rescue tug that vanishes about like a pee on a drum. Still, as they're never tired of telling us, there is a war on and we shall have to do the best we can. Uh, Lockhart. Sir. Have you loud hailed all ships regarding that alteration of course? All except one, sir. I'm just calling up number 32 now. Hello, number 32. Hello, number 32. I have a message for you. Take it down, please. Hello, number 32. I have a message for you. Take it down, please. You think they wanted to get lost? Try again, sir. Can we use the siren, sir? They don't seem to hear the human voice. We'll use the gun in a minute. Well, that's right. Somebody, sir. Yes, a man in a bowler hat. Number 32. I have a message for you. Take it down, please. Oh, God, the old fool's dead. <laughs> I'm afraid you've hurt his feelings, sub. You forgot to switch the live healer off. Mistakes, sir. Sorry. Message for you, number 32. Important alteration, of course. Please take it down. Keep at it, sub. Well, well, well. The officer of the day. If you can call him that. The captain's taken over for a bit. Evening round's correct, sir. I'll bet. Have you been up to the bridge? Yes. Did you check the position of the nearest ship? The nearest? I, I'm afraid I forgot that. Oh, you forgot, did you? What do you think we're doing on this convoy, Ferriby? Mucking about all over the Atlantic Ocean just for the fun of it? We're supposed to protect the convoy. Anyway, we're supposed to know where the goddamn thing is. And you forgot to check whether there was any convoy there. You know what your trouble is, don't you, Ferriby? If you stop drooling over that picture of your wife and thinking about her 24 hours a day, you might... You might make a sailor. I... I'm sorry. I'll go and make the check now. Oh, get out of my sight. You make me sick. Why don't you leave him alone? What did you say, Lockout? I said, why don't you leave him alone? He's only a kid. He's doing his best. It's not good enough. Would be if you gave him a chance. That's enough. You keep out of it. I don't have to argue with you. You don't have to argue with anybody. Can't you see it's no good going on at Ferriby like that? Only makes him worse instead of better. He's that sort of chap. Then he'd better change pretty quickly. He's doing his best. He's not. He's been no use ever since I stopped him having his wife up in Glasgow. That's been their trouble all along. What a horrible man you are. One more crack like that and I'll report you to the captain. Try it. Captain's not a fool. He knows how you treat that a bit. Now I will report you. Get your cap and come along. Well, it's a damned awkward time, number one. What's the trouble? Sub-Lieutenant Lockhart has been impudent to me regarding Ferriby, sir. Well, Lockhart? I think Ferriby gets a rough deal from the first lieutenant, sir. It's not your concern whether someone else gets a rough deal or not. You've got your own job to do. I realize that, sir, but if you think a friend of yours is being unfairly treated, the natural thing to do is to try to help him. Now, look here, Lockhart. This is not going any further. It's bad for you, and it's bad for the ship. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Now, uh, just forget about the whole thing. There's plenty to do without this sort of scrapping. Yes, sir. May I have a word with you, sir? All right, number one. Now, what's the trouble? Sir, I think Lockhart got away with it. You've got to make alliances, number one. He's a very new officer, and we've all been working pretty hard. I don't think it'll happen again. I've had a lot of trouble with Lockhart. I hoped you'd pull him up, sir. He needs stamping on good and hard. I want to avoid having to stamp on people as far as possible, number one. There are other ways of getting them to work properly. All right, number one, that's all. The first convoy was a bloodless affair. We met no U-boats, only because they were probably thankful to stay submerged and escape the fury of the weather. And the weather turned out to be the most violent enemy of them all. For eight days, we steamed straight into a westerly gale. 
buffeting through a weight of wind that seemed to have a personal spite against Compass Rose. She seemed doomed to ride this terrible ocean forever. But no voyage, save for the ships that are sunk, can last forever. As soon as we got in after our first trip, I applied for another officer. There was far too much work for a first lieutenant and two subs to handle. And the Admiralty appointed Sub-Lieutenant Morell to Compass Rose, fresh from the training establishment. In peacetime, he was a junior barrister. Well, do you think you're going to like the ship, Morell? Yes, the ship. And the captain. I understand the first lieutenant hails from one of the Dominions. Australia. Ah, do we often have tin sausages for dinner, by the way? Very often. In that case, whether this war is long or short, it's going to seem long. <laughs> you know, the first lieutenant used an expression which is novel to me. I wish you'd explain what it means. Well, what was it? He said, uh, don't you come the acid with me. Come the acid. I must confess that even as a barrister, I've not heard that before. What are we talking about? We were discussing the best way of dismantling the firing bar on the Aztec set. It's not too technical for you. No, no, but it may have been too technical for Bennett. He's been trained in a rougher school. Well, that may well be the case. So, coming the acid... It means that you probably corrected him without wrapping it up, you know. I could hardly have been more diplomatic. Well, then you must have overdone it. How strange to meet Scylla and Charybdis in Atlantic waters. Uh, perhaps I should explain the illusion. They were... Uh... Don't come the acid with me. Ah, now I understand. <laughs> He really is a monstrous man. Well, of course he is, uh, well, unique. Very few Aussies are like him. Oh, God, how can we get rid of him? I have an idea he might get rid of himself. He didn't like the convoy at all. I shouldn't be surprised if he gave this job up. How could he do that? Oh, there are ways. If I were him, I think I should get a duodena louser. For some inscrutable reason, the Navy takes him very seriously. If they suspect anything like that, they put you ashore straight away in case something blows up while you're at sea. But one of us had better tell him. I wouldn't like him to be in any doubt as to how to go about it, just for want of a word of advice. <laughs> the first few convoys followed the pattern of our initiation. The cruel sea was our only enemy. But this was not to last. Captain, sir. What is it, Ferebe? Burst of tracer bullets from the far side of the convoy, sir. I'll come up. Sound off action stations. Aye, aye, sir. Release clear, clear the way, sir. Close up, sir. Very good, Wainwright. That's good, close up, sir. Right, Phillips. What is it, sir? Low-flying aircraft attacking across the convoy, sir. Oh, as I see it. Too far away for us to have a crack at her yet. Yes, sir. He's coming our way. Another few hundred yards. There goes a bomb. See it? Yes, sir. In the moonlight. Oh, God. There must have been a tank. Poor devils. Will we pick him up, sir? Yes, we're their escort. If there are any, that is. Bridge, wheelhouse. Wheelhouse, sir. Roxon on the wheel. Starboard 20, steer 145. Starboard 20, steer 145, sir. Pull ahead. Pull ahead, sir. So presently we found them. With 20 years at sea behind me, even I was not prepared for the pity and horror of their appearance. First came the ones who could climb aboard themselves. Half a dozen shivering black-faced men, shot and silent. This was war at sea with all its pitiless vengeance. One came aboard with his scalp streaming with blood. Another had been scalded from head to foot with steam. 
They look round them in wonder, dazed by the swift violence of the disaster and by their rescue. And to these pitiful human beings, the solid deck, the fellow men, the warmth of compass rose, was sanctuary from the cruel sea. Hallows, hold him down. Aye, aye, sir. Why doesn't he die, sub? I wish he would. Uh, do us all a favor. Die. Please, die. Bennett will be back late from leave. He probably can't tear himself away from some disreputable tar. Oh, evening. Evening, sir. Evening, evening, sir. Number one back yet? I think I hear his approach now, sir. Evening, sir. Evening, number one. What's laid on? Snorkers. Good out. Oh. Had a good leave, sir? Yes, thank you, number one. Everything under control, Lockhart, while I was away. Everything, sir. Boilers clean to treat, as the dockyard made it said. Good. Holy cow. Hmm. What's the matter, number one? Hell of a pipe. I feel pretty crook. Oh. Well, you'd better lie down and take it easy for a bit. Holy cow, it's agony. I reckon I will go and lie down. Might pass off. Well, what are you all grinning at? Oh, sorry, sir. I was thinking of something. Oh, it hardly does you credit, Lockhart, at a time like this. If the first lieutenant is in pain... I should hardly have thought you would be able to laugh at anything else. Go in. Oh, come in, Lockhart. Sir, here are two signals. Yes, sir. The first is our sailing orders for four o'clock. Yes, sir. The second concerns Bennett. The first lieutenant won't be back for some time. Suspected duodenal ulcer. Oh. We'll have to sail without him, and there's no chance of getting relief by four o'clock either. I see, sir. You'll have to take over as number one and organize the watches on that basis. Yes, sir. I'll help you with it. You should be able to carry on until a relief arrives. I can carry on anyway, sir. Can you? I know I can, sir. All right, then. I'll see. Do your best this time anyway. You can count on that, sir. Oh, I think I can. Now, off you go and get those watches sorted out. So Compass Rose sailed on through 1940. Sometimes to Iceland, sometimes to Gibraltar, sometimes to a pinpoint in mid-Atlantic that was our rendezvous with the incoming ships. Another, and what was obviously to be a longer year, was born. And it began in port with a piece of domestic drama. You know, Bob, I've been doing a wee bit of thinking... Well, why don't you have a bash at your beer before you go crackers? Well, you've got two bookshe pants lined up already. Aye, I'll get to them. 
You see, Bob, um, I'm a widower with grown-up children. What about it, Jim? We both know you know Clark Gable. Uh, well, I was wondering about after the war. Well, let's get through the little thing first before we start salting out the peace. Aye, but if I do get through it, I want to get fixed up. And so say all of us, Jim. Well, what are, you, what are you worrying about? There's bags of shawl billets going for old-timers like you. I, well, I was thinking more about a home. Oh, you old basket. <laughs> Got your eye on some little wren glamour pants, eh? No, she's no wren. And no glamour pants. Oh. Well, cheerio, old Jim. Uh, cheers. No, she's a widow. Many a good tune played on an old boat. Uh, do I know her? Well, yes, you do, Bob. Here, ha- haven't you ever, well, uh, you know... Glad. Blow me, Kappa. Glad it's my sister. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? Ah, well, you see, Bob... Uh... Oh, well, that's marvellous, Jim. That's all. It's marvellous. Here, come on, shake on it. Oh, it's the best thing that could happen to her, that. Here, I'm for you and all. Uh, thanks, Bob. Well, have you asked you? Well, sort of. Uh, we, we've, we've got a... Uh... Uh, understanding. Hmm? The only thing is... Well, come on, what's the trouble? Oh, well, she's a wee bit worried about you. I mean, she's been housekeeping for you for a long time, hasn't she? Oh, don't be daft, don't be daft. I might get married myself one of these days. I might. You never know. Oh, you go ahead, Jim. I'll give the bride away any time you like. I can't see it happening soon, not with the war going the way it is. Ah, oh, it's the longest job I ever saw. It was on one of our journeys home from Gibraltar that Compass Rose justified the men who had designed and built her and the men who sailed in her. Toward the end of the morning watch, the light began to grow to the eastern, blanching the dark water. Bridge. Captain, sir. Captain, yes. Lockhart, sir. I think we've got a submarine on the radar screen. I'll be up at once, number one. Sure it's not a straggler? I don't think so, sir. This thing's at least ten miles behind the convoy. Have you had an echo like this before? Not exactly, sir. It's about the size we'd get from a a boy or a small boat. A trawler or a drifter? No, it's smaller than that, sir. Sound off action stations. Bridge, (laughs) three house. Pull ahead. Here, 10 degrees to starboard. Left charge crew closed up. Gun crew closed up. Two by the gun closed up. Action steaming stations. Oxen on the wheels, sir. Action stations closed up, sir. My God, number one, I think that this time. There it is. See it? That black speck on the horizon. Yes, I got it, sir. On the surface, too. Something I thought perhaps we'd never see. The cunning tower of a U-boat. Uh, Captain must be blind. Morel! Uh, a U-boat on the surface, dead ahead. It's far out of range at the moment, but be ready. We want to get a couple of shots in before she dies, if we can get near enough. Aye, aye, sir. I can see it, sir. Dead ahead. Shall we send a sighting report, sir? Yes, Wells. WT signal. Warn the office. Take this down. Admiralty repeated viperous. Submarine on surface, ten miles astern of convoy TG-104. Course, three, four, five, speed, five knots, and engaging. Number one? I kind of overheard, sir. Too far away for me at the moment. Uh, we'll need that Asdic box of tricks before long. You can stand by for the quickest crash dive in history as soon as they see us. Let's make the most of it while their trousers are down, sir. Therapy, stand by for immediate action. Crack it on, Chief. We haven't much time to play with. Aye, aye, sir. I think I can reach him now, sir. That German in the conning tower must turn round. He'll say God in Himmel or Donner better and crash and she'll be gone. Right, Morel. Fire! Damn! Thirty yards over. Fire! Blast! Sure! She's crash diving, sir. Nearly down. Fire! She's down, Lockhart! In Aztec contact, sir! She's moving quickly, sir! Every inch of steam you've got, Chief! Aye, aye, sir. If I have to split her apart. Moving right, sir! No! Fire depth charges! Aye, aye, sir! Pattern one! Fire! Depth charges gone, sir! Depth charges gone, sir! Quick, 
We must have got her. The damn thing was there. Get back on that search. We haven't finished yet. Sorry, sir. Target stationary, sir. Third pattern. Fire! Any minute now. Like a ruddy, great, dead, unwieldy fish. Open fire! There they come, the bastards. Machine gun? No, one of them's got guts anyway. Well, that's that. Cease fire! Wheel the midships. Stop engines. And stand by with those scrambling nets. See how they swim. The staunch apostles of total war. This is my favorite kind of survivor. They invented the whole idea themselves. I want to see how they perform. That was our moment of triumph. How soon it was to be tarnished. Even far down the Mersey, at the Crosby Light Vessel, we knew that something was wrong. And as we sailed upstream, we began to smell the acrid tang of smoke. Get out the morning wires. Aye, aye, sir. Can you train your glasses on the city, sir? It lo looks funny. Huh? There's an hell of a lot of smoke about. I can see the liver buildings. There's a ruddy great piece missing out of the skyline, though. Oh, it's copped up packet. What? Uh, what's it like, sir? Not too good, I'm afraid. Looks as though they've been raided several times. Oh, look at those horses. Hope to heaven they didn't get our oiler. She'd go up like a Roman candle. I was just getting to light some of those rather rugged tights. Stop talking and get on with those wires. Aye, right, sir. Ship secure, sir. Number one. Sir. There'll be a lot of requests for special leave, probably. You'd better cancel ordinary leave and give it to the ratings who have homes or relatives here. Aye, aye, sir. What about yourself, sir? See that those wires are squared off. Sir. I'm going ashore to phone. Now, it'll probably be some time because there'll be a queue as long as a wet week for that dockside telephone. I couldn't get through, Bob. But then they might just have damaged the telephone wires. Yeah, I know. It might be that, Jim. Well, this is the Duck Road, all right. There's not a great deal of it left. No, there isn't. Number 33. 31. Oh, my God. Well, that's that. Uh... Yes, Jim. Let, let's ask those rescue boats. How did it happen? How, uh, about the people inside? I, I was at the warden's place. Yeah, I know, but what about the people inside? I mean, you know, don't you? They were dead. I'm very sorry. There were two of them. Probably Mrs. Crossley. She used to sit with Glad in the evening. There's any earth I can give. What did they do with it? When was the funeral? Oh, Two days ago. There, uh, <clears throat> there were some others, you know. Twenty-one altogether. Twenty-one. Where was it? The funeral, I mean. Croft Road Cemetery. It was very tasteful. They were all together in one big grave. The mayor and the corporation attended, and, and, and the floral tributes. It, they can't have known anything. It was all over in a second. That voyage was a tough one. Six ships in two days, including Sorrow, our sister ship. We asked permission to search for survivors. We didn't get that permission till dawn. We found them without difficulty towards the end of the morning watch. Fifteen out of a ship's company of ninety. The men on the rafts were stiff and cold and soaked with oil. 
some alive, some dead. Sorrell's captain, Ramsey, my friend for many years, was holding in his arms the dead body of a young sailor. The whole story, the lost ship, the lost crew, the pain and the exhaustion, all these were written on Ramsey's grey face. It was a true captain's face, a captain in defeat, who mourned his ship and who bore alone the monstrous burden of its loss. But the enemy hadn't finished with us, that convoy. That's the third ship tonight. She's settling down. None of her boats are away yet, sir. You've got the best eyes in the ship, Wells. Aztec echo bearing. Two, two, five. Moving left. Increase revolutions. Aye, aye, sir. What's it look like, number one? Submarine, sir. Can't be anything else. Ferrabe. Sir? I'll take over here. Get down to your depth charges. Aye, aye, sir. I'll take her in at attacking speed and drop a pattern of depth charges on the way. Very good, sir. Starboard ten. Starboard ten, sir. Steer one three five. Steer one three five, sir. Captain, sir. Yes, Wells. Survivors in the water ahead, sir. I can see them. Sorry, sir. What's it look like now, number one? The same, sir. Solid echo, exactly the right size. Must be a U boat. Is it moving? Very slowly. There are some men in the water just about there. Six hundred yards from those men swimming in the water. What's it look like now? Just the same. Seems to be stationary. It's the strongest contact we've ever had. There are some chaps in the water. There's a U-boat just underneath them. All right. All right, then. Attack at all costs. That's what it says in the book. We'll go for it. Depth charge positions aft. Attacking. Stand by. Good, they're waving. The blokes in the water, you can't do it, so you can't. Do you think I'm enjoying myself, Wells? But those blokes! Drop first pattern. Aye, aye, sir. Depth charge is on, sir. Depth charge is gone, sir. No, number one, I don't mind telling you. I don't mind telling you I'm not. You've got to forget all about it. No good worrying about it now. You can't change anything. No, was a submarine. I'm sure of it. Uh, it's all in the report. It was all my fault anyway. I identified it as a submarine. If anyone killed those men, I killed them. No one killed them. It's the war. We've just got to do these things and say our prayers at the end. Have you been drinking, number one? Yes, sir. Quite a lot. So have I. First time since we commissioned. Good night. You poor old devil. You've had just about enough, haven't you? Can't get you properly to bed, my dear and revered captain, but at least I can snug you down for the night. <clears throat> you have quite a head when you wake up. God bless you. Oh, get your legs out straight. <clears throat> yeah, that's the best I can do for you. Wish it could be more. Wish I could 
really cure you. Drunk or sober, Erickson, you're all right. Number one, I heard that. That's all right, sir. I meant it. Number one, when we get back after this trip, I'll buy you the best dinner in Liverpool. Our next convoy was our worst ever. It fitted into the whole interminable, messy pattern of that seemingly endless war at sea, and its cost was very great. I've never known a Gibraltar run like it, number one. No, sir. Simply a steady wastage. Signal from Viper, sir. Read it, Wells. Following ships were sunk last night. Fort James, Arisky, Bulstrode Manor, Glen McCurtain. A men convoy list accordingly. Thank you, Wells. But the next convoy to Iceland was even worse than the Gibraltar run. Compass Rose was running southward past the frozen coastline after delivering four ships independently to Reykjavik. It was cold, and it grew even colder as night fell. Looks just as Iceland ought to look, doesn't it? Plenty of snow. Black cliffs, white mountains, broad glacier. Peaceful, cold and peaceful. Well, sir, call Vipers on our team. Plain language, they say torpedoed in position 050 degrees. 30 miles astern of you. Aye, aye, sir. Number one, tear away boats and rafts, but wait for the word. Aye, aye, sir. She's going down already. Poor little compass rose, just like sorrow. The RT smashed, sir. Stop engines, chief. Aye, aye, sir. Chief? Sir. Leave it, chief, and come up. Aye, aye, sir. Nothing can save her now, number one. Nothing. Shall I ditch the book, sir? Yes, well, throw over. That coxswain, sir. Pipe abandoned ship. Aye, aye, sir. Abandoned ship! Abandoned ship! What's the chances, sir? Oh, not too bad. Well, it's time to go. Good luck to you all. She's going. Uh, did anyone see Jameson? He were in Foxhall. None of them got out. Lucky devils. Better this any road. Ah, we got a chance still. <laughs> it's getting lighter. That's the moon. Shorty, wake up. Are you all right, Rose? Rose? Damn, he's gone. Shorty, wake up. Uh, Trefoil will have seen us on her radar screen. Wilson's dead, sir. You sure? Yes, sir. This is stone cold. All right. Tip him over, then. Who's going up on the raft next? <laughs> Any more for the Skylark? Must be pretty near Iceland. <laughs> Some men died well. Some men died badly. Some men just died, having nothing to live for. And so in the first light of early morning, Viperus found us, eleven men on two rafts. She brought us back to our home port and safety. Oh, wait up. Yes, sir. Another pink gin. Pink gin, sir? Oh, uh, no, no. Here's my captain. Make it two pink gins. Yes, sir. Two very large pink gins. Sir, congratulations. Well, uh, my very new brass hat. <laughs> Thanks, number one. Two large pink gins, sir. Oh, thank you. Well, the uh, lordship's only told me last week the passage of time, of course. Oh, nothing else, sir. Well, here's to it all the same. 
I really am sorry. Thank you. I know, sir. That's a, a damn silly question. Any better? No, not very much. No, I didn't think it would be. Did you go and see Morel's wife? Yes. Yes, I did. How was she? In bed. Taking it badly? I think she was taking it very well. There was someone with her. Damn the war. Yes. To hell with it. Tell me about your new ship. Ah, oh, no. She really is something. It's a new class. Frigates. Same size and shape as a destroyer. Is she? Eight or nine officers and about 160 men. She's got everything, but everything. Now, this time, we're going to give them more than they can cope with. Do you know we've got turbines, twin screws, three big guns, new ASDIC, new radar. I'll be commissioning her in about two months' time. I hope we'll be commissioning her, sir. Thank you, number one. I wanted you to say that. Well, let's raise our glasses. Good idea. To... Watts, and Tunbridge, and Tallow, and Wells, and all the others. And all the others. Oh, and to Compass Rose. Yes, to little Compass Rose. Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Catherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor in Undercurrent. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. From time to time, as we pass each other on the narrow drive that leads to our respective homes, I scrape fenders with one of my most charming neighbors, Catherine Hepburn. But in spite of our frequent and more friendly contacts, I found Catherine very difficult to lure before a microphone. Her radio appearances are rare indeed, so that it's something of a triumph to present her here tonight co-starred with another of Hollywood's outstanding stars, Robert Taylor, in his first green role since serving with the Navy Air Corps. Together, Bob and Catherine bring you Metro-Golden-Mare's thrilling screen hit, Undercurrent. Last Monday night, when we announced tonight's screenplay and stars, the audience response was, uh, well, to say the least, terrific. And I might say that the same is true of audience reaction when it comes to Lux Flakes. Hundreds of listeners who've used Lux Flakes to care for precious fabrics have written us their appreciation. I only wish I had time to answer them in person. But I'm sure that the help which Lux Flakes offer is an answer in itself. And your loyalty to our product enables us to bring you such exciting fare as Undercurrent, with such brilliant stars as Catherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor. They appear, respectively, as Anne Hamilton and Alan Garraway, as the curtain rises on our first act. It was a marriage no one ever would have predicted. Anne Hamilton, reserved, unaspiring, and Alan Garraway, the wealthy, celebrated inventor of the Garraway distance control. Garraway brought his bride to Washington, their first night there, he displayed her before a large, select group of friends. When the friends had departed... Oh! Anne, darling, what is it? 
I thought they'd never go, Alan. Oh, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have. What, darling? I shouldn't have what? You shouldn't have married me. Your friends asked them. They know it was a mistake. Anne, please. Darling, I can't help it. I didn't even know what they were talking about. They were laughing at me, Alan. I know they were. But I was proud of you. Alan, I was so lost among them. What must they have thought? I mean, well, good grief. I don't even know how to dress. Is that all that's worrying you? I'm going to take this dress off and never see it again. darling, it's a perfectly nice dress. Nice dress. It's eight inches too short and it's only two weeks old. (laughs) Alan, you're stuck with a wife who doesn't know how to dress. She doesn't even know how to behave. We'll go shopping tomorrow, darling. It won't do any good. By tomorrow night, you'll be the best-dressed woman in Washington. You're already the loveliest. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry to be such a boob, but I want so much to be right for you. Will you shut up? I'll learn. I really will. I'll learn to talk like your friends. I'll learn to be like them. I don't know how the heck I'll do it, but I'll do it. (laughs) If you do, I'll kill you. Darling, just tell me one thing. Who do you belong to? You. Well, that's all. That's all that matters. Is it, Alan? Is it? Mm Mm-hmm. And if you ever forget that, you'll be very sorry. Now, if Madame does not mind waiting, I will arrange to have some hats modeled for her right away. Well, darling? Of course, I just don't believe any part of this. A mink (laughs) coat, a beaver jacket, 14 gowns, 12 pair of shoes. Relax, will you? If I relax, I'll drop dead. (laughs) Oh, Alan, how could you have let me wear that brown horror last night? I'm in love with you, darling. I didn't even notice. But you must have. Darling, don't be afraid of hurting me. I don't know much about these things. Alan Garraway, is that you, Alan? Oh, hello, Mrs. Foster. Uh, Anne, this is a neighbor of ours from Virginia, an old friend of my mother's. Mrs. Foster, my wife. How do you do? I'm delighted to meet you, my dear. When are you coming down to Middleburg? Well, if business eases up next month, I hope. Well, Alan, she looks like a fine, honest girl. You, uh, ride, of course. I'm afraid I'm not very good at it. We're raised on horses at Middleburg, aren't we, Alan? Oh, definitely. Alan's not a bad rider, my dear, but his brother Michael's the boy with the light hands. Now, there's a real horseman. By the way, Alan, how is Michael? Michael is always Michael. I, I hope you'll excuse us, Mrs. Foster. We were just of going to... Of course. I'm late for an appointment myself. I'll be looking for you in Middleburg, my dear. Goodbye, Mrs. Foster. Alan, she's nice. You didn't tell me you had a brother. Well, I haven't had time to tell you a lot of things, darling. You, uh, you pick out your hats, Anne. I'll wait out front and get some air. But I, I want... <laughs> What's wrong, darling? You've seemed so troubled since we came back from shopping. You were surprised to learn I have a brother. But what a nice surprise. Where is he, Alan? Spoiled my first day alone with you. So typical. Good old Mike. I I meant to tell you about him, man. I've been putting it off, but one of these days we'll have to go to San Francisco. Our factory's there, and you'll meet people who know Mike, who adore him. He does that to people. My mother adored him. He was her favorite. Alan, please, if you drop When my father died, uh, Mike and I took over the business. I was the engineer. That's when I started working on my distance control. We'd been making plenty of money when suddenly we began to run out of funds. At first, I couldn't figure out why. Mike must have thought I was an imbecile to do it the way he did. It was just like putting his hand in the cash register. He was stealing from you, your own brother. Yes. Mike had bought a ranch in the country. He'd spend a lot of time there. He'd like to give parties. Anyway, I, I drove out to see him. Fortunately, he was alone. When I told him what I'd found out, he said that I'd never do anything about it. Not while Mother was alive. And I didn't. Mother was an invalid. She died the next spring. Please don't, Alan. Well, there's not much more to tell. After she died, Mike just disappeared. Last I was heard, he was in the Army. That was over three years ago. He disappeared because he was afraid of what you might do to him. Well, maybe, but Mike's not afraid of me. I keep thinking he's alive somewhere and hating me the way he must. I even felt I didn't have the right to marry you. Don't say that, Alan. He can't hurt us if we never let him come between us. Why should he? What's Mike got to do with us? Nothing, Alan, nothing. So we'll never think about him or speak about him again. But if anything ever does come up, you'll tell me, Alan, you'll let me know. Nothing ever will. Darling, I'm so deeply sorry for you. But I'm glad you've told me because it means you're not as sure of yourself as I thought you were. You need me even if it's only to help you forget. Yes, I do need you, Anne. You may have a no-good brother, but you're going to have an awful good wife. I'm so grateful to you for so many things. It's as though you'd led me by the hand into a strange and wonderful world, a world to dream of. Why dream? You're here, Anne. You're mine. And I love you. Well, 
Good afternoon, Mrs. Garraway. Did you have a nice afternoon shopping? Oh, yes, Mrs. Hildebrand. Any messages? No messages, madam. That means all your invitations for tonight have been accepted. Mrs. Hildebrand, I don't know what I'd do without you. The perfect housekeeper. How many dinner parties have we given this month? Is it 210 or 211? This is your sixth, madam. Oh, I beg your pardon. Would you mind looking at the table? I took the liberty of arranging the place cards. You know, you know, a strange thing happened this afternoon at a bookshop. Mr. Galloway left a book there months ago to be rebound. He must have forgotten all about it. It's a volume of English poems. I'm glad I found it. Yes, madam. Oh, you'll notice I put Judge Putnam on your right. What? Oh, oh, yes. And who's this one, Mrs. Hildebrand? Who is Mr. Henry Gilson? A new congressman from the Midwest, madam. I wondered why you'd placed him in the doorway. He's no one important, Mrs. Garraway. Ah, that explains it. If that is all, madam, I'd better see to the order. Sorry, Henry Gilson, you're just not important, poor guy. We have something in common, you and I. Now, me, I think you are important. Henry, you and Mr. Justice Putnam are changing places. There. Now tell me, Congressman Gilson, just what part of the Midwest do you come from? Yes, of course, just what part of the Midwest do you come from? Iowa. Oh, I love Iowa. So big and full of corn, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, it certainly is. Excuse me a moment. Shall we go into the other room for coffee? <clears throat> it was such a lovely dinner, Mrs. Galloway. Thank you, Mrs. Postman. Oh, ma chérie, your gown. What exquisite taste you have. Thank you, Madame Lefebvre. Oh, Anne, just a minute. Thank you, Mr. Ga... Uh, oh. <laughs> yes, darling, what? Anne, are you trying to be rude to Judge Putnam? Why on earth did you seat him practically in the doorway? I thought the draft might do him good. He seems so stuffy. Well, I invited him here for a reason. You know that. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. I don't know what got into me. I'll make it up to him right away. <laughs> I believe your wife's bewitched me, Carraway. <laughs> Why, I haven't talked so much about myself in years. Please don't stop now, Judge Putnam. Not when you're telling us about your home. Charleston must be beautiful at this time of year. It is, but I won't see it. Sometimes I feel it really belongs to the people who take care of it, much more than it does to me. Well, that's a very generous attitude, sir. Not only generous, I think, but wise. My father always says how foolish we are to think that we ever really possess anything in life. What do you mean, Anne? Well, I think Judge Putnam understands. No one ever really owns anything. All we have is a temporary use of it. It just isn't true to say my this and my that. Not even my wife? Oh, hey, <laughs> that's different. No, but, but, you know, I read something today which says what I mean better than anything I've ever heard. I'm ashamed to say I memorized it. I'd love to hear it, my dear. Well, I found it in an old book of poems. This particular poem was marked, and I thought to myself, the man who marked this poem is someone I understand and who understands me. Remember it, Alan? Remember what? My house, I say. But hark to the sunny doves that make my roof the arena of their loves. Our house, they say. And mine, the cat declares and spreads his golden fleece upon the chairs. And mine, the dog. And rises stiff with wrath if any alien foot profane the path. That's charming, Mrs. Galloway. <laughs> well, I may have left out a line or two, but that's the general idea. And I, I think Dr. Fort would like another brandy. Hmm? Oh, of course. <laughs> you see, Judge Putnam, poetry is one of Alan's hidden vices. Excuse me. It's a wonderful girl, Carraway. <laughs> yes, yes, she is. I'm a very lucky man. Oh, Alan, it was a nice party, wasn't it? Yes, it went beautifully. And uh, how about driving down to Middleburg tomorrow for a few days? Alan, could we? The house where you were born, the house where you grew up. Well, we can get an early start. Oh, probably... Alan, here's your book. Book? The book the poem came from. Well, that's not my book. But it is, darling. You sent it in to be rebound, remember? I'm afraid it's a mistake. But they had the name, Garraway, Middleburg, Virginia. No, it's a mistake. We'll, uh, we'll leave right after breakfast. Maybe a little isolated for you down there, darling. No telephone. No telephone. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like heaven. Alan, will you hate being cooped up with me for days? Give me a kiss and then tell me why you ask that. Because I love you. And I can't help noticing when we're alone how a lot of the glow you have with people sort of goes out of you. Anne, what's the matter? Oh, oh, I don't know. Nothing. I just want to be reassured, I guess. Well, consider yourself reassured. <laughs> About this book. If it is a mistake, I suppose I'll have to return it, but I hate to. What's the penalty for stealing books? Will you stop shoving that book at me? Can't you see I don't want to discuss it? Alan. Don't you know by now whose book it is? 
Even memorized a poem he marked. I told you it wasn't mine. It's... it's his. It's Michael's. He got you, didn't he, Anne? The sweet, gentle boy who loved poetry. He understands you. Isn't that what you said? I only memorized it because I thought it was yours. Yes, of course you did. And that, that was very unfair of me. I, I shouldn't take it out on you the way I feel about Mike. Please forgive me. I forgive you, Alan. Well, this is it, Anne. This is Middleburg. Alan, what a lovely old house. Oh, it's a dream. George! We're here, George. George? Just a caretaker, darling. Oh, oh. Well, aren't you going to get out of the car? <laughs> <laughs> now, back there are the stables, mm -hmm. and uh, the orchard's on the other side. Oh. And that Mrs. Foster you met, she lives beyond that stretch of woods there. Alan, you have a dog. Oh, yes, that's, that's Bait. I don't think Bait likes me very much. Dogs and horses never do. A oh. sign of bad character, I guess. <laughs> oh. Hello, Bait. Come here, boy. Hey, now, don't you back away from me. You're supposed to be glad to see me. Come here, dog. What you carrying on like that for? Come back. Well, Mr. Allen. Well, I'm sure glad to see you, sir. That was Bates, all right, ma'am. It just ain't used to strangers, that's all. George, this is Mrs. Garraway. Well, I'm glad to glad know you. Glad to know you, George. Place looks fine, George. It's beautifully kept. So neat. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. You can get the bags out of the car, George. I'll show Mrs. Mm. Garraway through the house. I've saved the living room for the last, Anne. Well, here it is. How charming. Well, I suppose it could be. It's a little grim right now. Not grim, darling. A little lonely, perhaps. A little unused. I'll open a shutter. Alan, I've been looking for pictures. I'd like so much to see a picture of your mother. Everything all right, sir? Oh, yes, George. Come in. I isn't there a picture of your mother somewhere? Well, there used to be, ma'am. I, uh, I, I took them down, Anne. I've stored away most of the personal stuff. Oh, I just... Would you like what? to drive over to Mrs. Foster's? No. Well, not if you're tired, dear, but I wanted to speak to her about buying a section of those woods we passed. You go ahead, darling. I'll unpack while you're going. All right. I'll be back by dinner time. <laughs> Mr. Galloway hasn't returned yet? No, ma'am. Well, did you have a nice walk? George, I just came from the stables. There was someone there. He, he just about scared me to death. A colored man, ma'am? Uh, big and fat? Yes. I'll teach that old Ben. No, he... no, it's all right, George. He went away. Ben, ben he, he, he's plumb out his head, ma'am. He don't mean no harm. I chase him off, but just keeps on coming right on back. He kept talking about the horses in the stable. Uh, I'll fix you a nice cup of tea, ma'am. No, no, George, wait. He warned me about the black stallion. Oh, yes, ma'am. He's a devil, that horse. Please don't go near him. He's Mr. Michael's horse, Ben said. Uh, yes, ma'am, he, he was. I, I think I will have that cup of tea, George. Good and strong, please. George, that must be Mr. Garraway. I'll go, ma'am. I'm in here, darling. Who was I... it, Anne? Who was just playing that piano? Alan, what, what, what darling, what's the Who matter? Who was playing that? Well, I was. You? Why did you play that piece? Well, I, I don't know. I play it often. Father taught it to me. Your, your father taught you that? Yes, he, he does play the piano. I'd forgotten. That's a piece that anyone might play, mightn't they? Alan, you're ice cold. Tell me what's wrong. I... My mother died sitting at that piano, playing that piece. You see, Ann, Middleburg is not all happy memories for me. Alan, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean to upset you, darling. That's all right. I wish I could have known your mother. But finding out that she loved that piece, too, makes me know her a little, doesn't it? That's a bond between us we didn't know about. Yes. Well, I, I guess dinner will be ready soon. I'll go clean up a bit. Oh, uh, bring them in there, George. Yes, sir. I'll uh, fix the cocktails, ma'am. Thank you. George. Yes, sir. Mrs. Garraway must have been a wonderful woman. Yes, sir. She was. She was an invalid for a number of years, wasn't she? Yes, sir. Laid up there in her bed, never complaining, always smiling. This piano must have been a great comfort to her when she did get up. Piano, ma'am? Well, Miss Garraway never played no piano. She didn't. 
But she died sitting at that piano, didn't she? No, she died upstairs in her room, ma'am. George, you can serve dinner anytime it's ready. Yes, sir. I'm starving. Be ready just in a minute, sir. Cocktails. We can use these, huh, darling? George's cocktails are the best. Almost good enough for you. Well, to us, darling. Yes, Alan. To us. Our stars will return in Act Two of Undercurrent in a moment. Libby, you look positively dreamy-eyed. What Prince Charming are you thinking about now? Oh, not a prince, but a king. Charles II of England. Hasn't he been dead since 1685? Yes, but Douglas Fairbanks Jr. makes his romantic and adventurous exile really come alive in Universal International's new picture, The Exile. Douglas not only stars, but he wrote and produced the picture, too. He had his hair dyed dark for his role as King Charles, and my, he's handsome. Athletic as ever? Oh, yes, indeed, John. You know, he's one of the few Hollywood stars who performs his own stunts for the camera. He had a very narrow escape during the filming when he fell 19 feet to the ground from a windmill. Hmm. I uh, understand there are some beautiful women in the exile, too. Oh, but definitely. There's Miss Maria Montez as the beautiful countess in her most dramatic role to date. And Douglas's own discovery, an absolutely lovely blonde, Miss Paul Crosset. Quite a cosmopolitan pair. Maria Montez was born in the Dominican Republic, wasn't she? Yes, mm mm-hmm. And Paul Crosset in Tahiti. She's also lived all over Europe and the Far East. There was a lot of travel talk the day I was visiting them, and a lot of chatter about one thing, how to live out of a suitcase. You'll be interested in this, John. Paul told Maria and me her favorite traveling trick. She always had her maid tuck a box of Lux Flakes into her suitcase. A tip to any traveler who wants to look fresh from tip to toe. Especially down to her stocking toes. Luxing stockings at night is so easy, and nylons dry so quickly, they're ready to put on again in the morning, fresh and smooth fitting. By luxing stockings frequently, a girl doesn't need to carry so many extras or own so many either. That's right, Libby. Because scientific strain tests prove that nylons last twice as long with Lux. That's just like getting an extra pair every time you buy a pair of stockings. It was really amazing how much more quickly stockings went into runs when they were washed with a strong soap or rubbed with cake soap. Another thing girls like about Lux is the way it keeps nylon stocking colors fresh looking longer. That's important with the new dark shades that are so smart now. Right, Libby. It's no wonder that so many girls count on Lux Flakes to keep stockings lovely longer. Here's William Keeley, your producer at the microphone. Intermission's over, and it's time for Act Two of Undercurrent, starring Catherine Hepburn as Anne Hamilton and Robert Taylor as Alan Garraway. It's been a strange and troubled 24 hours for Anne Garraway. Clashing against the peace and loveliness of Middleburg are the tormenting doubts of what Alan has told her, his brother, Michael, his mother. It's after dinner now. Alan has to drive to the village. And when he's gone, Anne has a plan. You sure you don't want to come to the village with me, Anne? Do you mind, darling? I am tired. That uh, telegram this afternoon, it was from John Wormsley. He's in charge of the San Francisco plant. You'll uh, be meeting him soon. Oh, Alan. Well, I'm sorry, darling. If you'd rather stay on here... Oh, no. If you're going to San Francisco, so am I. (laughs) You'll like San Francisco. Well, I won't be long. If you need anything, just call George. George, what is it? Miss Gerway. I said, what is it, George? Nothing, ma'am. N- n- nothing. What were you afraid of just now? You knew I was in here. No, ma'am. I hear the car drive off, and I, I thought you'd gone on, too. No lights on in the room here. I, I turned them off. Who did you think was in here, George? Who used to sit at this piano and play that piece? Oh, please, Miss Ma'am. It wasn't nobody, ma'am. That's not true. Who did you think it was? Did you think it was Michael? No, ma'am. But Michael did play that piece, didn't he? Oh, Miss Gerway, please. Don't tell Mr. Allen I was talking about Mr. Michael. I won't tell him, George. How he must hate him. He's tried to take every reminder of Michael out of this house. Erase him completely. No pictures, nothing. George? Yes, sir? Mr. Allen has been terribly hurt. 
We've got to find a way to help him. Just, just tell me what I can do. There's not much you can do, George. We'll be leaving soon for San Francisco. What has to be done, I must try to do myself. I'm a prize dope, Anne. Of all the places to take you, your first night in San Francisco, another nightclub. But you said Mr. Wormsley was to meet you here. Oh, well, I know. Alan, who was that girl, the girl you spoke to as we came in here? Sylvia Burton, an old friend. Just an old friend? Well, sort of. You jealous? <laughs> you bet. She's far too lovely for an old friend. You want to know something? Yeah. You've got it all over, Sylvia, in every way. People wouldn't even notice her with you in the room. Darling, you're wonderful. Catty about every other woman. Good evening. Oh, hello, Wormsley. May I present Mrs. Garraway? How do you do? I, uh, I'm very glad to meet you, Mrs. Garraway. Pull up a chair. How are things going? Very well, sir. Things are really breaking in Seattle. I suggest you fly up there as soon as you can. What's the matter with Henderson? Can't he handle the new business? Well, there's not much he can do without real authority, sir. He has as much authority as you have. Not quite, sir. Anyway, I brought some contracts along. If you care to look them over. Do you mind, darling? No, you go ahead and look them over. I'll run into the powder room for a moment. <laughs> I, uh... I just saw Miss Burton. Did you? Has your wife met her yet? Those contracts, Wormsley. Let me have them. Oh, hello, Mrs. Garraway. Oh, Miss Burton. How do you like San Francisco? It's wonderful. So many bridges. Yes. So many to cross. I beg your pardon? Um, what do you hear from Michael? Oh, nothing much. Did you ever meet him, Mrs. Garraway? No, I haven't, but I'm looking forward to it. You know, there have been some pretty unpleasant rumors about Michael. Well, whatever they are, I'm sure they're not true. Sorry. It's strange, but I was beginning to have a funny feeling that Michael might be dead. Oh, no, no I'm, I'm sure Alan would know. Yes, I suppose he would. You know, Miss Burton... When I saw you before, I... I wondered who it was you reminded me of. It's me. Not our features, exactly. Ju just something intangible. Have you noticed it? No. Is that your glove on the floor there? Oh, thanks. Maybe it's the way we dress or walk or something. Or maybe... Miss Burton. Miss Burton. Well, that's funny. Why should she just walk out like that? <laughs> Well, what do you think of our plan, Mrs. Garraway? I'm very impressed, Mr. Wormsley. Well, I imagine your husband's in Seattle by now. Is, uh, is there anything else around here you'd care to see? Yes, I'd like to see some photographs. Photographs? It's <laughs> silly of me, isn't it? But it's such a big plant now and so impersonal. What was it like when it started, Mr. Wormsley? The plant, the employees. Who was here at the beginning? Well, there's a picture on that wall behind you, Mrs. Garraway. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Oh, there's Alan. Alan in the overalls. And you, Mr. Wormsley. Yes. But those other three men? Well, two of them are still with us. The other one is dead. Who was he, Mr. Wormsley? His name was Carl Stoyer. Wasn't my husband's brother working here then? Why isn't he in the picture? He was at his ranch the day it was taken. His ranch? Oh, oh, yes. What's happened to the ranch? Well, Mr. Garraway took it over. Alan owns it? You know, I'd like to see that place. I'm afraid that's not very practical. It's, uh, it's quite remote. Fog is bad this time of year. There is a caretaker. But, but I'd, I'd like to spend the day in the country. Could you give me the keys, Mr. Wormsley? I'll send them to your hotel in the morning. And would it be possible to draw me a sort of map as to how to get there? I'll enclose a map with the keys. You've been very kind, Mr. Wormsley. Thank you. Good day, Mrs. Garraway. <laughs> Looking for someone, miss? Oh, oh. <laughs> Hello. I'm Mrs. Alan Garraway. How do you do? Are you the caretaker? Why, uh, yes, yes. I've just been inspecting the house. Well, I, I was just about to leave, but if there's anything I can do for you... Tell me, did you know Michael Garraway? 
Yes, I, I did. I'm a close neighbor up the road. He left here very suddenly, didn't he? Yes. I guess he was a rather unpredictable person. Well, <laughs> well, anyway, I, I think this is one of the most charming houses I've ever seen. It has, well, dignity. Doesn't look as though it had been shut up at all, does it? No. No, it doesn't. It looks, well, as though it were waiting for someone. I had a feeling coming in here that time was standing still. But time doesn't stand still anywhere, does it? Oh, yes, it does. Haven't you ever had a feeling of complete peace and contentment? That's what I felt when I came in here. Nothing to fear. Nothing to think about. This was, well, peaceful. And time stands still. <laughs> you probably think that's foolish. I suppose it is. No, I don't think so. I agree with you about the house. It is peaceful. Is that surf, I hear? Are we that close to the ocean? Oh, yes, if you'd like, I'll show it to you. It's none of my business, Mrs. <laughs> Garraway, but did you have any special reason to come out here? Well, it was such a nice day, and I thought I... No. I came out here to learn more about Michael Garraway. You, uh, you better watch the path. It's sort of rocky here. Everyone seems to be so vague about him, except my husband, of course. I don't know why I'm bothering you with all this. There's the ocean, Mrs. Garroway. Golly. Golly, it's beautiful, isn't it? You know, you know, it's amazing. Michael had so much. Why do people do the things they do to themselves? Why doesn't someone step in and stop them, help them? What about those people who refuse to be helped? Useless to even try. Oh, no, it's not. It's never useless. Not if your chance of helping them is one in a million. You feel quite deeply about it, don't you? You bet I do. My, that sea is near. Is there good swimming? No, there's a, there's a riptide. But it looks so calm. You can't always see the undercurrent, but it's there. Like life. <laughs> yes, that's right. Only well, fog's starting to roll in. It'll be getting dark soon. You going back to the house? Yes, in a minute. You, you go ahead. Thanks for taking me around, and forgive my philosophic outburst. Don't apologize for that. I think it was very well said. Goodbye, Mrs. Galloway. His house. Michael's house. Just as he left it. But walls can't talk and books and chairs and... What are you doing here? Alan! What are you doing here? Alan, you frightened me so... I came here looking for something. <clears throat> I asked you not to pry. I asked you to forget about Mike. Alan, you didn't leave Seattle just because... Ormsley telephoned me. He said you'd ask him for the keys. Yes, I thought it was important that I come. You're my wife, Anne. You've never even seen Mike. And yet he's managed to get a hold on you and make trouble between Darling, us. Darling, I'm only he trying... He had a diabolic cleverness about pushing people around. Always knew how to get his own way. You keep saying had and knew. Alan, is he dead? How should I know if he's dead? I hope he is. Alan, how can you... How much do you think I can stand? He's got you sneaking around corners trying to find out things about him. Well, what have you discovered? I'm here to help. Let's find out everything we can about him. A man who likes music and books, wouldn't you say? The strong, silent, philosophical type. He'd have read you poetry and told you whimsical stories about his neighbors. You'd have fallen for that, wouldn't you, Anne? Alan, I'm sorry. I know you're sorry, but that doesn't help. Why couldn't you do as I asked? If there's anything else you want to know, ask me now. Don't ask Wormsley or the natives or the bellboys at the hotel. Ask me. I'll tell you anything if you'll only stop bringing him into our life. I was wrong to come here, Alan, if you didn't want me to. But for you to shout at me and treat me as though I were a criminal. Alan, whatever I did, I did for us. To try to find out what it is that comes between us because of him. Alan, it's our life together that he's hurting. Our marriage. And I want our marriage. We'd better start back to town. Do you want to go up to our rooms, Anne, or would you rather have dinner first? I'd rather go up if you don't mind. I'd like to. Alan, wait. What's the matter? Listen. Oh, Garraway, shrewd, all right. His plan was all set for reconversion. Garraway knows all about reconversion. Did you ever see his wife? Anne, please. No, I want to listen. I saw her in Washington the day they arrived. She couldn't have looked out Of course, the poor girl had on her Sunday best, but really. We can go up now, Alan. <laughs> What are you thinking about, Anne? Those two women in the lobby. You going to let a couple of gossips throw you? I'm thrown by the truth. I was rather dowdy that first night in Washington. You expected me to be, didn't you? I what? You could have waited to have me meet your friends. 
But the truth is, if no one saw the before, you wouldn't get the credit for the after, would you? Why should I want to do a thing like that? So you could exhibit me as your very own invention, like the Garraway distance control. What do you mean by that? You know, Alan... I think I have a glimmering now of why you married me. I want to know what you meant about the distance control. I meant nothing about it. All right. What else do you think? Why did I marry you? You wanted another girl, but she fell in love with someone else. I happened to remind you of her, only I was so terribly admiring of you. And you thought if you could make me outshine her... Oh, you're mad, Anne. Yes, Alan. I think sometimes I am. I have a feeling as though I were living in a dream... Haunted by your obsession, your hatred for your brother, all around us. And, and things between us look pretty black right now. It's hard to talk. But I want to tell you that, that I love you. The way I acted at the ranch was unforgivable. I'll never speak that way to you again. I have to go back to Seattle. You'll have a couple of days to think. And when you do, try to keep a little old-fashioned trust and blind faith in our marriage. I want our marriage, too, Anne. It's very important to me. Please try. Yes, Alan. I'll try. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a moment, we'll return with Act Three of Undercurrent. The role of a script girl in producing a great picture is seldom fully appreciated by the public. Her meticulous attention to detail is of the utmost importance to a successful production. Our guest tonight is one of those unsung heroines. She's Miss Isla Jacobus, script girl for Clarence Brown, producer-director of Song of Love. Metro Golden Mare's romantic love story of Clara and Robert Schumann, starring Catherine Hepburn. It must have been a fascinating picture to work on, Miss Jacobus. It certainly was, Mr. Keeley. I learned so much about the life of Schumann, and the music in the picture is so thrilling. With Paul Henry to interpret the sensitive and celebrated composer, Robert Walker as Johannes Brahms, Henry Daniel as Franz Liszt, and a brilliant supporting cast... It's bound to be a superb picture. Especially with Catherine Hepburn as Schumann's devoted wife, who inspired some of his greatest music. Well, Catherine brings glamour and rare ability to every role. Her performance here tonight confirms that. She looks stunning, too, in Song of Love, in Clara Schumann's romantic 19th century costumes. And Mr. Kennedy would certainly have been impressed with the gentle care those costumes got. You mean Lux care, of course, Miss Jacobus. <laughs> Naturally. Replacing one of those costumes would have meant a lot of time and expense. So, when a garment had to be freshened for retakes, they always used Lux Flakes. And the studio wardrobe mistress told me that kept replacements down to a minimum. You must learn a lot of interesting things in the course of your work, Miss Jacobus. But none more important than clothes care, Mr. Kennedy. Important to any girl, I mean. I wouldn't trust my own blouses and nice washables to anything but Lux. I figure when experts choose Lux Flakes, it's wise to follow their advice. Yes, the experts know how much longer Lux Care keeps washables lovely. Actual tests have proved that wrong washing methods fade colors discouragingly soon. <clears throat> Lux Care kept them lovely up to three times as long. That's important to any girl these days when prices of new things are so high. Today, more than ever, Lux Care is thrifty care. Thank you for coming tonight, Miss Isla Jacobus. Back now to our producer, William Keeley. We continue with Act Three of Undercurrent, starring Catherine Hepburn as Anne and Robert Taylor as Alan. It's the following morning. With Alan back in Seattle, Anne is making an uninvited call on Sylvia Burton. It's very nice of you to see me, Miss Burton. You have a reason for coming here? There are some questions I'm trying to find the answer to. I'm rather curious about a few things myself. As far as Alan is concerned, I despise him. Does that answer one of your questions? Not quite. I love him. 
But it's not Alan I want to know about. It's Michael. I can imagine. All I know is that he and Alan had a terrible fight. Michael disappeared. But he seems to be coming up more and more in our lives, wherever we go, whatever we do. I've got to know more about him. My marriage, my, my happiness, my future seem to depend on it. And you'd like to know how close Mike and I were. <clears throat> well, we weren't. I tried, but Mike wouldn't have it. I used to think it was because he had some sort of funny sense of loyalty since I'd met him through Alan. He was that thing you have to look for with a microscope. A gentleman. And that's the man your husband spread those lies about stealing money. I believe my husband, Miss Burton. Nonsense. You think he's lying, I know he is. Why? Because I've been through this myself. When Mike disappeared, I went crazy trying to find out what had happened to him. And did you find out? Only that he'd been at his ranch. That was the last anyone saw of him except your husband. You see, I still think Mike is dead. You mean he was killed in the war? No, I don't mean he was killed in the war. Why hasn't he written to someone? His friends at the plant, his neighbors at the ranch, or a hundred other people he knows. Lots of us would like to know what happened at that last meeting, Mrs. Garraway. Ask your husband... What kind of a fight was it and what happened to Mike? How dare you speak to me this way, way Miss Burton? I, I should never have come here. Forgive me. It isn't such a shocking idea, Mrs. Garraway. Not when you've lived with it for a while. Hello? Mrs. Alan Garraway? Yes. One moment, please. Seattle is calling. Here's your party, sir. Anne? Yes, Alan? Oh, Anne, I miss you, darling. I miss you very much. I haven't been able to think or concentrate on anything but you. I'm, I'm so glad you said that, Alan. I'm so confused. I, oh, don't, I'm... darling, don't, don't. Anne, I, I have to leave for Baltimore in the morning. I can't very well get out of it. That's all right, Alan. I think it could work out well for us. If you like, you could go on to Middleburg, take the train. By the time you get there, I'll be through in Baltimore and can join you. Yes, Alan, yes. I'm going to devote the next few weeks to us, Anne. We'll have a real honeymoon in Middleburg. You wait and see. I love you, Anne. I love you. I wish I'd known you was coming to Middleburg, Miss Garraway. I wish you'd told me. Why, George, I don't think you're very glad to see me. Oh, no, ma'am, no, no. I'm real pleased. Uh, when will Mr. Allen be here? He'll be here later tonight. George, why do you wish I'd let you know I was coming here? Well, just, just, just so I'd have a little time to fix things up. Such as out there, George, out there by the stables? A little time to tell whoever it is out there to go away? Miss Garraway. There's nobody out there, Miss Garraway. I don't mean old Ben, either. Just now, when I was walking, the dog saw him. Bait saw him. Bait was all excited, jumping up and down and wagging his tail. But you didn't see nobody, ma'am. No, no, I didn't. It was too dark, and I, I was frightened, I suppose. I came straight back here. Oh, let it pass, please, Miss Garraway. Let it pass. I can't, George. I'm not frightened now. I'm going to go back to the stables and look for myself. <laughs> Bate, Bate, come here, come here, boy, come here. There's no one here now, is there, Bate? But there was. And you saw him, didn't you? You saw Michael. He's alive, isn't he? I thought that Sylvia Burton was right, that Alan had killed him. But everything that Alan said about him is true. Michael's here and he's hiding. That's why, George. Oh, Alan, Alan, how could I? How could I? It's all right, Bates. You can stop barking. It's no way to welcome me home. Hello, Alan. Mike. Take it easy. Better keep our voices down. Your wife's in the house. You've seen my wife? Don't worry. She didn't see me. Why did you come back? Wouldn't you rather know why I went away? I didn't steal any money, Alan. You've been a long time denying it. It'd be kind of tough to prove. You had the books pretty well rigged. But that's not what kept me away. It was Carl Stoyer. Stoyer's dead. Yes. Dead and buried. Just a nice old German refugee who lived for one thing only. To get back at the Nazis. Do you remember that invention he was working on? Every man at the plant was working on an invention of some kind or other. That's right. But only Stoyer died. The coroner said it was an accident. He 
He fell down the cellar steps. What's that got to do with me? It's got a lot to do with you. Stoyer had a pet name for that invention of his. His fan, he called it. He used to say, my fan will fix the Nazis. Your brother and me, we know. Someday my fan will pay them back. Fan. Fan, I, I couldn't figure it out until it dawned on me that fan is a German word. It means distance. Fan steering. Long distance control. That's why Stoyer died. He was murdered by somebody who wanted his invention. The distance controller was mine. It was Stoyer's, and it's made millions for you. Well, has the money been worth it, Alan? Has it been worth killing for? You can't prove any of this. Maybe not. Is Wormsley the only other one who guessed? Because you're paying him off, aren't you? Anyway, I, I wanted to get out of the whole mess. That's why I disappeared. But it seems it has to be faced after all. I have met your wife. Here? Today? No, at the ranch. She thought I was the caretaker. She's a fine girl, Alan, but she doesn't know about Stoya, does she? Well, I'm here to make sure she finds out. You think I killed Stoya? What makes you think I wouldn't kill you? I believe you're capable of trying. No. Once I could have killed you, but not now. I can't kill you any more than I can give Anne up. I'm going to keep her, Mike, for as long as I can. A minute, an hour, as long as I can. How can you think you have a right What to... gives a man a right? Does love because I love her. You can take everything else, but not her, Mike, not her. I, I never thought I would, but I'm crawling to you. She loves me. She's helping me. I, I've got a chance now. I can be all right. I never could before. What chance does she have, Alan? I'll tell her. Only I... I'll have to do it in my own time. Just a little time. That's all I'm asking. Until I'm sure of her. I think you can be sure of her. Well, I... I guess there's nothing left for me to do. She'll go along with you. I'll stay out of it. But tell her, Alan. Tell her, because if you don't, I won't be able to stay out of it. I'm going to see that she gets her chance, too. Anne, darling, wake up, dear. I'm back. Alan. Oh, Alan, Alan. Oh, forgive me, darling. Forgive me. Forgive you? I've been so wrong, Alan. I've got to tell you something, and I'm, I'm so deeply ashamed. I, I thought such crazy things about you. I, I thought you'd killed your brother. No, darling, listen to me. I thought that. And I was going away and never see you again. You were going to leave me? I couldn't have stayed. I couldn't have endured... You couldn't have endured living with a murderer. But it's all over, Alan. I know he's alive. I'm able to breathe again. Yes, Anne, it's, it's over. No one will ever come between us again. Alan, I want you to listen to me. You remember that I once told you that Michael was your obsession? Yes. I was wrong. I think he's my obsession. I want to drive him away. But there's, there's something unfinished somehow. I think if I could see him, hear him speak, then I'd, I'd know him the way you do, as a man, not a shadow, someone who is cruel and wrong and who has hurt you. Oh, I was so wrong about him. Everyone was. Everyone? Who did you speak to about Mike? Sylvia Burton. She thought you had killed him. And you believed her? Were you glad she was wrong? Glad, oh, yes, Alan, yes. Then why are you unhappy? Well, that's what I'm trying to tell you. He, he still... Here, in, in, in my mind, somehow. You, you've got to help me, Alan. I don't understand it. Do you understand? Yes, I think I do. You're in love with him. No. You're in love with him, aren't you? Oh, no, no. How could I be in love with someone I've never seen? You've seen a lot of Mike. A book, a poem, his house, a girl who once loved him. Aren't you jealous, Anne, of Sylvia Burton? Why did you go to her? What did you really want to know? Alan, please. You'd go to anyone who could talk about Mike. You wanted to believe what they had to tell you. You never believed me. You don't believe me now. Stop it, Alan. Stop it. It wasn't my happiness, our happiness. You were trying to find it was him. That's not true. You were so relieved just now. Not because I hadn't killed him, but because he was alive. You'll go on looking for him, won't you, Anne? And after you find him, then what? Will you leave me? Alan, Alan. Don't you see what you've done? You'll never leave me, Anne. Never. <laughs> Early. George! Did you sleep well? George is gone. I sent him into town. He won't be back until evening. Alan, Alan, no. I, I thought I'd go for a ride. That stallion will break down the stall unless he gets some exercise. I, th I thought we could. Uh... Why are you trembling? Here, sit down. Have some coffee. 
Alan, I... Don't be afraid, Anne. Fear is no good, I know. But now I'm finally free. Drink your coffee, Anne. <laughs> your hand's shaking. You're not going to be afraid the rest of your life, are you, Anne? Are you? Why run to your room? You can't lock yourself in. I've got the key. Hey there. Anyone up? Oh, hello, Mrs. Foster. Come in. Hello, Alan. Your wife up yet? Yes, I think so. Shall I call her? Well, it's a fine morning for a ride. Yes, it is. You must have had the same idea. You're dressed for it. Yes, I... Oh, there you are. Welcome home, my dear. How about coming over for breakfast and a ride? I'd like to very much. Wonderful. I'll expect you in half an hour. How's that? But I I can be ready in just a moment. Well, Biscuits for breakfast, Mrs. Foster? With my own two hands. And just wait till you taste them. There's nothing like them in the whole world. Mrs. Foster, there's something I must tell you. I must speak to you. That's fine, dear. We'll have a leisurely breakfast and all morning to get acquainted in. See you soon, dear. I'll walk along with you, Mrs. Foster. I'll have to saddle up the horses. What's the matter with the bride, Alan? A quarrel? Not a quarrel, exactly. Oh, don't worry. It's natural the first year, getting acquainted. What horse are you going to ride, Alan? The stallion, naturally. Well, you just make sure you don't give him to her. He's a mean one, that brute. Alan. Alan, did we have to come this way? Can't you handle your horse? I gave you the mare. But I, I'm not a good rider, Alan. This cliff... Why, I thought if we took the trail along the cliff, you'd enjoy the view. It's beautiful, isn't it? Alan, keep your horse back, please. It's easy to say. I can't hold him in. But there's no room for both of us. Yeah, it is narrow, isn't it? Quite a drop to the gorge, Anne. 200 feet. Alan, you're pushing me. Use your spurs. Go on ahead. Alan, Alan, please don't. Please don't. You want please. to leave me, Anne, don't you? You want to go to Michael? Well, I'll send you to him now. Alan, no, no. Hey, you little fool. Go on. Run away. See how far you'll get. Anne, what happened? Did your horse uh, throw you? It's quite a bruise on your uh, head, or did you hit a low branch? Oh. Uh, hurts, doesn't it, Anne? Uh, but nothing is going to hurt you anymore. Michael. I'm going to kill you, Anne. Uh, They'll think you broke your stupid little neck with your horse. Uh, hey! Hello. Hello, doctor. This is Mrs. Foster. There's been a terrible accident. Alan Galloway is dead. That stallion of his must have gone crazy or something. Kicked him to death, it looks like. You better come right out, doctor. His wife's been badly hurt, too. That music's beautiful, Anne. Who's playing? My father. He always does well by Chopin. I like your father, Anne. I'm so glad he was able to come down here. So am I, Mrs. Foster. You're all right, Anne. Staying on here at Middleburg all these weeks, doing your getting well here. It took courage to face it out. Most people would have run away. Hard to run away in a wheelchair. (laughs) Dr. Hill says by next week you can burn that wheelchair. But that isn't what I mean. That's not what I mean either. No, I feel I have something to do and that I must do it here. That's really why I stayed. Not because I have courage. I haven't. Here you are, darling, one of George's priceless eggnogs. Father. Well? Who's playing the piano? You have a visitor. Oh, no, no, I can't see him now. I'm not ready yet. I can't. You sent for him, Anne. Yes, I sent for him. I'll wheel you in. I can manage alone, thanks. You're Michael, aren't you? Yes. I'm sorry, Anne. I I should have told you that day at the ranch. I think I knew. Not at the ranch, but afterwards. I think I knew. You sent for me. Yes. I think I'd have come in any case. I was just waiting until you were well. It seems I'm a a very rich woman. Yes. It's wrong for me to have it. It belongs to you, Michael. No. No, it belongs to someone who's dead now. Carl Stoyer. His heirs, possibly. They must have it. Then, Michael, I'm a bad liar. I didn't send for you because of the money. The lawyers could have handled that. I wanted to know you. Now that you do. I'm happy to know you, Michael. Thank you. There are other things that I must tell you. I I won't forget Alan. I, I loved him very much. Not at the end. It was gone then. But I I did love him. I know. 
Anne, I almost got you killed. I was here the night before. I saw Alan, talked to him. I should never have left. I looked for you, Michael. I went away that night because... because I was full of my guilt about my feelings for you. I... I had no business to feel the way I did about you, my... my brother's wife. I won't talk about it now. Someday. Yes, Michael. stars will return for their curtain calls in a moment. Libby, have you any fashion tips for the ladies in our audience tonight? One very important one, Mr. Kennedy. I've noticed that some girls who are wearing the new longer skirts think that lengthening their dresses is enough. Actually, they need longer slips, too. Otherwise, the gap is often apparent and the skirts don't hang gracefully. Are the makers of slips cutting them longer now? Oh, yes. But you don't necessarily have to buy a whole new slip wardrobe. Why, imagine how annoyed Lux girls would be. After all, their Lux slips still have lots of good looks left in them. Well, naturally, I know that Lux care keeps slips lovely longer, but how can it make them longer? (laughs) Well, it can't do that, John. But there are some simple tricks a clever girl can work. For instance, she can sew a deep lace ruffle on the bottom of a too short slip, gain a good two or three inches that way, or cut an even strip off the slip near the bottom and fill in with lace insertion or a contrasting color. Then stitch back the snipped-off piece with a deep seam. All that lace sounds pretty, Libby, but is it practical? Why, of course, with Lux Care. If careless girls wash a slip the wrong way, handle it roughly or use strong soap or hot water, why, naturally, it'll be sad-looking in a short time. The color will fade and the lace is apt to tear. But after all, practically everybody knows that with Lux Care... Undies stay lovely three times as long. Actual washing tests prove that. As a matter of fact, Libby, Lux girls can afford more new slips on their budget, too. Instead of replacing drab, faded ones so often, they can use that money to buy extra new ones, have three times as many slips without spending any more. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. I'm sure we never could have enough of stars like Katherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor. And here they are, back at the footlights, to receive our thanks for two superb performances. Catherine, I'm happy our efforts to bring you to this stage tonight have been so splendidly rewarded. (laughs) I'm glad you feel I didn't let a good neighbor down, Bill, and I'm certainly happy Bob got back from his hunting trip in time to join us. Well, as much as I like hunting and fishing, I wouldn't have missed tonight's show, Kate. Flying your own plane must be very handy in getting you to where the fish are biting, Bob. (laughs) That's a big help when your time is limited. I understand, Catherine, that your newest picture is about to have its premiere in New York. It opens at the Music Hall on Thursday, Bill. Your pictures have always been favorites at the Music Hall, Kate. And the advanced critics here agree how wonderful you are in those concert sequences. Yes, Barbara and I saw the picture at the studio, and the scenes with you at the piano were really great. Well, praise from Caesar is praise indeed. That's right, Bob. You did used to be a musician, didn't you? (laughs) Well, I studied music at Pomona College until I got sidetracked into pictures. (laughs) From what the preview fans said about your new Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture, The High Wall, you were certainly sidetracked in the right direction. Well, I hope (laughs) they like it. On the subject of pictures, what's the news for next week, Bill? Next Monday night, we usher in our 14th year on the air. And to celebrate, we're bringing our audience one of the greatest works of an author whose popularity has never been equaled. It's J. Arthur Rank's exciting production... Great expectations. Charles Dickens at his best, Bill. Who do you have as stars? Our stars are Robert Cummings, Anne Blythe, Howard De Silva, and Lee J. Cobb. Great Expectations is a thrilling, dramatic story that should hold the interest of our listeners of every age. It should indeed, Bill. A play that nobody should miss. Congratulations and good night. Good night, Bill. Good night, Bob and Catherine. All our thanks. Lieber Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Robert Cummings, Anne Blythe, Howard De Silva, and Lee J. Cobb in Great Expectations. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. This is Community Chess Time, a time that unites Americans of all faiths and creeds 
behind the great work of the community chest. Experience has proved that this is the best way, the truly American way, of providing help to the unfortunate in your community. Each year, your local community chest helps support vital services, such as hospitals, clinics, homes for the aged, aid to the handicapped, and youth organizations. The theme of this year's campaign is everybody benefits, everybody gives. So give generously all you can afford when you're approached by one of your fellow citizens within the next few weeks. A contribution to your local community chest is an investment in the future of our nation. Catherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor appeared by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of Green Dolphin Street, starring Lana Turner and Van Heflin. Heard in our cast tonight were Ira Grossell as Michael and Francis Robinson as Sylvia. This program is rebroadcast to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Great Expectations with Robert Cummings, Anne Blythe, Howard De Silva, and Lee J. Cobb. For lighter, better-tasting cakes, try Spry, the pure, creamy, all-vegetable shortening with the special cake-making secret. Hear them say, boy, what a cook. Rely on Spry. S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Great Expectations with Robert Cummings, Anne Blythe, Howard De Silva, and Lee J. Cobb. Stay tuned to My Friend Irma, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Good evening. This is Peter Tobin introducing... Lux Radio Theatre Tonight and every Monday night at this time Lux Radio Theatre presents for your entertainment the finest in radio drama This week we present Home and Beauty by W. Somerset Maugham a comedy set in London immediately after the First World War what happens when a young woman finds herself married to two men at the same time, both of whom she loves dearly? After her husband, Major Bill Cardew, has been reported killed in France, lovely, frivolous Victoria marries his best friend, Major Frederick Lowndes. Their domestic bliss is suddenly and hilariously disrupted by Bill's return from the dead. Victoria adores both her husbands, and they both adore her. But while the two men argue the toss in the most gentlemanly way, Victoria finds her own way of unravelling the matrimonial tangle. Listen in a few moments to Home and Beauty, adapted by Helen Cunningham, produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Rolf Jacobs, and directed by Delphine Lethbridge. Here's an idea that will make you feel soft and beautiful. And you can do it this evening. Just take a long, creamy bath with Lux Beauty Soap. Sink back and relax and let the extra rich lather of Lux soften your skin to film star smoothness. Think of it. The creamy, moisturizing lather making your skin silky and relaxed. The precious perfume of Lux caressing you all over. Lux is the one beauty soap chosen by most beautiful Hollywood film stars. They choose it for its rich, moisturizing lather and precious perfume. Lux, a beauty treatment as you bathe. Shield gives a confidence that actually shows. In your eye. Put on Shield deodorant and it's dry in seconds. That's the way it stays right through the day. Shield never makes you feel sticky. It just protects you and keeps you dry, feminine, fresh. Wear Shield and the only thing you show is confidence. Shield gives a confidence that actually shows. In your eyes, in your eyes. And now, Act One of tonight's Lux Radio Theatre presentation, Home and Beauty.
Oh, Victoria, there's someone downstairs to see you. Who is there? Who? Mr. Lester Payton. I didn't know you were still seeing anything of him. He has been rather attentive lately. Yeah. Well, you should have married him instead of Freddie when poor Bill was killed in France. He's made a fortune during the war. He's got a Rolls Royce. And he can uh, wangle things like butter and sugar. Mother, don't talk like that. Freddie was Bill's best friend. It's only natural I should turn to him for comfort. And I adore him. Oh, he's a little unreasonable at times, but then so was Bill. I adored him, too. Yes. <laughs> and they both adored um, me. All the same, both so I... handsome. Oh, look at their photographs side by side on my dressing table. Yes. And both dear souls. I flatter myself there aren't many women who'd be married to two dear souls. I know, darling, but... Bill was very fond of Freddy and particularly wanted our child to be called after him. And that's why I called him Frederick. Although he was born three months after poor Bill was killed. I know. And that's why now you've married Freddy and had a son, you called, called him William. <sighs> yes, I thought it was only fair. And Freddy agreed. By the way, where is Freddy? Oh, dear, I'm absolutely furious with him. He promised to take me out to luncheon, but he never turned up. Didn't even telephone. I think it's too bad of him. He may be dead for all I know. What about Mr. Payton? Are you going to see him? I mean, you can't keep him waiting all afternoon. Oh, I may as well. Go and bring him up, Mother. You're... Don't you receive him up here? In your bedroom? Well, certainly it's the only room in the house apart from the nursery where there's a fire. You know how difficult it is to get coal. Oh, yes, we mustn't keep Mr. Payton waiting. Just give me a moment to put on some fresh lipstick, will you? I hope you didn't mind being dragged up all these stairs, Mr. Payton. We have to be frightfully economical with our coal, you know. I can only afford to have a fire in my bedroom. You're not going to tell me that you have any trouble in getting coal. Why on earth didn't you let me know? You don't mean to say you could get me some. Well, it's quite out of the question that a pretty woman shouldn't have everything she wants. Oh, I told Freddie that I felt sure he could wangle it, but... Uh, well, I mean, what's the use of being at the war office if you can't have some sort of pull? But he couldn't. Well, leave it to me. I'll see what I can do. Oh, how marvellous of you. Now that these men are coming back from the front, no one will look at us poor devils who stayed at home if we don't make ourselves useful. Well, you only stayed because it was your duty. Oh, I volunteered, you know. I didn't wait to be called up. But the government said to me, you're a shipbuilder, go on building ships. So I, I built them ships. And the little bird has whispered to me that the government intends to show its appreciation of your services in the honours list. Oh, one doesn't ask for that. One's glad to have been able to do one's bit. Oh, how true that is. That's just what I feel. Yes, Victoria's worked herself to exhaustion. I don't know how many committees I sat on or bazaars I opened. That's true. At the beginning of the war, you know, I worked in a canteen. But I had to give that up because I could never go out to lunch anywhere. I did think of working in a hospital, but they said I had no training. Oh, I'm sure you would have made a very good nurse, dear. Oh, I didn't propose being the ordinary sort of nurse. I was quite content to leave that to those who had to make their living by it. But it doesn't need any particular training to be nice to those poor, dear, wounded boys, to shake up their pillows and take them flowers and read to them. It only needs sympathy. I don't know anyone who has more. Mm -hmm. With people I like. <laughs> well, darling, I think I'll go and see how my precious little grandsons are. Oh, yes, Mother, do. Nanny's taken Fred out, but Baby's in the nursery. Excuse me, Mr. Payton. Yes, of course. You, uh, you have two children, haven't you, Mrs. Lyons? Yes, yes, two sons. Fred, who'll be two next month by my first husband, Bill Cardew, and William, who's just four months by my second husband. I'm sure you're a wonderful mother. Oh, I adore my children. And a perfect wife. <laughs> Do you think so? Doesn't your husband? Oh, he's only my husband. His opinion doesn't count. He's a lucky man. I envy him. Do you? Shall I tell you what I think of you, Mrs. Lyons? Oh, no, don't. You'll only exaggerate. <laughs> You know, there are only two qualities that I flatter myself on. I'm not vain, and I am unselfish. Oh, here's my husband now. Good afternoon, Peyton. Oh, oh, good afternoon, Major Lyons. Uh, Freddy, where have you been all this time? At my club. But you promised to take me out to luncheon. Did I? Oh, I forgot all to buy it. I, I'm so sorry. Were you busy? Yes. Well, Bill was never too busy to give me luncheon when I wanted it. Well, fancy that. Well, uh, I've been getting along. Now the war's over, you fellows can take things easily. My work goes on just the same. That's a new car you've got, isn't it? I have to get about somehow, you know. Mm, so do I, but being only a soldier, I manage it on my own two feet. Well, uh, goodbye, Mrs. Lyons, and goodbye, Major. Goodbye. So nice of you to come and see me. Now, Freddy, I'd be glad to know why you threw me over like that. Are you obliged to receive visitors in your bedroom? Oh, you don't mean to say you're jealous, darling. Hmm. I thought you seemed grumpy. Come and give me a nice kiss, hmm? I'm not in the least jealous. Oh, you silly old thing. You know, it's the only room in the house that's got a fire. Why the dickens don't you have one in the drawing room? My 
Poor lamb, have you forgotten there's been a war and there happens to be a shortage of coal? I'll tell you exactly why we don't have a fire in the drawing room. Patriotism. Well, I'm dashed if I can see why it'd be less patriotic to have a fire in the drawing room where we could all benefit from it, rather than here where it's no good to anyone but you. Darling, you're not going to ask me to do without a fire in my bedroom. How can you be so selfish? Heaven knows I don't want to boast about anything I've done, but after slaving my life out these last four years, I do think I deserve a little consideration. <sighs> I'll go and see the kid. It's not as if I grudged you the use of my room. You can sit here as much as you like. Besides, a man has his club. He can always go there if he wants to. I apologize. You're quite right. You're always right. And I thought you wanted me to be happy. But I do, darling. Before we were married, you said you'd make that the chief aim of your life. I can't imagine a sensible man would want a better one. Well, then, confess you've been a beast. A brute beast, darling. Hmm. No. I asked you to give me a kiss just now. Well, it's not a request I'm in the habit of having ignored. And I trust it's not one that you're in the habit of making to all and sundry. Mm. Mm. <laughs> now, hmm? tell me why you forgot to take me out to luncheon today. I didn't forget. I was prevented. I, uh, I haven't had luncheon myself. I I'll just ring and ask the cook to send me up something. Oh, the cook left this morning. Again? What do you mean, Again. This is the first time she's left. Well, hang it all. She's only been here a week. I, I don't know why on earth you can't keep your servants. No one can keep servants these days. Other people do. Don't speak to me like that, Freddie. I'm not used to it. I shall speak to you exactly as I choose. Well, it's so petty to lose your temper just because you, you can't have something to eat. I should have thought after spending two years in the trenches, you'd be accustomed to going without a meal now and then. Oh, for goodness sake, don't make a scene of it. But I who am making a scene... I don't know how you can be so unkind to me. Bill would never have treated me like that. But I can't imagine how you can... I'm not exacting. I do everything I can to make you happy. I'm patience itself. Even my worst enemy would have to admit that I'm not selfish. Victoria, now please, all I wanted Bill was... wouldn't have, have taken my poor loving heart and thrown it aside like an old hat. Bill loved me. He would always have loved me. Oh, I adored that man. He waited on me, hand and foot. I'd give anything in the world to have my dear, dear Bill back again. Well, I'm very glad you feel like that about it, because he'll be here in about three minutes. What? What on earth do you mean? He rang me up at the club this morning. Freddy, what are you talking about? Who spoke to you? Bill. Bill? Well, Bill who? Bill Cardew. But he's dead, poor darling. Oh, he showed no sign of it on the telephone. Oh, Freddy, how can you be so heartless to... To joke like well, this. Just wait and see for yourself. Oh, now, Freddie, please, don't be vindictive. I, I didn't mean what I said. I adore you, darling, you know that. You can have a fire in your study and to the devil with a fuel controller. I'm, I'm sorry for all I said just now. There now, it's all right, isn't it? Yes, perfectly. But it's not going to prevent Bill from walking into this room in about uh, two minutes. But, but it's not true, it can't be. Poor Bill was killed at the Battle of Ypres. He, he was actually seen to fall. He was reported dead by the war office. Oh, you know how distressed I was. I, I wore mourning and everything. We even had a memorial service. Yes, I know. It'll want a devil of a lot of explaining turning up like this. Well, I shall go stark staring mad in a minute. How do you know it was Bill on the telephone? I recognize his voice. Well, what did he say exactly? Hey, he said he was at Harwich Station and would be in London at 3.13 and would I break it to you? But that was before luncheon. Why didn't you come at once and tell me? Well, to tell you the truth, I was a bit shaken by then. I thought the first thing was to have a double whiskey and a small soda. And what did you do then? I sat down to think. And I thought steadily for a couple of hours. And what have you thought? Nothing. It's a devilish awkward position for me. For you? And, and what about me? I mean, after all, Bill was my eldest pal. You may think it rather funny that I've married his wife. May think? Do you mean you haven't told him? No. He's coming here under the impression that I'm his wife? Uh, yes. But, but, but why on earth didn't you tell him at once? It was the only thing to do. Well, it, it, it just didn't strike me at the moment. Besides, it's uh, well, rather a delicate thing to say on the telephone. Well, someone must tell him. I've come to the conclusion that you're the person to do it. Oh, no. No, I'm not going to deal my darling Bill this bitter, bitter blow. Anyway, it's not my province. Now, darling, you've got so much tact. I never knew anyone who could deal with a delicate situation as you can. You're so sympathetic, and, and you've got such a wonderful tenderness. No, no, no. There's only one way to deal with this. You just take him by the arm and you say, Look here, old man, the fact it's is... no good, Victoria. I... My George, here he is. Oh, no, I haven't even parted my nose. Fortunately, I have no personal vanity. Oh, where's that powder puff? Where's my lipstick? Hello, hello, hello. Uh, well, here we are again. Bill! Well, was I right? I can hardly believe my eyes. Now give me a kiss, old lady. Mm -hmm. oh. 
Well, Freddy, old man, how's life? <laughs> a one, thanks. Are you surprised to see me? Um, a little. In fact, a, a good deal. You've neither of you said you were glad to see me. Uh, yes, uh, of course we're glad, Bill, darling, yes. Tactful of me to get old Freddy to come round and break the news, don't you think, Victoria? Uh, yes, darling, and exactly like you. Ah, it's just like old times to hear you calling me darling every other minute. Uh, it's one of Victoria's favourite words. You know, I nearly didn't warn you. I thought it would be rather a lark to break in on you in the middle of the night. You what? <laughs> well, I'm just as glad you didn't do that, Bill. <laughs> what a scene, my word. The sleeping beauty on her virtuous couch. Enter a man. Shrieks from the sleeping beauty. It is I, your husband. Tableau. Oh, he really is a little lamb, Victoria. I did... Uh, who's that? Who the devil do you think it is? The language. And the voice. Bill can't use... Who is this man? Well, I may be a bit thinner. Girls, lost... don't you come near me or I shall scream. Well, I was only going to kiss oh, you. Oh, take him away. Victoria, who is that man? Uh, well, Mrs. Shuttleworth, it's Bill Cardew. But he's dead. He doesn't seem to know it. Oh, it's a horrible dream. Of course he's dead. That man's an imposter. Shall I show you the strawberry mark on my left shoulder? I tell you, Bill Cardew's dead. Prove it. Prove it? <laughs> The war office announced it officially. Victoria went into mourning. Why, we had a memorial service. Mm, fully coral. Yes. Did you have a memorial service for me, Victoria? Oh, that was nice of you. I say, old man, we, we don't want to hurry you, you know, but um, we're all waiting for some sort of explanation. Well, I was coming to that. I was just giving you time to get over your first raptures at seeing me again. Well, have you got over them? Uh, I can only speak for myself. I was wounded at Ypres. Badly wounded. Yes, a fellow saw you fall. Said you were shot through the head. Just stopped a minute and saw you were killed and went on. Well, I wasn't. I was eventually picked up and taken to Germany. Next thing I knew, I was in hospital. And my memory had completely gone. Mm, very strange. But your memory came back? Yes, gradually. It only returned fully shortly before we were released. Well, couldn't you have written then? They said I'd arrive before a letter or, or even a telegram. Well, I suppose it is possible. Well, I'm not dead, as you can see. And what's more, I propose to live for another 40 years, if not 50. Now, I wouldn't mind getting out of these dirty clothes and into something decent. I'll just go through to my dressing room. I remember I had a blue serge suit that was rather dressed. Oh, wait a moment. <laughs> I've put all your clothes away. Where? Uh, in camphor. You can't put them on until they've been well aired. Oh, well, I suppose I can... Uh, I say, is that the kid? Uh, what's his name? Uh, well, don't you remember just before you went away, you said you'd like him called Frederick if he was a boy? Yes, I did. But you said you'd made up your mind to call him Lancelot. Yes, well, when I thought you were dead, I felt I must respect your wishes. Of course, I asked Freddy to be godfather. Has the old ruffian been a standby to you while I've been away? Uh, I, uh, I have seen a good deal of him, yes. I felt you were safe with him, you know. He's a brick. I say, spare my blushes. He was very kind to me during my bereavement. Dear old chap, I knew you were a tower of strength. I, I, I did what I could, you know. Oh, don't be so modest about it all. Well, I'm going along to the nursery to make his lordship's acquaintance. Oh, oh, something's got to be done. Yes, but what? Oh, Freddy, think of something. I don't know what to do. Well, you've got to do something, even if it's only something stupid. The only thing that occurs to me is to stand on my head. Yeah, yeah, Victoria. Victoria, I, I think we've been done. Oh, dear. That child. Upon my soul, there's not much of him for a two-year-old. Uh, oh, the, the, that baby was four months last Tuesday. Four months? So you've been busy in my absence, Victoria. Uh, uh, Freddy, for goodness sake, explain. Don't just stand there with your, with your mouth open. Uh, the, uh, the fact is, you've made a rather absurd mistake, Bill. <laughs> you've been away so long that naturally there's a good deal you don't know. Such as? Well, uh, that infant you saw isn't your son. I had a sort of suspicion that he wasn't. Oh, the fool, the fool. Well, who the deuce is the father? Well, uh, in point of fact, uh, I am. You? You don't mean to say you're married? Yes, yes. Uh, lots of people are. In fact, marriage has been quite a thing during the war. Well, I'm jolly glad to hear it, old man. I knew you'd be caught one of these days. You were a wily old bird, but... Oh, well, we all come to it. My very best congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, that's awfully good of you. I, uh, I'm staying here, you know. Oh, are you? First rate. Uh, is your missus here, too? <laughs> it's rather difficult to explain. Oh. Don't tell me she's only got one eye. Look, can't you guess why I'm staying here? No. <gasps> you don't mean you've married Victoria's mother? Oh, good question. Well, uh, no, not exactly. What do you mean by not exactly? 
I hope you haven't been trifling with the affections of my mother-in-law. Oh, do I look as if I were the mother of that baby? Well, we live in an age of progress. One should keep an open eye about things. You misunderstand me, Bill. Is there nothing between you and Victoria's mother? Certainly not. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I should have liked to be your son-in-law. And you would have done the right thing by her, wouldn't you? Really, Bill? I don't think you ought to talk like that about Mother. If he's compromised her, he ought to marry her. He hasn't compromised her and he can't marry her. Well, uh, I don't want to be inquisitive. But if you didn't marry Victoria's mother, who did you marry? Confound you, I married Victoria! It's hello to Mrs. Felicity Usher, uh, known hello. as Flick. Hello, Flick. Hello, Mr. John. Tell me, Flick, what's the biggest wash day challenge that you could possibly imagine? Um, for my son's white shirts. Quite honestly, I think he's the dirtiest boy in the school. <laughs> really? Now, if I gave you a challenge, just one chance to get these dirty white shirts of your son's perfectly white again, how would you do it? I'd, I'd use surf, because surf contains super blue. I think it's most important that white clothes should be white and not grey and grubby looking. And to look smart, they must be white. Obviously, whiteness is very important to you. Yes, definitely. Yes, like Flick, most housewives I've challenged trust the experienced one, surf with super blue for perfect whiteness. Gosh, Mary, you're lucky to have such a hard-working servant. <laughs> what do you mean? I haven't got a maid. Well, how on earth do you manage to keep your floors so clean and shiny? Ah, oh, that's easy. I use Dual. Dual? Yes, Dual, the self-shining floor cleaner. It's so easy because Dual cleans and polishes in one go. How do you mean? Well, Dual lifts all the dirt out of the floor and dries to a bright, long-lasting shine. All by itself. So when you use Dual, you don't have to worry about polishing? No, Dual cleans and polishes in one go. Oh, Mr. Pitt, I'm so sorry to have kept you waiting in this chilly drawing room, but I'm still dressing. <laughs> You're very kind to have come so soon. What a catastrophe. You must be beside yourself. What in heaven's name are you going to do? I have no idea. That's why I telephoned you. You have encouraged me to bring all my difficulties to you. Yes, of course, yes. We, we must discuss the matter. I suppose you've been having the most terrible scenes. Oh, heart-rending. You see, they both adore me. And you? Ah, oh, I only want to do my duty. How like you. How exactly like you. It was so sweet of you to come and see me at once. I was afraid you wouldn't have time. Do you think I'd allow anything to stand in the way when you sent for me? Oh, but I shouldn't like to think that you were putting yourself out on my account. I wish I could pretend I were. As a matter of fact, I was only going down to see a place I've, I've just bought in the country, and as I wanted to try my new rolls, I thought I'd kill two birds with one stone. Oh, I didn't know you were buying a place. Oh, it's a very modest little affair. The park is not more than 300 acres, and there are only 15 bedrooms. But you see, I'm a bachelor. I want so little. But where is it? Oh, it's near Newmarket. A man in my position is bound to do something for the good of the country, and it seems to me that to patronise a good old English sport which, which gives employment to numbers of respectable men is an occupation which is truly patriotic. I'm going to take up racing. Oh, I think it's splendid of you. So many men waste their money on their own selfish pleasures. It's such a relief to come across anyone who's determined to make thoroughly good use of it. I've often wondered why you didn't go into Parliament. Uh, for the past four years, I've been too busy winning the war to bother about governing the nation. Yes, yes, but now they want strong men of keen intelligence and dominating personality. It's possible that very soon I shall have the opportunity to show what sort of metal I'm made of, but not in the House of Commons. In the House of Lords? <laughs> you mustn't ask me to betray the confidence of the Prime Minister. Oh, you look splendid in Scarlet Nerman. Uh, but it's too bad of me to talk about my own concerns when yours are so much more important. Oh, but you don't know how I love to hear you talk about yourself. One feels a, a brain behind every word you speak. Well, it's easy to be brilliant when one has a sympathetic listener. Of course, Bill and Freddie are darlings, but their conversation is a little limited. During the war, you know, it was rather smart to talk about guns and flying machines and flea bags, but now... I understand so well, dear lady. Uh, why do you call me that? Well, out of pure embarrassment. I don't know whether to call you Mrs. Cardew or Mrs. Lowndes. Uh, well, why don't you split the difference and call me Victoria? May I? Uh, it'll make me feel that you're not an entire stranger. 
Oh, and I need a friend badly. I'm all at sea. I'm married to two men, and I feel as if I were married to neither. I wish you weren't. I wish with all my heart you weren't. Why? Can't you guess? Oh, I must be very stupid. Don't you know that I, I dote on you? I curse my unhappy fate that I didn't meet you before you were married. Would you have asked me to marry you? Morning, noon, and night, until you consented. Oh, well, I never want a Paris model so much as when I know it's been sold to somebody else. I wonder if you'd want to marry me if I were free. Yes, with all my heart. But I'm not free. And you, if you were, would you marry me? I don't believe you're the sort of man who'd ever take no for an answer. Oh, you're perfectly adorable. <laughs> I, uh, I wonder if you'd take me out to luncheon. Give me a chance. Then come back in half an hour and you'll find me ready. Victoria, Victoria. Oh, you're in here, Freddy. Why the devil have you left the window open? It's freezing. I was trying to warm the room up a bit. Besides, they say it's healthy. Well, a short life and a merry one for me. I like a fug. Well, that won't make it any warmer. I tried that. You silly ass. Oh, why didn't you light the fire? Well, don't be so darned unpatriotic. You can't have a fire in the drawing room. Victoria must have one in her bedroom so that I... Where the devil did you get that silk? Hmm, rather saucy. I flatter myself. Uh, Victoria sent it in for me. Well, she needn't have sent you the only new suit I've had since the war. I think that's a bit thick. Well, I couldn't go round in the dirty old thing I arrived in. Well, if you'd had the decency to ask me, you might have had this suit I've got on. Oh, thanks, but I don't altogether like that one. It's a bit baggy at the knees. You're very much mistaken if you think you're going to wear all the new clothes and I'm going to wear all the old ones. If you're going to be shirty about it, where the devil did you get that type in? Hmm? Oh, uh, Victoria gave it to me on my birthday. Yeah, well, it's mine. She gave it to me on my birthday first. And where did you get those cufflinks? Those? Oh, Victoria gave them to me as a Christmas present. Oh, did she? Well, she gave them to me as a Christmas present before she gave them to you. You jolly well take them off. I'll see you blowed first. At your death, you left everything to her in your will. If she chose to give them to me, it's no business of yours. Well, I'm not going to argue about it, but I think it's dash bad form to swank about in a dead man's jewellery. Oh, by the way, did you ever have a hammered gold cigarette case? Rather. That was Victoria's wedding present to me. Did you get it too? Hmm. Thrifty woman, Victoria. I say, unless I have a fire, I shall turn into the Albert Memorial. Well, it's all laid. Apply a match and see what happens. Hmm, I think I will. Uh, here are some matches. Oh, thanks. There. Yeah. But now I can take my overcoat off. Well, Victoria will be furious. Well, that's your lookout. You'll have to take the responsibility. Me? But it's nothing to do with me. You're the master of this house. Not at all. I am but an honoured guest. Oh, no. The moment you appeared, I sank into insignificance. My dear fellow, where did I sleep last night? In the spare bedroom. That proves conclusively that I'm a guest and nothing more. Nonsense. Where the devil do you think I slept? Down here. Oh, why on earth did you do that? You were perfectly sober when I went to bed. Victoria said I couldn't sleep in the next room to hers now that you were back. Oh, well, I dare say you made yourself very comfortable on the sofa. Look at the darn thing. Uh, by the way, why has all the furniture been changed? Well, Victoria had the room redecorated after you were killed. They'd had too many old associations. She wanted to distract her mind. Oh, I was under the impression that you'd uh, undertaken that. I was sympathetic. That is surely what you'd have liked me to be. Of course. Uh, I'm not blaming you. If you'd seen Victoria in tears, you couldn't have expected a man not to try and console her. She's the only woman I ever knew who looks as pretty when she cries as when she smiles. It's a great power. There. I knew you'd take it like a sensible man. Quite so. Uh, when would you like me to clear out? My dear fellow, why should you want to do that? Surely you, you don't for a minute imagine that I shall be in the way. I propose to make my visit quite a brief one. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Victoria will be very disappointed. Oh, but of course that's no concern of mine. You and your wife must arrange that between you. My dear fellow, you quite misunderstand me. I am not a man to come between husband and wife. What the devil do you mean? Well, if it comes to that, uh, what the devil do you mean? Good morning, Bill, dear. Hmm. Good morning, Victoria. Good morning, Freddy. Hmm. Good morning, Victoria. I went to Bill first because he's been away so long. Very naturally. And he was your husband long before I was. I don't want either of you to be jealous of the other. Who lit that fire? He did. It was his match. Of course, you don't care if we run so short of coal that my wretched babies die of double pneumonia. It's simply criminal to use coal in here. I'm tortured by the pangs of remorse. But uh, if you feel so badly about it... Did you get quite so close to the fire? Well, if there is a fire, I may as well get some benefit from it. Now, as I was saying, I don't want any jealousy. I adore you both, and I'm not going to show any favouritism. It's quite all right, Victoria. I know quite well that I only came second in your heart. 
As long as Bill was around, you never had a thought for me. Oh, I don't know about that. Even the most constant woman likes a change now and then. No, no. I know Victoria has a faithful heart. She can never really love any man but you, Bill. Victoria, you know how I adore you. You're the only woman in the world for me. But Bill has come back. And therefore, there's only one course open to me as a gentleman and a man of honor. It's a bitter, bitter sacrifice, but I'm equal to it. I renounce all rights in you. I will go away, a wiser and a sadder man, and leave you to Bill. Goodbye, Victoria. Give me one more kiss before we part forever. Oh, how beautiful of you, Freddy. What a soul you've got. <laughs> Goodbye, Victoria. Forget me and live happily with a better man than I. I shall never forget you, Freddy. Goodbye. Oh, go quickly now. I shall break down. Goodbye, Bill. Do be kind to her. I couldn't do this for anyone but you. Nothing doing. What do you mean? <laughs> Get away from that door and let me pass. Only over my dead body. Bill, why prolong a painful scene? My dear Victoria, I'm not the man to accept a sacrifice like that. No, I'll not come between you. Oh, Bill, how noble. Victoria, I'm a gentleman and a soldier. To all intents and purposes, I'm as dead as mutton. I'll remain so. Victoria will never be happy with me now that you've come back. Not another word. She's yours. I understand it all. You're both so noble, so heroic, so unselfish. But I can't have you both. I must have a husband, but only one. I cannot have and will not have two. Wait. I have an idea. Let's draw lots. How do you mean, Freddy? Well, we'll take two pieces of paper and make a cross on one of them. Then we'll fold them up and put them in a hat. We'll draw. And the one who draws the cross gets Victoria. Oh, That'd be rather thrilling. No, I'd sooner toss for it. I'm lucky at tossing. You mean to say you funk it? Well, I, I don't exactly funk it. It's an awful risk to take. Oh, it'd be so romantic. Come on, get some paper, Freddy. Yes, yes, all right. No, I, I don't like it. This isn't my lucky day. I saw the new moon through glass. I knew something was going wrong the moment I opened my eyes this morning. There. Now, whoever draws the blank paper renounces all claim to Victoria. He vanishes from the scene like a puff of smoke. He'll never be heard of again. I still don't like it. I repeat that I only do it under protest. Now, Bill, don't be disagreeable the moment you come home. You'll have plenty of time for that during the next 40 years. And you seem rather above yourself, Freddy. Supposing you draw the blank. I saw a dappled horse this morning. <laughs> well, the pieces of paper are ready. Uh, what shall we put them in? Mm, well, here's the waste paper basket. That's the best thing. <laughs> right. Now, you do understand. One of these papers has a cross on it. I will put the two papers in the basket. There we are. And now Victoria shall hold it. It's agreed that whoever draws a blank shall leave the house at once. Yes. Right. Here you are, Victoria. Now, now, yeah. shake them well. All right. <laughs> I say, isn't this thrilling? <laughs> now, you draw first, Bill. No, no, I can't. I really can't. But it's your right. You're Victoria's first husband. Oh, he's right there, Bill. You must have the first dip in the lucky bag. Oh, Come on. This is awful. I'm sweating like a pig. Carriage, old man, carriage. It's no good. I, I can't. Oh, I can see how much you love me, Bill. Well, shut your eyes, man, and make a plunge for it. Oh, well, the only thing is to get it over. I wish I'd been a better man. Now, the other's yours, Freddy. Come on, take it. Thank you. Blank. It's blank. Blank. Oh, I haven't opened mine yet. Oh, my heavens. Oh, my poor Freddy. Don't pity me, Victoria. I want all my courage now. I've lost you, and I, I must bid you goodbye forever. Oh, Freddy, this is too awful. You must come and see me sometimes. No, no, I, I couldn't. That's more than I could bear. I shall never forget you. You're the only woman I have ever loved. Give me one last kiss, Victoria. Mm. Mm. <laughs> goodbye. Before you go, you might just let me have a look at that other piece of paper... The one with the blank on it. Hmm? Why do you want to see it? Well, just uh, curiosity. Now, really, Bill. I don't know how you can be so heartless, giving way to curiosity when my heart is breaking. Anyway, I threw it on the fire. Oh, no, you didn't. You put it in your pocket. I've had enough of this. Can't you see that I'm a desperate man? Not half so desperate as I am. If you don't give me that piece of paper quietly, I'll take it from you. Go to blazes. Come on, give it up. What is the matter? Have you both gone mad? I'll make you. <laughs> Here, don't you touch me. Now... Will you give it up? 
Let go of my arm. You're twisting it. Yes, and I'll break it if you don't give me that paper. Oh, you devil. Stop it. All right. All right. You can have it. That's better. Hand it over now. There you are. I don't know how you can call yourself a gentleman. You dirty dog. What's the matter? Well, look at this. It's got a cross on it. They both had crosses on them. I don't understand. Don't you? He was making quite sure that I shouldn't draw a blank. What? I did it for your sake, Victoria. I knew that your heart was set on Bill. Only you couldn't bear to hurt my feelings. So I thought I'd make it easier for you. Oh, that was just like you, Freddy. You have such a charming nature. It almost brings tears to my eyes. Oh, now that's the baby. I must go and see where Nanny is. Now don't say anything important till I get back. How did you guess? You were so devilish calm about it. That was the calm of despair. One might almost think you didn't want Victoria. Bill, old chap. You know I'm not the sort of man to say a word against my wife. Nor am I the sort of man to listen to a word against mine. But hang it all. If a fellow can't discuss his wife dispassionately with her first husband, who can he discuss her with? I can't imagine, unless it's with her second. Uh, tell me what you really think of Victoria. The sweetest little woman in the world. No man could want a better wife. She's pretty. Charming. Delightful. I confess that sometimes I thought it hard that when I wanted a thing it was selfishness, and when she wanted it was only her due. I did sometimes wish I could call my soul my own. The fact is... I'm not worthy of her, Bill. As you so justly said, no man could want a better wife. No, no, you said that. But I'm fed up. If you'd been dead, I'd have seen it through like a gentleman, but you've turned up, so now it's over to you. No, no, no. Look here, there's only one thing to do. She must choose between us. I'd rather toss for it. I'm not going to risk anything like that. I've had enough of your hanky-panky. I thought I was dealing with a gentleman. Shh. Here she's coming up. Oh, Reddy, this is too much. Nanny's given notice. What? So I've telephoned Mother to come and fetch the children. Oh, well, that's all right, then. No, all the other servants are leaving, too. Right now. Oh, well, that's a bit thick, I must say. Oh, I've done everything in the world for them. And now to, to walk out like this. They're following the example of that wretched cook, of course. Oh, well, uh, Freddie and I will do the housework and cooking until you get some uh, some more. Uh, but there's one thing, Victoria. Yes? Well, uh, we've decided there's only one thing to be done. You must choose between us. Oh, how can I? I adore you both. Besides, there's nothing to choose between you. And I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. No, you must decide. Now, take a good look at us, Victoria, and say which of us it's to be. To tell you the truth, I don't see why it should be either. What? Hang it all, it must be one or the other. I think no one can deny that since the day I married you, I've sacrificed myself in every mortal way. I've worked myself to the bone to make you comfortable. Very few men have had such a wife as I've been to both of you. But one must think of oneself sometimes. How true. Well, the war's over now. And I think I've done my bit. I've married two dear souls. Now I want to marry a Rolls Royce. But I, I thought you adored us. Well, you see, I adore you both. It's six of one and half a dozen of the other. And the result is... A washout. Hang it all. I think it's a bit thick. Do you mean to say that you fixed up to marry somebody else behind our back? Oh, you know I wouldn't do a thing like that, Freddy. Well, I, I don't get it. My dear Freddy, have you ever studied the domestic habits of the unicorn? We're afraid our education was very much neglected. The unicorn is a shy and somewhat timid creature. And it's impossible to catch him with the snares of the hunter. But he's strangely impressionable to the charms of the fair sex. When he hears the frou-frou of a silk petticoat, he forgets his native caution. In short, a pretty woman can lead him by the horn. Oh, Victoria, dear, I've come for the children. Oh, and Mr. Payton is downstairs. Did he come in a Rolls Royce? Why, yes. I'll come down at once. The unicorn's going to take me out to luncheon. <laughs> New Skip is the best powder for automatic washing machines. Ask any manufacturer about Skip's low lather formula and how it works with his machine to give the best results. And ask any housewife about Skip's great new whitening power. It's true. My machine manufacturer recommended New Skip, so I tried it. And it's fantastic. New Skip has oxygen whiteners and it gets my whites really white. And Skip is great for colors too. 
Whichever program I use on my automatic washing machine, Skip gives me wonderful results. Yes, Skip is best for your clothes and your machine. That's why it's recommended by all 16 top manufacturers of automatic washing machines. Close-up toothpaste is for close-ups. Close-up when you kiss me. Kiss me. Close-up when you touch me. Touch me. Close-up when you smile. When you're close to people, really close, you need new close-up toothpaste. Clear red or clear green mint. Two whiteners clean your teeth their whitest white. A real mouthwash gives you fresh breath. Close-up, it gets breath as fresh as possible and teeth as white as possible. Close-up when you kiss me. Kiss me. Close-up when you touch me. Touch <laughs> I say, these, these coals weigh about a ton. You might carry them up to the drawing room. I might, uh, but I'm not going to. It isn't my work. I'm doing the cooking. You really can't expect me to do the housework as well. Are you doing the cooking? Looking around this kitchen, I don't see any sign of it. There's a lot of dirty dishes. I don't see why I've got to sweat my life out. Ah, you see, you have no organisation. Housework's perfectly simple. Only one must have organisation. I have. That's my secret. I was a mug to say I do the housework. I might have known you'd freeze onto a soft job if there was one. I naturally undertook to do what I could do best. Cooking is an art. Any fool can do housework. Now just look nippy and get the table laid while I see to the potatoes. Is it luncheon or dinner? Well, I don't know yet. But we're having it down here in the kitchen because it's easier for dishing up. Organisation again. What does Victoria say to that? No, I haven't told her yet. She's in an awful temper this morning. Oh, why? Well, because the water in the bathroom wasn't hot. Wasn't it? You know very well it wasn't. You were too lazy to get up in time. So much for your organisation. What do you mean? Well, ever since I've been at the war office, I've heard fellows talking about organisation. But I never could find anyone to tell me just what it was. It's beginning to dawn on me now. Well, uh, what is it? Organisation means getting someone else to do your job for you if you can. And if you can't, letting it rip. I really think it's too bad of you two. I've been ringing the bell for the last quarter of an hour. There are two men in the house and neither of you pay the least attention. We were having an argument. Yes. Let me put it before you, Victoria. No, it has nothing to do with Victoria. I'm the cook and I won't have anyone come interfering with my kitchen. You must do something, Victoria, or you'll get no luncheon. I shan't be here for luncheon. Why not? Because... Because Mr. Lester Payton has made me an offer of marriage, and I have accepted it. But you've got two husbands already, Victoria. Hello, who's that? That's my solicitor. Oh, what? I told him to come at once. I'll go and open the door, Freddie, will you? What the dickens does he want? He's going to fix up my divorce. Oh, you're not letting the grass grow under your feet, are you? Hurry and answer the door, oh, All right. I was just taking my apron off. This is a... Desperate step you're taking, Victoria? Well, I had to do something. You must see that the present situation is absolutely impossible. Well, if you've quite made up your mind to divorce me, uh, I can almost look upon you as another man's wife. What do you mean by that? Only that I can make love to you without feeling a thundering ass. Oh, oh careful, they're coming. It would never do for my solicitor to find me in my husband's arms. It would be outrageous. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Rayham? Uh, how do you do? Do you know my husband? I'm pleased to meet you, gentlemen. I dare say it will facilitate matters if I am told which of you is which and which is the other. Uh, well, this is Major Cardew, my first husband, oh, and this oh. is my second husband, Major Lance. Ah, oh, that makes it quite clear. How do you do? Uh, how do you do, Major? How do you do, Major? Oh, interesting coincidence. Uh, both majors. I suppose Mrs. Lance has put you in possession of the facts, Mr. Rayham. I think so. Uh, we had a long talk in my office yesterday. She is determined to divorce you both. I told her that this is not necessary, since she is obviously the wife of only one of you. But it's just as well to take no risks. Yeah, but do I understand that you two gentlemen are agreeable? Speaking for myself, I'm prepared to sacrifice my feelings, deep as they are, to the happiness of Victoria. Very nicely and feelingly put. And, and you, sir, will you give this lady the freedom she desires? Yes, of course, certainly. Well, so far, so good. Now, it will save time and trouble if we get up the case against both of you in the same way. Since neither of you will defend the case, there is no need for you to go to the expense of legal advice. 
And so I propose to go into the whole matter with you now. You can feel quite easy about taking Mr. Raham's advice. He's arranged more divorce cases than any man in England. You must be a very busy man. I assure you, Major, I'm one of the busiest men in London. Well, I will come to the point. In this country, if a couple, for reasons which merely concern themselves, wish to part company, a husband needs only to prove adultery to divorce his wife. But the English law recognises the natural polygamy of man, and so when a wife desires to divorce a husband, she must prove, in addition, cruelty or desertion. Now, do you wish the cause of offence to be cruelty or desertion? Well, personally, I should prefer desertion. Certainly. I should very much dislike being cruel to Victoria. And you know, I could never hurt a fly. Well, I... Then we'll settle on desertion. I, I think myself it is the more gentlemanly way, and besides, it is more easily proved. I will arrange it all by means of letters. Uh, an application for the restitution of conjugal rights will be made, and then six months later we shall bring an action for divorce. Six months later? But when will I be free, then? In about a year. Oh, but that won't do at all. I must have my freedom by, uh... Well, before the racing season ends at all events. Oh, uh, as soon as that? Well, the derby, if possible. Certainly by the 2,000 guineas. Well, in that case, it will have to be cruelty. Eh? It can't be helped. They'll have to be cruel. Well, I don't like the idea, Victoria. Oh, try and be a little unselfish for once, darling. I'd never strike a woman. If I don't mind, I don't see why you should. Uh, cruelty has its advantages. If it's properly witnessed, it has a convincing air which desertion never has. Uh, my mother will swear to anything. Servants are better. The judges are often unduly suspicious of the mother-in-law's testimony. But you can leave it safely to me. I've devised my own system and have never known it to fail. I always arrange for three definite acts of cruelty. First at the dinner table... Uh, perhaps then... we could leave the principal for the time being and go into the details later. Uh, oh, very well. But, uh, let us pass to the last point. Trivial in itself, but essential in order to satisfy the requirements of our English law. Adultery. That, I think, you can safely leave to us. With the price of a supper in my pocket and an engaging manner, I'm prepared to supply all the evidence you want. I am shocked and horrified by your suggestion. Do you expect a man in my position to connive at immorality? Immorality? Well, uh, there must be, uh, shall we say, a soupçon of it uh, under normal circumstances. Not at all. I always arrange this part of the proceedings with the most scrupulous regard to propriety. I shall arrange for both of you to come to my office and meet a certain lady. What's she like? A most respectable person. I have employed her in practically all the fashionable divorces of the last 15 years. You amaze me. Does she make money by it? Oh, sufficient for her simple needs. She charges only 20 guineas for her services. Well, I'm sure I could get it done for less. And not by a woman of refinement. Oh, well, with most of us, it's only once in a lifetime. <laughs> well, I, I will proceed. You will fetch this lady at my office and drive with her to the Hotel Majestic, where you will register as husband and wife. You will be shown to a suite of rooms which I shall engage for you, and supper will be served in the sitting room. You will partake of this, and you will drink champagne. I should like to choose the brand myself. I have no objection to that. Thanks. Then you will play cards. Miss Montmorency is a wonderful card player. She has not only an unparalleled knowledge of all games for two, but she can do a great number of tricks. In this way, you will find the night passed without tediousness, and in the morning, you will ring for breakfast. Well, I'm not sure I'll have much appetite for it. Sounds like the devil of a beano. I should like to see her first. Come to think of it, I'd like to see her too. Men are so weak. I'd be much easier in my mind if I'm sure these poor boys won't be led astray. Well, that's easily arranged. I have Miss Montmorency with me. She is waiting in a taxi cab at the door. Uh, is she that sort of person I should like to meet, Mr. Ray? Oh, a perfect lady. She comes from one of the best families in Shropshire. Oh, well, go and fetch her, Freddy. Oh, very well. Do you mean to say that with this evidence you'll be able to get a divorce? No doubt of it. I've got hundreds. Well, I'm only a soldier, and I dare say you'll not be surprised that I find it difficult to believe. Brandy. Brandy. Oh, what's the matter? Is this the way? You'll soon see. Uh, come straight in, Miss Montmorency. Make it a big one, and have one yourself, too. Ah, Miss Montmorency. Uh, but... This is the kitchen. Oh, I see what you mean. Let's have another. Uh, I'm afraid it's the only room in the house that's habitable at the moment. Uh, yes, uh, Miss Montmorency, uh, Mrs. Frederick Lowe. Oh, I'm charmed to make your acquaintance. The injured wife, I presume. Uh, yes. So <laughs> sad. 
I'm afraid the war is responsible for the rupture of many happy marriages. I'm booked up for weeks ahead. So sad. Do sit down, won't you? Thank you. And now, which of these gentlemen is the erring husband? Well, uh, they both are. Oh, really? And which are you going to marry after you've got your divorce? Neither. But I naturally concluded that one was the husband you are discarding, and the other the husband you are acquiring. The eternal triangle, you know. In this case, the triangle is four-sided. Oh, how very peculiar. I don't want you to think I've been at all careless, but the fact is, through no fault of my own, they're both my husbands. Oh, really? How very interesting. And which are you divorcing? I'm divorcing them both. Oh, I see. Oh, very sad. But I think I ought to tell you at once that I shouldn't like to misconduct myself. Uh, I use the technical expression with both these gentlemen. Oh, oh, oh we shall be generous, Miss Montmorency. I have to think of my self-respect. One gentleman is business, but two would be debauchery. Mrs. Lowndes is anxious to put this matter through as quickly as possible. Well, I dare say my friend, Mrs. Onslow Jarvis, would oblige if I asked her as a personal favour. Mm, are you sure she can be trusted? Oh, she's a perfect lady, the widow of a clergyman, and she has two sons in the army. Unless we can get Miss Montmorency to reconsider her decision, I'm afraid we shall have to put up with Mrs. Onslow Jarvis. I am adamant, Mr. Rahem, adamant. Well, I'm all for Mrs. Onslow Jarvis, personally. Then you fall to me, Major. Um, I didn't quite catch your name. Card you. I hope you play cards. Sometimes. Oh, it's such a relief to find a gentleman who's fond of cards. Otherwise, I suppose the night seems rather long. Oh, not to me, you know. I am such a student of human nature. But my gentlemen begin to grow a little restless when I've talked to them for six or seven hours. I can hardly believe it. One gentleman actually said he wanted to go to bed. But of course I told him that would never do. Uh, forgive my asking. You know what men are. Do they never attempt to take uh, liberties with you? Oh, no. If you're a lady, you can always keep a man in his place. I can assure you, Miss Montmorency, that you need have no fear that I shall take advantage of your delicate position. Of course, you will divest yourself of none of your raiment. On the contrary, I propose to put on an extra suit of clothes. Oh, I'm sure we shall have a delightful night. And I know you, Major... Um, Lowndes. Uh, I'm sure, Major Lowndes, you'll like Mrs. Onslow Jarvis. She has such charm of manner, so much ease. You can see that she did a lot of entertaining when her late husband was vicar at Clacton. They have a very nice class of person at Clacton. Yes, I, I shall be charmed to meet her. I don't know what Mr. Raham would say to our sharing a suite. We could play bridge. She's a very fine bridge player, and we only play strippings a hundred because in her position she can hardly gamble, can she? Uh, I always like to oblige, Miss Montmorency, but, but I hardly think that arrangement would do. Uh, you know how fussy some judges are. Uh, we might hit on one of them who saw nothing in it. Oh, oh, well, well, let's take no risks. Business is business. It must be you and me alone then, Major Cardew. You will let me know in good time when you fix the fatal night. I'm very booked up just now. Of course, we'll do everything to suit your convenience, Miss Montmorency. And now, uh, Mrs. Lowndes, as we've settled up everything, I think Miss Montmorency and I will go. I can't think of anything else. Goodbye, no. then. I am not going to say goodbye to you, Major Cardew, but au revoir. Believe me, I look forward to our next meeting. Good morning, Mrs. Lowndes, and good morning, Major Cardew. Uh, shall I show you to... No, no, we shall find our own way out. Goodbye, goodbye Mr. Bain. Goodbye. 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 Well... This is a bit of all right you've let us in for, Victoria. Well, darling, it's the only thing I've ever asked you to do for me in all my life, so you needn't complain. Uh, I'll bear it like a martyr. The only thing left is for me to bid you goodbye. Already? You must understand, under the circumstances, it wouldn't be quite, quite nice for me to stay here. Besides, without servants, it's beastly uncomfortable. I should go to Mother. Oh, your mother? Oh, where else would you expect a woman to go in a crisis like this? And the children there already, so, uh... Would you even stay for luncheon? Uh, Lester will give me a better one, I think. In any case, I realise it's a painful moment for both of you, and we shan't make it any easier by dragging it out. True. Goodbye, Bill. I forgive you everything, and I hope we shall always be good friends. Goodbye, Victoria. I hope this will not be, by any means, your last marriage. <laughs> when everything's settled, you must come and dine with us. I'm sure you'll find Lester has the best wines and cigars that money can buy. Mm. Goodbye. <laughs> and now, Freddy, it's your turn. Now that there's nothing more between us, you might give me back that tie pin I gave you. 
Here you are. <laughs> Thank you. And there was a cigarette case. You've no doubt got it in your pocket. Take it. <laughs> Thank you. They say jewelry's gone up tremendously in value since the war. I'll give Lester a cigarette case as a wedding present. You always do, Victoria. Men like it. <laughs> Goodbye, Freddie, dear. I'll always have a pleasant recollection of you. <laughs> Goodbye, Victoria. Or would you like a taxi? <laughs> no, thanks. I'll walk. I think the exercise will do me good. <sighs> Wonderful woman. Yes, I shall never regret having been married to her. Now, what about lunch? <laughs> Annabella, if we could just have a turn to the left. That's enough. Now, smile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's just about it. Now, we'll move on to the interior shots, and that's it for the day. International fashion model Annabella G is on location in southern France. Being a top model, you can imagine how Annabella cares for her complexion. She uses Lux Beauty Soap. Lux is so creamy, so very soft. It cares for my complexion. I wouldn't use anything else. Like Annabella G, like beautiful women everywhere, choose the creamy, moisturizing lather of Lux to care for your complexion. Lux, a beauty treatment as you bathe. Gosh, Mary, you're lucky to have such a hard-working servant. <laughs> what do you mean? I haven't got a maid. Well, how on earth do you manage to keep your floors so clean and shiny? Ah, oh, that's easy. I use Duo. Duo? Yes, Duo, the self-shining floor cleaner. It's so easy because Duo cleans and polishes in one go. How do you mean? Well, Duo lifts all the dirt out of the floor and dries to a bright, long-lasting shine all by itself. So when you use Duo, you don't have to worry about polishing? No, Duo cleans and polishes in one go. In tonight's Lux Radio Theatre presentation of Home and Beauty by W. Somerset Maugham, the part of Victoria was played by Margaret Milner Smythe, with Roger Service as Bill Cardew, her first husband, and Tony Wood as Freddie Lowndes, her second husband. As her mother, you heard Sheila Raymond Jones. John Simpson played the part of Lester Patton, and Peter Lee Hunt that of Mr. Raym, the lawyer. Miss Montmorency was played by Gillian Lomberg. Home and Beauty was adapted by Helen Cunningham, produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Rolf Jacobs, and directed by Delphine Lethbridge. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray in Remember the Night with Elizabeth Patterson, Beulah Bondi, and Sterling Holloway. And ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Fine acting, a good story, and superb direction each contribute to the success of a motion picture. And we'll have to combine all three to explain the resounding success of the current Paramount picture, Remember the Night. As it happens, I take a personal pride in the success of this picture, because Mitchell Lyson, who directed it, served his apprenticeship with me. Consequently, it's with a special bow in Mitch's direction that I introduce our radio adaptation of his screen hit, Remember the Night. A triumphal return engagement for the same two stars who played it on the screen, Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray. And with them, we have Beulah Bundy, Elizabeth Patterson, and Sterling Holloway of the picture cast. Remember the Night is a play you'll remember, and Lux Toilet Soap is a product you'll remember. When our feminine listeners remember to think of their appearance, and that's at least, well, part of the time, they know Lux Toilet Soap is a real aid to loveliness. Just why Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray have never been teamed before is one of Hollywood's unsolved mysteries. But the results in this picture call loudly for more of the same. So we were very insistent on having these stars of the picture in our production tonight. Barbara dropped in to visit my Northwest Mounted Police set, but I sent her home right away to get her script of Remember the Night. 
And I had to break into something to get Fred McMurray. I had to break into his vacation in Mexico. It was the same vacation, which we interrupted a few weeks ago to bring him back to this microphone. However, he, he took our persecution very amiably and buckled right down to work. Ordinarily, I, I don't suppose a courtroom is the most promising place in the world for a love story. Especially if the party of the first part is the prosecutor and the party of the second part is the girl on trial. But remember, the night is delightfully original from beginning to end with a love story that begins in a law court. So once more, it's curtain time in the Lux Radio Theater as we start Act One of Remember the Night, starring Barbara Stanwyck as Lee Leander, Fred McMurray as John Sargent, with Beulah Bondi as his mother, Elizabeth Pat Patterson as Aunt Emma, and Sterling Holloway as Willie. <laughs> A jewelry store on New York's Fifth Avenue. In the glittering showcases, a thousand precious stones sparkle in their brilliant settings. Although it's just a few weeks before Christmas, there's only one customer in the store this afternoon, a pretty girl in costly furs. On her wrist is a diamond bracelet, placed there by a, an enthusiastic clerk. He smiles happily, sensing the sale is practically complete. Glorious, madam, isn't it? One of our most beautiful bracelets, really. Yes, it is beautiful. You won't regret taking it, madam. I'm sure I won't. Uh, what's the price, please? Only $5,000. $5,000, that's reasonable. You won't find another one like it in New York, madam. Uh, shall I have Mr. Meyer make out the papers? Just a moment, please. I think I'd like to see one or two more before I make up my mind. Uh, that one in the lower tray, please. Let me see that. Oh, of course, madam. Uh, personally, I prefer the one you're wearing, but... This one's quite beautiful, too. Uh, the emeralds set the diamonds off very nicely. Now, if you'll just place this one on your... Madam! Madam! Where? Why, she's gone! Mr. Meyer! Mr. Meyer! She's gone! Police! Police! Don't! What is it? Oh, that girl! She went out the door while my back was turned. She went out with a $5,000 bracelet. <laughs> Car number 17, pickup girl about 23 years, dark complexion, silver fox furs, vicinity 5th Avenue, 54th Street. Search for diamond bracelets stolen from Meyer and Company. That is all. Hello. Hello. Oh, uh, this is Officer Cassidy reporting to headquarters. Say, we picked up that girl on call 17. Yeah. Caught her cold with the goods in a hock shop over on 3rd Avenue. She was trying to pawn the bracelet. Yeah. Okay, I'm bringing her in now. District Attorney's office. Who? Oh, just a moment. Who is it? Commissioner's office. It's about that acquittal yesterday in the shooting case. Uh, tell him I'm busy. Hello? Can the district attorney call you back? Thank you. Is that all they have to do, beef about acquittals? All right, Tom, let's get going. Okay, boss. What's the first case today? That's a cinch. Dame by the name of Lee Leander cops a bracelet out of Miami Company on 3rd Avenue in Hoxton. Open and shut. First offense? Nah, she's got a record. This is a third offense. Well, that's good, that's good. The first offender at Christmas time is tougher than tiger meat. Tom, look at that chart. Convictions only 78% is against 82% last year. Hey, can I handle this case, boss? I'll get you a conviction. Uh, you probably could handle it as well as some of these dopes, but when the right case comes along, I'll give it to you. Wife beater or something like that. Your face isn't right to prosecute a woman. Oh, boss, listen. Nothing doing, Tom, nothing doing. We'll get Sergeant on this one. Sergeant? What's his face got that mine hasn't got? Well, whatever it is, he's never lost a case for me yet. Yeah, but he's gone home for Christmas. Ohio or Oklahoma or someplace like that. Now, listen, I could get you a conviction so Take quick. it easy, Tom. It's Take it easy. Miss Day, get me John Sergeant on the phone. Yes, sir. Now, boss, now that ain't fair. Stop moaning. Sergeant's terrific with these pretty girls. Oh, Mr. Sergeant. Mr. Sergeant. Phone's ringing. Well, answer it, will you? I'm trying to get packed up in here. Okay, I'll answer. Hello? Hey, wait a minute, Rufus. Uh huh? Listen, if that's the office, tell him I've already left. Okay. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes. Well, this is the office. He's already left. Oh, you blockhead. Give me that phone. I just said... Uh, Shut up. Uh, good morning. Who all wants to speak to Master Sergeant, please? Uh, hello, Sergeant. Uh, who do you think you're kidding? Oh, all right, never mind. Who is this? This is your boss. You know, it's a good thing you didn't take up acting for a living. Yeah? Well, what do you want? Well, listen, we got a case to try this morning. 
I'll see you at the office in 15 minutes. Now, wait a minute. I'm supposed to be going home for Christmas. Sure, sure. You can leave here this afternoon. Yeah, but I've got 730 miles to drive. You told me I could... Now, look, Jack, don't argue. It's a female case, and I need you. Now, come on. Oh, I was afraid of this. Who's defending? No, Leary. That windbag? He'll give us the Gettysburg Address and the Declaration of Independence. Oh, no, he won't. Now, I'll have Tom meet you in court, and you'll be out of there by noon. Now, get right down here. Goodbye. Now, listen, boss. Hello. Hello. Oh, O'Leary. Oh, He'll talk all day, all day long. When you leave, Mr. Sergeant. Shut up. Yes, Quiet, please. Proceed with your summation, Mr. O'Leary. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, during the course of this trial, you've heard the prosecuting attorney, Mr. Sergeant, attempt to prove that a valuable bracelet was taken from the premises of Meyer and Company by the defense. All this has been a waste of time, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, of your time and mine. Time we could spend to, to better advantage in, in last-minute Christmas shopping. At least I, I know that's what I'd like to be doing. <laughs> May it please the court, we object, Your Honor. The jury's Christmas shopping has nothing to do with the case. Objection sustained. I withdraw the illusion, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, when I say the time has been wasted, I mean the state has gone to great lengths to prove that Anna Rose Malone, sometimes known as Lee Leander... Sometimes known as a lot of other things... ...did on the afternoon of December 3rd walk out upon Fifth Avenue with a bracelet which was still the property of Meyer and Company. To prove something, she freely admits. As if the proof of this constituted a proof of guilt. Since the dawn of civilization, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, since the beginnings of jurisprudence, wise men... And women have refused to be hoodwinked by circumstantial evidence. The contents of a whiskey bottle... Hey, Jack, I don't like that smile on that jury's pan. All juries get soft-hearted at Christmas, Tommy. If you ever get a case to prosecute and you see that peace on earth, goodwill toward men look come in their eyes, get a continuance, even if you have to fall down and tell the judge ate green apples. Yeah. ...that a young woman walking out of a store with something not her own is necessarily an evildoer. Oh, how flimsy is this argument. How unfair... But on it, and because of it, you have been asked to take away the liberty of a fellow human being. Now, the truth is simple. The bracelet was removed during a temporary loss of will and consciousness, now known as schizophrenia, but formerly known as hypnotism. Holy mackerel, that's a sweet one, hypnotism. Shut up, Tommy. You mean you're not going to object? Shut up. He's just postponed the case till after Christmas. Yeah? How do you figure that? Hypnotism. Oh. Yes. Yes, I said hypnotism, and that's exactly what I meant. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I want you to gaze upon this girl's face. Is this the face of a hardened criminal? An outcast from society? No. No! But the prosecution would have you believe that she willingly, and in her right mind, stole, stole a bracelet. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what really happened. The truth. This girl... This poor, unfortunate creature went into that jewelry store not to buy, not to steal, but only to look. A salesman showed her the bracelet, urged her to clasp it around her wrist, begged her to examine it under a more powerful light, and then excused himself. The bracelet is under a powerful light. The young girl stares at it closer, closer. The great central stone flashes blindingly in her eyes. Blue, green, purple, orange, closer, still closer. Suddenly, the colors are gone. Everything is dark. A breath of cold air brings her to her senses, but... What's this? Where is the jewelry store? Where is the light she was standing under? What is she doing on Fifth Avenue, blocks away from Meyer and Company? She... she doesn't know. She can't remember. Her mind is a blank. And why... Why, this girl, this poor, unfortunate creature was a victim, an unwilling victim of hypnosis. Your Honor, the defense rests. All right, now, Tommy, watch. Your Honor. Yes? Your Honor, the hypothesis of hypnotism is a very interesting one. Let me be the first to admit it. But unfortunately, I am no Svengali, nor are you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. The people of the state of New York will require the expert testimony of Dr. Kynmus, the psychiatrist. For this purpose, the people will request a continuance be granted till after the Christmas holidays. We object, Your Honor. The defense has already summed up. The case was practically closed. Objection overruled. But Your Honor... The defendant will remain in custody, subject to giving a $5,000 bond. And all jurors, parties, and witnesses 
are instructed to return to the court Tuesday, January 3rd. Court adjourned, and a very Merry Christmas to you all. Just a minute, just a minute, Sergeant. That was a dirty trick you played on me. It means another day in court. And I don't get paid by the state. I have to earn my money. No more sense of humor than a gravestone. Huh? Well, Merry Christmas, Francis. Why, you... Oh, take it easy, Mr. Leon. Let me go. I want to speak to my lawyer. Mr. O'Leary, this guard says I have to have a bond or stay in jail. That's right. Is it right? You ought to know, Mr. District Attorney. I'm afraid it is. Well, how can I get a bond? I haven't any more money, and I don't want to spend Christmas in jail. Please don't let them do that. What do you mean you haven't got any more money? What have I been talking for, to hear my own voice? If you hadn't talked so much, I'd be out of here right now. What do you mean by that? Hypnotism. That gag's so old, it's got whiskers. Oh, please, please don't let them keep me here over Christmas. Ah, what's the difference? What could you do if you haven't got any money? I could walk around, couldn't I? Come on, miss. It ain't as bad as you think. You get a nice little uh, room and a nice turkey dinner on Christmas. Yes, yes, I know. Never mind the build-up. Let's go. I hope you have a Merry Christmas, Mr. Sergeant. Hey, she's kind of sore at you, Jack. Yeah. Say, uh, Tommy, on your way out, send Fat Mike in here, will you? Huh? Fat Mike the bondsman? If you know any other Fat Mikes, you can send them, too. I get it. You don't, but let it pass. Okay, I'll send them right away. Hey, Mike. Yeah? Mr. Sergeant wants to see you right away. Sure, sure. Coming. Hello, Mr. Sergeant. You want to see me? Yeah. What will you charge for 5,000 bail from now till January 3rd? Did they pin something on you, pal? No, it isn't for me. It's for the young woman who's in here today. Oh, I see. How much? For a friend of yours? Nothing. Not a red Samelka. I didn't ask you for any favors. Favors? It's a privilege. You still living at the same place? Yeah. Why? How soon you want her out? Right away. Okay. She's out. Thanks. So long. Hey, Rufus. You got those other grits packed? Rufus! Yeah, I am, boss. What's the matter with you? She's here, boss. Who's here? I don't know. Then how do you know she's here? I just let in the living room. You let who in? The lady. You you mean there's a lady here in the apartment? Yes, sir. Well, what'd you let her in for? I, I told you I wasn't home to anybody. Yes, sir. I told him that. But he shoved the door open anyhow and pushed the lady in with his compliments. Who did? A man. Oh, uh, Fat Ike. Fat Ike? You mean Fat Mike? Yes, sir. He sure ain't thin, Mike. Hmm. What did he bring her here for? I don't know. Guess I'll have to go and speak to her. Guess you will. <laughs> well, hello. Hello. What are you doing here? I don't know yet, but I've got a rough idea. Well, uh, anyway, I'm glad you're out. Mm-hmm. Now what do I have to do for it? Well, for one thing, you could say thank you, but if that doesn't fit in with your plans, just skip it. My motive's in this matter. Here you are, you... boss. Here's the drinks. What drinks? I didn't take them. Got some soda, mint. Thanks. Drink, boss? Get out of here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I know. <laughs> You know, one of these days, one of you boys is going to start one of these scenes differently. And one of us girls is going to drop dead from surprise. What are you talking about? I suppose you do this with all the lady prisoners? Oh, yes. My life is just one long round of whooping. Well, you're in a good spot for it. Wonderful. I have only to wave a finger and I can satisfy my slightest whim. And I suppose if anybody says no, you just put them right back in the cooler. That's right. Now, look. When court reconvenes, I'm going to try to put you in jail for a good long time. That's my business. But you haven't been convicted yet, so I don't see why you shouldn't enjoy Christmas like the rest of us. That's why I told Mike to get you out. And bring me up here. I did not tell him to bring you up here. Then why did that gorilla bring me up here? Because he's got a mind like a sewer. Thanks. Now, look, I'm very glad to have been of service to you. Now, if you... You mean I... I don't have to stay here if I don't want to? You most certainly do not. Oh, then I'll stay. But I won't be forced. Now, wait a you minute. You know, there's nothing as dangerous as a square shooter. If all men were like you, there wouldn't be any nice girls left. Yes, well, all this is leading into a very interesting subject that I haven't time to pursue at the moment. I'm going away on a little trip, and it's quite a drive, and I haven't had my dinner yet. Oh, and... you mean you want me to go? Well, yes. Where? Where what? Well, I was on my way to a nice, comfortable jail with three meals a day and turkey for Christmas, and now Don't I... Don't you live someplace? No. Where have you been, living in a tree? I had a room in a hotel, but they locked me out. Oh. Well, how much do you owe this hotel? $126.40. Oh. Well, that doesn't solve any problem. Look, why don't you just put me back in the clink? That solves lots of problems. Well, for one thing, I'm not sure I can't. And, well, that wasn't the idea. Have you had dinner? Not yet. Now, come on, then. I'll take you to dinner, and we'll figure something out. You really didn't want me to come here at all, then? I'm sorry to say I did not. I see. Well, shall we go? Here's your hat, boss. Going out, huh? Yes, I am. Hot dog. <laughs> but don't forget you got to see you more. Shut up. <laughs>
anything else? No, thanks. It's been nice up to now. Yeah. You know, I was thinking I uh, I might lend you my apartment while oh, I'm Oh, that sounds like a play, doesn't it? Yeah, sounds like a flop. Don't worry about me. I can always chisel a hotel for a week or so. That's a nice, cheesy idea. Well, I'm not going to sleep in the subway. And as far as the holiday's concerned, I guess I'll get plenty of that when you get through with me. Oh, uh, not that I mean it in a disagreeable way, you understand. I understand. Your business is your business. Of course, some people wouldn't care for that kind of business, but somebody has to do the dirty work. Thanks. Just too bad it had to be somebody as nice as you. How long have you been swiping things? Always. Have you been caught before? Uh Uh-huh. Did you take things you didn't need? Sure. In the presence of beautiful things, did you feel a sudden irresistible urge to take them in your hands and hurry away with them? Oh, you mean was I hypnotized? No, no, I I mean maybe you're a kleptomaniac. Oh, no, no. They tried that, though. Now, you see, to be a kleptomaniac, you can't sell any of the stuff afterwards or you you lose your amateur standing. I don't understand it. Oh, I, I don't think you ever could understand because your mind is different. Right or wrong is the same for everybody, you see, but the the rights and the wrongs aren't the same. Oh, that's ridiculous. Is it? All right, try it like this. Suppose you were starving to death. Yeah. And you didn't have any food, and you didn't have any money, and you, you didn't have any place to get anything. Mm-hmm. And there were some loaves of bread out in front of a market, and, well, now remember, you're starving to death, and the man's back was turned. Would you swipe one? You bet I would. That's because you're honest. You see, I'd have a six-course dinner at the table door to cross the street and then say I've forgotten my purse. Get the difference? I think you're way smarter. Yeah, that's it. We're smart. Very smart. Well, we're all finished. Uh, waiter, check, please. Uh, right away, sir. Well, Miss Leander, I've got a couple of extra bucks I don't need. Here's uh, my Christmas dinner I promised you, and a room and a couple of breakfasts. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, check, sir. Oh, here you are. Oh, uh, will you ask the band to play my Indiana home? Oh, yes, sir. I'll ask for them. Thank you. Why do you want them to play that? Because that's where I'm going. No. Are you a Hoosier? Yeah, Wabash, Indiana. That is a farm just outside of Wabash. Wabash, Indiana? Oh, no wonder I liked you. I'm from Eltonville. No. Uh-huh. Well, that's only about 50 miles from... Yes, sir? Well, I'll be darned. <laughs> we have to come here and meet like this. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? So, you're going back home, huh? Yeah, I go home every Christmas. You do. Oh, gee, that's great. My mother still runs the farm. She does all right, too. She raises partridge, wine, us, Poland, China. Oh, and... we never had anything, that's why. Well. <laughs> we never did either till lately. How long since you've been home? Never. Why? I ran away. Well, I don't know what the circumstances were, of course. But... Not so hot. Well, time takes care of those things. Do they write to you? I had a letter from my mother when my father died. Oh, your mother's alive, then? Huh? I hope so. That song, it's awful pretty, isn't it? Kind of... Oh, it kind of does things to you. Yeah. Say, so look, how would you like to go home for Christmas? What? I mean it. I, I could drop you off at your place and pick you up on my way back. Home? Oh, gee, I, I don't know. Oh, come on, it'll do you good. What do you say? All right. Unless, aren't you afraid? Afraid of what? How it might look. Rising young district attorney and me. Oh, I, I didn't think of it. I know. You never think of anything wrong, do you? That's what makes you such a swell guy. The curtain falls on the first act of Remember the Night with Barbara Stanwyck, Fred McMurray, Elizabeth Patterson, Beulah Bondi, and Sterling Holloway. Over on Rockwell Street, in a little white bungalow, the first guest has just arrived a bit early for one of those bridge get-togethers the ladies have from time to time. We're going to let you hear what this guest says, and what she thinks, too. Why, hello, Ellie. How nice you look. Where did she find that dress, I wonder? She has the best taste. Here's the way I look, Ellie. I'm a little early. Came right straight from the office. I worked late and I didn't really have time to go home and change. Gosh, do I feel grimy. I can only take a quick bath. My, how lovely the living room looks. Those flowers are just the right color. I wonder if she'd think me nervy if I asked to take a bath. Tired? Oh, well, not exactly, Ellie. I'm just sort of, 
Well, messy, you know. A bath? Oh, how lovely of you. I hadn't thought of it, but it would make me feel better. Oh, thanks. That's awfully kind. What a pretty negligee. Well, I feel good in this. Everything she has is perfect. Yes, thanks so much, Ellie. Don't wait. I have everything I need. She's got lots of toilet soap. I ought to have known she would. She's got such taste. Everything is perfect. Mm, gosh, does this feel good. This nice luck soap will do the trick all right. I love the way it lathers. Yes, a Lux Toilet Soap Beauty Bath will do the trick. Leave Ellie's guest feeling fresh from head to toe. This luxurious white soap that nine out of ten screen stars use has creamy, active lather that swiftly carries away perspiration, every trace of dust and dirt. You'll find a daily Lux Soap Beauty Bath a wonderful way to protect daintiness, make you sure of fresh, fragrant skin. And it's true that Lux Toilet Soap in your bathroom has come to be one of those little things that mean good housekeeping, good taste. The superlative quality of this fine white soap, its delicate, distinctive perfume, makes it a joy to family and to guests. It's luxurious, and yet not a luxury. For it's sold by so many thousands of cakes that its price is kept low. Now, the economical way to buy it is three cakes at a time. And you might try leaving a cake you aren't using in among your linens or under things. It'll leave them delightfully fragrant. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of Remember the Night, starring Barbara Stanwyck as Lee and Fred McMurray as John Sargent, with Beulah Bundy as his mother, Elizabeth Patterson as Aunt Emma, and Sterling Holloway as Willie. Westward, along the snow-banked highways from New York, more than 20 hours of steady driving have brought Lee Leander and Jack Sargent to Eltonville, Indiana, and the front gate of Lee's former home. A bright moon softens the outline of the ramshackle house that, that stands cold and dark on the outskirts of the town. From within the house comes the warning wail of a dog as Jack swings the car up to the sagging front porch. This is it, huh? Yes. Yeah. Well, all out then. End of the line. Oh, please, let's wait till... Well, my mother might not even live here anymore. Hey, don't be so nervous. Well, will you go in with me? Sure, I'll go in with you. Come on, I've got your bag. See that tree? Yeah. I fell out of it when I was 12. Oh, I was a terrible tomboy. See, from that branch right up there. I landed on my head, too. <laughs> That's a better gag than hypnotism. Your lawyer should have used that. As a matter of fact, you should have had me for your lawyer. Come on now, smile. Here we are. Oh, gee, I, I didn't mean to knock so loud. Oh, that sounds like Mickey barking. Oh, it couldn't be. He'd be too... Here's somebody coming. Yeah. Now, look, I'll pick you up on New Year's Day in the afternoon. Don't forget. No. Gee, you've been sweet. Will you shut up? Yes? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Doesn't Mrs. Malone live here? Oh, I guess you want my wife. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, this is Henry. Somebody want me? Mama... Oh, Merry Christmas, Mama. Well, you... You know me, don't you? Come in. This is Mr... Uh... Sergeant, how do you do? Sit down. You're looking fine, Mama. What did you come here for? What do you want? Oh, I don't want anything, Mama. It was just Christmas, and Mr. Sergeant happened to be driving... You past... see, I live in Wabash. It's just about 50 miles from here. I knew you'd be glad if glad? I... Glad? Why should I be glad? Good riddance to bad rubbish, I said, the day she left. Oh, Mama, please, Mr. Sergeant... Just like her father she is. Always laughing at serious things she was. Never doing what she's told till she winds up stealing. Stealing my mission money. Money I'd put by with the sweat of my brow, that's what. I didn't steal it. I, I told you a thousand times I only borrowed it. I was going to pay you back. But you didn't pay me back, did you? And you never paid me back. Well, how could I after you called me a thief in front of the whole town? Nobody would give me a job. And you left here. The great lady. We weren't good enough for you. A decent home, a hard-working mother, and a crook for a daughter. Oh, Mama. Look, Lee, I don't want to tear you away, but uh, we still have 50 miles to go. Oh. Are you ready? Oh, yes. It's been very interesting to meet you, Mrs. Uh... The name doesn't concern you. It most certainly does not. Come on, kid. Oh, 
God. I've forgotten how much that woman hates me. And how much I hate her. That's a terrible thing to say, isn't it? No. But ever since I was little, she was always so right and I was always so wrong. Thanks for getting me out. I'll stay anywhere. Any old place will do if I'm far enough away from her. Hey, take it easy. I wish I'd broken my neck when I fell out of that tree. It's a little too late to think about that now, isn't it? You won't make me stay in Nelsonville. You'll find me a room somewhere else. Sure, I will. Any old dump will do. That's just what you're going to get. It's only got one window and the mattress is stuffed with rocks and... It's got a painting of the cross-eyedest old man you ever saw in your life. How do you know? How do I know what? Oh, that my grandfather was cross-eyed? You mean you're... You're taking me home with you? Why not? Oh. Well, forget... Now what? Oh. Oh, Mother. Oh, my boy, my oh, boy. Oh, gosh, Mother, it's good to see you. Oh, I just can't believe you're here at last. Well, Jack, Sergeant. Hey, Annie, hello, Annie. How about a kiss, huh? <laughs> oh, uh, uh, I declare I'm glad you're here. If only to stop your mother from taking leave of her senses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, I'll say. Hello, John. Welcome home. Hello, Willie. The girl's still chasing you? Oh, John. <laughs> what made you so late, dear? We thought you'd be here by six at least. Well, you see... <laughs> hey, who's that in the front seat? Oh, I, I'm sorry. Mother, this is Miss Lee Leander. She's come to spend Christmas with us. How do you do? Oh, how nice. Well, I'm so glad to know you, my dear. And this is my Aunt Emmy. Knows more about flannel cakes than the guy who invented them. Hello. <laughs> I'm right pleased to meet you, Miss Leander. And this is Willie Sims, our hired boy. Crazy about the girls, and the girls are crazy about him. I <laughs> Willie Sims. <laughs> pleased to meet you. Hello. I hope I won't be too much trouble, Mrs. Sergeant. Trouble? Why, bless your child, it's a joy no to have you here. No trouble at all, not a thing. <laughs> but, John, Sergeant, why didn't you send me a telegram? Well, you see, Mother, this was rather unexpected. Well, and I... never mind all that. Now, come along, child. You must be near freezing to death. And here we are, cackling like a couple of Emmy. What? Did you leave those cookies in the oven? Oh, jeepers creepers. Oh. <laughs> Come along now, everyone. This way, Miss Leanne. Thanks. Oh, boy, John. What? Ain't she a peacherino? Who? Oh. <laughs> oh. All I can say is hot dog. <laughs> Come on, grab a grip, will you? I want to thaw up in a hurry. Go on, Jack. Now, don't stop. Play that other piece you used to do so good. I can't remember it anymore, Mother. Oh, well, try, dear. Don't you think he plays nice, Miss Leander? You don't have to answer that, Lee. I, I had $14 <laughs> worth of piano lessons once, and they've never forgotten it. <laughs> <laughs> Willie, hand me that popcorn. We've got to have it all strung for the tree tomorrow. Yes, am Here you are. Well, here. Yeah, you can help me. You haven't done a thing all night. Oh, gee, didn't I help Miss Leander with all them dinner dishes? You should have done them yourself, Willie. Miss Leander's a guest. Oh, I oh. like doing them, Mrs. Sargent. I've lived in hotels and uh, places so long, I haven't been around the house as much as I'd like. <laughs> Your folks dead? Willie. Ma'am? Oh, I don't oh. mind. My father's dead. My mother's remarried. Well, that's too bad, my dear. I always say it's so hard on the children. It just isn't the same with a new parent. Uh, um, um, go on, go on, Jack. Now, just one more piece. No, that's all the next year, enemy. Oh, please, dear. I'll play you a piece if you want. Oh, that'd be fine. Oh, gee, can you play? Well, I used to play in a dime store. What would you all like? It doesn't make any difference. I can sing the end of a perfect day. Now, Willie. Well, I can. So can everybody else, Willie. The end of a perfect day. I think I remember it. Oh, boy. Uh, give us a downbeat, please, Miss Leander. <laughs> when you come to the end of a perfect day And you sit Alone with your thought While the chimes ring out With a carol day For the joy that Son, time for bed. 
gracious, the evening's gone past. The rest went up long ago. Wait, Mother. There's one thing you must be curious about. What, dear? Miss Leander. Yes? I, uh, I don't know whether to tell you this or not, but I don't like to bring somebody under your roof without you knowing exactly who she is. Oh, John, I think I can guess. What? Huh? Oh, no, no, not at all, Mother. She isn't even a friend of mine. Well, she certainly should be. I think she's charming. She is charming, Mother, but... Uh... She reminds me of your father's cousin, Winifred, who died when her second was born. The lovely, sweet thing. I was just saying to Emmy... Wait a minute, Mother. Unfortunately, the girl's a crook. I'm going to put her in jail when we get back to New York. What? But in the meanwhile, she had no place to go for Christmas, oh, so I... Oh, the uh... poor lamb. You'll do no such thing, John Sargent. Why, that girl's as honest as all outdoors. I can tell by just looking at her face. Well, if she did take some little thing, I'm, I'm sure it was entirely by mistake. She's, she's probably a, a hypochondriac. Hypochondriac, huh? Don't she mind be at that? She hasn't really taken things, has she, dear? You're just making a bad joke now, aren't you? No, Mother. I'm afraid this isn't even her first offense. But that doesn't mean she wasn't unhappy and lonely and a human being like the rest of us. Well, the poor thing probably didn't get enough love as a child. Do you remember how bad you were... Well, not really bad, but... Do you remember the time you took my egg money I was going to buy a new dress with? And then how hard you worked to pay it back when you understood. You made me understand. Oh, it was love, dear, that made you understand. Well, I do hope she enjoys her stay here. Now, we must do everything to make her happy and comfortable and to feel like one of the family. Do you think we ought to lock up the silver? (laughs) (laughs) Well, good night, son. Good night, Mother. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, dear. Oh, well, I don't know. Oh, this is lovely. I've never seen so many presents in all my days. Well, here's another one for you, Mother. For me? Oh, John, another bottle of perfume. Ecstasy, too. Well, I haven't even started on that bottle of ecstasy you gave me last year. Oh, see. And then here's a present for you. Oh. Willie, what have you got there? I don't know yet. Getting her open. My Jack. Huh? What? Oh, what's this supposed to be? Oh, a nightgown, Emmy. Oh, Jack Sergeant, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Gee, you can see right through it. <laughs> Willie, it's lovely. Uh, <laughs> gee, we've got all our stuff open and... Well, I'm sorry about the present situation, Lee. We'd only know him sooner. Why, John, there's some presents for Miss Leander over there on the sofa. Oh. Why, of course, Jack, you must have forgotten. Oh, well, I guess you can always trust Santa Claus. Three packages, Lee, here. Merry Christmas, Oh, no. Oh, you shouldn't have gone to all that trouble. Open them up now, dear. Oh, what a lovely pincushion. It's so pretty. Oh, it's nothing at all. Just scraps and things I've been collecting for years. (laughs) Here's the next one, huh? Very Merry Christmas to Miss Leander from Jack's Aunt Emmy. Stockings. Oh, thank you so much. Mm. Bed socks. (laughs) Not so fancy, but wonderful on a cold night for a spinster lady. Oh, that's (laughs) awfully sweet of you all. Here's another, Miss Leander. Oh, no, not really. Yeah. Who's that from, Willie? From you, you big dunce. Don't you remember anything? Oh, but I didn't... Great, you're safe. Oh, Oh, perfume. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's nothing. Just a bottle of perfume. And ecstasy, too. Yeah, that's right. Oh, you're you're all much too kind. I don't think I've ever met anyone so thoughtful and so... Oh, nonsense, child. We're so happy to have you and so anxious for you to enjoy your stay. Of course, there isn't much to do here, except tonight we're bobbing for apples, and tomorrow the young folks have a treasure hunt, and Thursday's the charity bazaar. Then we rest up for a day. And the next day's New Year's. That's the big event. And this year we're having a real old fashioned barn dance like the Hicks were supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's all there is. Farmers' wives don't die of boredom anymore, they die of heart failure. <laughs> <laughs> Merry I declare this is the best barn dance we've ever had. <laughs> yes. Oh, they dance beautifully together, don't they? It reminds me. What? Who? Jack and Miss Leander. Like they were made for each other. If you're hinting that John's in love with her, well, well, he isn't, Emmy. Better six, Lucy. Better six. She's in love with him, too. I tell you, they're not. You don't know anything about these things, Emmy. Lucy Sergeant, if you're referring to the fact that I never married, I'd like to point out that you don't have to be a horse to judge a horse show. If ever I saw two people in love. They're not. They can't be. 
They just can't be. Almost over, isn't it? Yeah, just about. We'll be pulling out for New York in the morning. And the third will be one day nearer. The third? Mm-hmm. Oh, you mean that third? When my case comes up again. I haven't thought of it. I have. But you've all been so sweet, no matter what happens after we get back. It won't matter so much. I'll have some wonderful memories. So will I. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to wish you all a very happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year, Lee. Happy New Year, Jack. You know, it's an old-fashioned custom, but people always kiss each other. Well, at this time. I know it. Well, what am I waiting for? I don't know. Why are you? Six o'clock comes right early, children. You better get your sleep. What time is breakfast, Aunt Emmy? Time you leave early. What'll it be? Flannel cakes or fried mush? Well, how about it, Lee? Oh, I think we'll ride better on the mush. Fried mush, then. Good night, children. Good, good night, night, Aunt Emmy. You sleepy? Not very. How about a good night cigarette? Well, I'd love it. I'll meet you downstairs. Swell. I'll be waiting for you. Just a minute, Jack. I was just... Oh, Mrs. Sargent. I'm sorry to disturb you, dear, but you'll be in such a rush in the morning. Oh, no, you're not disturbing me. Come in. Thank you. First of all, I want you to know how glad we've been to have you here and how much I hope you've enjoyed your stay. You'll never know how much. And then, well, I want you to know how sorry I am that you're in trouble and how much I hope it'll come out all right. I... I didn't know you knew about that. Oh, you poor child. You can be sure I I never would have mentioned it now, only... Well, has Jack ever told you anything about his childhood? No, why? We were very poor after my husband died. In fact, we had nothing. Jack had to do chores before school and after school, and then after chores, he studied in the evening so he could go to college. Then he had to work his way through college and through law school. Oh, I don't mean there's anything unusual about it, but I'm I'm only trying to tell you that he worked very hard to get where he is. Very, very hard. And, well, he's my son, and I wouldn't want anything or anyone to spoil it for him now. I see. But I don't see why anything should spoil it for him, do you? He's in love with you. Oh, no, he isn't in love with me. He's never had any more interest in me than, well, some panhandler he'd buy a meal for. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. He kissed you tonight. Well, not exactly ugly. Oh, he might have had a little fever for me, but it isn't going any further, and it hasn't been any place either. I see. He's no fool. And even if he was, I wouldn't hurt him or you, Aunt Emmy or even Willie. Thank you, dear. And good night. But you do love him, don't you? I'm... I'm afraid so. I knew you did. Lee. Lee. Yes? How about that good night cigarette? No. No, thanks. I'm too sleepy. Oh. Okay. See you in the morning. Good night. Good night. I'll see you in the morning. <laughs>
curtain falls on the second act of Remember the Night with Barbara Stanwyck, Fred McMurray, Elizabeth Patterson, Beulah Bondi, and Sterling Holloway. Before our stars return in Act Three, let's hear from our studio reporter, Libby Collins. Well, Mr. Heroic, I'm much impressed with the young Warner Brothers star who's attracting a great deal of attention right now, Jane Wyman. Oh, yes, Jane Wyman. Say, she did Warner Brothers proud in Brother Rat and a Baby. And let's see... And in Angel from Texas, a new picture which will be out in a few weeks. Young Jane Wyman distinguished herself so in those two parts, Mr. Roy, that all the wise money in Hollywood is betting that she'll be one of the biggest stars in pictures in a year or two. What's Jane like personally, Libby? Mm, She's one of the all-round nicest girls I've ever met. And a regular dynamo of energy. In fact, her nickname at the studio is Dynamite. That's interesting. She's just been married to Ronald Regan, who has a romantic interest in several pictures. Yes, I remember that. Incidentally, Jane is another of that army of models who've made good in pictures. She makes good use of that experience now by designing her own clothes. Do you know what a Hollywood makeup man told me about Jane Wyman? No, what was it to be? That she's one of the most naturally beautiful girls in Hollywood. And so I thought what she has to say about complexion beauty ought to be especially interesting. Well, I think you're right about that, Libby. What does she say? She says she thinks the most important single thing a girl can do for her complexion is to use Lux soap every night at bedtime for an active lather facial. Jane says she herself never misses out on this, no matter how tired she is. It only takes about three minutes, and she sleeps better because her conscience is clear. She knows she done right by her skin. Thank you, Libby. It's evident that Jane Wyman is a clever little girl. She's not going to risk spoiling her complexion the good looks that mean so much to her success, through carelessness. Now, what about your complexion? Is it as lovely as it ought to be? You'll find Lux Toilet Soap a wonderful beauty aid. You'll find, if you use it regularly, this soap with active lather really works. Now, perhaps without realizing it, you've been careless about removing stale cosmetics, dust and dirt. And so your skin is, well, not what it might be. Why don't you make sure of thorough cleansing? Why don't you begin tonight to give your skin the gentle beauty care that Lux Toilet Soap's Active Lather gives? Take your first Active Lather facial tonight, and then keep it up for 30 days. See what it can do for you. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain rises on the third act of Remember the Night. It's early the following morning. In the half light, just before dawn, Jack and Lee are ready to leave for New York. As they come down the steps of the old house, Mrs. Sargent takes Lee aside. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye, Mrs. Sargent. Remember, there's always a room upstairs for you, and we'll be only too glad to have you. That, that is, if everything turns out. <laughs> I mean, of course it will. I know it will. And don't drive too fast, Jack Sargent. If you get tired, just drive into a field someplace and go to sleep. No, thanks. Anyway, we're going up through Canada. I've never seen the place. Canada? What are you talking about? Oh, just a different way of getting there. Well, whatever you do, John, take good care of yourself. I will, Mother. Bye, Jack. Bye, Emmy. So long, Willie. Goodbye. Goodbye, dear. Let me hear from you often. I will, mother. Bye. Goodbye, Miss Leanne. Goodbye, Goodbye. Willie. Goodbye, all. Goodbye. 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 Hey, Goodbye. don't forget to write. And don't you forget to chop some wood. Christmas is over. Oh, ain't it the truth? Ain't it the truth? <laughs> idea of stopping. Lee, do you know where we are? Of course. We're in Canada. We should be. We crossed the border three hours ago. No, you don't get it. Look, this is Canada. Over there's the United States. Stay here, Lee. Don't go back. Oh, stop talking nonsense. It isn't nonsense. I'm not a policeman. I can't make you go. Is your conscience gnawing at you? What do you think it was when I got bail for you? Oh, that. That seems like 80 years ago. I didn't even know you were against me. Oh, I, I did know you were supposed to be trying to put me in jail or something, but... 
Oh, you were so gentle about it. Yeah, that's part of the technique. If you don't treat a woman with kid gloves, every man in the jury wants to punch you in the nose. And you have to handle the jury with kid gloves, too. You'll get it right in the verdict. You know, it's very hard to put a woman in jail no matter what she's done. I'm supposed to be kind of a specialist at it. No, you're not. Sure I am. You're just trying to make me hate you so you won't feel so bad when you give me the business, aren't you? Look, are you going to stay in Canada? A fine district attorney you are, telling me to jump bail. You know I love you, don't you? Don't say that. And you love me? No. I suppose that's why you've looked at me the way you have, and kissed me the way you did. And why your hand has always found mine, and mine has always found yours whenever they were anywhere near each other. Oh, Jack, don't be a fool. Look, I... I'm only human... You've got to remember how hard you work to get where you are. You've got to think of the hours and the days and the years you spent getting through college. I see. Mother's been talking to you. Well, why shouldn't she? She's got everything to be proud of. And you've got to be proud and think about it, too, instead of telling people to jump bail and tell... I love you, Lee. Oh, Jack. I love you. Oh, darling. It'll be awfully hard to lose you. You know what I wish? What? I wish the case was over and you'd been acquitted. And... Oh, then you shouldn't have had it postponed. Yeah. If I hadn't, I'd never have met you. That's true. So the case is dismissed and you've been acquitted. Not good. And I pull out a marriage license. Oh, and, gee. And we march right into the judge's chambers and have him marry us. <laughs> you know, you're talking like a madman, don't you? Yeah, I, I guess so. Come on, let's go. Jack, the courtroom's less than a block away. Or don't you care if the jury and the rest of them see you with me? Oh, so I'm not good enough to be seen with you, huh? You don't love me anymore. I never loved you. Were you just toying with oh, me? Oh, shut up. <laughs> You'll have to develop more courtesy and respect for your future husband, or I shall fall back in strong measures. A woman, a dog, and a hickory tree, the better you beat them, the better they be. Oh, quit it, <laughs> will you? All right. What? I can't argue with you. Imagine being married to a man who argues for a living. But you know all this isn't right. Can't you see the papers? District attorney marries girl crook. I'd only hurt you, Jack. But you won't be a crook. You, you'll be acquitted. How do you know? Well, I, I don't know, but I, I think you've got a good chance. You wouldn't do anything to make them acquit me, would you? What could I do? I don't know, but you could throw the case Listen, if you... Listen, you're being tried by a judge and a jury. It's up to them. They know the facts. They speak for themselves. There's nothing I can do about it. Not a thing. I hope there isn't. It would be a fine thing, wouldn't it? Now, don't worry. Everything's going to come out all right. So long, darling. I'll see you in court. You may proceed, Mr. Sergeant. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, well, if this jury will let me, they've been mumbling to themselves all morning. I'll take care of the jury, Mr. Sergeant. Thank you. Now, Miss Leander, I believe you have testified that you were hypnotized at the time you left the jewelry store and walked up Fifth Avenue. Didn't you? I, I... Did you or didn't you? Answer the question, Miss Leander. Well, my lawyer said so. Oh, your lawyer said so. Are we to understand, then, that you and your lawyer do not agree as to exactly what happened? Don't answer that question. Object, if Your Honor, please. The question is entirely improper, and I, I ask it to be stricken from the record. Sustained. The jury will disregard the question. I was only trying... Your Honor, those jurors are at it again. If they'd listen to the testimony instead of whispering among themselves... Like... Proceed with the case, please. You can't hear yourself think. Well, Miss Leander, were you hypnotized or weren't you? I... I suppose... We don't want your suppositions. We want to know whether or not you were hypnotized. Yes. Guess what? I guess I was hypnotized. You guess you were hypnotized. First you supposed you were hypnotized, now you guess you were. Kindly remember you're under oath. Do you know the penalty for perjury? If your honor, please, I object. Sustained. Tell me, Miss Leander, just how many times have you been hypnotized by beautiful jewelry? I guess quite a lot of times. Did you hear by any chance Dr. Keimlitz's opinion concerning hypnotism? Well? I, 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 I'm trying to think. I, I... You don't treat a woman with kid gloves. Every man on the jury wants to punch you on the nose. Oh... Will the witness please answer my question? And will the juries please stop mumbling? Jack, you... you... You have to handle the jury with kid gloves, too. You'll get it right in the verdict. He's my son. All right, it's all right. Just take all the time you want, Miss Leander. He's worked so hard. I wouldn't want anything to spoil. 
spoil it for him now. Well, Miss Leander? Oh. Nothing must spoil it for him. Well, Miss Leander, what is it? What is it? Oh. Your Honor, I object to the tactics being pursued by the district attorney. He's, he's harrying the defense. No, no, wait. Wait, I want to plead guilty. Your Honor, I, I don't believe this young woman is well. I request a five-minute recess. I want to plead guilty. Your, Your Honor, Honor, it must please, be... Please, it must be perfect. Your Honor, a few minutes recess, please. please. She's obviously not responsible for what she's saying. I ask that Your Honor intercede in this matter. Why do you wish to plead guilty? Because I am guilty. You see, when you work hard for something and, and promises are made, you just can't toss it away, no matter what. Your Honor, it must be perfectly clear now that this is not normal behavior. Perfectly clear, of course. And the state has no desire to take advantage of a temporary operation. There isn't anything temporary about this. Your Honor, you can see that I'm in my right mind. I plead guilty. You leave me no other alternative. The court at this time will fix next Friday, January 6th at 10 a.m. as day for passing sentence. The prisoner is remanded to the city jail. The jury is dismissed. Mr. Sergeant, to see you, Miss Leander. All right. This way, Mr. Sergeant. Ten minutes. Thanks. Hello. Do you realize what you've done? Yes. Do you realize it can't be undone? Yes. You understand there's no appeal, nothing but jail. How long will I get? Oh, how do I know? Maybe not very long, but if, if you'd kept your trap shut, you wouldn't be in here at all. Well, there wasn't anything else to do. You're so strong, and you argue so well, and I... I love you so much. Yeah, you certainly proved that. I'd always do what you wanted, even if it wasn't good for you. I'd never have a chance against you, and... You'd never have a chance with me. Like, well, like just now when you were trying to lose the case. Oh, aren't you ashamed? Oh, stop it. Oh, I know what you were trying to do. Save little Jackie's career from the bad, bad woman. Don't you think I'm the best judge of what's good for me and what I want most in this world? No. And while you were making your big gesture, did you stop to think how much you'd be hurting me? Do you think I'll stop loving you just because they lock you up with a bunch of hoodlums and hopheads for the next few years? I'm not much better. Well, you were good enough for me. Will you... Will you come and see me sometime? Come and see you? I'm going to send for the judge and marry you right this minute. Oh. Oh, no. Thanks, but... If you still wanted me afterwards... You'd be a sucker if you did, but... If you did... It wouldn't be the same. I'd be all square and... And... You would have had plenty of time to think things over. I don't have to think. I'll be waiting for you, Lee. No matter how long it is, I'll be waiting. Jack, will you stand beside me and hold my hand when I'm sentenced? You know I will. Then I won't be afraid. It'll be kind of like a marriage at that, won't it? And the... The other part won't be so bad or so long. With your voice always in my ear, your smile always before my eyes, and the, the feel of your hand always in mine. Oh, Lee. I love you so. I love you so. Lee Leander and John Sargent will meet again in the not-too-distant future. Right now, we meet Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray again as they take a curtain call. Uh, CB, I, I think Fred ought to run for district attorney. A, a jury would be putty in his hands. Oh, not me, Barbara. I, I'd be scared to death making speeches in front of a lot of people. <laughs> oh, you'd get over that, Fred. There's a trick to it. You pick out one person in the audience and talk to him. Forget about the crowd. Oh, that doesn't work, C.B. Oh, you can't be sure until you try. I've tried it. 
You know, I used to play the saxophone in an orchestra. Why, well, that's nothing to be ashamed of, Fred. Uh, you never heard me play the saxophone. Well, uh, what I was going to tell you was that whenever one of us did a solo, we had to stand up. But I couldn't do it because I was, I was so scared my teeth chattered. You ever, you ever play the saxophone with your teeth chattering, C.B.? <laughs> Fred, Fred I, I, I'm ashamed to say I, I'd never played a saxophone. With or without my teeth chattering. <laughs> Well, somebody told me about that trick of looking at one person and forgetting about the crowd. So one night when my saxophone solo came along, I picked out a girl that was dancing just in front of the orchestra, and I played the saxophone right to her. Did it work? No, she stuck her tongue out at me. <laughs> Guess she must have been a music lover. <laughs> well, seriously, Fred, I enjoyed doing Remember the Night with you both for the screen and here in the Lux Radio Theater this week. And now I, I want to say just a word about Lux Soap. I think it's a grand complexion care. I, I wouldn't be surprised if I said something like that before, C.B., but it's still true because I still use Lux Soap just as I have for years. I'll never get tired of hearing you say that, Barbara. What's the play for next week, C.B.? Next Monday night, our play is the great motion picture hit, Love Affair. And our stars will be Irene Dunn and William Powell. Love Affair, produced by Leo McCary for RKO, is one of the finest love stories the screen has given us in many years. <laughs> A drama that begins on shipboard... And ends, well, I'll leave that for next Monday night, when we'll have William Powell and Irene Dunn as the lovers in our production of Love Affair. I'll take two seats on the living room aisle for that one, uh, C.B. Hmm. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. The jury finds you both guilty of a great performance. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night. When the Lux Radio Theater presents Irene Dunn and William Powell in Love Affair. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Heard in tonight's play were Lou Merrill as O'Leary, Jack Carr as Rufus, John Fee as Judge, Edward Marr as Tom, Wally Mayer as District Attorney, Celeste Rush as Mother, Arthur Q. Bryan as Mike, Walter White as Clerk, Sidney Newman as Cassidy, Anne Lee as secretary, and Warren Rock as a policeman. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Peter Tobin introducing Lux Radio Theater. Tonight and every Monday night at this time, Lux Radio Theater presents for your entertainment the finest in radio drama. This week we bring you Trap for a Lonely Man by Robert Thomas, translated by Lucien Hill and John Sutro. A distraught young man, Daniel Corbin, living in a remote chalet in the French Alps, reports to the police that his wife, Elizabeth, has disappeared. After ten days of unsuccessful searching, a young woman suddenly appears at the chalet in the company of a priest and claims to be Elizabeth Corbin. Daniel declares most vehemently that the woman is not his wife. The woman declares equally vehemently that she is. Who is lying and why? Is the young woman an imposter? Or is Daniel suffering from loss of memory, perhaps madness? Listen in a few moments to this tense and brilliantly constructed mystery, Trap for a Lonely Man, produced for Lux Radio Theater by Anne Freed and directed by Henry Diffenthal. And now, Act One of tonight's Lux Radio Theatre presentation, Trap for a Lonely Man. Inspector, 
Any news? No news, I'm afraid. What? Do you mean to say you've driven all the way from Chamonix to tell me that? No news? Five minutes' drive, that's no distance. I just dropped in to see how you were. What have you done since I last saw you? Anything? I put in a report. It's taking its course. Taking its course? What's the use of that? I want results. I demand results. Have you got any news of my wife or haven't you? Monsieur, there is no need to shout. I'm sorry. Do sit down, won't you? Monsieur, you mustn't torture yourself. <laughs> At least 10,000 wives leave their husbands every year in France alone. And 99 of 100 come back within a week. Have you done anything to find her? Oh, yes, I know, I know. You put in a report. But apart from that... It's not a police job to bring back flighty wives, you know. My wife isn't flighty. She left me ten days ago after a quarrel. Did you often quarrel? Now and again, who doesn't? Have you any idea where she might have gone? Is there any way you can write to her? I told you, I told you. I wrote to our flat in Paris. The letter was returned. The porter had instructions to mail letters here. Any relatives? Friends? I don't know much about her friends. She never mentioned anyone special, and I haven't met any of her family as yet. We've only been married three months, Inspector. And I've told you all this before. Does she see any of her relatives? There's only an old uncle, and he's on his last legs. Oh, yes. I recollect the rich old uncle. You told me. Yes, I... She'll think. come back, Monsieur Corbin. My advice to you is to stay where you are and wait until she does. So stop worrying. If anything's happened to her, we'll know soon enough. Don't! If anything happened to her, I'd never forgive myself. It's all my fault. Oh? It was an argument. Nothing serious. But I've got a temper. Oh, she'll never come back, I know it. Nonsense, of course she will. I loved her desperately, Inspector. You are young, monsieur. Even supposing she doesn't come back. Don't let it spoil your life. It's not worth it. Nothing is. You get married in June, she walks out in September. What's three months in a lifetime? It's easy for you to talk. Oh, take the long view, ma'am. Your wife was rich, wasn't she? Yes, she was. With these rich women, you can't win. Your wife has had money all her life, and she's used to her own way. She'll either come begging for you to take her back, or you'll get a letter from her asking for a divorce. A divorce? When she went down on her knees to get me to... And she'd do a thing like this to me. That's what you've come for, isn't it? Well, go on. Give me the divorce papers. Come on, let's have them. Monsieur, I am a policeman, not a lawyer. Why should I have divorce papers? I told you I had no news of your wife, and I haven't. Why should I lie to you, eh? I'm sorry, Inspector. But I'm worried, and I've been missing her desperately. I apologize. I'm irritable. You've been patient and understanding. Monsieur, my advice to you is don't worry. She'll come back. I'm an older man than you are, and I know women. The very devil to manage, but where would we be without them, eh? Now you pour yourself a drink and try to relax. I must get back to the village. If you have any news, let me know. Yes, Inspector. And thank you again. Good evening. Good evening. You are Monsieur Corbin, aren't you? Uh, Daniel Corbin? Yes. I know the lady of the house, but I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet. I'm Father Maxima. Oh, how do you do? I've just taken over the parish of Saint-Jean from Father Simonet. I expect you know Father Simonet, don't you? No, I'm on holiday. I've only rented this chalet. Uh, sit down, Father. Thank you. Can I give you a drink? Uh, I won't say no. It's whiskey. chilly these autumn evenings. A brandy? No, whiskey, I think. Uh, a very weak one, thank you. I ventured to call because I have a holy picture for Madame Corba. A holy picture? It is the custom of our mountain churches. We present a holy picture when we receive a donation. My wife gave you a donation? Yes, she gave me a hundred francs. A lot of money. She's a wonderful person. Yes, isn't she? Here's the picture. I'll see my wife gets it when she... If she returns. Oh? She's gone. Left me. Oh. I'm sorry. Uh, um... May I ask you a question? Um, are you still in love with your wife? Of course. You were married in church, I hope. Yes. A tiny church among the pine trees near Juan. Honeymoon in Venice. Then a friend of mine offered to rent me the chalet. The second evening we were here, we quarreled. Elizabeth packed her bags and left. I see. That was ten days ago, and I haven't heard a word from her since. Not a word. 
I love her dearly, I do, Father, and I miss her. Oh, more than I can say. Monsieur, I have good news for you. Oh? Your wife has come back. What did you say? I saw a young woman at afternoon prayers today in my church at Saint-Jean. She was weeping. I recognized her as Madame Corbin. She told me the whole story. You... you mean... I brought her here with me. She was afraid you'd be angry, so I told her I would speak with you first. She's waiting outside. Oh. Here. Are these your cigarettes on this desk? Uh, would you like one? Yes. Yes, please. My wife outside. This is... Uh, here. Thank you. I'll ask your wife to come, monsieur. Uh, madame, uh, will you come through, please? Daniel. Oh, darling, please forgive me. But... Oh, everything will be all right now. I know it will. Oh, I've missed you so terribly. Oh, darling. Father Maxima, I'll thank you for everything. Bless you. I must just go to my room now. There, monsieur. But that is not my wife. What? That woman isn't Elizabeth. Monsieur, I don't comprehend. I've never set eyes on that woman before in my life. You're joking. Father, I tell you, I don't know that woman. Isn't she Madame Corbin? Certainly not. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. That girl is either an adventuress or a lunatic. Now, you upstairs, come down. Come down. And now, keep calm, monsieur. You will kindly get out of my house and take that woman back where you found her. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, Madame Corbin, uh, will you come down, please? Tell me, do you often have these emotional upsets? Do you suffer from loss of memory at all? Loss of memory? Of course not. I tell you, that woman is not my wife. She's the woman who gave us that generous donation the other day. What? She... She called herself Elizabeth Corma. But of course, monsieur. Uh, this is ridiculous. Oh, you called, darling? Oh, oh, it's so wonderful to be home again. I've only spent two days in this chalet, but I've missed it terribly. Oh, my mountain. Look here. You are not my wife. Oh, darling, you haven't been drinking too much, have you? Oh, dear, empty glasses. Remember what the doctor said? He said you shouldn't drink. You know it's bad for your nerves. And your depression is always worse when you drink. Nerves? Depression? What the devil are you talking about? My nerves are, are perfectly all right, and I'm never depressed. Ah, so that's what it is. Oh, it's nothing serious, Father. Uh, Only mild attacks now and again, and, and they don't last. Oh, darling, it's me. I'm back. You aren't my wife. Great heavens, I should know. Why are you doing this? I should never have gone away. Look at the state he's in, Father. Oh, my poor darling. Father, don't listen to her. She's trading on your innocence. She wants you to think I'm mad. This woman is an adventuress. I don't know her. I've never seen her before. Get out. Do you hear me? Get out! No, you're hurting my arm. Uh, steady now, monsieur. You must not treat your wife like that. She is not my wife. Daniel, if this is a joke... A joke? You believe I would joke about this? Now, darling, do stop it. Get out of here or I'll have you arrested for trespassing. Really, Daniel, stop being childish. Why are you pretending to be Elizabeth? Answer me. Why? But I am Elizabeth. Tell the truth. What game is this? Darling, darling, look at me. I'm your wife. I'm Elizabeth. Oh, Father, help me. Help me. He doesn't recognize me. Recognize you? I keep telling you I have never set eyes on you before. Father, he was like this in Venice on our honeymoon. One evening... How do you know that my wife and I went to Venice on our honeymoon? One evening I came home rather late from the hairdresser. And I found Daniel in our hotel room raging like a maniac. What? It took me all night to quieten him down. That's a lie. Oh, it's all my fault. I should never have left him, Father. But he was cruel lies. It's all wretched lies. You'll help me, Father, won't you? You'll help me? Yes, yes, my child, of course I will. We'll both look after you, Monsieur Cobain. But are you feeling better now, my angel? Do you recognize me now? It's all a plot. A fantastic, incredible plot. But I'll soon put things right. Oh, yes, I will. What are you doing? I telephone the police. For heaven's sake, don't. You'll make us both look ridiculous. Yes, monsieur, don't be too hasty. I don't know what you're up to, madame, but I'm not allowing you to get away with it. Daniel, please. You're frightened, aren't you? You see, the police know all about my wife's disappearance. 
So if you think you can, can force yourself upon me like this, you're mistaken. Oh, do something, Father. Help him. This is all very bewildering. I don't mind playing the good Samaritan, but I like to know what I'm doing. So if you don't mind, I'll phone the police. Hello. Chamonix? Uh, get me police headquarters. Yes, it's urgent. The inspector, yes. Hello, this is Father Maximin. I'm at the Corbin Chalet on the Chamonix Road. Oh, you have? Then I think you'd better come straight back. Well, you see, I brought his wife home. Well, no, Inspector, he isn't. He's not pleased at all. Give me that. Steady, monsieur. Listen, Inspector. A strange woman has just forced her way in here, and she's threatening to stay. Please come over immediately. No, this is not a joke, and I've not been drinking. Yes, yes, perhaps. Well, one or two. Yes, he's still here. Right? I'll tell him to stay. Thank you, Father. The inspector will soon get rid of her. Poor darling. Look, what game are you up to? Do you plan to get money out of me, is that it? <laughs> You're in for a disappointment, then. I won't allow you to get a penny of my money. That understood, not a penny. Your money? My money, you mean? You hadn't a penny when I married you. I... Oh, I... I'm, I'm sorry, darling. I, I didn't mean to say that. What's mine is yours, anyway. Now, see here. Monsieur, please, compose yourself and let us wait for the inspector. I'm getting sick and tired of this whole wretched business. I wish the inspector would come and, and arrest this imposter. Forgive me, madame, but uh, have you any means of identification? Papers, uh, a passport or something? That's an excellent idea, father. I should have thought of it. Well, madame, your passport, please. Of course, in my bag. Here you are. Elizabeth Corbo. This is a fake, a forgery. This seems authentic enough, monsieur. Great heavens. She's not alone. There must be a whole gang behind her. Daniel, for pity's sake, pull yourself together. If the police see you like this, they'll, they'll think you're verging on a breakdown. There's a car coming now. It's the police. At last, the inspector will soon clear this up. Inspector, come quickly. What's the matter? What's all this about? This woman arrived in this house. There she is. Madame. Good evening, Inspector. I'm afraid it's all a ghastly misunderstanding. Misunderstanding? Explain, madame. Uh, my husband telephoned you during one of his nervous attacks. What? That? It was nothing serious, really, Inspector, but he does have these spells sometimes. You mean I was brought back here and... I'm to... Elizabeth Corbin. She is not. I returned home a few moments ago she and found... She isn't my wife at all, Inspector. This woman's an imposter. Now, now, take it easy. Don't get so excited, monsieur. Sit down. Yes, do sit down, darling. Inspector, I don't know what sort of game she's playing, Be but... Be quiet, Daniel. You're only making it worse for yourself. I thought it best to call you, Inspector. I hope I did the right thing. Yes. Good evening. Oh, uh, I'm the new parish priest of Saint-Jean. Oh, I see, yes. Uh, this unfortunate gentleman doesn't recognize his wife. Father, she is not my wife. I'll show you a photograph here on the desk. Oh. Monsieur? There was a photograph of my wife on that desk. Father Maximin, you came over to this desk a moment ago. To get your cigarettes, yes. You're in league with her, aren't you? My photograph, where is it? The photograph of Elizabeth, which was standing there? No, there. not really. This is... Now, darling, you mustn't attack Father Maxima. He has nothing to do with all this. Your yeah, hand and glove, the pair of you. This man isn't a priest. Inspector... Now, you... watch what you're saying, Cobain. Look here, all of you. I'm Chief Inspector of the Police at Chamonix. I'm a busy man, and I haven't the time to spend listening to some crazy story about a wife who runs off and returns a different woman. This woman... Isn't my wife? She is. I'd be obliged if you would stop shouting at me. Inspector, that woman is not Elizabeth. Oh, really? This is ridiculous. Would you mind letting me talk to Monsieur Corban alone? I'd rather tell you what happened myself. For the time being, I'm making the decisions. Would you mind going? Whatever you wish, Inspector. Father Maximum, will you explain? Father Maximum will have his say in a moment. Perhaps you wouldn't mind waiting in here. Both of you. But, Inspector, uh, Come I... along, madame. It is best. Now, monsieur, let's try and make some sense out of this rigmarole. Rigmarole is right. 
That wretched woman forces her way in here and claims... Uh, do you mind if I sit down? Of course. Sorry. Uh, you were saying? Yes, well, it's like this. Just after you left, I was sitting here quietly when suddenly... Uh, do you mind if I smoke? Uh, of course not. Thank you. Proceed, monsieur. Your nerves are in a shocking state, aren't they? Can you wonder? That girl has the face All to... right, I've sent in one report about you, and I'm quite prepared to send in another. Now, let's begin at the beginning. You are Daniel Corbin. I've told you all this already. Now, do sit down and try to relax. You mustn't worry, monsieur. I'm here to help you. I'm sorry. Uh, you have no family, is that right? No family at all. My parents are dead. Have you ever been in trouble with the police? No, never. I swear, never. All right, I believe you. Go on. Last May, I met a wonderful girl called Elizabeth Marshalline. We got married three weeks later, and... But I've told you this before, and You are both living in such perfect harmony that she walks out and leaves you. But we've been happy. And she comes home again, and it suits you not to take her back. And there we are, the whole story. Have you found someone else, monsieur? There is no one. That woman isn't Elizabeth. She says she is, but she is lying. But why in heaven's name should she want to impersonate your wife? Heaven knows. It's such an unlikely story, monsieur. I wonder. Monsieur? I wonder if that so-called priest saw me as a likely victim and tipped her off. She means to convince you and everybody else that she is my legal wife. And then she's entitled to my money. Why? Are you so very rich, monsieur? Well, no, but... Then it doesn't make sense, does it? No, I suppose not. Unless you have uh, undeclared assets salted away, have you? No, certainly not. Or expectations? Expectations. A legacy, perhaps. I haven't any relatives. Wait a moment. I know. My wife's uncle. He's a millionaire. She mentioned some time ago that he was desperately ill. That's it. Has he died? I... I don't know. Curiouser and curiouser. Look... I'm frightened. If she's cool enough to pass herself off as my wife, she won't stop at that. Before long, she'll manage to become my widow. An accident, anything. Mm, it's happened before. And she's free to do as she likes. But what about your wife? Your real wife? She's gone. Perhaps. But she won't stand aside and allow someone to take over her fortune. It doesn't make sense, monsieur. It doesn't. Candidly, I find the whole story utterly fantastic. That's a good word for it. Fantastic. And evil, too. I believe this to be the work of a highly organized gang. Hmm, I'm curious to hear her side of the story. It's up to you to break it down, Inspector. And you'd better trace my wife quickly. I think I'll see the priest first. Father Maximum? Yes, Inspector? Just a few questions, Father. I'm sorry to trouble you. You have your papers on you? Of course, sir. Here. And if you'd care to ring the Bishop of Chambéry... Oh, there's no hurry. Ring him now. Don't give me orders. Do you mind? You'll excuse my checking up, won't you, Father? Of course. You're only doing your duty. I'm afraid this poor fellow isn't at all well. His mind seems to be... Why, you... Be quiet and let me handle this. Two, one, two. Father Maximum, I'm calling Canon Cambert of Chamonix. You know him, I expect. He's a great friend of my father's. I see. Hello? Is that you, Father? Inspector Quentin here. How are you? Oh, good. I wonder if you can help me. I have a Father Maximum here. Oh, you know him, do you? Splendid. Yes, yes, that is correct. Thank you. Goodbye, Father. This is unbelievable. Unbelievable is right. Look at him, will you? The nerve, the bare-faced impertinence of it, sheltering under a cassock. That's enough, Monsieur. Father Maximum looks perfectly calm, and you look a nervous wreck. The comparison isn't in your favor. Now will you sit down and keep quiet? All right, all right. Now then, Father, tell me all you know. Well, there isn't much. Madame Corbin came to see me. She said she wanted to go home, but she was afraid of her husband's temper. So she asked me to go with her. When she arrived, her husband started shouting that she was an imposter. Go on. And then, of course, I realized that Monsieur Corbin had... Uh... Lost his memory? Exactly. He threatened us. He tried to throw her out. She was in despair, poor soul. She was what? Quiet. According to you, Father, this woman really is Elizabeth Corbin. Most definitely. 
I saw her myself in this very room ten days ago. I see. It's a lie. Oh, it must have taken you weeks of research to spring the trap like this. Days of rehearsing to get it perfect. Now, look here, monsieur. I've had enough... Uh, gently, this... father. I'm sorry. Now, Corban, let's have a few names of people who saw your wife here 12 days ago. Who? Let me see. Who saw her? That's right. Wait a moment. We arrived on a Friday evening. I got the key of the chalet from Madame Chardonnay at the cafe in the square. Did your wife go into the cafe with you? Oh, no, she stayed in the car. The postman doesn't come right up to the house, does he? No, he leaves the mail in the box down by the gate. But, but the grocer delivers here. But he didn't see Elizabeth. I remember she was lying down. Anyone else you can think of? Not here. But there are dozens of people in Venice who saw us together, and in Juan, and in Geneva. I dare say, but bringing people all the way up here without any sort of warrant, that will take some doing. I'll pay. That's not the point. Now, let's stop wasting time. Madame Coban, come in here, will you? Thank you. Sit down. Oh, it's dark in here, Inspector. Let me switch the lights on. I'll do it, madame. Oh, thank you. Uh, the switch is over by the door. Oh, it's getting chilly, too. Father, I wonder if you'd turn on the heating for me. There's a red lever in the kitchen under the gas meter. And I'd very much like a soft drink. There's some fruit juice in the refrigerator. Thank you so much. A pleasure, madame. I see you know the house well. Naturally. Quite so. Your husband... I'm just... not. Your husband, I repeat, until proof to the contrary, has just been telling me how you met and got married and how you came to be staying here. Yes. Uh, he's been suffering from his nerves lately. I thought the mountain air here at Chamonix would do him good. You thought that... The... Monsieur, please. Now, madam, we come to the quarrel you had just before you went away. Yes, I'm desperately sorry about that. I should never have left. I had no idea it would bring on this breakdown. May I see your papers, madame? Oh, but of course. Here, Inspector. They're all forgeries. You'll see. You will see. They seem perfectly genuine to me. <coughs> Enter. Yes, what is it, Francois? This letter was found in the post box, sir. It was addressed to Madame Corbin. Thank you, Francois. Uh, you may go. Oh, uh, yes, sir. This letter is from Bellinger and Martin, solicitors at Saint-Denis. May I have it, please? Don't give it to her. Give me that letter at once, Inspector, or I'll ring up the Commissioner of Police at Chambray and report you. You have no right to keep that letter. Give it to me, please. Don't let her have it. This woman is not Elizabeth Corvan. Well, for heaven's sake, prove it. All then. right. Prove it. All right, I will. I'll soon show that she isn't Elizabeth. I'll ask her some questions now. What questions? About us. Intimate questions. All right, Corvan. Go ahead. Tell me the name of the travel agency in Venice which arranged our tour through Italy. My wife bought the tickets, Inspector. The Marcellus Agency in the Piazza San Marco. Oh, What's the name of the friend who rented us the chalet? Jean Bernadet. Is that right? Yes. Do you think it's worthwhile going on with this Corbin? Yes, yes, yes. One more question. Where did we break our journey on the way to Chamonix? Geneva. The Globe Hotel. Wrong! I've got her! I all got right, her. all right. I'll soon check. Give me one for. Hello. Fernand? Put a priority call through to Geneva headquarters. Get them to check on reservations at the Globe Hotel by a couple called Corban early this month. There won't be any. We never stayed. Quiet! Hurry, will you, Fernand, and call me back as soon as you know. Any more questions? Yes. My wife and I had an argument on the day after we were married. What was it about? Darling... This is all very embarrassing. I don't think we should discuss it in front you of... You see, Inspector, she doesn't know. Yes, I do. It was about money. Is that right, monsieur? She guessed. She just guessed. She guessed right, though. That's the point. Hello? Yes? Yes? I see. Thank you. No, that's all. That was the Geneva police confirming a registration at the Globe Hotel in the name of Elizabeth and Daniel Corbin. What? It's not true. It can't be. We never stayed there, not at the Globe Hotel. We did it. Monsieur, you signed the register. I did not. My men have seen. There is no doubt. None. But I didn't. This, this must be madness. Yes, monsieur. I'm beginning to think it might be.
It's here. New Dual. Yes. Dual is the new floor cleaner that really deserves to be called revolutionary. Because Dual actually cleans and polishes your floors all in one go. Dual is an entirely new floor cleaner that has its own built-in floor polish as well. Dual saves you hours of work. With Dual, you get all your washable floors spotlessly clean. And you get a magnificent, hard, non-slip, dirt-resisting shine, all in one go. And the more you clean with Dual, the more brilliantly your floors shine. Get new Dual right away. It's the revolutionary new floor cleaner that cleans and polishes all in one go. Remember, it's Dual. D-U-A-L. Dual. You are now listening to Drive, the hungry detergent. Only Drive, the new kind of washing powder, has Insolve, the professional stain remover. That's why Drive, with Insolve, eats stains like baby food, tomato sauce, egg, chocolate. Yet it's so gentle with fabric, so kind to colors. Just soak overnight in new Drive and stains vanish. Then wash in new Drive for astounding results. New Drive Eat Stains gets your whole wash so clean it's spotless. Well, Inspector, and what are your plans now? I'll get back to the station. Inspector, I never signed that register. Uh, darling, go up to your room and try to rest. You must. Uh, that is a good idea, monsieur. You must relax. It's imperative. Remember the last time you were like this, Daniel? You were perfectly all right after a couple of days. So you've been like this before, have you? Never! Uh, yes, in Venice. Have you forgotten, <gasps> darling? I'm beginning to understand. Well, you'll be better tomorrow, monsieur. Uh, goodbye, madame. Uh, Inspector. Madame? You've forgotten my letter. Ah, oh, madame, so I have. Here we are. You read it, Inspector. Read it aloud. But, madame... Please. Very well. We regret to inform you that your uncle, Hugo de la Fossere, passed away last night. It's uh, dated three weeks ago, uh, forwarded from your Paris address. They knew. Don't you see, Inspector? They knew all along. I should be obliged if you would call at my office as soon as convenient to discuss the will and legacies. Please accept my condolences. So... You'd better keep that letter, Inspector. Oh? And check on the identity of the lawyers in case my husband imagines I've written it. The lawyer's identity isn't in doubt. That's the one thing I am sure of. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must return to the station. I've spent hours up here and I can ill afford the time. Don't go, Inspector. What? Don't go. I tell you, this is a plot. Tomorrow she'll get rid of me. A mental home, an accident, suicide, anything. She'll get rid of me. For heaven's sake, Inspector, do something. Or else tell me that I'm raving mad. Tell me I've imagined the whole wretched business. Tell me that. No, monsieur. I will take it. Quentin here? Uh-huh. I see. Right. Uh, thank you. Well? Is there anything wrong, Inspector? That was my assistant. A message from Geneva. Oh? Well, it's about these reservations at the Globe Hotel. Some zealous young constable noticed alterations or erasures or something. I shall have to investigate this further. There, you see. I told you. They tampered with the register. But, Inspector, you see my papers, my passport, everything. You heard me answer questions. Yes, yes, we'll discuss this further tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow I'll be dead. Oh, come, come, come. That is melodramatic, monsieur. No harm will come to you. Good night. Listen to me, Inspector. Listen. Oh, no. I'll pour you a drink, my darling. There you are. No. Monsieur, don't be churlish, I beg of you. Here. It will do you good. Who are you? Who are you? And what do you want? Well, Monsieur Cobain, a new day, a beautiful day. How do you feel, eh? She's still here. She's taken over completely. <laughs> but you don't care. No one does. <sighs> it's like some kind of nightmare. I can't believe it's happening to me. Inspector, you're a clever man. You're accustomed to dealing with, uh, with criminals. Haven't you the slightest doubt about her? Well, 
Yes. Oh. It's very faint. No more than a glimmer. Hardly that. Follow it up, then. If you can't help me, no one can. Now, now, monsieur. Let us see what we can do together. There must be a weak link somewhere. Yes, yes. But keep calm whatever you do. We'll see if we can't find some people who knew your wife, on your responsibility, of course. My superiors aren't going to proceed on a mere suspicion of mine. Now, can you give me any names? Well, yes, but we've only been married three months, and we did make a crowd of friends at one. Splendid. Make me out a list of, say, ten people and leave it to me. All right. I'll do that, Inspector. Now, let me give you a bit of advice, monsieur. Act as though you've resigned yourself to the situation. Don't force her hand. Play along with her. Meantime, I'll be doing my job, and any moment now, your real wife may turn up. Pray heaven that you're right. You must take a firm grip on yourself. I'll try. I feel really much better now that I realize that you're on my side, Inspector. I think I'll go out. I need some fresh air. You wouldn't do that. Oh? There are fast cars on these roads. You mean... What? Outside the house? Outside anything is possible, monsieur. I'll stay here, then. Anyway, you've got the telephone. Your line is directly connected to the police station. I arranged it this morning. I'm very grateful. It's all part of the job, monsieur. Now then, you think of that list of names and cheer up. Cheer up. Oh, good morning, Inspector. Oh, good morning, madame. Don't you think my husband looks much better? He slept very well, Inspector, and he needs rest. Oh, you do, my darling. Yes, he seems much better, ma'am. But I'll be on my way. I'm glad to see this improvement, monsieur. Well... Goodbye. Oh, well, just one thing. What's the address of your flat in Paris, madame? 157 Rue d'Anjou. Thank you. It's the fifth floor on the left. <laughs> Very clever. <laughs> Go on. Laugh, curse you. But I'll get out of this. You see if I don't. Of course you will, darling. You won't get me. Yes, darling. Now do rest while I go down to the village. What would you like for lunch? To the devil with lunch. All right, then. How about some steak? And a mushroom omelette to start with. How will that do? I imagine both dishes will be liberally sprinkled with poison. <laughs> oh, darling, the things you say. Well, I won't be long. And do rest while I'm gone. Daniel, keep calm, keep calm. A drink. Yes, a drink to steady me down. No. Drink nothing. Eat nothing. <gasps> Who's that? Anyone at home? Who will drink much to drink? Who are you? Open the door, monsieur. What do you want? My apologies for this interruption, monsieur. Melouche is the name, artist by profession. Oh. What the devil do you want? I am on holiday. I was sitting in the sunshine, eating my breakfast, when crash, my bottle of red wine fell from my fingers and broke into a million fragments. You wouldn't have a bottle of red wine to sell, I suppose? No, I'm afraid not. Now, if you'll excuse me... I uh, notice whiskey yonder. Uh, would you have any objection if... It... Oh, help yourself, but be quick. One moment, no more. <sighs> ah, this is living. Uh, would you like me to do a portrait of you, sir? You have a most expressive face. Look, if it's money you're wanting here, take this. Go and drink my health. You're giving me this? But, monsieur... Take it and get out. Why, monsieur, you're a Medici, a patron of the arts. Oh, this is a fortune. Just a moment. Huh? Look at me. Uh, anything wrong? Have you ever worn a beard? Well, that depends on the time of year. I don't suppose by any chance... No, that's too much to hope for, and yet... I have a feeling I've seen you before. Do you remember me at all? Do you? Your face isn't unfamiliar to me. Think carefully, man. Think, man. I, I've seen you, but where? G give me some clue. Some I idea. can't. It's got to come from you. Oh, dear. Where were you three months ago? Mon Lapin. Ah, that's it, of course, monsieur. You're the one who got married in that little church to the tall, blonde lady. Yes, I remember now. Oh, I offered to paint you. Quiet, your... quiet. Don't talk so loudly. Uh -huh. Someone might hear you. <laughs> Another woman. <laughs> I can't explain. There isn't time in any way. You wouldn't believe me. But your evidence is absolutely vital to me. It torpedoes their whole devilish scheme. Oh? Now listen to me. You call yourself an artist, so you can do my portrait. Start drawing. What, but I... Sit down there and pretend. In a moment, a woman will come in here. Your lady, Brave? Great heavens, no. Now... Whatever you do, don't tell her you were present at my wedding at one. Oh, but I thought... Don't argue, will you? Listen. You've never seen me before. I've never seen you. 
You're doing my portrait, and that's all there is to it. Right, I get the idea. The new one is jealous of the old, is that it? Eh? Yes, 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 that's it. So, not a word. If all goes well, I'll give you a thousand francs. What? There must be a catch somewhere. It is coincidence that I saw you in one. Get on with that sketch. I want to make a phone call. Very well, then, but this is strange. A thousand francs. Oh, that's Picasso's rate. Hello? Corbin here. Give me Inspector Quentin, please. Yeah. What, what are you doing? Be quiet. I'll explain later. I'm in the clear with the police. Monsieur, I demand to know what this is all about. Quiet. Hello. Well, where is he? Oh. Get hold of him as soon as possible. It's urgent. Say I've got the proof I wanted. Tell him to come here to the chalet as soon as he can. Thanks. I insist on an explanation. You've got to trust me. Now, pick up your pencil and keep drawing. But, Monsieur... Don't I... argue! Not another word. Uh, you did say a thousand francs, Monsieur. A thousand francs, nothing less. Uh, this is my day. Describe my wife to me. Describe her. This is important. You said she was tall and fair. Yes, and her nose, it was uh, so. And she was, how do you call it, a, a lady of consequence. She was wearing a... Now, let me see her. A... Blue dress. Quite so, Monsieur. Blue dress. Great heavens, this is providential that I recognized you. And I so nearly didn't without that beard. Shh! Someone's coming. Get on with that sketch. Oh? What's going on here? Who's this man? Allow me to introduce myself. Malouche, portrait painter. Oh? I am sketching this gentleman. A very rough sketch. I always start this way. Hmm. Yeah, but monsieur, he fidgets the whole time. He is very difficult for me. Do you make a living from your drawing? Mm Mm-hmm. I suppose you've had exhibitions in one. Uh, what, uh, Daniel, darling, why are you so continually looking at your watch? Are you expecting someone? No, I don't want to intrude if you're expecting company. I'll be back tomorrow. Yes, goodbye. We'll see you again. I'm not expecting anyone. Don't go. Sit down and get on with that sketch. But look, <sighs> darling, you can't force a creative artist to work. Inspiration comes and goes. You must let him leave if he wants to. That's right. I'll see you tomorrow. Sit down. Darling, don't shout. Wait a minute. I recognize you. Yeah, me? Yes. You were at our wedding. Don't you remember, darling? Only he wore a beard. You were at Juan. Uh, me? Now think carefully. I can assure you it's worth your while. Uh, am I intruding? <gasps> oh, Reverend, do take my chair. I'm going. A car. The police. What? I called them. This man was at Juan. He saw Elizabeth. He remembers her. Come on, describe her. Go on. Monsieur, go on. please, I, I must go out this way quickly. Merciful heavens, a gun. Reverence, you with a gun. Quick, the back way. No, you don't. Leave go of my arm, Corbin. Leave go. Give me that gun. Help, please. Quickly. Ah! What's this? What's the devil? Inspector, Inspector, my husband. He took the gun and he shot Malouche. Oh, no. Oh, no. Give me that gun, Corbin. Give it to me. Oh, you... Poor demented fool. What have you done now? Boy, have I got that fuzzy feeling. I gotta get a clean, fresh mouth and a new tongue. Do I need you, Pepsodent? Heavy duty Pepsodent. Cleaned up, freshens up. Toothpaste with the sparkle clean taste. Heavy duty Pepsodent works harder than your toothbrush to give you the big clean up. Freshens your breath, gets rid of that fuzzy feeling. The toothpaste with the sparkle clean taste. Boy, with heavy duty Pepsodent, you brush that dullness clean away. It's here, new duo. Yes, Dual is the new floor cleaner that really deserves to be called revolutionary. Because Dual actually cleans and polishes your floors all in one go. Dual is an entirely new floor cleaner that has its own built-in floor polish as well. Dual saves you hours of work. With Dual, you get all your washable floors spotlessly clean. And you get a magnificent, hard, non-slip, dirt-resisting shine all in one go. And the more you clean with Dual, the more brilliantly your floors shine. Get new Dual right away. It's the revolutionary new floor cleaner that cleans and polishes all in one go. Remember, it's dual. D-U-A-L, dual.
Inspector, what's going to happen to my husband? First of all, let me hear your story. Well, Malouche came to the door and asked me if he could do Daniel's portrait. That's a lie. You were in the village when he came. Quiet, monsieur. Proceed, madame. I persuaded Daniel. You persuaded? I thought it might make Daniel relax. Well, they were only alone for a moment. I don't know what they said to each other. And a second later, I heard a shot. Another lie. She lies, Inspector. If you will not keep silent, I must ask you to leave the room. And then, madame? Malouche fell as Father Maximin came in. Did Monsieur Corbin threaten you as well? Uh, no. Or you, Father? He didn't have time. Uh, you came in just then. But he would have killed us both if you hadn't, I'm quite certain. You'll have to arrest him, Inspector. You can't allow a dangerous psychopath like Inspector, that... Inspector, you must let me speak. You must allow me to speak. In a moment. Yes? Speaking. Right. Come over immediately. Hurry. What is it, Inspector? That is my business. Now then, Monsieur Cobain. Give me your version of what happened. Malouche was a witness at my wedding in Juan. I sent for you so that he could tell you the truth. But they killed him. They killed my only witness. On the contrary, monsieur, there is a second witness on the way. What? Someone else. You won't have long to wait. Oh, this is tremendous, Inspector. Someone who knows my wife, who knows Elizabeth. Who is it? You'll know soon enough. If I'm not mistaken, the witness arrives. Monsieur, stand over there with your back to the door. You, Father Maximum, over there. Of course, Inspector. And you, Madame, go to the top of the stairs. When I call, come down, you will walk down the stairs without a word. Yes, Inspector. This witness has no idea why she's been brought here, so her reaction will be spontaneous and incontestable. Is it a woman? Quiet, Monsieur, and keep your back to the door. I insist. Ah, Francois, bring Madame in. The Keep your face to the wall. Well, Inspector, what is this all about? I insist that you tell me. My apologies. I'm looking for someone who knows the people who live here. One of my men, who was a neighbor of yours, understood you to say you had attended the wife. Is that correct? Yes. I came to give her an injection two weeks ago. Would you recognize them? Certainly. There's Monsieur Corbin standing with his back to me. Excellent. Madame Bertin, I was never so pleased to see anyone in my whole life. Are you sure this is Monsieur Corbin? Positive. Madame, will you come down the stairs? Who is this, madame? Madame Corbin, of course. Good morning. What? Shh. And I, too, am pleased and relieved to see you, Madame Beton. Are you certain this is Madame Corbin? Oh, of course I am. They're all against me. All of them. Well, I'm afraid I don't understand what's going on, Inspector. He doesn't recognize his wife. Oh, how sad. Perhaps he needs treatment or a sedative of some kind. And now, if you've finished with me, perhaps someone could drive me back to Chamonix. Of course. Uh, uh, Francois, uh, will you drive Madame back? She's lying. I tell you, she's, she's lying. Stop her. Don't let her go. Why, I'll... Uh, say... Madame, please, do you mind going? I have something more to say about this. She is lying. Oh, stop that, monsieur. You are begging for a straitjacket. What? Madame Corbin, will you go through to the next room? And you, father. Of course, Inspector. Come, madame. Now then, monsieur. As far as I'm concerned, Madame Berton identified your wife and that's an end to it. I see no reason to doubt her word. That woman through there is your wife whether you like it or not. If she wasn't, how could you possibly account for the way she has behaved all through this? Why, she has never for a second shown the slightest fear that your other alleged wife might come back. No, she isn't afraid that Elizabeth will come back because she's sure she won't. What do you mean? They know everything. Who could have told them? Who, if not my wife? She must be at the back of it all. Oh, great heavens, this is definitely insanity. Hello? Yes, it's me. Right. Good. I'll come right over. What's happened? That was the hospital about Melouch. Oh, he's dead? He's dead? No. Oh. They're going to operate. As soon as he's conscious, I'll question him. Suppose he dies. Then you'll have to prove you didn't kill him, won't you? I must go straight to the hospital now, monsieur. You'll be back. Indeed, yes. I'll be back. There's still a great deal to be done. Excuse me. So Malouche didn't die after all, darling? No. No, he didn't. You thought you were clever. Oh, yes. But you didn't bargain on Malouche, did you now? And you can't get at him. You can't bribe Malouche. 
He'll talk. Oh, no, he won't. Yes, he will. He will. He's honest. He'll tell the truth. He won't. What's to stop him? Death. Are you ready? Yes, I've packed everything I could lay my hands on. What's Corbin doing? Nothing. He seems dazed. Does he know where he's being taken? Yes, uh, he didn't react at all. Malouche's death has stunned him. Ah, here he is now. We were talking about you, Corbin. You'll be very comfortable at the clinic. We'll visit you as often as we can. I don't want to leave here. My friend, you've killed a man. You keep forgetting that. The inspector wants you to go to the clinic. He thinks it's a good idea, and so do I. You trust the inspector, don't you? But what's all that luggage there? You may have to stay there for several days under observation before the law decides what's to be done with you. You'll never get away with this. And I'm not going. I'm not. This is official. You are going to this clinic as a patient. Then you'll be sent to trial, unless the doctors prove that you're unfit to plead. Get the luggage into the car, Father. Right. I'm not leaving here, and neither are you. Oh, yes, we are. All of us. You're coming for a nice long drive. Come along now. Hurry. Cobain, I don't want to be forced to carry you to the car. I did not kill Melouche. He died on the operating table as a result of bullet wounds inflicted by you. It was you, Cobain. This is murder. Now, come on. That's enough of this talking. Here's the inspector. What? Oh, Inspector, we were just driving my husband to the clinic now. There is no need, madame. Oh? Why? What happened, Inspector? What happened? You'll be relieved to know, Monsieur Corbin, that you did not kill Melouche. What? But surely we, we both saw him. It was a shot in the shoulder, not a fatal wound by any means. A minor operation. But I was given to understand that he died on the operating table. He died five minutes after he returned to his ward. Shock, obviously. I don't think so. They're performing an autopsy now. They let me know immediately they get the results. Oh, Inspector, what a relief. A male nurse was seen leaving Malucha's room just before he died. The hospital staff are being questioned. The trouble is one man in a white coat looks very like another. He must have done it. He must have killed Malucha. Don't be absurd. You left here after they took Malucha to hospital. You killed him because he was my only witness. Be quiet, will you? You're a complete fool, Inspector. These people are tricking you. Yes, I am a complete fool. I should have arrested you long ago. Then why don't you? Why don't you? Why send me to the clinic with these two people? Why? I want to be arrested. At least I'll be safe in jail. Yes, Inspector, arrest me for the attempted murder of Merlouche. I'll get a clever lawyer. I'll prove my case, and then, by heavens, I'll expose this woman for the imposter she really is. Darling, you don't know what you're saying. I shot Merlouche deliberately with intent to kill... Now, Inspector, arrest me and take me to Chamonix. Ignore him, Inspector. Inspector, arrest me for attempted murder. Arrest me, I say. If you want police protection, you shall have it. I promise that by eight o'clock tonight, you will be safely locked up. Yes? Speaking. Hmm. Oh. I see. Yes, that does alter the picture completely. Thank you. Well, who's that? That was the result of the autopsy on Melouche. Yes, 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 yes. It has revealed traces of strychnine in the stomach. What? He was poisoned? He did it. They went to the hospital and poisoned him. They killed Melouche. Corban, there is no proof. Not of anything. But, Inspector, it's plain common sense. It stands to reason that... Monsieur, they... when one deals with insanity, reason and common sense don't apply. What? What do you mean? From the moment I was called in by you to investigate your wife's disappearance, I knew I was dealing with a madman. I am not... Your whole story is distorted. It's twisted. It's grotesque. There's no truth in what you say. In a wild moment, you might well have poisoned Malouche. After all, you did try to shoot him. He was my only witness. Why would I want to shoot him? It is here. Here in the mind, monsieur. Sometimes, sometimes I wonder if you aren't on their side. Sometimes I wonder. Do you, monsieur? Great heavens. What a fool I've been. That's it. It all fits perfectly. There was a mastermind behind it all. It's you! You planned it brilliantly, using your official position as a cover. And I've sweated my heart out, trying to persuade you that this woman isn't Elizabeth. What a laugh that is. What a laugh. 
You're very clever. But as long as there's breath in my body, I'll fight you. You'll never get me. <laughs> <laughs> you killed Elizabeth, didn't you? She's dead. Now I'm sure of it. And you killed her. Prove it. I go to the peace in Paris. Go on, then. Unless you can produce Elizabeth Corbin's body, which you can't, you'll never prove this girl here isn't your wife. They'll find her body, and you'll die for it, all of you. You killed her. She's dead. Yes, your wife is dead, Corbin. Murdered. Murdered. But where is her body? Murdered. Murdered. Where is her body, Corbin? They'll find it. Where? Where? Where is it? They'll search the woods out there. The body. The rocks. They'll drag the rivers. The body. They'll find it. Where's the body? They'll find it. Where's her body, Corban? In the gorge of the forest of Chamois. <gasps> oh, no. No, no, no. Thank you, Corban. No. I've been waiting since yesterday morning to hear that. No, no, no. You must have thought me stupid not to smell a rat when a rich woman disappears, leaving her husband a sole heir. Three days after you reported your wife's desertion, the body of a woman was pulled from the Chamois Gorge, and Nurse Beton identified your wife. Oh, no. An accident? Hardly. Her skull was beaten to pulp. I could have arrested you on suspicion of murder at any time. But suspicions aren't proof, and I needed your confession. Oh, you were a cool one, I will say that. You acted your role to perfection. Anyway, we decided to set a trap for you. Oh, May I introduce Chief Inspector Take? I thought he made an excellent father maximum, didn't you? And then Mademoiselle Stephanie is your wife. No, no. Incidentally, no. Melouche nearly upset our apple cart. But in the end, he was most amused at being shot at by a blank cartridge. Not to mention all the free drinks he had. He's not dead. Of course not. However, out of all the tricks and lies and inventions we made to get you, one thing was true. I made you a promise. I said that by eight o'clock tonight you would be safely locked up, Corban. And by heavens, you will be. Would you believe that a deodorant could help you look good? Shield aerosol deodorant has something very special. The unique stay dry formula that keeps you dry, keeps you looking cool, crisp and confident, even in today's flimsiest fashions. And Shield's extra dry spray will never sting or burn your skin, even if you use Shield right after your bath. So slip into something comfortable. Slip into the deodorant that helps you look good. The newest Shield aerosol with Stay Dry. Lovely, fresh as a daisy, dewy-eyed. That's international film star Elka Sommer. Sunflower by day, exotic moonflower by night. Vivacious Elka Sommer. How does Elka Sommer retain this 24-hour radiance? It's Lux Beauty Soap. I use it for lots of reasons. It's pretty shape. It's lovely perfume. Doesn't it remind you of Paris? And most of all, I love the care it gives my complexion. You see, the lather is so pure and mild and gentle. I'd like every woman to use Lux. Remember, Lux, it's the complexion care of the stars. In tonight's presentation of Trap for a Lonely Man by Robert Thomas. The part of Daniel Corbin was played by Don Ridgway, with Fred Stone as the inspector and Maureen Adair as the woman. As the priest, you heard Ian Hamilton. Others in the cast were Reg Richards and Dacia Charlesty. Trap for a Lonely Man was produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Anne Freed and directed by Henry Diffenthal.
can that be? Oh, this is a fine time to call. Blimey, it's late. I must have slept longer than I, than I thought. Oh, dear. Oh, all right, all right, I'm coming. Hello, dear. You back then? Oh, yes, thank heavens. Oh, talk about rush. I don't think I've been off my feet all day. And you never saw such a queue for the bus. Oh, that's why I'm a bit late. I hope you weren't worried, Henry. No, 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 love. I just doing a few jobs, you know. Oh, look, there's my key. It was on the mantelpiece all the time. I knew I'd left it somewhere. You were a long time answering the doorbell. Yes, I... Well, I, I was on top of the steps. What were you doing up there? Oh, well, cleaning. Well, it needed doing, you know. Oh, how nice. And all the time I was ringing the bell, I was saying to myself, I bet the old devil's asleep. <laughs> no. As a matter of fact, I've, I've had a busy day. I, I've worked up quite an appetite. Oh. Well, it won't be a very exciting supper tonight, I'm afraid. Cheese omelet be all right? Oh, yes, I, I suppose so. Did you pay the milkman? Uh, well, well, no. No, I didn't. I, I didn't have enough money, daughter. I left you ten bob. Yes, I know you did, dear, but, well... But what? Well, you didn't spend it, did you? Well, of course I didn't. Not all of it. But there was Sam and Charlie down at the local at dinner time, so, well, I had to buy them one. Why? I... Do they know you're out of work? No, I don't think so. Well, we didn't talk about it. Oh, why you had to go to the pub at all, I don't know. Well, I thought I might hear of something going. Oh, yes. Well, it happens sometimes, you know. You mix around and you, well, you hear something. It's not likely anyone would think you were interested if they didn't know you were out of work. You'd have been better off at home, looking through the wanted ads. Yeah, I looked this morning. Nothing doing. Oh, well, I brought the evening papers. Here you are. And you better have a go at them. Dora, I am trying, you know. Oh, yes. Yes, I know, Henry. Well, I'm just out of luck, that's all. Everyone's out of luck at some time or another. I'll have a job soon, you see. Yes, Henry, of course you will. Oh, well, I mustn't stand here all day talking. I'll get your supper ready. Yeah, well, let's see what there is tonight. Hmm. What did you have for lunch today? Tomato soup and a buttered roll. You ought to have a proper meal. I'll have a proper meal where we can afford it. Well, is anything doing? No, no, same old stuff. You need qualifications for all these. No qualifications, that's my trouble. Well, what about that job on the building site? If you had enough qualifications then, you've enough now. Uh, times have changed, Dora. We're living in a competitive age. They said that the other night on the radio. You've got to have knowledge. Knowledge to pay for nowadays. Hello, what's this? Oh, have you found something? Well, I'm not sure. Well, what does it say? Uh, Big financial reward for right man. No qualifications necessary. Well, it sounds all right. Well, doesn't it say what the job is? No. No. Oh, I expect it's a joke. One of those cranks with nothing better to do. I've seen them before. Is there a phone number? Mm, no. No, no, it's a box. Well, I don't suppose there'd be any harm in writing, would there? No, I don't suppose so. Shall I? You've got nothing to lose, have you? All right. All right, I'll do it now. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, eh? Where's the writing paper? This may be the chance of a lifetime. You never know. I thought you'd have been in bed by now, James. Oh, I was writing some letters. Is it very late? Well, it's nearly twelve. Oh, I didn't realise. I can't be long, darling. You know what the doctor said about early nights? Oh, he's an old fusspot. He thinks the whole world would feel better if it slept more. I'd spend half my life like a tortoise if he had his way. You ought to take it easy, though. I keep telling you, Margot, I'm better, cured. I'm not going to go on being ill just so that old Cranshaw can send his bill in. Oh, but darling... The doctor knows best, I know. The doctor knows best what's best for the doctor. Another three weeks of his visits and he'll be off to Madeira for his holidays. Every time he rings the front door bell, it costs me money. Better to be safe than, than sorry. sorry. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> He's only doing what's best for you. You talk as if he didn't care about you. Oh, he cares about me, all right. He cares about my signature on his check. You're always so impatient, James. You can't rush these things. He told you it would be a slow business. Oh, you bet he did. Old Cranshaw is dedicated to saving life. But it's better for him to do it slowly than quickly. That way, he can keep on visiting and I can keep on paying. I'm better, I tell you, and if Cranshaw persists in visiting me, I shall shoot him as he comes up the path. <laughs> There's no reasoning with you. But I'm going to get a hot drink. How about you? Uh, no, thanks. Well, don't stay down here too long, will you? I promise. I just have these letters to finish and then I'll be up. Well, you'll see that you are. Uh, 
Now then, where was I? Ah, yes. Henry Scrub. Henry! Henry, here I am. Oh, I'm sorry. I... Oh, are you going out? Uh, yes, I, I won't be long. Oh, well, I hope not, love. I've got a nice piece of fish for your supper. And look, a nice bottle of beer. Hey, what's this? Have you got a rise or something? Oh, no, I just thought you deserved it. I'll leave it here. You didn't go without lunch today, did you? No, of course I didn't. Oh, do you have to go out? Well, as a matter of fact, Dora, I'm, uh, I'm going on business. What do you mean? Henry, you haven't found Well, it's, it's early days yet, love, but, well, today I had a letter. Remember that ad in the paper that I wrote to on the off chance? Yes. Well, he wrote to me. A bloke called James Cornelius. I've got to go round and see him tonight. This may be it, me girl. I told you I'd get a job, didn't I? Oh, I hope so, Henry, I hope so. And if it is, if I come back tonight with good news, you and me are going out to celebrate, just the two of us. Oh, that'll be great, Henry. <laughs> well, I'd best be off. I, I don't want to be late, do I? Well, good luck, love. Keep your fingers crossed. Here, yeah, Bobby, how about a bit of service down this end? Well, I'm doing my best. I haven't got six pairs of hands. I could die of thirst down in here. The day you die of thirst, I'll go into a convent. Oh, excuse me, miss. Just a minute, can't you see I'm serving? Mr. Evans! Come in, Flory. One pint. And about time, too. Oh, excuse me, I wonder if I could... Well, what do you want, mate? Half a bitter, please. Flory, half a bitter. Half a bitter, Mr. Evans. I wonder if you can help me. There's no credit if that's what you're after. No, no, I just wondered if you could direct me. Oh, I see. Stranger around here, are you? Yes, I, I am. I'm looking for Brookfield Crescent. Do you know it? Brookfield Crescent? Yes, I know it, all right. Half a bitter, Mr. Evans. No, that's for Rockefeller here. Half a bitter, Mr. Rockefeller. Tempence, please. He's asking for Brookfield Crescent. Oh, that's ever so smart. He's thinking of buying a bit of property up there, I shouldn't wonder. <laughs> <laughs> First set of traffic lights, turn right. Second set of traffic lights, turn left. Then first left and you're there. Got it? First set right, second set left. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Good night. Here, you haven't finished your drink. He hasn't finished his drink, Mr. Evans. Uh, can I offer you a drink, Mr. Scrub? Well, a, a glass of beer would be nice. I'm afraid I'm out of beer. I was going to have a whiskey. Oh, I don't drink whiskey as a rule. Only Christmas and so on, you know. Celebrations and all that. Well, let's say that this is a celebration, then, eh? A special occasion. Oh, well, all right. If you say so, Mr. Cornelius. Uh, do sit down and relax. Thanks. Nice place you got here. Must have cost you a bob or two. Oh, let's say that I was one of the more fortunate ones, shall we? Though lately, perhaps, not quite so fortunate. Oh? Uh, your whiskey. Oh. oh, thanks. Cheers. Uh, cheers. Are you married, Mr. Scrub? Yes, my wife's working. No children? No. I see. Oh, sorry, darling. I didn't know you had someone here. You're back early, Margot. Yes. I decided not to stay at Helen's for dinner after all. I didn't expect you until much later. Oh, it doesn't matter, does it? Oh, I shall go away and hide in a moment. Oh, um, uh, this is Mr. Scrub, Henry Scrub. Oh, how do you do? Uh, Mr. Scrub uh, just popped in for a little business talk. Oh, Oh, well, I mustn't interrupt you. I thought it was time we did something about the garden. Uh, Mr. Scrub is a gardener. Something of an ex- Well, I wouldn't say that. Oh, you're really. far too modest, my dear chap. You'll have your work cut out in this garden. It's like a jungle out there. Well, goodbye for now, Mr. Scrub. Goodbye. I won't interrupt you again, darling. I'm not a gardener, Mr. Cornelius. It doesn't matter in the least. But you tell your wife. I told you it doesn't matter. She will have forgotten about it very quickly. What sort of a job had you in mind, Mr. Scrub? Well, any sort of a job. I don't mind telling you I'm desperate. So we can say that you aren't too particular about the type of work. Providing the money's all right. Oh, I think I can promise you that the money will be all right. I think I can promise you that. Your wife knew you were coming to visit me this evening? Yes. Well, you didn't say it was a secret. Oh, it's not a secret, Mr. Scrub. Not a secret at all. You, uh, you gave her the address, then? Um... No, 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 I didn't. Good. Uh, to look at me, Mr. Scrub, would you say that I was a very strong man? A strong man? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Well, well you're a well-built man. I, well, I suppose you would be strong. I'm not a strong man at all, Mr. Scrub. Oh? No, I'm anything but a strong man. I liked your letter. It was a frank, honest letter. And now that I meet you, I see that you're indeed a frank, honest sort of man. I had quite a few replies to my advertisement, you know. Yes, I expect so. But I selected the people I wanted to interview very carefully and put their names on my shortlist. 
Here it is, you see. Only three of you. And you, Mr. Scrub, are the first of the shortlist to be interviewed. Would a single payment of £2,000 be of any interest to you? £2,000? How long would it normally take someone in your position to earn £2,000? You can earn that for one evening's work. Well, I, I don't follow. The job I have to offer is not a permanent post. I require your services for one evening only. Here, if you think I'm going to rob a bank or something... Oh, no, Mr. Scrub, nothing like that, I assure you. Then what do I have to do for the money? I want you to kill somebody. Kill somebody? You'd better try the next name on your list. I, I'm off. But you haven't heard the whole of my proposition. I've heard enough. Look... I may be badly off and all that, but I'm, I'm not going to kill anyone. Not even if your victim can be guaranteed not to resist. You're balmy. Look, I'm not a murderer. Here, look, get out of my way, will you? I'm going. Think what you could do with £2,000. Please, let me pass. You haven't asked me yet who the proposed victim is. No, and I'm not going to. I don't want to know. See, I, I'm going now, and I don't advise you to try and stop me. I should put that poker down, Mr. Scrub. I told you I ain't going out of that door. You just try and stop me and I'll crown you with this. I thought you weren't interested in murder. Just let me go, will you? No, Mr. Scrub, I'm not going to let you go. I warned you. If you attempt to leave now, I shall attempt to stop you. And if you like to attack me with that poker, then go ahead. What are you up to? What are you trying to make me do? I just want you to hear me out, that's all. Let me explain why I brought you here. Look, mister... I don't want £2,000. I just want to go. Let me at least tell you who your victim will be. It might make all the difference to you. What do you mean? I want you to murder me. You're mad. You're stark staring mad. On the contrary, I'm extremely sane, as you will see if you let me explain. I'm not interested, I tell you. I told you. you I wasn't a strong man, and it's true. I have a serious heart complaint. My doctor tells me I shall be lucky if I live six months. Well, I... I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Cornelius, but I've got to go. In order to get out of this room, you will have to attack me. And in view of what I've just told you, you may well kill me, and without the £2,000 I have offered you. On the other hand, if you will let me explain, then I give you my word that if your decision is still no, then I shall allow you to walk out of here quite unhindered. I don't seem to have much choice, do I? It may surprise you to know, Mr. Scrub, that I am not a wealthy man. When I die, I shall leave my wife provided for, but nothing more. That is, if I die from natural causes. Well, oh, I sort of don't understand. I think you will in a moment. You see, the money realized on my death through life insurance will be automatically doubled in the unlikely event of my being murdered. Well, no insurance company would pay on such a claim. Why not? The odds against the average citizen being murdered must be considerably greater than against his just dying. So you see, Mr. Scrub, you will be helping my wife by doing what I ask. Well, what do you say? I won't do it. I'm not a murderer. I, I couldn't kill anyone. I couldn't. Not even to please the victim. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Cornelius. Very well. If that really is your decision, you're quite free to go. Uh, Mr. Scrub. Well? Here is my card. That's the telephone number, in case you change your mind. No, no, take it, please. After all... £2,000 is a very large sum of money. Don't you agree? That'll be one and six, please, sir. Well, hello. Look who's here. I say, Mr. Evans, look who's here. It's that Mr. Rockefeller again. Come to finish his beer, I shouldn't wonder. You find Brookfield Crescent all right, then? Uh, yes, yes, thanks. I found it. You didn't stay long. Were they expecting you after all? Oh, <laughs> Mr. Evans. What'll it be, then? A whiskey, please. Whiskey, eh? Well, well. What have you been doing up there? Pinching the silver? One whiskey, Flory. One whiskey, Mr. Evans. You look as though you could do with it too, mate. You feeling all right? Yes, I'm fine. One whiskey, Mr. Rockefeller. That'll be two, Bob. Thanks. Here. Are you feeling all right? You look quite pale. I'm all right, I tell you. Well, there's no need to snap. I only asked. Oh, I'm sorry. He quite snapped at me, Mr. Evans. Who did? The funny little chap. Ever see him around here before? No, I don't think so. Well, we're not likely to forget him in a hurry, are we? Oh, he's going already. He never seems to stay long, does he? I think he's coming back for another. Uh, I wonder if you could tell me where the nearest phone box is. Oh, you can use the one in here in the bar, if you like. Well, I think that would be a bit noisy, wouldn't it? Well, it's very kind of you and all that. Well, right. Outside to your right, you'll find a kiosk on the corner. Uh, oh, thank you. That would be better. Good night. Good night. Funny little chap. Seems in a bit of a state about something. Wonder what he's up to. Henry, where have you been? 
I thought you were never coming. Well, it's not very late, is it? Well, it's half past ten. Whatever took you so long? Well, it was quite a long way, and, well, you know, I had to wait for a bus. You weren't worried, were you? You know me, love. I get so anxious. Was it no good, Henry? No. Oh. Oh, well, better luck next time, eh? What sort of a job was it? Hmm? What kind of a job? Oh, well, it was, it was nothing. Sort of gardening job. Well, that would have been all right. No, no. He wanted an expert, like I said. You've got to be qualified, see? Pity he didn't say what it was in his ad. Would have saved you the bus fare. Hmm, yeah. How long were you with him? Hmm? Oh, I don't know. Well, about half an hour, I suppose. Whatever for? If you were no good for the job, why didn't he say so and let you go? I don't know, Dora. Look, why do we have to keep on about it? I haven't got the job and that's that. I bet you went into a pub. I didn't need to. He, he gave me a drink when I was there. Gave you a drink? Yeah, I, well, we, we talked. Henry, are you telling me the truth? Sergeant Meadows speaking. Mm-hmm. Hmm? What? Oh, just a minute. What name? Yes. And the address? Mm. Right. Don't touch anything. I'll have someone over right away. What was that, Sergeant? About a Mr. James Cornelius, sir. I know that name. He's head of some big paint firm, isn't he? Not anymore, sir. Uh, that was his wife. He's been found dead. It looks like murder. Mrs. Cornelius, about what time was it when you discovered your husband? I think it would be about ten o'clock. I'd had a bath and was going to bed early. I came down first to see if there was anything he wanted. Go on, please. Well, I, I came in through that door. I didn't see him at first. He... He was lying on the floor near the desk. In the position in which we found him? Yes. You didn't move him at all? Oh, no. I could tell that he was dead. And then you telephoned the police? Yes, that's right. When you went up for your bath, Mrs. Cornelius, what was your husband doing? I mean, was he working or what? Well, he was reading, I think. I see. You called in here, then, on your way up to the bath? Yes. What time would that be? Oh, I don't know. Well, the bath would take you how long? Possibly half an hour or so. So if you came down from your bath about ten o'clock... Then it would have been about 9.30 when you looked in on your way up. Would that be correct? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I suppose it would. Mr. Cornelius, I take it, was alone at that time? Yes. Yes, he was. What is it, madam? You uh, you looked as if you'd thought of something. I don't suppose it's at all important. Let me be the judge of that, please, madam. You never know what may be important. Just tell me anything you remember. Well, it was just that my husband did have a visitor earlier in the evening. A friend? Well, no, it was a business acquaintance. Something to do with the garden, my husband said. Had you ever seen him before? Oh, no. He was a strange little man. In what way strange? Oh, I don't know, really. I was just surprised to see him, I suppose. When was it, then, that you met him? Well, when I came in from visiting a friend earlier in the evening. They were in here talking. But when he went for your bath, this visitor had gone. Oh, yes. I heard him leave. I see. Could you tell me this gentleman's name? I don't know if I can remember it. My husband did introduce us. It was an unusual name. At least the surname was unusual. Try to remember if you can, Mrs. Cornelius. We like to follow up every lead. Mm, Scrub. That was it. Henry Scrub. I remember him repeating the name as he stood up to meet me. I see. Henry Scrub. Henry. Henry, wake mm. up. Mm. Oh. oh. What is it? You've been in here all night. Oh. However, I? I must have fallen asleep in the chair. What time is it? It's just after half past eight. I'll have to dash and I'll be late for work. Well, you'd better have some breakfast. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'll have a coffee when I get to work. Are you sure? Yes, I'll be all right. Well, so you get a good meal at lunchtime, then. Oh, our bell at this time of the morning. I wonder who that can be. No, oh, I should let it ring. We don't want anyone coming in here at this time. Oh, no, I'd better go and see who it is. It might be important. Well, you said yourself you'd have to dash. No, it won't take a second. Uh, Mrs. Scrub? Yes. Uh, I wonder if I could have a word with your husband. Now? Yes, it's important. Well, I, I suppose you better come in then. Funny time to call, though. Yes, I know. Now, I'm sorry to trouble you, but it is rather urgent, and I wanted to catch your husband before he left for work. I haven't got no work. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a police officer. Here. And I... Here, what do you want with us? I'm coming to that, Mrs. Scrub. Uh, do you mind if I ask you a few questions, sir? What's all this about? 
Well, I haven't done anything wrong. I didn't say you had, sir. Just a few routine inquiries, that's all. Do you know a man called James Cornelius? No. No, I don't. Didn't you visit him last night? No, I told you I've never heard of him. Mr. Scrub, we know you visited Mr. Cornelius last night. His wife gave us your name. She said she came in when you and her husband were talking. So, you see, there's no point in denying it. All right. All right, suppose I was dead. There's nothing wrong in that, is there? I was after a job. Mr. Cornelius is dead. He was murdered last night. Murdered? Yes, Mr. Scrub. Murdered. Well, what's that got to do with me? I, I went about a job, that's all. What's it got to do with me? We're only trying to establish times, that's all. We thought you might be able to help. Uh, could you tell me what time it was that you visited Mr. Cornelius? Well, it was about eight o'clock. Eight o'clock when you arrived? Well, yeah, about eight. And when you left? Oh, I didn't notice. Well, did you have a long talk, or was the interview over quickly? Well, we... Well, we talked sort of quite a bit. About half an hour, I suppose. Uh, so you left round about 8.30? Oh, I suppose so, yes. And Mr. Cornelius was alive then? Yes, of course he was. What are you trying to say? What kind of a job was it Mr. Cornelius had to offer? Sort of a gardening job. Did Mr. Cornelius offer you the job? No, he, he didn't think I was suitable. How did you get in touch with Mr. Cornelius in the first place? There was an advertisement in the evening paper. Well, why did you apply for a gardening job when you knew you weren't enough of an expert? Well, the advertisement didn't say what a job was, just said there was good money. I see. What did you do, sir, after you left Mr. Cornelius's house? Well, I, I walked down to the main road to get a bus. Did you stop anywhere? Mm, no. No, I don't think so. There's nobody you spoke to on the way to the bus who might be able to help us about the time. Well, I... I did go into a pub for a drink. I, I was feeling a bit shaky. Shaky, like. Mr. Scrub? Why shaky? I don't know. I, I don't know why. I, I just felt like a drink. So you went into a pub? Yes. What did you drink? Mm, whiskey. Well, I told you I felt a bit shaky. Yes, I know, yes. Do you remember the name of the pub? Well, it was the Fox and Geese, I think. It, it's quite near Mr. Cornelius' house. I expect we'll be able to find it. How long does it take to get from here to where Mr. Cornelius lived? Well, about an hour. Well, a bit less, perhaps. Depends on the buses. So, getting there at eight, you left here about seven-ish. Well, yeah, that's right. Uh, Mrs. Scrub, what time did your husband get back last night? Oh, well, about ten-thirty, I think. So, if you left Mr. Cornelius's house at eight-thirty, as you said, it took you twice as long to get home as it did to get there. Well, I told you, I went into a pub. For a whole hour? That's all right, Mr. Scrub. We'll check with the publican. I think that'll be all for now, sir, and, uh, well, thank you for being so cooperative. A uh, Good day, Mrs. Scrub. Uh, it's, it's all right. I'll uh, let myself out. Henry, you never told me he was dead. Well, I didn't know. He was all right when I left him. I swear he was. You believe me, don't you? Of course I believe you, Henry. That inspector thinks I did it. No, he doesn't. He's only trying to get the facts, that's all. Look, you best get off to work. You'll be late. I'll stay at home if you'd rather. No, no, no. It's all right. You better go. All right, love. Why don't you cook that fish for your lunch? It's all ready. Yeah, yeah, all right. I'll, I'll see to it. Henry? Yes? Why did it take you two hours to get home? You finished those glasses yet, Flurry? Not yet, Mr. Evans. You better go move on, then. It'll be opening time soon. Yes, Mr. Evans. And we could do with some more crisps. Uh, good morning. Are you the landlord? I am, and I don't serve out of hours. Well, I'm very glad to hear it. I'm a police officer. Yeah. Well, all right, Flurry. You run along. Yes, Mr. Evans. What's it all about? We've had no trouble here. I only want some information. Do you happen to remember a little fellow coming in here last night about 8.30? Or about... Five feet eight, a bit down at heel, but drinking whiskey. Funny you should mention that. There was a little bloke like that in here. Came in a couple of times. Strange little fellow he was. About what time would his first visit have been? Oh, about a quarter to eight, I should think. He, he wanted to know the way to Brookfield Crescent. We had a good laugh. I mean, he didn't look the type for Brookfield Crescent. You know what I mean. Yeah. And the second visit? About 8.30, like you said. I remember he had a whiskey that time and not beer, because I made some remark about him having pinched the silver. Reckon he needed a strong drink, too. Seemed in a bit of a state about something. How long did he stay? Oh, not more than a couple of minutes. You're sure of that? Of course I'm sure. Ask Flory, she'll tell you the same. I see. And that's all you can tell me about him? I'm afraid so, yes. Well, thank you. You've been most helpful. 
Now, perhaps I... Oh, wait a minute. Yes? Well, uh, I don't suppose it's important, but uh, there was something else. Look, I've told you exactly what happened, Dora. How many times do I have to go over it? But you don't seem certain about the details. Look, Henry, I'm only trying to help. You call this helping going on and on all the time? Why don't you leave me alone? I'm not leaving you alone till we get this thing sorted out. The police are bound to be suspicious if there are things you can't account for. I mean, if you weren't in the pub for long, where were you during that other hour? You've got to be able to explain it, Henry. But I can't. I, I can't, I tell you. Maybe it just took longer on the bus. I don't know. You're not even telling me the truth, are you? What do you mean? When you came back last night, there was something you didn't tell me, wasn't there? Do you think I don't know when you're hiding something? You didn't tell me everything, did you? Did you, Henry? No. No, I, I didn't. Well, tell me, Henry, you've got to. What happened? What happened when you saw Mr. Cornelius? Oh, go on, love, you can tell me. Well, it, it sounds dark, but it was something to do with an insurance policy. Yes. Well, he asked me... He asked me to murder him. Why didn't you tell the police that? Because they wouldn't have believed me any more than you do. Oh, that'll be them again, you see. Now, look, Henry, you've got to tell him the truth. You've got to tell him exactly what happened. Because if you don't, I don't know what's going to happen to us. But I can't tell him. You've got to. What's the harm? You've done nothing wrong. What does it matter what they find out? They can't hurt you as long as you tell the truth. Oh, look, I I'll have to let him in. Dora. Yes, love? I'm not telling him. I'm not telling him, see? Uh, I'm sorry to trouble you again, madam. Is your husband in? Yes, he's in. Then uh, may I come in? Oh, oh yes, of course. I I I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, good morning again, sir. I hope you don't mind answering a few more questions, Mr. Scrub. I haven't much choice, have I? I found the public house you went to, sir. I had a word with the landlord, and later the barmaid corroborated what he had told me. He remembered me going in then? Oh, yes, sir. He remembered you very clearly. There you are, Henry. What did I tell you? On both occasions. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, yes. I, I went in on the way to Mr. Cornelius's house as well. That's right. You didn't tell me that, though, did you? Oh, I've forgotten. Inspector... Did the landlord agree about the time my husband went there after visiting Mr. Cornelius? Oh, yes. He agreed it would be about 8.30. There. You see, Henry? And he added that you only stayed there for under five minutes. So the mystery of the two-hour journey home remains unsolved, doesn't it? Let's try and recap a little, shall we? Let's start from when you left the pub, shall we? The second visit. What was the first thing you did? Well, I told you, I, I walked down the road and waited for the bus. Did you stop anywhere between the public house and the bus stop? No, no, I didn't. You're sure of that, sir? Of course I'm sure. Not for cigarettes or anything? No. You didn't telephone your wife to say you were delayed? No, I didn't. You didn't make a phone call of any sort? No. You're sure of that? Do you think I don't know if I made a phone call or not? Supposing somebody said they saw you. Oh, I never made a phone call. So it wouldn't be right. Well, leave they... him alone, can't you? Leave him alone. I'm sorry, Mrs. Scrub. I'm only trying to get at the truth. And I can't when it's clouded with little lapses of memory. Why don't you tell me the truth, sir? It'll help us all, you know. Let's go back, shall we, to just before he was killed. You've got to tell him, Henry. You've got to. Has your husband been holding something back, Mrs. Scott? I've told you everything. Oh, for heaven's sake, Henry, tell him before it's too There's late. There's nothing to tell. Inspector, Mr. Cornelius didn't want a guard. Dora, don't. You mustn't. He wanted my husband to kill him. You don't believe it, do you? I'm trained to keep an open mind, sir. Would you like to tell me some more? He said something about an insurance policy. That he was going to die in six months, and, well, if he was murdered before then, his, his wife would receive twice as much from the insurance. And that's why he asked me to... To murder him. Did you agree to the suggestion? Of course I didn't. What do you think I am? I told him he was mad and I left. And that was when he went into the public house and had the whiskey. Yes, and wouldn't you have done if you'd have been asked to do something like that? And yet you didn't come straight home after your drink. What were you doing? Thinking it over? I didn't kill him, Inspector. I didn't kill him. You've got to believe me. Well, I may have some more questions to ask you later, Mr. Scrub. You won't be going away or anything, will you? You don't believe me, do you? About what Mr. Cornelius asked me to do? I only believe when I have the evidence. At the moment, I've only your word, and, uh, well, that hasn't been too reliable up to now, has it, sir? I'll check with Mr. Cornelius's insurance company, and then we'll know, won't we? Uh, it's all right, Mrs. Scrub. <laughs> I know the way. Good morning. Well, 
Well, I hope you're satisfied. Now you see where you've landed me. The truth didn't help much, did it? Well, you must admit, it, it does sound a bit unlikely, doesn't it? But it's it? what happened. Oh, Dora, surely you believe me. I only said it sounded unlikely, that's all. I'll get you something to eat. It's getting late. Dora? Yes, love? Supposing, supposing they never believe me. What will happen? Will they arrest me? Oh, they're not going to arrest you because you tell a couple of lies. They might think I was hiding something. But they'd have to have proof, Henry. They'd have to prove you, you were there at the time of the murder and all that. And you weren't there, so you'd nothing to worry about. No, I suppose not. You, uh, you didn't try to phone me, did you, Henry? Hmm? Last night when you left the pub, you, you didn't try to phone me. No? Now, why? Oh, I only wondered. It just seemed so certain, that's all. Why would I be phoning you when I was coming home? Oh, no, of course not. When he said that about someone having seen you, I, I just wondered... Oh, well, he was just bluffing. I mean, if you did make a phone call, that would account for a few more minutes. And the more time you can account for, the less suspicious he'll be about you taking two hours to get home. He was bluffing, I tell you. But supposing someone did say they saw you. I mean, well, why should he make up a thing like that? Nobody saw me, I tell you. There was nobody near the phone box. All right. All right, so I made a telephone call. Does that make me a murderer? Why did you say you hadn't? Why did you tell him another lie? Because it would have made him even more suspicious. Why? There's nothing wrong in making a phone call. I was telephoning Mr. Cornelius. But why? Why, Henry? Why should you want to ring him? You'd only left him a few minutes before. Well, I, I wanted to see him again. Did he answer the phone? Yes. He, he said I was to go back to his house right away. And did you? Did you, Henry? Yes. I went back. Yes, Superintendent? Of course, sir. As soon as I have anything definite. Uh, yes, it's beginning to look that way, sir. Open and shut. I'm waiting for the information from the insurance people now. When I have that, then I think we've got enough to go on. Yes, I'll keep you informed, sir. Goodbye. I'd have quicker results if the super kept off my back. Do you think this man Scrub did it, sir? I don't know, Sergeant. It's beginning to look that way. He had the opportunity and the time, and he needed the money. Detective Inspector Thatcher? Yes? Yes? You're sure of that? I see. Thanks. Come on, Sergeant. Where are we going, sir? Henry Scrub. We'll have to pull him in. How do I know you're telling the truth now? Look, Dora, I tell you, I suddenly remember that list of names that Mr. Cornelius showed me. I was afraid that the police would find and be round here asking questions. But they were round here anyway. Only because Mrs. Cornelius remembered my name. I didn't know she'd do that. I, I just had to go back for that list. How could you be so sure he was going to be killed? He was offering a lot of money, Dora. And I suddenly thought, supposing someone else on that list agrees to do him in. With my name, there are... I'd be suspected right away. You mean, you think one of these other two names here must be the murderer? Well, it seems likely, doesn't it? Let's have a look. There you are. Mm. Uh, what did you say to Mr. Cornelius when you went back? Well, I, I said I was thinking it over. We talked a bit, and when I had a chance, I grabbed a list of names off his desk and put it in my pocket. How long were you in there? Oh, well, I don't know, about half an hour, maybe a bit more. That's where the time went that I couldn't account for. As soon as I got the lit, I got up and we shook hands and I... But I left. You shook hands? Well, well I think so. Why? Well, what did you say to him? Well, I just said anything just to get out of the house. What did you say to him? Oh, does it matter? What did you say to him? Well, I... I said I'd do what he asked, but... But it was only to get out of the house, that's all. You said you'd murder him? Only to get out of the house. I I'll see who it is. Oh. Oh, come in. Thank you. It's the inspector again, Henry. Good afternoon, sir. I'm afraid I shall have to ask you to come to the station. What? Oh, no. He's done nothing I'm wrong. I'm sorry, madam. Like to get your coat, sir? Does this mean that you're arresting me? Uh, no, sir. Simply asking you to come to the station for questioning. But haven't you asked him enough questions already? Perhaps he'll answer them better at the station, madam. How long will I be gone? That depends on you, sir. But I've told you what happened. Yes, I know, sir. But it wasn't true, was it? What do you mean? You see, sir, we've been checking Mr. Cornelius's insurance policies. 
And I have to tell you that in not one of them was there a clause covering the possibility of his being murdered. Well, what do you want? Oh, I'm sorry to trouble you. I was, uh, I was looking for number 24. Well, you found it. Oh, this is the right number, then. That's what it says on the door. Who do you want? Oh, uh, 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 Mr. Ferrance. What do you want with him? Well, I, I wanted to ask him some questions. Oh. You one of them Jehovah's Witnesses? Oh, no. no. Nothing like that. Uh, does he live here? Sometimes. You mean he's... I mean he's a sailor. Oh, I, I wonder if I could speak to him... You see, I need his help. Well, I'm his wife. What's it about? Well, do, do you know if he went to see a man named James Cornelius about a job on, on Wednesday night? Cornelius? You know the name, don't you? Yeah, matter of fact, I do. Well, did your husband go to visit him? He was going to, I know. He'd been out of work a bit, see? I think he was going to see him. And did he? On Wednesday evening? No. Are you sure? Of course, I'm sure. He got a ship Tuesday night. He sailed on Wednesday morning. Oh, Oh, I see. So I'm afraid he can't help you. No. Oh, well, never mind. Thanks very much. You're welcome. How many times do I have to tell you, Inspector, I didn't make any phone call? So if I told you that both the landlord and the barmaid at the Fox and Geese watched you from the window and saw you go into a telephone kiosk on the corner and make a call, you'd say they were mistaken? Yes, yes, I would. And if I told you that after you'd made the phone call... They saw you come out of the box and go back in the direction of Mr. Cornelius's house. You'd still say they were mistaken. Yes, yes, I would. They were both lying. They must have been. Because that is what they told me, Mr. Scrub. And both of them are prepared to go into the witness box and swear it under oath. Hadn't you better start telling me the truth, sir? I've nothing more to tell you. Very well. Then I'll tell you what I think happened. You went to see Mr. Cornelius about a job. But he told you you were unsuitable. You were angry and you were poor... And after a drink, you decided to go back to Mr. Cornelius's house and help yourself to some of his valuables. No, no, never. Mr. Cornelius had mentioned to you that he was going out. So you telephoned his house to make sure that he'd gone. You got no reply, so you assumed he had gone. And you went back to his house and broke in through the French window. Oh, I didn't, I tell you. And as you were busy helping yourself, you were interrupted by Mr. Cornelius, who hadn't gone out after all. There was a struggle... And you hit him with the poker. Well, I never hit him, I swear. There were fingerprints on the poker, Mr. Scrub. Your fingerprints. Well, there might have been. I did pick up the poker when oh, I was there. Oh, you picked there. up the poker. You admit that. Yes, but look. What did you pick it up for? He wouldn't let me out of the room. I asked her to let me go. But you but did he pick up the poker. Well, only to threaten him. You threatened to hit him with the poker. Yes, but it wasn't the way that you think. Wasn't it, Mr. Scrub? Wasn't it? Excuse me. What do you want? This is the Regent Billiard Hall. That's right. There's no place for you, lady. Better be on your way. Uh, I was looking for a man named Fred Pender. That's me. I'm Fred Pender. They told me at your digs that I'd, I'd find you here. Why do you want to find me? I, uh, I need your help. Now, well, look, lady, I'm a busy man, see? I'll be closing up this place in a few minutes, and I can't stand here but talking to you. it's very urgent. Who are you, anyway? Funny place for you to be hanging around. You better get off home. It'll only take a minute. I said you better get off home. Now go on before I call a copper. Did you write to a man named James Cornelius? Cornelius? What do you know about him? All right. All right, Inspector. I did make a phone call. To Mr. Cornelius? Yes. I told him I wanted to speak to him again, and he said to go back to his house at once. And did you go back to his house? Yes. When you knew he was there? Why? There was a piece of paper with my name and address on it. I had to get it. And did you? Yes. It's, it's here in my, in my pocket somewhere. Go on, sir. There's plenty of time. I must have left it on the table at home. Yeah, that's it. I, I showed it to Dora. I remember now she never gave it back to me. So it'll be there now? Yes. I'll send a man over, shall I? And then we'll know. Uh, you better step in here, lady. Now, look. What are you, one of them female coppers? No, no. I don't know anything about this bloke, Cornelius, see? So you'd better get off home. But you did write to him, though. I know you did. You seem to know a lot about me. Maybe too much. You know, I don't like people poking their noses in. But you did write to him. Yes, yes, I wrote to him. Sounded interested. Plenty of money on that. And he asked you to go and see him? Well, go on. You seem to know everything. Wednesday evening? Yeah, Wednesday evening. Did you go? 
Look, I don't know who you are, but I've got work to do, see? Now, will you please go? Did you go, Mr Cornelius? Yeah, well, I, I tried to. About ten o'clock it was. But nobody answered the door. Satisfied? So you don't know if he was still alive at ten o'clock? Still alive? Mr Cornelius was murdered that night. Didn't you know? Well, Sergeant, did you find Mrs Scrub? Still no reply, sir. She didn't say she was going out. Oh, maybe she popped next door to see a friend. I shouldn't worry, sir. We can always find the list of names another time. That is, if there ever was one. Of course there was one. Why else would I go back to the house? Like I said, perhaps, to help yourself. Isn't that what really happened? You were surprised to find Mr Cornelius was in after all. There was a scene, and you attacked him. You attacked a defenceless man with a poker, and you killed him, didn't you? You picked up that poker, and you killed him. Oh, no, I didn't. I may have picked up the poker, but I didn't use it. I swear I didn't. No, sir, I know you didn't. You... you know? Yes, I just wanted to find out whether you knew it wasn't a poker that killed Mr Cornelius. It wasn't? No, sir. He was stabbed. Well, what did you come here for, lady? Are you trying to involve me in something? Look, I didn't know he was dead until you told me. I never got no answer when I rang the bell. I never went into the house. So whatever happened, it's nothing to do with me. Now you go off home. Would you tell the same thing to the police? Look, lady, if you're in trouble, that's your affair. I ain't done nothing, so I ain't got nothing to worry about. Well, let's call the police, then. Now, you're either brave or balmy. Now, suppose I was involved in this murder. Do you think I'd let you call the police? They think my husband killed Mr Cornelius. Oh, oh, I see. And you were trying to push it onto someone else, eh? Well, you picked the wrong man. I'm as clean as a whistle. How do I know you're telling the truth? Don't push your luck, lady. I've been very patient with you. Now, off you go home. If your old man committed the murder, I'm very sorry. But it's got nothing to do with me. Cornelius was alive all right when I left there. How do you know? Eh? Hey? How do you know if he was alive if you hadn't seen him? Circulate that description, will you, Sergeant? Tell them to keep an eye open. She may only be in with a neighbour, but well, you never know. Right, sir. Is there any news of her, Inspector? I've got a man posted outside the house. He'll let me know if she comes in. I'm sure you're worrying unnecessarily. But if Dora's got that list, she may be trying to find those other names on it. I don't think so. One of those people's a murderer. If she finds him, heaven knows what'll happen. You'll have to tell the police, Mr. Pender. Are you balmy? But if you saw Mr. Cornelius alive and well at ten o'clock, my husband couldn't have killed him because he left there at half past nine. If your husband didn't do it, they'll find out soon enough. They don't need no help from me. Suppose I call a policeman. I'll deny every word. I'll say I never went near Mr. Cornelius' house. It'll be your word against mine. If you don't tell the police, then I will. I wouldn't do that, lady. Not if I were you. Now, perhaps I'd better take you home, eh? I think you talked enough for one night. Let go of my arm. I told you I didn't like people poking their noses in my business. Let me go. Here. Hey, you come back here. And I assume, Mr. Pender, that you would have come forward of your own free will in the long run, hmm? Well, uh, yeah, I suppose so, Inspector. Is this a photograph of the man you saw? Yeah. Yeah, that's him. No doubt about it. All right, Mr. Pender, I think that'll be all for the moment. You've been most helpful. We can get you at this address for the present, I take it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, Constable, see Mr. Pender up, will you? Good day, sir. Uh, you'll do your best to keep me out of it, won't you? I'm afraid you're already in it, Mr. Pender. Well, Sergeant? Do you think he's telling the truth, sir? I wouldn't be surprised. And if he is, then somebody else isn't. Mrs. Cornelius, do you remember whether your husband had any other callers that evening, apart from this Mr. Scrub? I don't think so. At least not while I was at home. He may have had while I was out. What time was it when you got home that evening? About eight o'clock. So, as far as you know, between eight o'clock and the time you found your husband dead, the only caller was Mr. Scrub? Well, as far as I know, yes. Unless, of course, someone was let in without their ringing the front door bell. Or if you were prevented from hearing the bell because you were in the bath, uh, all the splashing and so on might have made it difficult. That's possible, I suppose. You see, Mrs. Cornelius, what I want to find out is whether somebody rang the front doorbell around ten o'clock and got no answer. Well, I can only say that if they did, then I didn't hear it. As I remember it, you said you went for your bath about 9.30. Would that be correct? Well, I think so, yes. And at that time, your husband was alone in here? Yes. I looked in on my way to the bath. He was alone. Had you heard Mr. Scrub leave? Oh, yes, I had. 
About 8.30. Now, between 8.30 and the time you went for your bath, you didn't hear your husband letting anyone in at the front door? No. So if, for the sake of argument, Mr. Scrub returned here about 10 to 9, he must have come in another way. Why should he have come back? Mr. Scrub says your husband wanted to be murdered. What? He says your husband offered him a large sum of money to do it. But, but that's just ridiculous. Not the sort of thing your husband would have said, even as a joke. Most definitely not. Was he a very even-tempered man, your husband? Well, reasonably so, yes. Not given to going off into rages? No. What a funny question to ask. I'm sorry, but it all helps to make up the complete picture. How ill was he? Well, he was getting better. He'd had a nervous disorder, but he was over it. Though, of course, he still had to take it easy, not do too much. You wouldn't say that he was dying? Oh, no. No. Mrs. Cornelius, how well did you get on with your husband? Well, Inspector, how... did you get on with him? I loved him. I loved him more than anything in the world. Now, please, haven't we had enough questions? After your bath, when you came down here about ten o'clock... Do I have to tell you all that again? He was still alive, wasn't he? I don't know what you mean. Your husband was still alive when you came down from your bath. You were wearing a blue housecoat. He was in his shirt sleeves, just as we found him. But he was alive. I don't understand what you're getting at, Inspector. I told you how I found him. It wasn't true, though, was it? I know it wasn't. You see, what you don't know, Mrs. Cornelius, is that that night at about ten o'clock, there was a man outside those French windows. What man? I a man named Fred Pender. He had an appointment that night to see your husband, but he got no answer when he rang the bell. So he went round the back of the house to see if anyone was in. And there he saw you. Mr. Cornelius was shouting, wasn't he? Getting rather violent. And you were trying to restrain him. Do you want me to go on? It was an accident. I swear it was an accident. It was you who killed him, wasn't it? Wasn't it, Mrs. Cornelius? Yes. 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 I suppose he was ill in a way. Mentally ill, I mean. He was always imagining things. Often he'd say to me that he thought he was going to die or that people were plotting to kill him. He seemed to enjoy the idea of being involved in dramatic situations. So everything he said to Mr. Scrub that evening was because of his state of mind, with no foundation in fact at all. Oh, yes. He often used to do things like that. And then sometimes he'd go off into uncontrollable rages... They never lasted long. And then he'd be perfectly normal again. Sweet and kind. What happened then, Mrs. Cornelius, when you came down from your bath? I, I made some remark about the visitor he'd had. Mr. Scrub. It was something perfectly harmless, but he misunderstood. He went into a rage, said I was interfering in his life, that I didn't love him, that all I wanted was his money. I tried to calm him down, but he was no good. What happened then, Mrs. Cornelius? Well, suddenly, he picked up the paper knife from the desk and rushed at me. I, I struggled with him. He must have tripped or something, because suddenly he was on the floor. And there was blood. And I didn't know what to do. Why didn't you tell us this at once? I suppose I was afraid. Everyone's entitled to defend themselves when they're attacked. Would you like to get your coat, madam? My coat? I'll have to ask you to make a statement, that's all. It won't take long. Yes. Yes, of course. I'll go and get it. Poor woman. Inspector? What is it, Sergeant? Fred Pender never saw that happen. He only said he saw them when Cornelius was shouting. Then he left. No, I know. But she didn't know that, did she? So if Mrs. Cornelius hadn't told us herself, what would have happened? We'd never have known, would we? It's summer, a late afternoon. At a wharf on Cape Cod, a young man in a small cabin cruiser is about to cast off for an island several miles offshore. 
I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon, but are you going to the island tonight? I missed the steamer. Well, that'll teach you not to be late. Besides, you don't take passengers. This is a government boat. Oh, I'd be very indebted to you. My cousin's expecting me. I promise I won't be any trouble. Can't you see I'm full up with supplies? Well, I'm not very large. Well, please. Come on. Oh, thank you. Hey, just put your bags over there. Thank you. I've never been to the island before. How long a trip is it? Oh, about two hours. I love the sea. I come by it naturally, I guess. All my ancestors were whalers from Portland. Maine or Oregon? To a Yankee, there's only one Portland. Maine. Welcome to New England, Yankee. Oh, thank you. What have you been doing? Sure been awful quiet. I've been making a sketch of you. Me? Where? Huh. Hey, that's good. You going to the island to paint? Yes. Yeah, the island's a regular hangout for artists. They're always wanting to paint the lighthouse. Eben won't let him near the place. Eben? Uh-huh. Eben Folger, he's the lighthouse keeper on Dragonhead. I'm, um, uh, what you might call his temporary assistant. Oh. Well, there's the island. Have you ashore in ten minutes. I hope your cousin's still there. Am I glad to see you. Oh, you certainly gave me a scare, Kate. Steamer came in and not a sign of you. Oh, I'm sorry, Freddy. I missed it by one minute. Well, the car's down here. Oh, incidentally, who is that who brought you across? His name's Bill. Oh? Pat arrived yet? Yes. Freddy, where's Dragonhead? Dragonhead? Well, it's a lighthouse about a mile offshore. Why do you ask that? The Dragonhead launch brought me over. Do you know the keeper? His name's Folger. Oh, dear, I'm sure I don't. Now, tell me what you'd like to do tomorrow, Kate. You can paint... Does he come to the mainland every day? He? Who are you talking about? The lighthouse keeper. Well, of course he does. Oh, I don't know. How do I know what he does? Now, come on, Katie. Come on. Hello? Hello, Mr. Folger. Oh, come it, ain't you got no ears? No visitors, I said. This here's government property. No visitors. If you'd let me explain, Mr. Folger. You get back in your sailboat and get out of here. But there's something in this package that may interest you. Huh? Now, wait a minute. You're the one that stopped me in town yesterday, ain't you? Yes, in Granby's antique shop. Yeah, you're the one who wanted to paint my picture. And I told you if you was to pay me $50,000, I wouldn't be found dead sitting for no Tom Fool portrait. I know you did. And when you left, I bought this. It's a, a ship model, Mr. Folger. Miss Granby told me you're an expert on ship models. Tell her for me to mind her own business. Oh, it's a great imposition, I know. But you see, I know so little about ship models, and I... I don't like the idea that I may have been rooked. Won't you look at it, Mr. Folger? Eh, yeah, maybe. Hey, Evan, do you want me to... Well, hello. Why, hello. Say, you the one he brung over in the launch from the mainland? Yes. Now, about that model... Oh, you're pretty smart for a woman. You knowed I wanted this ship model, didn't you? I want to strike a bargain with you. Watch out, Evan. She's a Yankee. You found out I tried to buy this here model. That old lady Granby. Hundred and fifty dollars, she said. My country, that's highway robbery. You can have it for nothing if you'll pose for me. No. Only an hour a day for two weeks. No. You set the time yourself. You who hesitates is lost, Evan. You're getting too big for your britches, son. All right. You be here each day at four, but no Sundays. Sundays, too. Oh, Sundays then, doggone it. <laughs> He's a tough customer. You're pretty slippery yourself. I know. Well, I... I guess I'd better go. You must be busy. Yes, I have a little work to do here. Well, I... I'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye, Bill. Goodbye, Kate. What's happened to Evan? He's gone into the lighthouse. Then you let him? He says he can't pose if there's a fog and he can't control the axe of God. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I haven't any complaints. We've had such wonderful weather all week. Well, let me see the painting. Oh, my, that looks fine, Katie. Oh, thank you. Hey, that fog's rolling in fast. You're not going to try to sail back in it, are you? Well, I... you better stay here for a while. Oh, I'd like that, but... Well, Mr. Folger's never been very hospitable. Oh, that's nonsense. He's got a heart as big as a house. Come on. I've never been at the top of a lighthouse before. Does the fog frighten you? A little. There's something so terribly lonely about it. I don't mind being alone, but I... I don't like to feel lonely. There's a difference, isn't there? You know, I don't mind being alone either. Fact is, I deliberately took this job to get away from people. I can understand that. But you know, you wouldn't be afraid of that fog if you went right out into it. Come on, let's go down. I'll show you what I mean. I'll take you to a favorite cove of mine. 
It's like the end of the world. It could end like this? I don't think I'd be frightened, even if it were. Or lonely, either? No. Uh You know, I, I, I knew you'd get over it out here. I wonder what people would do if the world should end like this. Then they'd have time to say all the things they'd always wanted to say. Then they'd have the courage to say... For instance? Honest things. Such as? Such as telling you that I didn't particularly want to paint Eben's portrait. Then why have you gone to all this trouble? Because I wanted to see you again. Lonely people want friends. But they have to search very hard for them. It's difficult for them to... to find... Other lonely people... Yes. The fog's lifting. It wasn't the end of the world after all. You're the first person I ever brought here. And you know, the one time that I I wish I could paint is when I'm here. Katie, do you suppose that you could catch all this? Oh, no. No, I'm not nearly a good enough painter. Oh, Bill, you were made for all this. Was I? You know, I went to a class reunion this spring. Some of the fellas, they, well, they, they were ribbing me about being stuck way off down here. One of them even offered me a job. I guess he felt kind of sorry for me. Oh, if he only knew how I felt for him. You found your place in the world. I envy you. You know, you're the first person that's understood that. Don't ever give it up. I don't ever want to. I'm through at Dragonhead for a while, Katie. You're going away? Yes, I have to go up to Boston tomorrow to see the superintendent. Oh. Well, it's been lots of fun these past few days. I I know I've had a wonderful time. I'll miss you, Bill. Oh, Katie. Oh, Bill. Come on, I'll take you over to the island in the speedboat. Thanks for bringing me across, Bill. I... I can go the rest of the way myself. No, but I'd like to walk you home. Oh, no, no, it's late, and I have a lot of things What's to do. What's the matter? What's the matter? Are you ashamed of me? Oh, no. Huh? <laughs> no, it isn't that at all. You wouldn't be holding that on me now. You haven't got a husband or anything like that, huh? Oh, of course huh? not. <laughs> what an idea. Hmm? Well, good night, Bill. I'll sail your boat back in the morning. Thanks. We could have lunch, maybe, huh? If you'd like. I'll pick you up at the wharf at 12 o'clock. And, oh, Katie... When I go away, it it won't be for long. I'm glad, Bill. Good night. Good night, Katie. Hello, sis. Pat. I thought I'd wait up for you, Katie. We haven't had a talk for a long time. I've been busy, Pat. Tell me the truth, Katie. That lighthouse keeper isn't old, is he? Yes, he is. He has a beard down to his ankles. Having fun these days, Pat? Bored stiff, frankly. Why don't you go to Hyannis? Your gang's all there. Not trying to get rid of me, are you, Katie? Don't be silly. You know, darling, you're not a very good liar. Now, who is he? Who's what? Pat, you have a one-track mind. All right, don't tell me. What'd you do tonight? I know something's happened to you. You were singing like mad in the shower this morning. And for an elderly lighthouse keeper with a beard down to his ankles, you spend an awfully long time in front of the mirror. I saw the hunky-dory offshore. Does that mean Tom Fraser's in town? Oh, Tom's getting to be a bit of a nuisance. He's a good catch, Pat. Want him? Oh, no. I know my limitations, Pat. I'm dead I'm going to bed. He must be wonderful. Bet you ten dollars I get it out of you. Ten dollars you don't. Such a divine night. No kind of night to be stuck in a house all by yourself. You should have gone out. It's been warm enough to go without a coat. Painting in the dark, dear. (laughs) Oh, I wish now I'd double that bet. (laughs) Darling, just so you'll feel better. I will be seeing Tom for the next few days. Lunch on the yacht tomorrow, and heaven knows what from then on. Good night. Night, Pat. Hey, Katie, where are you going? Hey, Katie. Well, good morning. Hey, what's the matter? Didn't you see me? 
I couldn't have looked very closely, could I? <laughs> For a second there, I thought you'd forgotten all about our luncheon date. Date? Oh, oh no. No, I didn't forget. You were walking right past me. Oh, how could you think I'd forget? I'll be right back. I, um, I want to speak to that sailor at the end of the wharf. Oh, sure. Sure, go ahead. Morning, Phil. Morning, Miss Pat. Uh, Phil, will you please tell Mr. Fraser I can't possibly come out for lunch today? Yes, Miss Pat, I'll tell him. Thank you. Tell him I'm dreadfully sorry. You really dolled yourself up today. I always doll myself up when I have a luncheon engagement. I have a wonderful idea. Let's go to the cottage for lunch. Oh, now, wait a minute. You know how you've been about keeping me away from there. It's a woman's privilege to change her mind. Well, <laughs> Well, that's just fine. Good. More coffee? No, 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 thanks, Katie. I'm just right. It was a divine night last night, wasn't it? Yes, yes, it was. Unusual to have it warm enough to go without a coat. That's right. Well, Katie, you got me going around in circles. Yeah, you know, I don't know if I can quite explain it. But look, you're a swell person. I always knew that. But, well... It, it, it just seems that there was something lacking. Now, maybe I can explain it this way. It's like you were a cake. A cake? Uh-huh. Yeah. A cake without any frosting. And I guess, well, I guess most guys are kind of like the frosting. You know what I mean? And today you think I'm well frosted. I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, was, I was never more fooled in my life. <laughs> Katie. Katie, I guess you know that I think you're something special. I'm afraid I think you're something special, too. Well, what I... I really want to say is... Well, what was it you wanted to... Oh. Hello, Katie. You're not seeing things, Bill. It's true. Well, I'll be. Hello, Bill. I see you did keep our date for lunch. Well, I... I, I thought I did. <laughs> Look at him, Katie. Bill, if you could only see your face. That, that's very clever. <laughs> Which one of you think these things up? I'm always the one. Katie, I swear I was going to confess, but you came home just a second too soon. Oh, it's lucky for you she did. You were just about to be kissed by a perfect stranger. As you can see, it's very easy to confuse us. Yes. Uh, Katie, your sister here is a very dangerous woman. Well, I better be on my way. I have to catch the four o'clock boat. Will you walk to the gate with me, Katie? Going away? Yes, I'm going to Boston overnight on business. Oh, uh, uh, thanks for the lunch, um... Patricia. Uh, Patricia. Bill, Pat, Pat's apt to do crazy things. No, oh, that's all right, Katie. Oh, uh, the Lippincotts are giving an old-fashioned barn dance tomorrow night, and I'll be back in time. Would you like to go with me? I'd love to. All right, I'll pick you up at 8 o'clock. I'll be ready. So long, Katie. So long, Bill. Have a good trip. I'd like to buy a paper bill, but I don't seem to have any change. Well, hello. Hello. Which one is it? You know. Uh, yes, I know. How'd you get here, Pat? Flew over. Lots of people have to go to Boston, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I guess they do. done a square dance, Bill, since I was a kid. Hope you don't mind if I step all over your feet. Oh, we'll step on each other's feet, Katie, if you are Katie. I swear by my honor, it's Kate. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> well, here we go. Bill, there's Pat. Huh? Well, so it is. I wonder how she knew about this. Uh, uh, maybe the Lippincott's invited her. But she doesn't know the Lippincott. Well, maybe I mentioned it to her in Boston. Boston? Yes, I, I didn't, didn't you know that Pat went to Boston yesterday? No, I didn't. Well, well, good evening, Kate, dear. Hello, Freddie. Freddie, this is Bill Emerson, my cousin, Mr. Lindley. Well, how do you do, Mr. Emerson? Pat, come with you, Freddie? Yes, yes, she did. She asked me to bring her. This uh, sudden passion for the bucolic life, hardly her type of thing, is it? Well, Bill, aren't you going to ask me to dance? Well, sure, Pat, sure. I'll be right back, Katie. Well, that was quick work. Katie... Let's you and I have a nice, cool drink of Applejack, shall we? No, thanks, Freddy. Katie, tell me something. Just where does Pat fit into this jigsaw puzzle? It's a long story, Freddy, and I don't feel like telling it. Excuse me, I think I'll go out and have a cigarette. Katie? Freddy, don't bother about me. Hey, would you like to take a drive, Katie, huh? It's a fine night. 
Can I get you some coffee, then? You can drink it out here. Oh, for heaven's sake, say something. Katie, if that Bill Emerson means so much, do you fight for him? I can't. Why must you always let that sister of yours get ahead of you? Freddy, take me home. Why, Katie, I thought you'd be asleep. We missed you. Bill looked everywhere for you. Hatch, you know I've never been very good at mincing words. What does Bill mean to you? I might as well admit it, Katie. I'm mad about him. And he feels the same way. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. It isn't anybody's fault. Bill's so fond of you, Katie. Over and over, he said what a swell person you are and what fun you'd had together. Oh, skip it. Pat, do you know Bill? Do you understand the kind of things he likes? The kind of life he likes? You've never known anybody like him before. When Bill's kind fall in love, they mean it. I know the kind of person Bill is, Katie, and I am mad about him. You must believe me. I believe you. And I wish you all the happiness in the world. You said yourself a minute ago that it wasn't anyone's fault. Go to bed, Pat. Go on before I make a fool of myself. Please. It was just one of those things, Kate's twin sister, Pat, and Bill Emerson. Their meeting, their falling in love, and now, in the sister's spacious home in New York, their marriage. Cousin Freddie has just observed that Kate has slipped away from the wedding guests and gone upstairs to her studio. I thought you were probably in here. I wanted to get away for a few minutes, Freddie. You should go back to the guests. Kate, you've got to forget Forget Pat, Bill, everything. There's nothing you can do about it. I know. I know there's nothing I can do about it. Have you made any plans? I'm going to work to paint. Now you're talking. That's my girl. Hello, hello. Long distance. I was hello, talking... Hello, Kate. Are you still there? Yes, we were cut off, Freddy. But you were saying something about an exhibition. Yes, the Gruen Gallery on Madison Avenue. My oils and watercolors. Are you proud of me? Kate, that's just wonderful. When? Two weeks from tomorrow. Oh, good evening. Good evening. There's one nice feature about art exhibits. What? The buffet table. When the paintings bore you, try the hors d'oeuvres. I intend to fill up before I'm thrown out. Who's going to throw you out? Don't be funny. Look at me, I'm a bum. By any chance, are you also an artist? Enough of one to have an opinion of this exhibition. Oh, then you're a critic as well. You don't have to be a critic to recognize an amateur. Well, most of the people here don't seem to share your opinion. These people? What do you expect them to say? Well, I think I may as well tell you. I painted this collection. I was wondering when you'd confess. How'd you get in? I walked in. I was hungry. What do you do? I paint. But I never had an exhibition, if that's what you're driving at. If you had the opportunity, what would you do? You're making me an offer? I think I'd like to see some of your work, find out whether you're a phony or not. Well, let's get out of here. I'll show you. Now? Now or never. I'll get my coat and meet you outside. Ah, Miss Bosworth, don't you like my room? Don't you like my paintings? Your kind never does. If you'd stop being class conscious for a minute, I'd like to say something. Go ahead. I owe you an apology. You most certainly are not a phony. What shall I do now, bow from the waist? What's your name? Karnak. Now that you've done me the great honor of praising my canvases, I suppose I'll have to start praising yours. Tell me what's wrong with my painting. Everything. Chiefly because you're what you are, stiff, Ingrown, afraid. I bet you're not even a woman. I know your kind, a checkbook in one hand and a paintbrush in the other, while someone like me can't even afford a decent pad of drawing paper or a tube of paint. What did you mean, I'm not even a woman? Yeah, that always gets them. 
You can criticize a woman's work, but when you suggest she's not a ball of fire, oh boy. What are you talking about? Come here, I'll show you. I think I'd better be going. Okay, go. But you're not a hopeless case, you know. How encouraging. Good night, Mr. Connor. All right, Connor. What happened this time? Why did Deirdre quit? She's the best model we've Because had. I happen to speak my mind about you and about the way you paint. Connor, I think it's time we settled a few things. You're most welcome to use this studio, you know that. But not if you continually upset everything and everybody in my home. First the servants, now Deirdre. Okay, go on with your smug little life if you want to, but you can count me out. Oh, stop being such a pig-headed boor. I'm perfectly willing to allow you to humiliate me as regards my work. I want it that way, but not as a person. Nor will I allow you to humiliate anybody else as long as you're in this house. Oh, go soak your head. Come on, let's get to work. Go and get your think. Hello, yes? Oh, Bill. Well, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Pat with you? Oh, I see. Why, yes, of course I can. Oh, don't be silly. You're not interfering with anything. No, I can be there in no time, Bill. Yes, I will. Goodbye, Bill. You can be where in no time? The calls department store. I thought we were going to work. Tomorrow, Connor. Tomorrow. Bill, it seems forever since I've seen you. It has been a long time, hasn't it? How's Pat? Oh, she's fine. Why'd you want to meet me here? Well, I uh, had so little time, and I want to get a birthday present for Pat. I thought you might be able to help me. Oh, I see. Well... What about lingerie or a, or a negligee? Oh, sure, that's fine. They're over this way, Bill. What are you doing in New York? Uh, making arrangements to take a trip to Chile. Oh, for a Yankee, that's a far cry in New England to Chile. That's right. A new job? Uh-huh. Pat going with you? Yes, uh, yes, she is. You remember my telling you about uh, a job my college friend offered me? Yes. Yes, I remember very well. Well, I finally took it. It's even more money than I thought. I can't think of you away from the island somehow. Well, I had to do something to make more dough. I can't let Pat go on spending her own money. Oh. Here's a negligee, Bill. Looks like Pat. May I help you, madam? Hold it up to you, will you, Katie? Oh, it's a wonderful style for you, madam. Well, am I a prize dope? What's the matter? Well, if it's Pat's birthday tomorrow, it's yours, too. Of course. Well, I'd like to get you something, Katie. Uh, Oh, that's sweet of you, Bill. No, thank you. Oh, but there must be something here you'd like. No, no. Thank you very much. Are you taking the negligee, sir? Uh, Yes. uh, Oh, wrap it as a gift, eh? Yes, sir. You know, I'm surprising Pat. She doesn't expect me until Thursday, but I I want to be there for her birthday. Oh, Bill, how stupid of me. I completely forgot I have an engagement. I must run Wouldn't you have time for a drink before I catch the train? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I really have Well, uh, well... It's been wonderful seeing you again, Katie. Wonderful to see you. And thanks a lot for helping me out. Oh, it was fun. Goodbye, Bill. Give my love to Pat. Hana, haven't you gone home yet? Where have you been? Kind of late. Oh, I went to a newsreel. I walked around the lake in the park. Who's this guy, Bill? Where is he? Gone. You look awful. Can I fix your drink? No, thanks, Connor. You know... I've been doing a lot of thinking. All this art stuff's been a substitute for something, hasn't it? You'll be glad to know, Carnock, I've come to a decision. Hmm? I'm a third-rate artist. I always will be. So you won't have to bother with me anymore. What are you going to do? I don't know. I haven't decided. Always running away. No wonder you lost him. We won't discuss it, Connor. You'll never land a guy all closed up inside like this. But I wasn't always like this. People change. Remember what I said when I first met you? I most certainly do. You kind of went for me then, only you got cold feet. Connor, your conceit really amazes me at times. Man needs woman. Woman needs man. That's basic. Everything else starts from that. Art, music, the whole works. Only women like you want to make something important out of it. You want a guy to stifle himself for you, the grand passion, all of that baloney. Yes, we do. Now, don't go female on me. Get wise to yourself. Oh, leave me alone. Sure you're not running away from me now? Really? That's better. What's the matter? Would you like being kissed? I'm sorry, Connick. I guess it is the grand passion or nothing. Connick, I think I'll go to the island in the morning and try and figure things out.
Hello. This is Western Union. We have a telegram for Frederick Lindley. I'm sorry, but Mr. Lindley isn't here. May I take the message, please? It's from New York City. Arriving this evening, don't bother to meet me. Love, it's signed Kate. Oh, thank you very much. Yes. What are you doing on the island? I thought you and Bill were on your way to Chile. I wasn't able to go. He went alone. Where's Freddie? He got my wire, didn't he? Freddie had to go to Providence for a few days. Oh, I didn't know. You look tired, Katie. Anything wrong? Nothing in particular. Pat, why couldn't you go to Chile? Oh, I had a perfectly dreadful cold, something like the flu. What a shame. Bill was so excited about your going. Bill so naive about a lot of things. But that's Bill. Naivete is a bit trying to live with all the time. Katie, you haven't said a word about my dungarees. I'm getting to be a big outdoors girl now, learning to sail, all that sort of nonsense. That I want to see. I'll prove it to you tomorrow. We can sail out towards Dragonhead, your old stamping ground. Take off your hat, Katie, and stay a while. I'm coming about, Katie. Well, what do you think of your new skipper? She's all right. Pat, whatever possessed you to come down here? Oh, I wanted to see the gang again. Pat, it looks as if we were going into some heavy weather. That's wonderful. Hey, look out, Katie. I'm going to jive. Pat, it looks really nasty. We better turn back. Not on your life. I've always wanted to sail in a storm. Katie, you were right. We should have gone back. It's too late now. All we can do is hope to get in Lee of the lighthouse. Watch it, Pat. Oh, I should have insisted we go back. You manage the rudder, Pat. I'll handle the sail. Hang on, Pat. Katie, we're heading straight for the rain. I'm no pulling back. Lee wouldn't hang on. No, Pat, no. Don't stand up. Get down. Get down to the bottom of the boat. Hello. Hello, police headquarters. This is Evan Fold, your Dragonhead Lighthouse. You better get over here as soon as you can. There's been a drowning. A girl named Kate Boswell. I pulled her sister out. The other is a goner. Yeah, and bring a doctor with you. I think the doctor's still inside with Mrs. Emerson. She'll be coming out of that sedative soon. I'll need all the facts for the police record, so suppose you... I told tell... you all the facts. I looked out, and there was the boat heading for the rocks. Sail was all torn to shreds. Could you see which one of them was handling the boat? How could I tell in a sea like that? I couldn't tell them apart anyways. When you got out to them, were you able to see the body of the other one, or was it under the boat? I never did see the body. Coast Guard ain't found it yet either. They never will. Mrs. Emerson. Mrs. Emerson. It's all right, Mrs. Emerson. I'm Dr. Knowles from the village. Mrs. Emerson. Mrs. Emerson. Mrs. Emerson. Mrs. Emerson. Why does he call me Mrs. Emerson? Bill. 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 She's opened her eyes. She's coming around. Oh. oh. There. There, Mrs. Emerson. Everything's all right. We just want you to keep very warm and quiet. I tried to pull her back. I tried. We know, Mrs. Emerson. Evan saw you. He knows you did everything you could. No. I'm the police chief, Mrs. Emerson. Now, your sister came up to visit you yesterday, didn't she? I... I don't... She's confused. Don't you bother her with that stuff now. Mrs. Emerson, ever since it happened, you've been lying here crying for Bill over and over again. You keep saying... I tried to save her. Well, Bill ain't going to blame you, Mrs. Emerson. If the good Lord had wanted to take you instead of her, why, he'd have done it. So you get well and strong now, Mrs. Emerson, and be a good wife to Bill. She'd have wanted it that way. Evan, Mr. Lindley's come. Yeah. It's your cousin, Mrs. Emerson. He's come to see you. Thank you. I won't talk to you very long, dear. I don't want to tire you. Can you understand me, Pat? Yeah, Bill is coming home. He just answered my wire. 
He arrives in New York by plane Friday. By plane on Friday. Oh, Bill. Bill. Three days ago, Patricia Emerson was drowned off Dragonhead Lighthouse, and her body never recovered. But as far as the world is concerned, the girl lost in the storm was Kate. Motivated by her love for Bill, overcome by the temptation to be his wife, Kate has assumed her dead sister's identity. At her home in New York, she and Freddie have just returned from the airport. With them is Bill Emerson. You really shouldn't have bothered going to the airport, Pat. Oh, of course I'd meet you, Bill. Don't be silly. You know, you've hardly said a word. Well, there's not much to say. I'm terribly sorry about Kate. I hope you don't mind if we stay here a few days so I could, you know, straighten out some of the things. Oh, I prefer to stay. I've got some work to do here in New York. I think we could all do with a drink. Freddy? Uh, no, not for me, Pat. I have an appointment. Oh, but you simply can't leave us. I'll drop around tomorrow. You're being frightfully unsocial, Freddy. Goodbye, Bill. I... Call me if there's anything I can do. Thanks a lot for your help, Freddy. This really hit him, didn't it? I know just how it feels. It's very strange for me without Kate. Would you like a scotch? You know I drink bourbon, Pat. Oh, yes, of course. Kate is gone, but, you know, somehow I, I just can't believe it. I didn't know she meant so much to you. We were very good friends. That doesn't mean that I was in love with her. She knew that. How do you know? Oh, well, she... She told me just before the wedding... Bill, I'm so glad you're back. There's nothing any different between us, Pat. I, I came back only because of Kate's death. As soon as you... Why, the astonishment. Now, don't try to pretend that you've forgotten. Oh, no. No, of course I, I haven't forgotten. I I only thought that perhaps... I know you've been through a lot. That's why I didn't go directly to a hotel. It's unfortunate that the accident happened at this time, but I think that just as soon as you get Kate's affairs wound up, you'd better go to Reno and get it over. Reno? Pat, it was your idea as much as mine. Oh, yes, of course. It's just... Bill. Bill, would you mind very much if I went to Boston tonight? I I could come back later and straighten out Kate's things. If you'd prefer. And, and Bill. Yes? Could we let this divorce business ride for a while? I, I can't seem to think about it right now. What's there left to think about? I want another chance. Do you think you deserve one? Oh, maybe not, but I want it. Well, that's the first honest thing you've said in months. Let me try. All right, Pat. You'll probably change your mind when you get to Boston, but in the meantime, we'll let it go at that. Thank you, Bill. How long will you stay in New York? Oh, I don't know. Two, three days. Uh... Be sure and wire me when you're coming. I, I'd like to have everything ready for you. Yes. Uh, yes, I'll wire you. What? Your ticket, miss. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Ticket, please. Boston. I'm going to Boston. To Pat's home. How will I know? Little things, what rooms there are. What Pat used to do. And the servants. I don't even know their names. I must be out of my mind. And for what? Bill's going to leave me. What did Pat do to me? What did she do? Hello? Hello? Is that you, Mrs. Emerson? Yes. Who is this, please? Why, Lucy, ma'am. Lucy? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Lucy. I didn't recognize your voice. I, I'm in Boston, Lucy. I just got in and I'm at the station. Yes, ma'am. Are you coming straight home? Uh, yes, I'll take a cab. I, I thought I'd call you first. Mr. Talbot phone. Uh, well, thank, thank you, Lucy. I'll be home in a few minutes. I certainly didn't expect you back so soon, Mrs. Emerson. Uh, Mr. Emerson will be home by the end of the week. Oh, for heaven's sake. I thought he'd be in Chile for three months. Lucy, I think I'll go right to my room. I, I have a headache. Oh. You'd better take my bag up. What are you waiting for, Lucy? I thought you said you were going up. Well, I, I, I am. I, I just want to see what this mail is. Yes, ma'am. I wouldn't bother about unpacking tonight, Lucy. Just put the bag on the bed. Well, I guess the mail can wait. Mr. and Mrs. Devereaux calls. Oh? They're leaving tomorrow. Well, I, I'll call them later. 
<laughs> You're looking things over, aren't you, Mrs. Emerson? I'm sure glad I kept everything dusted. The house looks very nice, Lucy. Those roses on your dressing table. I thought you might like them there. Mr. Talbot sent them. Thank you, Lucy. He's been calling every day. I didn't think you'd mind if I told him you were coming home. That'll be all, Lucy. Don't you want me to call him? What? Mr. Talbot. He said he'd be there all evening. Uh, well, I'll attend to it later. But he's moved. He said to tell you he finally found an apartment. The Empire House. Apartment 326. Thank you. What about Alma? I'd better let Alma know you're home. Well, couldn't that wait, too? Well, it can if you want, Mrs. Emerson. But if you knew my cooking as well as I do, you'd tell Alma to be here first thing tomorrow morning. Oh, of course, tell her to be here. Yes, ma'am. Good night, Mrs. Emerson. Good night, Lucy. Oh, Bill. Bill. Who is this Talbot? Is that what Pat did to me? Who's the telegram from, ma'am? Mr. Talbot? I just figured since you won't talk to him on the phone, maybe he wired you. Lucy, Mr. Emerson will be home this afternoon. Where's your coffee, Bill? Oh, uh, help yourself to cream and sugar. Thank you. And here, your tobacco. Isn't Alma the world's best cook? We're lucky to have her. Look, Pat, I, I know all this is as difficult for you as it is for me. Oh, but it isn't, Bill. I love being here with you. You do believe that, don't you? I want to. You know that. What about Talbot? Have you seen him? No. Surely you must realize that that's the most important thing to get straight between us. I don't want to see him. Don't you think you owe it to him to tell him that it's all over? Oh, perhaps it isn't over. Oh, yes, it is, Bill. I swear it. He's telephoned and sent me flowers, but I haven't acknowledged them. I... Well, I thought that was the very best way to handle it. Pat, until you get this Talbot thing straightened out once and for all, there isn't anything more we can say to each other. Oh, Bill. Empire House. Apartment 326. Pat. Hello, Jim. Well, come in, darling. Come in. Martini. No, thank you. I don't believe I feel like one. Jim, I know I should have called you. Yes, Lucy told me Bill was back. I must say I was surprised, considering everything. He came back today. And just where does that put me? I have something to tell you, Jim. I find out I'm still in love with Bill. I'm sorry. That's perfect. You mess up my life when you say you're sorry. I happen to have arranged to divorce my wife for your sake. I suppose it never occurred to you that someone could say a thing and mean it. There's something behind all this, Pat. What is it? No, no, there isn't. You must believe that. I'm in love with Bill. I always will be. But you can't mean this after all we've meant to each other. So it was just an interlude with you. Yes, that's what it was. You dirty little double-crosser. You're doing to me what you did with all the others, aren't you? The others? You didn't think I knew about them, but things get around, Pat. You're not a very discreet person. Oh, I wish... Get out. Get out! Why the suitcase? I'm leaving, Bill. May I ask why? You were right. It wouldn't have worked out. I should have known it wouldn't. You've seen Talbot. And you're still in love with him, is that it? Oh, no. No, it isn't. Well, if you're not still in love with him, then why are you leaving? Bill, you can't want me to stay, can you? Not after... You said the only thing to be straightened out between us was the Talbot business. But what about the others? Much worse. Surely you knew about them. If you didn't, you were a fool. Don't you know you've been the laughing stock of this whole town? I don't understand. I don't understand. Is the room all right, my dear? As soon as I got you... Patty, I hope I won't be a nuisance. Don't talk like that, ever. Now, sit down. While you were unpacking, I made some tea. You look as if you needed it. Oh, Freddie, I don't know what to say. I had... I had so many things to tell you. You see, I've left Bill. Oh, that isn't what I wanted to say at all. Freddie, if I were to uh, tell you... Wait a you... minute. I think I know what you want to tell me, Kate. How long did you know? Well, I suspected just after the accident. But I tried to put such thoughts out of my mind. 
And then when you called and said you were coming here to the island, of course, I knew. It's absolutely unbelievable that you would do such a thing. But it seemed my only chance for happiness. But you were never a liar, Kate. How could you think you could live a lie? I didn't think. I just let it happen. Oh, it was so simple at first. It wasn't going to hurt anybody. But after I'd found out how Pat had treated Bill, I... Well, I couldn't go through with it. She'd hurt him so terribly that he'll never forget. And no matter what I try to do, it will always be there. What are you going to do? I don't know. I want to do what will hurt Bill the least. To a man like Bill, the truth is the only way. Freddie, would you forgive me if I went out for a while? Certainly. You see, Fred, Bill never loved me. should I do? What should I do? Katie. Katie. Oh, I knew I'd find you here, Katie. Bill, then you know. Yes, I know. I can't even ask you to forgive me. I don't want you to ask me anything. I don't want you to tell me anything. Oh, Bill. I'm the one who needs forgiveness, Katie. Oh, yes, I fell in love with Pat, but it was never right. Not the way we were always right for each other. I've known that for so long. Oh, but all that happened... We'll forget it, Katie. We'll forget everything that happened as though we never left the island. Can you do that? Yes. Oh, Katie, I love you so. I love you so much. 